This is Audible. Bloomsbury presents Clean Sweep, 8th Fighter Command Against the Luftwaffe, 1942-45 By Thomas McKelvey Cleaver Read by Lance C. Fuller Forward By Brigadier General USAF, retired, Clarence Bud Anderson The air war over Europe was hard and demanding. Between the first mission on August 7, 1942, and the final combat mission on April 29, 1945, the Eighth Air Force lost more men killed and wounded than the U.S. Marines did between the first landing at Guadalcanal that same August 7, and the declaration the enemy was defeated on Okinawa in mid-June 1945. Eighth Fighter Command scored its first victory on August 19, 1942, over Dieppe. Between then and the final missions in late April 1945, two-thirds of all the enemy aircraft shot down by the Air Force fighter pilots in World War II in all theaters were shot down in the skies over Europe. The command struggle to become an effective fighter force that could provide the crucial protection for the bombers was epic on all levels, personal, organizational, and technical. I was proud to be a member of that organization, most particularly a pilot in the 357th Fighter Group, the Yoxford Boys, as we called ourselves after being welcomed to Europe in a broadcast by Lord Ha Ha. In those first days of our war, the P-51 Mustang we flew was not the airplane it became. There were problems with the engine, the guns, and other operational difficulties we had to overcome as we took the battle to the enemy and the skies over Berlin and other cities. Thomas McKelvey Cleaver tells this story in detail with accounts from both sides of the battle that illuminate the struggle and put it on the human level of young men fighting like none before had ever fought, or ever would again. I am pleased to recommend Clean Sweep, 8th Fighter Command Against the Luftwaffe, 1942-45, as an honest account of our war. Clarence Bud Anderson, Brigadier General, USAF, retired, 357th Fighter Group, 363rd Fighter Squadron. Author Preface Here are some facts you should know. Between August 19, 1942, when the first enemy airplane was shot down by a pilot in an 8th Fighter Command unit, and the end of operations over Germany on May 5, 1945, the 15 fighter groups fielded by that command were credited with the destruction of 9,000 enemy aircraft in the air and on the ground. Twelve of the top 15 aces of the U.S. Army Air Forces, USAAF, in all theaters served in 8th Fighter Command. Also, during that period, the 8th Air Force suffered more casualties, killed and wounded, than the U.S. Marine Corps did between the invasion of Guadalcanal on the 7th of that month, in which the 8th flew its first mission through the entire Pacific Campaign to the end of June 1945, when Okinawa was declared secure. When I decided to become a screenwriter, a writer a bit further down that road told me that the way to get noticed and start one's career was to write the movie you want to see. This advice was quickly followed by the admonition, just know you'll never see it on the screen. I chose to follow that advice and decided I would write the fighter pilot movie I had always wanted to see. The result, Little Friends, did get optioned by a then-hot young actor who was also a pilot, and he did show it around, and it did get me noticed, and it never got made. But researching it led me to meet some very remarkable people. A fellow aspiring writer read an early draft and told me he knew a producer who had been a fighter pilot and provided me an introduction. Jackson Barrett Barry Mahan grew up in Southern California and learned to fly while in high school. In 1941, he joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, and a month before Pearl Harbor, he arrived in England, where he was assigned to 121 Eagle Squadron. By the end of July 1942, he was credited with shooting down four FW-190s. On August 19, 1942, the three Eagle Squadrons flew together for the first time in the war as part of the cover for the Dieppe raid. At 0830 hours, he shot down his fifth FW-190 then turned on the wingman and hit him before the element leader he hadn't spotted shot him up and he was forced to bail out, unluckily being fished out by the crew of a German torpedo boat 
who made him prisoner. At Stalag Luft III, he was the real cooler king, and only missed taking part in what came to be known as the Great Escape, because after 60 days in the cooler, punishment for his third escape, he wasn't in condition to go. In the years after the war, he entered the movie business as Errol Flynn's last agent, later making low-budget films. Barry took a liking to me and proceeded to introduce me to his fellow Eagles and fourth fighter group pilots. It was the door into the world of the people whose stories populate this book. Most prominent of these was the amazing Steve Pisanos, who lived up to Walter Cronkite's description of him as the single most interesting individual I ever met in all of World War II and became my friend for the next 34 years. Top fourth ace Jim Goodson, the epitome of the dashing fighter pilot 40 years later, and Jim's Sancho Panza wingman, Bob Wehrman. Never an ace. Bob was a close observer of people who provided insights into the pilots he flew with that brought the Eagles alive to me. Eventually, after putting me off for 15 years, their legendary leader, Don Blakesley, gave in after I was recommended to him by my friend and his former neighbor, Air Apache's strafing king, Vic Tatelman. He finally opened up on the realization that he'd run across a historian who really wanted to hear what he had to say. Steve's introduction to his longtime friend, Walter Cronkite, gave entry to a productive afternoon's conversation learning the politics of the air war from an astute observer. Gladwin Hill, who was Cronkite's opposite number for the Associated Press, turned out to live five miles from me. His stories of being a war correspondent with the 8th Air Force also provided great insight. Meeting and talking with generals Adolf Galland, Gunther Rahl, and Walter Kropinski opened the door to the other side. Kropinski's story of his feelings just before ordering a 12 o'clock high attack into the American bombers was invaluable to understanding the Jagdwaffe's war. My longtime friendships through planes of fame with ME-262 pilots Jörg Chipinka and Hans Busch helped me gain understanding of the lives of the frontline pilots. Forty-five years ago, Elmer E. Mack McTaggart taught me aerobatics and told me the story of how he set the record for escape and evasion back in 1943. His fellow 78th Group pilots Dick Hewitt, Ernie Russell, Huey Lamb, and Wayne Coleman were each founts of information. I was also fortunate, from my involvement at the Plains of Fame Air Museum, to know Bud Mahurin for 30 years. Bud always opened his presentations at the museum by saying, I've crashed every plane I flew. That wasn't an admission of lack of ability, but rather the fact that this bold and aggressive pilot flew to the limits every time he climbed in a cockpit. Bud's never-ending supply of risque humor brightened every meeting, and his near-photographic recall of his fellow Wolfpack pilots was irreplaceable. His introduction to Hub Zemke allowed me to interview the other leading American fighter leader of the war. Major Chili Williams was also a friend out at Chino, which was the only way I could ever have discovered his remarkable story as a photo reconnaissance pilot. Getting hired as the unit publicist's assistant on The Right Stuff led to meeting and becoming friends with one of my childhood heroes, Chuck Yeager. He was the only person I ever interviewed for whom I ran out of questions. We spoke so long. It wasn't until years later that I realized I had grown up immersed in stories of the 8th Air Force. Mr. Smith, who lived on the far corner from us on our block, had flown 30 missions in Liberators. My high school physics teacher, Mr. Kusel, flew 35 missions as a B-17 pilot. Mr. Allen, one of the leaders of Boy Scout Troop 242, flew 25 missions as a navigator. All three eventually relented and answered the questions from the curious kid who wanted to know about their war. Bert Stiles grew up around the corner and down South York Street from where I grew up 23 years later. I took piano lessons from his mother, and once, after I had given a good performance at a recital, she let me see the room she kept exactly the way he left it in 1944. I may well have been the only student at South Denver High School who looked up at the big brass plaque on the wall outside Senior Hall that held the names of students who died in the war and was in awe of his. I think I am the only other writer to graduate from that school. It is shocking to me to realize as I review this 
that every one of the people named here who told me their memories of this war is no longer with us. The world is a lesser place without them, and it is my privilege to be able to bring them back to life here. Thomas McKelvey Cleaver, Encino, California, 2022 Chapter 1 The Most Important Day The sky over the English Channel at midday on July 28, 1943, was partly cloudy, an early indicator that the past week of clear weather over northwestern Europe was coming to an end. Fifteen miles west of the Dutch coast, the 40 olive drab and gray white-nosed P-47 Thunderbolts of the 78th Fighter Group eased their slow climb out of England behind them to 23,000 feet and leveled off to cross into enemy airspace ahead. Each big fighter carried a bulbous tank attached to its belly beneath the semi-elliptical wings. Standard operating procedure was for the fighters to make their entry into the enemy's air at 29,000 feet, above the flak. But this time, 84th Fighter Squadron Commanding Officer, CO, Major Gene Roberts, who led the formation, was attempting something new. He recalled, We started with the usual 48 fighters, three squadrons of 16 fighters per squadron. However, two of the pilots reported mechanical problems and had to abort as we crossed the English Channel. In each case, per our standard procedure at the time, I had to dispatch the aborting airplane's entire flight of four to provide an escort back to base. That left us with 40 fighters for the mission by the time we reached Holland. Brand new Group Commander Lieutenant Colonel Melvin F. McNichol flew beside Roberts as White Three Element Lead on this, his first mission. Deputy Group Commander Lieutenant Colonel James Stone was Red One of the second flight, while Captain Jack C. Price, who had scored his first FW-190 on July 14th, was Blue One of the third flight. First Lieutenant Quince L. Brown, victor in his first air combat 30 days earlier, led the fourth flight as Yellow One. His wingman, Flight Officer Peter Pompetti, also a one-victory pilot, was known in the group as a maverick. Above Robert's squadron, the 83rd Fighter Squadron flew high cover, led by Captain Charles P. London, Red One, the group's top scorer with three. Major Harry Dayhuff, another single-victory pilot, led the 82nd Fighter Squadron in the low position. At this altitude, Roberts reckoned the Thunderbolts could draw the last of the fuel from the unpressurized ferry tanks they carried. For a fighter that was as thirsty for fuel as the P-47, every gallon mattered, as the pilots attempted to get as far into enemy territory as possible. The Thunderbolts crossed the coast north of Rotterdam, high enough that the sound of their roaring Pratt & Whitney R-2800 the P-47's power plant, was unheard on the ground below. They flew past Nijmegen, where all the pilots switched to their internal fuel tanks as they pulled back on their sticks and followed Roberts up to 29,000 feet, where they leveled off and entered German airspace over Kleve. From this altitude, they could see the city of Heltern on the horizon. Roberts thanked the lucky tailwind they must have found for pushing them so far east, this was the deepest penetration of Germany yet made by 8th Fighter Command fighters. Only the day before, the 4th Fighter Group had used the troublesome, unpressurized belly tanks for the first time to set a new penetration record, making it as far east as the German border. Robert's decision to delay climbing to penetration altitude as long as possible was proven right as, for the first time ever, American fighter pilots looked down from their cockpits on western Germany. Their mission was withdrawal support to bring the bombers out of Germany, after which the Debden Eagles of the 4th would provide final cover across the channel. Good summer flying weather in the latter part of July 1943 had allowed 8th Bomber Command to mount 14 strikes ever deeper into Germany since July 24th, the first sustained air offensive by the 8th Air Force against Germany proper since the Americans had commenced operations from southern England a year earlier. 8th Air Force leaders saw it as the opening blow of the combined bomber offensive that would, over the next 10 months, prepare the way for the cross-channel invasion and the liberation of Europe. The seven days of good weather would be known among the air crews afterwards as Little Blitzweek. 
Today, July 28th, the Blitz would end with three missions against the Fackelruf factories at Aschersleben, Vaunamunda, and Kassel, respectively. They were deep penetration missions beyond the range of escort fighters and drew maximum opposition from the German defenders. One group of bombers executed a feint in the direction of much-bombed Hamburg-Kiel, then swung inland toward Aschersleben, 90 miles south-southwest of Berlin. Despite a cloud deck over the target, 28 B-17s bombed the AGO Flugzeugwerk, a major FW-190 constructor, when a small hole in the 9 tenths cloud cover opened and the lead bombardier was able to recognize a crossroad only a few miles from the aiming point. Calculating quickly, he dropped by timing the flight to the group's ETA. The next day, reconnaissance photos showed a tight concentration of hits on the target. British intelligence estimated that the attack, despite being only 67.9 tons, resulted in four weeks' loss of production. The flying fortresses were able to head into the westerly wind at 22,000 feet, thankful that the wind allowed them to continue straight on for home. As the bombers came out of the flak field over the city, Defending German pilots in BF-109 and FW-190 fighters slashed through the bomber boxes. Defending gunners in the bombers fired at the gray fighters as they streaked through the formations, cannon flashing. Three fortresses were hit, catching fire and heading down. The sky filled with blossoming parachutes. A B-17 in the lead box took hits in an engine and dropped below, out of formation. The pilot added power to the three engines left as he desperately tried to keep up with the squadron for protection. The bombers neared Haltern, where rocket-armed BF-110G twin-engine fighters attacked from the rear, firing their missiles outside the range of the bombers' defensive fire. The missiles were far from accurate, but if one rocket found its mark and the B-17 it hit exploded in the middle of the formation, it might take down a second and damage others. At that moment, the 78th arrived on the scene. Robert spotted the enemy fighters. We were outnumbered by at least three to one odds, but were able to maneuver into attacking position with very little difficulty. The main reason for this success was that the German fighter pilots didn't believe we could possibly show up that far inland and were not expecting to see a defensive force at all. The American pilots took full advantage of German confusion. Roberts remembered. There was one B-17 beneath the main formation, and it was being attacked by around five German fighters. The bomber was pouring smoke and appeared to be in deep trouble. From my position, in the lead of the group, I dove down on the enemy fighters that were attacking the cripple. However, the Germans saw us, broke away, and dived to the ground. There wasn't much more we could do to help the crippled B-17, so I pulled up on the starboard side of the main bomber formation, about 1,000 yards out. I discovered on reaching this position that my second element, Lieutenant Colonel McNichol and his wingman, had broken away and was no longer with me. I had only myself and my wingman, Flight Officer Glenn Kuntz. We immediately saw enemy aircraft ahead of us and above the formation. I judged that there were over 100 enemy aircraft in the area, as compared with our 40. Unknown to Roberts, McNichol had suffered an oxygen system failure and collided with his wingman, First Lieutenant James Byers. Incredibly, McNichol survived the resulting crash, regaining consciousness to find the airplane upside down, with members of the Dutch resistance attempting to free him. With two broken shoulders and other serious wounds, he was turned over to the Germans, who denied him medical care for several days, in an attempt to get information. McNichol survived two years' imprisonment and emerged from captivity in 1945. With his loss, Jim Stone, who had been in command prior to his arrival, once again became group commander. He would hold the position over the next year. Roberts and Kuntz came across a gaggle of Falko Wolfs. Dead ahead of me was a single FW-190, at the same level as Kuntz and me, about 1,000 to 1,500 yards ahead. He was racing in the same direction as the bombers so he could get ahead of them, swing around in front, and make a head-on pass. The bombers were most vulnerable from dead ahead. The Germans referred to this tactic as queuing up. Roberts dived slightly below the enemy fighter to avoid being spotted, then closed to 400 yards and opened fire, hitting the German heavily with a three to five second burst. 
The Fock of Wolf's wheels dropped, and it spun down in smoke and flames. Robert spotted two more. They were about 2,000 yards in front of me, heading out so they could peel off and come back through the bomber formation. Robert's closed so fast, he had to pull up and roll in on his second victim to avoid a collision. I opened fire from dead astern. I observed several strikes and, as before, the enemy fighter billowed smoke and flames, rolled over, and spun down. Amazingly, Roberts and Kuntz were still in the middle of the action. After the second engagement, we were about two miles ahead of the bombers, about 500 feet above them, and still well out to their starboard side. Kuntz was on my right wing. About this time, I observed a 109 on the port side and ahead of the bomber formation. I dropped below the bomber formation, crossed over to the port side, and pulled up behind him, again at full throttle. As Roberts closed on this third enemy fighter, the 109 suddenly executed a starboard 180-degree turn to attack the bombers head-on. Roberts followed as the bomber formation loomed beyond the German. I closed to within 400 or 500 yards and opened fire. He was in a tight turn, and that required deflection shooting. My first two bursts fell away behind him but I continued to close. I fired my third burst as he straightened out to approach the bombers. This caught the enemy fighter from dead astern within 150 yards of the bombers. It fell over into a spin, trailing smoke and flame. While Roberts dispatched his third victory, wingman Kuntz flamed the wingman Roberts had failed to spot. We are now at the same level as the bombers and approaching them from head on. We had no alternative but to fly between the two main formations, which were about two miles apart. Bless their hearts, they did not fire. Roberts then spotted two 109s attacking a P-47. They were all heading 180 degrees to me, so I couldn't close effectively to help. I did fire a burst at the leading German, but without enough deflection. The P-47 dove and took evasive action. I didn't see him or the Germans again. I headed out and joined up with a loose element from the 84th, and we headed home together. Gene Roberts had just scored the first triple victory by an 8th Air Force fighter pilot. Everyone else was equally busy. Top scorer Charles London caught two FW-190s at 26,000 feet, flaming the leader and diving to avoid the wingman. Zooming back up to 28,000 feet, he spotted a BF-109 and hit it in its engine, setting it afire. With this victory, London was the first 8th Fighter Command ace. Quince Brown and Peter Pompetti spotted a flight of four BF-109s and hit them from the rear. Brown damaged the leader while Pompetti fired on the remaining three. As he made a high G-turn, five of Brown's eight guns jammed. With only three still working, he hit the wingman on the right in the cockpit, killing the enemy pilot before breaking off to avoid a collision. Captain Jack Price came across a flight of FW-190s and flamed the leader. He turned into the enemy element leader and opened fire with his wingman, 2nd Lieutenant John Bertrand. Each hit one of the three remaining 190s, which both went down out of control. Lieutenant Colonel Stone hit a BF-109 that blew up so close that his wingman, 2nd Lieutenant Julius Maxwell, flew through the explosion. 82nd Squadron Commander Dayhuff spotted a BF-109 making a beam attack on the bombers, closing astern. The German blew up under his fire. Suddenly, the sky was clear of enemy fighters. The battle had been an intense ten minutes, and the Thunderbolts broke off while they still had gas to return to their Duxford home. No more B-17s were lost after the 78th's P-47s engaged. The B-17s were soon picked up by the 4th Fighter Group and taken home safe. For a cost of 7 P-47s lost in the melee, the 78th was credited with 16 victories. Added to the 8 credited to the 56th and 4th Groups, the day's battles doubled 8th Fighter Command's total score to date. Charles London had become an ace, while Gene Roberts had scored the first triple. Overall, the missions cost 22 B-17s and their crews, with the force sent to Aschersleben losing 15 of the 39 that bombed the target. Leutnant Heinz Konoka's 5th Staffel Jagdgeschwader 11, 5th Squadron of Fighter Wing 11, employed W.GR.21 rockets and scored the first real success with them. One rocket hit a B-17 with a direct hit that caused it to crash into two others, with all three going down. 
Claims by the defending gunners bore witness to the intensity of the fighting, with the Oschersleben force claiming 56 enemy aircraft destroyed, 19 probably destroyed, and 41 damaged. All claims from both groups totaled 83, 34, 63.27. The Jagdwaffe's actual loss was 15, which was primarily due to the intervention of the 78th's P-47s. July 28, 1943 is the most important date in the history of 8th Fighter Command. For the first time, American fighters found and attacked superior enemy fighter forces over Germany, scored heavily with minimal losses, and protected the bombers. It was a sign of things to come. Chapter 2 War on the Horizon In April 1936, Brigadier General Stanley D. Embick, one of the U.S. Army's rising stars, opined that it was inadvisable to have a long-range bomber, since this would give rise to the suspicion both at home and abroad that our GHQ, General Headquarters, Air Force was being maintained for aggressive purposes. Embick was specifically referring to the result of the Air Corps request for proposals issued on August 8, 1934, for a multi-engine bomber to replace the Martin B-10. It was to be capable of reinforcing the Air Forces in Hawaii, Panama, and Alaska, with a suggested range of 2,000 miles and a suggested top speed of 250 miles per hour, while carrying a useful bomb load at an altitude of 10,000 feet for 10 hours. Significantly, the design circular did not specifically mention the number of engines. Douglas Aircraft responded with the DB-1, a military version of its successful twin-engine DC-3 airline, while Martin Aircraft put forth the Model 146, which was an improved B-10. Boeing Aircraft in Seattle presented the Model 299. The then enormous design would be of all-metal construction, with retractable landing gear and a bomb load of an astounding 4,000 pounds, and would be powered by no fewer than four engines. All three produced prototypes at their own expense, which flew in 1935. Boeing demonstrated the capabilities of the Model 299 by flying it nonstop from Seattle to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, on August 20, 1935, in nine hours and three minutes, at an average cruising speed of 252 miles per hour. At the fly-off, the Model 299 was clearly superior to the DB-1 and Model 146. GHQ Air Force Commander Major General Frank Maxwell Andrews, a man so important in Air Force history that he is the only individual who gave his name to two Air Force bases, Maxwell and Andrews Airfields, believed that the Model 299 was better suited to the emerging Air Corps doctrine of strategic bombing. The Air Corps agreed with him, and before the competition finished, it was suggested the Air Corps purchase 65 of the aircraft, to be known as the YB-17. On October 20, 1935, test pilot Major Ployer Peter Hill and Boeing employee Les Tower took the Model 299 on a second evaluation flight, but forgot to disengage the gust locks that locked the control surfaces in place while parked on the ground. The Model 299 lifted off and entered a steep climb, stalled, nosed over, and crashed, killing Hill and Tower while the other observers aboard survived with injuries. With the crash, the Model 299 was disqualified, since it could not finish the evaluation. The design was not at fault in the accident, and the Air Corps remained enthusiastic about the big bomber. However, Army procurement officials were daunted by its cost. Douglas quoted a unit price of $58,200, $1.1 million today, for a production order of 220 aircraft compared with $99,620, $1.88 million today, for 65 Model 299s. Army Chief of Staff General Malin Craig canceled the order for 65 YB-17s and ordered 133 Douglas DB-1s as the B-18. Regardless of the 299's crash, the GHQ Air Force remained impressed. While the Model 299 never received a military serial, the B-17 designation appeared officially on January 17, 1936, when the Model 299 was retroactively termed XB-17. 
General Andrews had found a legal loophole in the Army procurement regulations and convinced the Air Corps to order 13 YB-17s, designated Y-1B-17, after November 1936, to denote special F-1 funding, for service testing on that day. The YB-17 incorporated a number of significant changes from the Model 299, including more powerful engines. Twelve of the Y-1B-17s were delivered between March 1st and August 4th, 1937, to the 2nd Bombardment Group at Langley Field in Virginia for operational development and flight tests, where crews immediately adopted the suggestion that a pre-flight checklist be used to avoid accidents such as the one that had befallen the Model 299. In one of their first missions, General Andrews sent three of the bombers, directed by lead navigator First Lieutenant Curtis LeMay, to intercept and photograph the Italian ocean liner Rex, 610 miles off the Atlantic coast. The mission was successful and widely publicized, leading to a renewed battle between the Army and the Navy over which service bore responsibility for coastal defense, with the result that in early 1937, now Major General and Deputy Chief of Staff Embick issued a second statement that, Our national policy contemplates preparation for defense, not aggression. Defense of sea areas, other than within the coastal zone, is a function of the Navy. The military superiority of a B-17 over the two or three smaller planes that could be procured with the same funds remains to be established. Following that, Secretary of War Harry H. Woodring canceled planned production of more B-17s in fiscal year 1939 on the grounds that they cost too much and were not needed. At the time that General Embick first declared the role of the Army Air Corps, the service's pursuit squadrons were equipped with the Boeing P-26, the service's first all-metal monoplane, still with an open cockpit and spatted landing gear, armed with two 30-caliber machine guns and capable of a top speed of 234 miles per hour, carrying fuel for a combat range of 360 miles. Some squadrons still flew P-6E and P-12E biplanes. In May 1935, Wille Messerschmitt's new BF-109 fighter with an enclosed cockpit and retractable landing gear had first flown in prototype form, also armed with two rifle-caliber machine guns, its British Kestrel engine powering it to a then-blistering 280 miles per hour. That November, Sir Sidney Cam's Hurricane fighter took to the skies. Still fabric-covered, it used retractable gear, had an enclosed cockpit, and was designed to carry no fewer than eight 30 caliber machine guns. It produced a speed of nearly 300 miles per hour from its new Rolls-Royce PV-12 engine, soon to be called the Merlin. A month before Embic defined American military aviation, R.J. Mitchell's amazingly graceful Type 300, another all-metal monoplane with enclosed cockpit and retractable landing gear, also powered by the new Rolls-Royce engine, flew on March 5, 1936. The next month, the Hawker prototype received the name Hurricane, while Mitchell's fighter received the name Spitfire, which he detested only slightly less than the alternative, Shrew. Not everyone in the Air Corps was as blind to the world situation and its possibilities as General Embick. In 1934, the same year that the German Air Ministry ordered Fakewulf, Arado, and belatedly Messerschmitt to design modern fighters for a competition to equip the then-secret Luftwaffe, while the British Air Ministry issued specification F5-34 to Sir Sidney Cam for his proposed interceptor and agreed to finance R.J. Mitchell's private venture model 300 for 10,000 pounds sterling. The Air Corps' Air Material Division had issued a circular requesting design proposals for a new fighter to replace the P-26. It specifically required retractable landing gear and all-metal construction the prototypes to be tested in a fly-off competition in 1935, which was delayed to 1936 to allow the respondents time to construct their prototypes. The result had been all-metal monoplanes with enclosed cockpits and retractable gear from Northrop Aviation, the Seversky Aircraft Corporation, and the Curtis Wright Corporation. The Northrop design did not compete due to its loss in company testing, while the designs from Seversky and Curtis became, respectively, the P-35, and P-36. 
While the P-35 won the competition and received an order for 76 aircraft, the P-36 became the recipient in 1938 of an order for 200, the largest Air Corps order for a fighter since World War I. On January 28, 1938, President Franklin D. Roosevelt launched a program for the buildup of air power in reaction to a secret report by Charles A. Lindbergh of the growing Axis threat and expansion of the Luftwaffe as a result of his well-publicized visits to Germany. At a remarkable meeting that day, the President ordered the Air Corps to develop a program for the production of 10,000 airplanes, stating that he didn't want to hear about ground forces that a new barracks at some post in Wyoming would not scare Hitler one goddamn bit. In response to the President's order, the Air Corps approached Consolidated Aircraft Corporation in San Diego with a proposal for the company to produce the B-17 under license. After company president Reuben Fleet and his senior executives visited the Boeing factory in Seattle, Washington, Fleet instead directed his design staff to submit a more modern design. The Model 32 was designed around David R. Davis's high-efficiency airfoil wing design, with a twin-tail design from the consolidated Model 31 flying boat, and a new fuselage that was intentionally designed around twin bomb bays, each one being the same size and capacity as the B-17's single bomb bay. In January 1939, the Air Corps asked Consolidated to submit a formal design study for a bomber possessing longer range, higher speed, and greater ceiling than the B-17. The Air Corps specification was written in such a way that the Model 32 would be the winning design, receiving the designation B-24. The Davis wing gave what Consolidated called the Liberator, a high cruise speed, long range, and the capability of carrying a 10,000-pound bomb load. However, although the thick wing could provide increased fuel tankage while providing increased lift and higher speed, the wing made the airplane unpleasant to fly when operationally equipped at heavier wing loadings. At high altitude and in bad weather, the Davis wing was also more susceptible to ice formation than that of the B-17, which caused distortion of the airfoil section with a resulting loss of lift. It drew comments such as, The Davis wing won't hold enough ice to chill your drink. However, when the RAF received early models of the Liberator, they became the first aircraft to fly the Atlantic nonstop as a matter of routine. In comparison with both the B-17 and the RAF's Lancaster Heavy Bomber, the B-24 was physically difficult to fly, with heavy controls and poor low-speed performance. Once armed and armored to operational requirements, it had a lower operational ceiling and was more susceptible to battle damage than the notoriously tough B-17. Air crews preferred the B-17, while the USAAF general staff favored the B-24. Eventually, 18,500 B-24s, including 8,685 manufactured by Ford Motor Company in its massive River Rouge factory in Detroit, were produced, making the B-24 in all its subtypes the most produced bomber, heavy bomber, multi-engine aircraft, and American military aircraft in history. Just before the President's 1938 instruction, but still adhering to the official position that the purpose of the Air Corps was defensive, Circular Proposal X-608, a set of aircraft performance goals authored by First Lieutenants Benjamin S. Kelsey and Gordon P. Saville for a twin-engined, high-altitude interceptor for the tactical mission of interception and attack of hostile aircraft at high altitude, was issued in February 1937. Born February 27, 1910, in the remote mining town of Ishpeming, Michigan, where his Swedish immigrant father ran a construction company, Clarence Johnson was ridiculed for his name in elementary school with some boys calling him Clara. While waiting in line one day to get into class, one boy started up the name calling and Johnson tripped him so hard the boy broke a leg. The others then started calling him Kelly from a popular song at the time. Has anyone here seen Kelly? Kelly from the Emerald Isle? He was Kelly Johnson ever after. Smitten by aviation when an airplane landed in his town in 1916, he won a prize at age 13 for designing a rubber band-powered airplane that flew further than other entries. Majoring in aeronautical engineering at the University of Michigan, Johnson conducted wind tunnel tests of Lockheed's proposed Model 10 airliner and found it lacked adequate directional stability. However, 
His professor, who had been hired by Lockheed to conduct the tests, felt it was stable and informed Lockheed accordingly. After completing his master's in 1933, Johnson joined Lockheed as a tool designer for a salary of $83 a month. Soon after, he convinced Chief Engineer Hall Hibbard that the Model 10 was unstable. Hibbard sent Johnson back to Michigan to conduct more tests. He eventually changed the wind tunnel model to have twin rudders directly behind the engines to address the problem. Lockheed accepted his change, and the Model 10 went on to become successful as the Electra, while Johnson was promoted to aeronautical engineer. After assignments as flight test engineer, stress analyst, aerodynamicist, and weight engineer, he became chief research engineer in 1938. The first project he was handed was designing the proposed high-altitude interceptor in response to circular proposal X-608. In 1975, then-retired General Ben Kelsey explained that when he and Saville drew up the specification, they used the word interceptor as a way to bypass the inflexible Army Air Corps requirement for pursuit aircraft to carry no more than 500 pounds of armament, including ammunition, and to avoid the restriction of single-seat aircraft to one engine. Kelsey and Saville were looking for a minimum of 1,000 pounds of armament and wanted to get a more capable fighter better at dogfighting, and at high-altitude combat. The circular specification called for a maximum airspeed of at least 360 miles per hour at altitude and a climb to 20,000 feet within six minutes. At the time, this was the toughest set of specifications the Air Corps had ever put forward. Since it was only expected that any order for a successful prototype would involve no more than around 60 aircraft, Kelly made no bargains with ease of production in the design he created. Working under Hibbard's overall management, he considered a range of twin-engine configurations, including putting both engines in a central fuselage with push-pull propellers, as the Luftwaffe ultimately did with the DO-335. Eventually, he chose a design featuring twin booms to accommodate the engines, turbo superchargers and tail, with a central nacelle housing the pilot and armament. The XP-38 was designed to be armed with two 50 caliber M2 Browning machine guns with 200 rounds per gun, two 30 caliber weapons with 500 rounds per gun, and an Army Ordnance T1 23mm cannon with a rotary magazine substituted for the non-existent 25mm Hotchkiss aircraft cannon specified by Kelsey and Saville. Armament was changed in the 12 YP-38s to a 37mm M9 cannon with 15 rounds in place of the T-1. The M9 did not perform reliably in flight, and further armament experiments between March and June 1941 resulted in the final configuration of four M2 Browning machine guns with 500 rounds per gun and one Hispano 20mm cannon with 150 rounds. Putting the entire armament in the nose meant that the guns did not have their useful range limited by pattern convergence. A P-38 pilot could reliably hit targets at any range up to 1,000 yards with a combined rate of fire of over 4,000 RPM with every sixth projectile, a 20mm shell. The design featured two 1,000-horsepower turbo-supercharged Allison V-1710 liquid-cooled engines fitted with counter-rotating propellers to eliminate torque with the turbochargers positioned behind the engines, exhausting along the dorsal surfaces of the booms. It was the first Army aircraft to feature a tricycle landing gear and also the first American fighter to make extensive use of stainless steel and smooth, flush-riveted, butt-jointed aluminum skin panels. To top things off, the XP-38 was also the first military airplane in the world to fly faster than 400 miles per hour in level flight. Lockheed's Model 22 design was declared the winner on June 23, 1937, and the Air Corps commissioned a single prototype, the XP-38, for $163,000. Construction began in July 1938 in an old bourbon distillery in Burbank, California, purchased by Lockheed to house expanding operations. Johnson later designated this secure and remote site the first of five Lockheed Skunk Works locations. Ben Kelsey made the XP-38's first flight on January 27, 1939. 
the prototype demonstrated such outstanding performance that Kelsey proposed a long-distance speed record flight to Wright Field to relocate the XP-38 for further testing. The record attempt was approved by newly promoted Air Corps Commander General Henry H. Hap Arnold, who recommended a flight to New York City. On February 11, 1939, Kelsey flew from Burbank to New York in seven hours and two minutes, not counting two refueling stops. He flew conservatively, working the engines gently and even throttling back during descent to remove the associated speed advantage. During his final refueling stop at Wright Field, General Arnold congratulated Kelsey and said, Don't spare the horses, on the next leg. After reaching altitude, Kelsey pushed the XP-38 to 420 miles per hour. As he neared his destination at Mitchell Field, the control tower ordered Kelsey into a slow landing pattern behind other aircraft which resulted in the prototype crashing short of the runway due to carburetor icing. Although the prototype was a total loss, the Air Corps ordered 13 YP-38s on April 27, 1939, for $134,284 each, on the basis of the record flight. At the same time that they had produced Circular Proposal X-608 for a twin-engine interceptor, Kelsey and Saville had hedged their bet with a circular proposal X-609 for a single-engine, high-altitude interceptor. One company had responded, Bell Aircraft, with a proposal for a radical fighter with its engine buried in the fuselage behind the pilot, allowing the nose to accommodate a heavy bomber-destroying armament of a 37mm cannon and two 50 caliber machine guns, with a turbocharger in the rear fuselage and using a tricycle nose wheel landing gear for the first time in any single-engine fighter. With the turbocharger, Bell promised a top speed of over 400 miles per hour at 25,000 feet. The proposal was quickly accepted by the Air Corps with an order for a prototype designated XP-39, to which Bell gave the emotive name Aracobra. Unfortunately, during the detailed design of the prototype, less imaginative Air Corps officers still committed to the idea of the defensive-only Air Force, ordered Bell to remove the turbocharger, since they saw the airplane with its heavy armament as a useful ground attack fighter to oppose an invading enemy army. Thus, the fighter Bell created, which was later lauded by pilots who flew it, such as Chuck Yeager, who recalled it as his favorite for its excellent performance below 10,000 feet altitude, was defective from the beginning and would be cursed by the pilots forced to try to fight in it at higher altitudes, where air combat increasingly occurred. The need of an effective high-altitude single-engine fighter remained unfulfilled, but this would soon change. By 1939, Seversky aircraft had become Republic Aviation. As with many visionaries, Alexander P. Seversky was not a successful manager. Following the victory at the fighter fly-off in 1936, he had purchased three factories and an airfield and hangar, with a seaplane assembly base at Farmingdale and Amityville on Long Island. When it became known that Seversky had negotiated a secret contract with the Japanese for 20 SEV-2PA fighters, the Air Corps stopped procurement of the P-35 at 76 aircraft. Bankruptcy was avoided in 1938 when Paul Moore, brother and heir of Edward Moore, who had been the source of Seversky's initial financing, refinanced the company with the proviso that Seversky would have his budget cut as president with day-to-day control by managing director Wallace Kellett. When Seversky made a European sales tour, the board of directors reorganized the company in his absence as Republic Aviation Corporation, with Kellett, the new president, on October 13, 1939. Seversky's most important decision had been to hire Alexander Kartveli as a designer. Born Alexander Kartvelishvili in Tbilisi, Georgia, on September 9, 1896, he moved to Paris shortly before the outbreak of World War I to study aeronautical engineering and graduated in 1922 from the highest school of aviation in Paris. Between 1922 and 1927, he designed the Bernard and Fuerbois aircraft for the Louis Blériot Company. One of his aircraft established a world speed record in 1924, demonstrating his gifts as a designer. Following the success in 1928, American millionaire Charles Levine invited him to come to New York and join the Atlantic Aircraft Corporation. He met Seversky in 1931 
and went to work for his fellow Georgian, Americanizing his name to Cardvelli. He designed the SEV-3, from which he created the P-35. Cardvelli was interested in increasing the altitude capability of the P-35 and convinced the Air Corps to approve turning the last P-35 into the XP-41, powered by a Pratt & Whitney R-1830-19 engine equipped with a two-speed supercharger and revised, inward-retracting landing gear. At the same time, he created the AP-4, which was rolled out shortly after the company's reorganization and name change to Republic. Powered by a Pratt & Whitney R1830 engine with a belly-mounted Boeing-developed turbocharger, the AP-4 had excellent high-altitude performance and an effective oxygen system. The Air Corps ordered 272 as the P-43, naming it Lancer. All Cartvelli's designs to that point had excellent range due to Seversky's demand that they use a wet wing as a gas tank. The P-35 had a range of 1,000 miles, and the P-43, not much less. The newly named United States Army Air Forces canceled further production in 1942 due to leakage in the wing tanks, though this problem was solved in the field when the P-43 arrived in China, where it served effectively in combat with the Republic of China Air Force until replaced in 1944. At the time that the Air Corps bought the P-43, Cartvelli was already at work on the P-44 Rocket, a development of the P-43 with a more powerful engine. In late 1939, in answer to complaints that his designs weighed too much, he commenced design of the AP-10, a lightweight fighter powered by the Allison B-1710 liquid-cooled engine, armed with an astounding eight 50-caliber machine guns. The Air Corps became interested and backed the project, giving it the designation XP-47. But by the spring of 1940, both Cartvelli and the Air Corps had concluded that both the XP-44 and the XP-47 were inferior to Luftwaffe fighters. Cartvelli tried improving the XP-47, proposing the XP-47A, which failed to gain interest. Then, looking to the 1938 specification in circular proposal X609 for a single-engine, high-altitude interceptor, which had yet to be fulfilled, he offered a new design. The Air Corps ordered a prototype in September 1940, designating it XP-47B, though it had virtually nothing in common with either the XP-47 or the XP-47A. The design was all metal, save for fabric-covered elevators and rudder, with a semi-elliptical wing that went back to the P-35 and had been used on the P-41 and P-43. Significantly, because it was to be a point-defense interceptor, the wing was not designed as a gas tank. Fuel was carried only in the fuselage, with main and auxiliary self-sealing fuel tanks placed under the cockpit with a total fuel capacity of 305 U.S. gallons, deemed more than sufficient for its intended role as an interceptor. An armament of eight 50 caliber machine guns with 500 rounds per gun filled the wing outboard of the wheel wells for the wide-track landing gear. The power plant was the brand-new Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp two-row 18-cylinder radial engine producing 2,000 horsepower using a four-bladed Curtis Electric constant-speed propeller, 12 feet, 2 inches in diameter. The engine cowling ducted cooling air for the engine, the left and right oil coolers, and the turbo supercharger intercooler system. Engine exhaust gases routed into a pair of pipes running along each side of the cockpit provided power to drive the turbo supercharger turbine, located in the lower rear fuselage. When operating at full power, the pipes glowed red at their forward ends, spinning the turbine at 21,300 RPM. The ductwork and turbo supercharger gave the XP-47B a deep fuselage, requiring the wings to be mounted in a relatively high position. This, in turn, meant using long-legged main landing gear struts to provide ground clearance for the enormous propeller. In order to assure sufficient room in the wings for the guns, the gear legs were fitted with a mechanism that telescoped the strut nine inches when extended. The resulting XP-47B had an empty weight of 9,900 pounds, 65% more than the P-43. It would be the heaviest single-seat fighter used operationally during the war. 
Republic test pilot Lowry B. Brabham first flew the XP-47B on May 6, 1941, by which time it had been given the name Thunderbolt. The prototype proved impressive in early trials, with only minor problems, but was lost in an accident on August 8, 1942. By then, it had shown a level speed of 412 miles per hour at 25,800 feet and demonstrated a climb from sea level to 15,000 feet in five minutes. However, while the XP-47B gave the Army Air Forces cause for optimism, the airplane had its share of teething problems that caused an equal amount of apprehension. The President's message to Congress on January 12, 1939, issued in the aftermath of the Munich Conference the previous September, with conflict now threatening in Europe and an undeclared war raging in China as the result of Japanese aggression, asked for a much larger appropriation to strengthen the military establishment. This time, funding for Air Corps requirements constituted more than half the total requests and marked the beginning of a period of Air Corps expansion which did not reach its peak until 1944. Asserting that increased range, increased speed, increased capacity of airplanes abroad have changed our requirement for defensive action, President Roosevelt strongly urged that $300 million be appropriated for the purchase of aircraft for the Army and Navy. At the outbreak of World War II in September 1939, the United States was well down on the list of military powers. The U.S. Army, with a strength of 174,000, was 19th in the rankings of ground forces, putting it, according to historian Eric Larrabee, ahead of Bulgaria, but just behind Portugal. The U.S. Army Air Corps was rated 4th or 5th in the relative standings. The National Defense Act adopted in April 1939 following the German takeover that March of what was left of Czechoslovakia, and the British issuance of a guarantee to Poland, which convinced a sufficient number of members of Congress that an emergency was indeed on the horizon, had approved a strength of 5,500 airplanes for the Air Corps, with a top limit of 6,000. At the outbreak of war on September 1, 1939, the Air Corps had a personnel strength of only 26,000 and possessed some 1,200 bombers and fighters, the majority of them obsolete, and none other than the P-36 that had entered service in 1938 and also been ordered by the French Air Force, capable of entering combat against a European air power like Germany. Pilots in first-line operational units in Hawaii and the Philippines were still flying the open cockpit P-26. In May 1940, the president called for an air force of 50,000 airplanes. 36,500 airplanes for the Air Corps, 13,500 for the Navy, and production of 50,000 airplanes a year. Eddie Rickenbacker, America's ace of aces from World War I, said that the United States was 10 years behind Germany in military aviation development. The only edge the Air Corps could claim was the B-17, but there were only 42 of those. To take advantage of approved increases in aircraft and personnel, the Air Corps in the spring of 1939 formulated a plan calling for 24 tactical groups to be combat-ready by June 30, 1941. Before this objective was reached, however, the trend of events abroad urged further expansion, and in May 1940, the Air Corps projected a force of 41 groups. By July, the goal was again revised upward in the 54-group program, which foresaw an air force of 4,000 tactical aircraft 187,000 enlisted men, 15,000 aviation cadets, and 16,800 officers. In September 1941, an 84-group program was announced in anticipation of the vast expansion contemplated in the as-yet-unapproved Victory Program for munitions. The aircraft industry was asked to expand from its normal capacity of some 2,000 planes a year to more than 4,000 a month. Aircraft production in 1940 showed an increase of 250% over 1939. By the summer of 1941, with the clock ticking down toward Pearl Harbor, the personnel strength of the Army Air Forces was 152,125, and the service possessed 6,777 aircraft, of which 120 were heavy bombers, 903 were light and medium bombers, and 1,018 were fighters. 
even that total was inflated with substantial numbers of obsolete bombers and fighters. While the general public was largely isolationist in sentiment at the time that war broke out in Europe, between then and Pearl Harbor, it had, for the most part, come to recognize the threat. Many young Americans, sensing that a war was coming, chose to enter the military during this time, when the possibility of choice of service was still available. Both the Navy and the Air Corps built up their flight training programs, and more young men became aviation cadets or joined for the opportunity of technical training. This change in public opinion was, in reality, a psychological preparation for war. It was brought about by the sheer logic of events abroad, particularly the fall of France in June 1940 which led to passage of the Selective Service Act and institution of the country's first peacetime draft that summer, and the Battle of Britain that followed. This psychological preparation was the most important single factor in improving national defense before the outbreak of war. Pilot training goals were successively raised to keep pace with the anticipated progress of other defense programs, From a 1939 plan calling for the training of 1,200 pilots a year, the figure was raised in 1940 to 7,000, then to 12,000, and in February 1941 to 30,000. By September 1941, when the 84 group program was under discussion, the Army Air Forces contemplated training 50,000 pilots a year by mid-1942. At the time of Pearl Harbor, No one in the upper reaches of the Army Air Forces paid much attention to the two fighters that had been delivered to Wright Field by North American Aviation. They had been designed and built for the Royal Air Force, RAF, who called them Mustang. In the summer of 1940, the British Purchasing Commission had approached James H. Dutch Kindleberger, president of North American Aviation, NAA, with a proposal for the then little-known company to produce license-built copies of the Curtis P-40, a fighter developed from the P-36, with which the British planned to equip the RAF. Kindleberger turned them down, saying he didn't want to produce an obsolete airplane, and suggesting to them that his company could deliver a world-beating fighter of original design. The myth of the Mustang's creation is recurring in aviation history. In October 1981, at a conference honoring the 40th anniversary of the prototype's first flight, designer Edgar Schmoud was asked about the story that the airplane had been designed and built within 100 days. The first Mustang was indeed built in 100 days, he replied, but I had been designing it for five years before. Born in 1901, Edgar Schmoud fell in love with aviation when he saw an airplane fly in his native Germany at age eight. From then on, he was dedicated to the idea of becoming an aviation engineer. Self-taught, he became an apprentice in a small aircraft engine manufacturing company during the last year of World War I. With the Versailles Treaty having crippled aviation, development in post-war Germany, he left for Brazil in 1925 and took a job with the General Aviation Company, the aviation branch of General Motors Corporation's Brazilian subsidiary. He built a reputation for solid work, and in 1931, he was brought to the United States by General Motors, GM, where he achieved his dream of becoming an aircraft designer at the Fokker Aircraft Corporation of America, now owned by GM. In 1934, GM sold Fokker to the North American Aviation Holding Company, which had been founded in 1928 to buy and sell interests in airlines and other aviation-related companies. The Air Mail Act of 1934 ended such companies. NAA became an aircraft manufacturer with the acquisition of Fokker, with James Dutch Kindleberger recruited from Douglas to run the new company. Kindleberger moved the company headquarters from Maryland to Los Angeles. At that time, Schmood, whose wife did not wish to move to California, took a position with Balanca in New York. A few months after the death of his wife in a car accident, Schmood rejoined NAA hired as a preliminary design engineer since Kindleberger was looking for young designers. Over the next several years, he was involved with the design of the GA-16 trainer that became the BC-1 and led to the famous T-6 Texan trainer series. Schmood's first foray into fighter design was the NA-50, a single-seater based on the T-6 trainer, 50 of which NAA sold to the Peruvian Air Force. 
Kindleberger managed to convince the Army Air Corps to let his design team inspect and disassemble the first Messerschmitt BF-109 to arrive in the United States following its capture in the Spanish Civil War. This connection to the BF-109 and the later similarity of the early P-51 to the German fighter led to an urban myth that Schmude had worked for Messerschmitt. Although this was untrue, Schmude did put the knowledge he gained from studying the BF-109 to use in his ongoing side hobby of designing a fighter that would be right, as he explained later. When the British Purchasing Commission came calling with the offer to build P-40s under license and Kindleberger offered a totally new fighter instead, he knew all about Schmude's hobby. The result was an airplane that equaled the performance of the Spitfire with the range to fly into Germany from Britain on internal fuel. Its only problem was that it was powered by an Allison engine without a supercharger, limiting its high-altitude performance. As war clouds loomed in the fall of 1941, all thought of the Army Air Forces as a solely defensive organization had long been cast aside. On December 7, 1941, a total of 70 tactical groups had been activated, including 14 heavy bombardment, 9 medium bombardment, 5 light bombardment, 25 pursuit, 11 observation, and 6 transport groups, though most were at cadre strength only, and few had been equipped with suitable aircraft. On December 10, 1941, when the U.S. Congress declared war on Germany in response to Hitler's declaration of war against the United States, all the major types of airplanes with which the Air Force would fight World War II were in production. There were now 198 B-17s, with 93 more coming off the line that month as production of the B-17E, the first version capable of offensive combat, began to grow. The B-24 had also entered production, but the first ones were only just entering service. The P-38 had been brought to operational status in one fighter group for roughly six months, but of some 60 produced, there were only 20 P-38Es, the first subtype capable of combat, and the airplane had demonstrated dangerous tendencies in flight as its performance took it into areas of aeronautical knowledge that were little understood, the primary one being compressibility. The P-47 had flown as a prototype, but there were still numerous problems to be worked out with that airplane, compressibility being only one. And two Mustangs sat in the back of a hangar at Wright Field. As U.S. military power grew and expanded during the years between the Nazi invasion of Poland and Pearl Harbor, the military establishments of Britain and the United States grew closer and expanded cooperation. This was most notable in the exchange of military intelligence and, more significantly, in the joint creation and development of war plans by U.S. and British officers. This began following the defeat of France in June 1940, with the effort expanding as the British demonstrated they could prevail in the Battle of Britain. Over the following year, U.S. war plans, drafted in 1941, went far beyond the academic exercises of earlier years. U.S. planners began to accept the fact of military cooperation with Britain and other Allied nations, which were already at war. British officers paid more frequent visits to Washington, where they worked in close and frequent coordination with their American counterparts in the brand new Pentagon. With the U.S. public still largely ambivalent, at best, over the issue of American involvement in the war, and for obvious security reasons, these planning sessions and their results were not publicized, outside of occasional public statements by Roosevelt and Churchill supplemented by less intentional disclosures through leaks to the press by those still opposed to the process, in order to give the public some notice of the increasingly close rapport between the two nations. Isolationist political opponents of the Roosevelt administration talked constantly of the existence of secret agreements for war. At the staff level, a due regard for legal limitations had to be strictly maintained. The plans being developed involved what would happen if the United States should enter the war, with no mention of when. Regardless, the result of this broad military strategy that evolved in 1941 remained that after Pearl Harbor without radical modification as the basis for the new Anglo-American alliance. This all began with a series of conversations between a U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee and a delegation representing the British Chiefs of Staff that began at the end of January in Washington, 
with the goal of developing a broad overall agreement regarding mutual goals. This was embodied in a final report that was submitted on March 27, 1941, known by its short title, ABC-1. The report laid out the best means by which the United States and the British Commonwealth could defeat Germany and her allies, should the United States be compelled to resort to war. The report included broad plans involving the employment of forces and cooperation between the two militaries. This included delineation of areas of responsibility, principles of command, and the forces likely to be involved. The primary point on which the planners agreed was that the United States would continue to aid Britain and other Axis opponents. This would later be enunciated by President Roosevelt when he called on the country to become the arsenal of democracy and recognized that the greatest thing the United States brought to the alliance was its unparalleled economic power. The offensive strategy adopted was known as Germany First, based on the belief that since Germany was the preeminent member of the Axis, the Atlantic and European area is considered to be the decisive theater. Thus, the main U.S. and British effort would be concentrated on the defeat of Germany. The long-term pattern of offensive action against Germany was described, economic pressure by blockade and other means, a sustained air offensive against German military power, supplemented by air offensives against other regions under enemy control which contribute to that power, early elimination of Italy, raids and minor offensives against the continent, support of all neutrals and belligerents who opposed the Axis, and the buildup of forces for an eventual liberation of German-occupied Europe. As regarded aviation, it would be the policy of the associated powers to achieve as rapidly as possible superiority of air strength over the enemy, particularly in long-range striking forces. In operations in the Atlantic area, U.S. Army air bombardment units would operate offensively in collaboration with the Royal Air Force, primarily against German military power at its source. In light of subsequent events, ABC-1 is one of the most important military documents of the war. Since October 1939, the War Plans Division of the General Staff had been working on five basic war plans for possible use against potential enemies. Each plan, bearing the generic code name RAINBOW and its own numerical designation, assumed a different situation and course of action in regard to the Atlantic and Pacific areas. RAINBOW No. 5, which contemplated an offensive in the Atlantic European areas and a strategic defense against Japan and the Pacific, fitted most accurately the strategy outlined in the United States-British staff conversation. Consequently, that plan was developed in detail in the spring of 1941, and by the end of April, the Joint Army and Navy Basic War Plan, Rainbow No. 5, had been adopted as the primary strategy. Rainbow No. 5 accepted all the major theses of ABC-1, the assumptions, overall strategy, and principles governing strategic direction and theater command were identical. In the European theater, where the United States was to exert its principal effort, initial operations were to be preponderantly naval protection of shipping and aerial bombardment of Germany. Hence, the Army forces set up for early deployment included a token ground force to aid in the defense of England and the bombardment force for the air attack on Germany. Rainbow No. 5 was approved by the Joint Board on May 14, 1941, and within three weeks by the Secretaries of War and the Navy. During the next six months, no change was effected in the basic principles of the plan, but in view of developments in the international situation and in U.S. forces available, modifications in detail were necessary. On November 19, the Joint Board approved Revision No. 1, which, among other things, established a more substantial initial increment for the Air Force in the United Kingdom. Further discussions of joint strategy and policy at the Argentina conference between Roosevelt and Churchill and staff negotiations afterward revealed a basic disagreement between American and British war planners. The British held to the belief that Germany was too strong to attack frontally without a preliminary undermining of the foundations of the Nazi war machine and German national morale. Their policy was to accomplish by blockade, subversive activities and propaganda, and aerial bombardment. The bomber offensive should be carried out on a scale far beyond any previous attempts, 
limited only by the number of aircraft which could operate from the United Kingdom. To that end, production of heavy bombers should be given highest priority. By concentrated bombardment of transportation centers and the industrial areas surrounding them, it was thought that cumulative efforts would seriously weaken the German ability and will to resist. Since the British war planners were all veterans of the Western Front of World War I, there was always hope that a direct military confrontation at the Old Front could be avoided, and that these methods alone might induce Germany to sue for peace, with the role of the British Army limited to that of an army of occupation. Nevertheless, a land army should be prepared to invade the continent and Germany itself. Among the immediate reactions of the U.S. leaders in the memorandum of September 25, 1941, that constituted the formal reply to the British statement, the attitude of the Air Corps leadership was important. They rejected the British idea of area bombing of the enemy population and recommended the strategic bombardment of specific industries, which would be carried out by daylight bombing with the statement that they believed the attack on civilian morale implied by area bombing was actually counterproductive. Had the RAF leaders taken the time to consider the response of the British public to the German Blitz of 1940-41, they would have seen that the Americans were correct. They also stated their belief that too much faith was placed in the probability of success solely through the employment of a bombing offensive, whereas Dependence cannot be placed on winning important wars by naval and air forces alone. The air leadership joined the rest of the army in stating that the British gave too little attention to the buildup of large ground forces, which would be needed completely to defeat the German war machine. In substance, the U.S. Joint Board was not inclined to believe that American entrance into the war, with initial cooperation limited to air and naval action, would ensure an early victory and it was convinced that overall strategy should adhere more closely to that described in ABC1. The British, surprised by the strong tone of rejection in the U.S. memorandum, responded in November that their review had been misunderstood. They gave a reasoned explanation of what they meant by morale bombardment and their choice of target objectives. They affirmed that their emphasis on the bomber offensive did not preclude a final land offensive, they then went on to present what would become the British position on delay of the cross-channel invasion until Churchill was forced by his two stronger allies to formally commit to a 1944 invasion at the 1943 Tehran Conference. They had been studying the problems of landing operations and had found many difficulties and expressed interest in American views on the detailed aspects of such an operation. The Pearl Harbor attack three weeks later postponed the American reply. The implied differences in outlook were to be debated repeatedly over the next two years. More importantly for the immediate future, while both ABC-1 and Rainbow No. 5 scheduled air attack from the United Kingdom as the earliest American offensive action, neither plan contained any detailed statement of how that mission should be accomplished. All the military considerations flowed from the assumption that if America became embroiled in war with Germany— such a conflict would inevitably involve Italy and very probably Japan. This was based on Allied understanding of the Triple Alliance that had created the Axis powers, which had been signed by the three nations in November 1940. Gaining knowledge of the specifics of this treaty through the breaking of the Japanese Purple Code used for diplomacy by a small team in the State Department was the first great U.S. contribution to the eventual Allied supremacy in signals intelligence. The Triple Alliance required the other two parties to declare war on any opponent that came into conflict with a third party, whichever that would be. There was initial disagreement among diplomatic and political experts over how likely it would be if either Japan or Italy came into conflict with the United States, that Hitler would live up to the agreement and declare war in support of the others, with many pointing to his failure to live up to any other political agreements he had made since coming to power in Germany. This would be resolved to the Allies' benefit on December 10, 1941, when Hitler, for the only time in his career, acted in accordance with an agreement he was party to and unilaterally declared war on the United States following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Had he not done so, it was politically unlikely that the Roosevelt administration could have brought the Congress to unilaterally declare war on Germany in the absence of any warlike actions by the Germans.
Chapter 3 Fledgling Fighters It has been an article of faith in most histories of the strategic bombing campaign that the Army Air Forces, AAF, believed so strongly in the doctrine of Duhay and Trenchard, the bomber will always get through, that all plans for the coming campaign were based on the fact that 8th Air Force could operate over Germany with self-defending bombers until losses proved otherwise in the summer of 1943. The truth is radically different. While indeed there was a substantial pre-war belief among AAF leadership that the bomber will always get through, AAF planners studied the massacre of 18 unescorted Wellington bombers in December 1939 that led the RAF to abandon daylight bombing. Additionally, Air Corps observers in England had reported what happened to unescorted Luftwaffe bombers during the Battle of Britain. Thus, by the time serious planning for the creation of a strategic bombing force to operate from the United Kingdom began in 1941, a force of fighter escorts was seen as integral for the force and its operations in Europe. Only one American fighter was considered competitive with German fighters, the P-38 Lightning. Originally designed as a short-range, high-altitude point defense interceptor, in September 1941, a P-38D equipped with two 160-gallon drop tanks had demonstrated potential as a long-range fighter capable of operating over distances of 600 to 800 miles. The first pursuit group had only received the first 13 pre-production YP-38s in June but production tempo expanded as the following airplanes were modified at the Burbank production line with operational equipment. The 36 P-38Ds delivered in September were equipped with self-sealing fuel tanks and armor plate. The 210 P-38Es that began rolling off the line in November were close enough to combat standard that a squadron of these early lightnings served in the Aleutians throughout that campaign. Almost as soon as squadrons received it, the P-38 demonstrated gremlins not heretofore experienced in combat aircraft. Its high performance took it into previously unexplored areas of aeronautical science. What pilots found most disturbing was a tendency to tuck the nose under in a dive, thus increasing the dive angle while controls stiffened to the point that a pilot could not pull back on the yoke, even bracing his feet on the instrument panel. If the dive was started high enough, there was a possibility of successful recovery as the fighter entered thicker air that slowed its rush toward the ground. But if the airplane had nosed over beyond vertical, there was no hope of avoiding the inevitable crash. Additionally, there was an unfortunate tendency for the Fowler maneuver flaps to deploy differentially, resulting in the airplane flipping over due to the differential lift of the wings and going inverted without notice. On Friday, December 5, 1941, there were 69 P-38s of all subtypes in the AAF, only 12 of which were considered fully equipped and capable of operational use. The AAF had begun creating new pursuit groups as rapidly as possible in 1941 through a process of subdividing an existing group to create new groups with an experienced cadre providing leadership for the new organization. For pilots who had joined the Air Corps over the previous two years, this led to phenomenal promotion as former lieutenants moved up in the unit structure to captain positions, and those who demonstrated flying skill and leadership potential could end up in command of a unit and promoted to major within a year of having first been commissioned. This process only accelerated after Pearl Harbor thrust the country into the war. Between mid-December 1941 and early January 1942, the first pursuit group, which was the group with the most experience on the P-38, lost over half its trained pilots and ground crews, as personnel were assigned to the newly formed 14th and 82nd groups. On January 7, 1942, 2nd Lieutenant Robert Ebby was transferred from the 94th Pursuit Squadron of the 1st to the 49th Pursuit Squadron of the 14th Pursuit Group which was commanded by newly assigned First Lieutenant Armin Peterson, who had been an Air Corps pilot since graduating from flight school in the fall of 1940. Ebby was promoted to captain two weeks later. Ebby later recalled, That day, we transferred to Long Beach Airport to check out in P-38s. 
Of the other two squadrons in the group, one flew a mixture of P-38s and P-43s, while the third was equipped with Volti P-66 fighters, which were terrible. Groups equipped with the Bell P-39 and Curtis P-40, which had entered production in 1940-41, and were available in greater numbers than the more capable P-38 and P-47, were quickly expanded and sent on to the Pacific as rapidly as possible. Despite the P-39's lack of high-altitude capability after the turbocharger originally planned for the airplane was removed by Air Force decision, Bell's speedy increase in production meant that it became an important type by sheer availability. Most units were sent to the Pacific, where the airplane's lack of performance was quickly discovered in combat over New Guinea. However, the 31st Pursuit Group, which had been the first to equip with the P-39, flying its airplanes during the important 1941 war games that were the Army's dress rehearsal for the coming war, was assigned to air defense of the West Coast, operating from Payne Field, Washington. Shortly after New Year, the 31st gave up pilots as cadre for the newly formed 52nd Pursuit Group. In February 1942, the 31st started over when the unit was divided in half, with the original 39th, 40th, and 41st squadrons transferred to the 35th Pursuit Group for immediate transfer to Australia. The new 31st set up with the 307th, 308th, and 309th Pursuit Squadrons in New Orleans, where they flew P-40Bs for three months before their complaints resulted in re-equipment with the P-39 in early May. By the end of January, the 14th Group had flown its 14 P-38s and an assortment of P-43 and P-66 fighters from Southern California to Hamilton Army Airfield in Marin County across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. Ebby recalled, We trained new pilots and prepared for overseas duty. Twice a week the call came down from Fighter Command to ship a certain number of pilots overseas the next day, which was done by drawing names out of a hat. We were one of two groups defending the northern west coast, with the other at Payne Field. The number of P-38s in the group grew as pilots were sent to Burbank to pick up new airplanes from the factory. The inexperienced pilots soon discovered the gremlins lurking in the lightning. Ebby remembered, We were soon averaging more than one crash a week in the P-38, with most of those being fatalities. Pilot morale was low. On February 7, 1942, two weeks after the 14th had transferred to Hamilton, the new 78th Pursuit Group, composed of the 82nd, 83rd, and 84th Pursuit Squadrons, was formed and took half the pilots of the parent 14th Group. The 82nd Squadron had 24 enlisted men and seven pilots, commanded by 1st Lieutenant George Nash. By March 27, the squadron had expanded to 92 men and six pilots, now commanded by a second lieutenant. First Lieutenant Frank Wagner was made group commander at the end of the month. The 14th and 78th groups operated as one unit, while the pilot ranks were quickly filled out with new flight school graduates, none of whom had any twin-engine training. Newly promoted Captain Gene Roberts, assigned to the 84th Squadron, remembered, A high-time P-38 pilot in this period was one who could record his total P-38 time and low double digits. On May 7, 1942, Captain Armin Peterson, the 14th Group's 49th Squadron Commander, was promoted to Major and transferred to the 78th as Group Commander. That day also saw the official AAF designation change from Pursuit Group to Fighter Group, with squadrons becoming fighter squadrons. First Lieutenant Harry Dayhuff arrived from Naval Air Station, NAS, North Island, on May 15th, with three of the four P-38s that had originally taken off. Second Lieutenant Wendell Sepik had been lost off La Jolla when he flew into a cloud bank, became disoriented, and spun out of the cloud and crashed. Dayhuff soon became the 82nd Squadron's new commander. On June 23rd, the three squadrons began operating from Hamilton Field, Oakland Airport, and South San Francisco Airport. Dayhuff recalled, Our training was hit or miss until Major Peterson organized the group, unified our goals, and set it all down in writing. Ebby, who had been transferred to the group staff, remembered, 
During this period, all squadrons were constantly on alert with one flight of four pilots in readiness with the planes warmed up and ready to scramble on receipt of orders from fighter command. One night, I was out on a flight and we were notified that a Japanese submarine had been spotted off the Golden Gate. We managed to identify the submarine as a fishing boat that was heading back to harbor. The P-38 was such a handful that accidents could happen quickly in the air or on the ground. Group Operations Officer Morris Lee would never forget a visit he made to the 83rd Squadron at South San Francisco Airport, today's San Francisco International. As he walked through the main hangar, he happened to look out the open doors, spotting an out-of-control P-38 that was headed straight at the building. He yelled for everyone to evacuate the hangar as the airplane ran into the structure. I ran around to where the P-38 had crashed into the doorframe of the maintenance hangar. The pilot was a new trainee who had been shooting landings. He managed to open the canopy and raised up the cockpit, crying, Help me! Before anyone could do anything, he was engulfed in flames, and the fire caused the ammo to start cooking off. Boxes of 50 caliber and 30 caliber ammunition stored nearby in the hangar started going off. Several planes under repair in the hangar were soon aflame. Fire units from nearby communities took several hours to contain the major conflagration. I can still hear the pilot's helpless cry as he slumped back into the seat behind a wall of flames. This was only one of many fatalities. Lee also recalled. At this time, we were losing approximately a pilot a week to fatal crashes. One I had to investigate north of Hamilton Field had gone straight in from a vertical dive. The two engines required a backhoe to retrieve them from 10 feet in the ground. A jellied mass the size of two basketballs was all that was identifiable of the pilot. While squadrons on the West Coast struggled to tame the P-38, Republic's P-47 had begun to come out of the production line at Farmingdale on New York's Long Island. The USAAF had ordered 171 P-47Bs with an engineering prototype YP-47B delivered in December 1941, followed by the production prototype in March 1942 the first production P-47B rolled off the production line that May. Originally designed to meet the X-109 specification for a single-engine, high-altitude point-defense interceptor, the amenability of the airplane to take on roles unforeseen when the prototype XP-47B rolled out of the factory in early 1941, which would guarantee it a place in history as one of the truly outstanding aircraft of World War II, was then unknown. Among the problems pilots soon identified was that the Thunderbolt's sheer size limited ground propeller clearance after raising the tail into a fuselage-level attitude, which made for challenging takeoffs requiring long runways. This meant that pilots had to learn to hold the tail low until close to takeoff speed on the initial run, unlike the procedure for other tailwheel aircraft. Also problematic was the gun installation's tight fit and cramped ammunition belt tracks, which led to jamming, especially during hard maneuvering. Additionally, at high altitude, the ailerons snatched and froze, while control loads were excessive at higher speeds. Power was affected by arcing in the ignition wiring, which was fixed when Republic fitted a pressurized ignition system. This problem would continue when the airplanes were shipped by sea to England where it was discovered that the engine packing cases had not been sealed tightly, allowing salt air corrosion in the wiring. Teething problems continued. A Republic test pilot was killed when the fifth production P-47B lost control in a dive on March 26, 1942, and crashed due to tail assembly failure after its fabric-covered tail surfaces ballooned and ruptured. This was the first indication that the Thunderbolt's performance brought pilots into the transonic flight regime approaching Mach 1, where they experienced compressibility, a problem never encountered before the P-47 and P-38 flew. Changes on the production line gradually addressed the P-47B's problems. The USAAF quickly followed the initial order with an order for 602 improved P-47Cs. Importantly, metal-covered control surfaces were introduced on the production line to the P-47C in early 1943. Initially authorized on November 20, 1940, the 56th Pursuit Group stood up at Hunter Field, Georgia, on January 14, 1941, 
with three officers and 150 enlisted men. Its component units were the 61st, 62nd, and 63rd Pursuit Squadrons. Following the arrival of more pilots and ground support crews in May 1941, the 56th transferred to Charlotte Army Air Base, North Carolina, where it received six AT-6s, three Bell P-39Ds, and five Curtis P-40Bs. Pilots concentrated on building flight experience that summer and fall. Following Pearl Harbor, the group went to Charleston Army Airfield in South Carolina, where it was equipped with a full lineup of P-36s. In January, the 56th flew to Mitchell Field, Long Island, to provide air defense for New York City. It soon took possession of 10 Curtis P-40Es and four P-38Es. By April 1942, the group was equipped with P-40F Warhawks. By May 1942, group headquarters was at Teaneck, New Jersey, while the 64th Squadron took up station at Bridgeport Airport in Connecticut, the 62nd at Bendix Airport, New Jersey, and the 63rd at the Republic Aviation Factory on Long Island. With a squadron at Republic's airfield, it was unsurprising when the newly renamed 56th Fighter Group was selected as the first group to be assigned the new P-47, with the first received in June. The group's proximity to the factory allowed it to serve as an operational evaluation unit for the new fighter. As its members gained experience over the course of the summer, Republic made numerous modifications as a result of unsatisfactory reports from 56th pilots and engineers. The pilots soon found that while the rate of climb was not impressive, high-altitude performance was. Runs at 400 miles per hour were easily obtained at 30,000 feet. It could also dive faster than nearly every other fighter due to its weight. However, diving from high altitude needed caution. Two pilots were killed when they failed to recover from high-altitude dives. Among the pilots reporting to the group that summer was 2nd Lieutenant Robert S. Johnson. Born in Lawton, Oklahoma in 1920, at age 8, he had seen the Air Corps flight demonstration team, the Three Musketeers, led by Captain Claire Chenault, perform a routine with their P-12s roped together. He later wrote, I turned to my father as we walked back to our car and told him I was going to be an Army fighter pilot when I grew up, and I was going to be the best one. On November 11, 1941, he was sworn into the Air Corps as a member of Class 42F and was commissioned with his wings on July 9, 1942. Though he had requested assignment to fly the A-20 and was classified as a bomber pilot on graduation, he found himself assigned to the 56th Fighter Group. While the four P-38 equipped groups spent the first half of 1942 in training, the 31st Fighter Group was notified that it was going to England on May 17th, becoming the first U.S. fighter unit to arrive in England in June. AAF planners planned to send fighters to England by air and determined the P-39 could fly transatlantic in stages from Newfoundland to Greenland, then on to Iceland, and then northern Scotland. All that was needed was for the diminutive fighter to strap on the new 175-gallon ferry tank recently developed for the P-38. The idea was daunting enough that the leaders of the 31st managed to convince AAF headquarters that further research and testing was needed. It was found that the tank could be attached under the fighter, but that there was less than a foot of ground clearance. This meant that the airplanes could only operate from smooth paved runway. Bluey West 1 in Greenland didn't qualify. With a long enough takeoff run, the P-39 could get airborne, with a climb rate that almost touched 200 feet per minute. The big problem was in the air. The tank had no internal baffles, which meant that fuel sloshed fore and aft or side to side with the slightest movement, and such sloshing amplified the maneuver that had caused it. Control was marginal at best. One experienced pilot flew into a cloudy patch where the oscillation of the fuel caused the airplane to maneuver wildly enough to topple his artificial horizon. The resulting out-of-control crash was fatal. A second similar event was almost fatal but the pilot was able to force open one of the cockpit doors and bail out at the last moment. It was decided that P-39s would travel by ship. The group's ground echelon arrived in Scotland on June 9th 
after a five-day voyage from New York aboard the Queen Elizabeth. The next day, they took a 14-hour train ride to their new airbase, Atcham, in Shropshire, where they were surprised to discover 48 Spitfire 5B fighters waiting for them, rather than the familiar P-39s. RAF Fighter Command had managed to convince 8th Fighter Command's leader, Brigadier General Frank O'Driscoll Monk Hunter, that the P-39 could not survive in the European combat environment. The pilots were buoyed by a telegram from Hap Arnold that read, You have been chosen to be the spearhead of the United States Combat Forces in the European Theater of Operations. Congratulations and good luck. Traveling aboard HMS Ramapura over 13 days, they arrived a week after the ground echelon. The conversion did not go easily. Several Spitfires were soon written off, including four on June 28, 1942. The first flying fatality was recorded the next day, the cause being engine failure on takeoff. The week after a celebration of Independence Day on July 4th, the group and squadron commanders were sent to fly with the 412 Squadron of the Royal Canadian Air Force, RCAF, for operational experience. While the 31st found its feet in England, the 52nd group arrived in Northern Ireland. Its men needed more training and remained there while they too were given Spitfires rather than the Era Cobras they had spent the previous five months mastering. By July 14th, 21 of the 31st Spitfires had been written off in training. Fortunately, enough replacements arrived to present the group in full when King George VI and Queen Mary arrived for a visit on July 16th. On August 1st, after the group leaders returned from flying with the Canadians, the group moved to Tangmere in East Anglia, where it would finally go to war. A further reorganization saw the group broken up, with the 307th Squadron sent to Biggin Hill and the 308th to Kenley, while the 309th remained at Tangmere. Each squadron became a fourth squadron in the three-squadron RAF wing, based at the three different fields, to gain more experience before operating together. While the 31st learned the Spitfire, an event occurred that would have a profound effect on the way that 8th Bomber Command would operate in the coming air campaign. To date, the Americans had been following RAF experience and basing operational decisions on that information. As a result, RAF Bomber Command expected that 8th Bomber Command would join them in the nightly air war over German cities, while RAF Fighter Command expected 8th Fighter Command to reinforce their efforts. This thinking came to an abrupt halt with the arrival on June 18th of Major General Carl Tui Spatz with orders to establish the headquarters of the 8th Air Force at High Wycombe. Spatz had demonstrated his combat command ability over the Argonne Forest in the fall of 1918, during which he shot down several German airplanes despite flying a Salmson 2A2 bomber. Throughout the interwar years, he had been at the leading edge of technical development in the Air Corps, setting several records along the way. He had the full confidence and backing of his closest friend, Hap Arnold, Chief of Staff of the Army Air Forces. Spatz was one of a handful of USAAF leaders with the moral authority to win the fight over an independent role for the AAF against the RAF leadership and Churchill. His assignment from Arnold was to integrate the American Daylight Offensive as an equal to the British Night Offensive, not in a subordinate role. This was a battle that would continue through the next 17 difficult months as 8th Bomber and Fighter Commands struggled to make the Daylight Offensive successful. While the pilots of the 31st were getting ready to go to war, the 1st and 14th groups, the most experienced of the four P-38 groups formed, were notified that they were moving to England now that two B-17 groups were there and close to being operational. Given the P-38's range with one normal 160-gallon tank and one 175-gallon ferry tank under wing, it was planned that they would fly to Europe. The first fighter group began flying aircraft to England on June 27, 1942, with formations of 6-8 P-38s, each escorted by a B-17 providing navigation over the North Atlantic route, which started at Presque Isle, Maine, flying on in stages to Goose Bay, Labrador, then to Bluey West 1 in southern Greenland, on to Reykjavik, Iceland, with final destination at Goxhill, England. 
On July 15th, six P-38Fs from the 94th Squadron and their two B-17 escorts were forced down on the Greenland ice cap. Although all personnel were recovered safely, the aircraft were left behind and the plan to send fighters by air was abandoned. The first group moved to England by ship in late July, followed by the 14th in August. The 309th Squadron became the first U.S. AAF fighter unit to see action in the European Theater of Operations, ETO, on August 9th. The squadron was on a training flight when it was notified that there were FW-190 fighter bombers in its area. Squadron Commander Major Harrison Thing spotted one German fighter when it streaked past and chased it, pressing the trigger to become the first U.S. AAF fighter pilot to open fire on the enemy in the ETO. Later that afternoon, the squadron accompanied the RAF wing it was assigned to on a sweep over France, where the enemy ignored it. August 17th was a red-letter day in the history of the 8th Air Force. 18 B-17Es from the 97th Bomb Group, six each from the 340th, 341st, and 342nd Bomb Squadrons, took off from their bases at Polbrook and Grafton Underwood in Northamptonshire at 1530 hours on the first bombing mission mounted by the USAAF in the ETO. 8th Bomber Command Leader General Ira C. Eaker had originally ordered the mission be flown on August 10th. The day after the 97th Group was declared operational after training for a month following its arrival in the United Kingdom in late June. The general was immediately confronted by an enemy the bombers would contend with to the end of the war. English weather. The field was covered in fog so dense one could not see the runway from the hard stands. The fog hung around for the next six days, only clearing unexpectedly on August 17th. The target for the dozen bombers of the main force was the Sauvie Les Rouen Railroad Yards in Rouen, the largest and most active railroad yard in northern France, while six more made a diversionary strike. The lead ship was B-17E, 41-2578, Butcher Shop, flown by 340th Squadron Commander Major Paul Tibbetts, who would fly a second historically important mission three years later in the Pacific as commander of the B-29 in Ola Gay, with 97th Group Commander Colonel Frank A. Armstrong Jr. flying B-17E, 41-9023, Yankee Doodle. Lead ship of the 341st Squadron was Brigadier General Ira C. Eaker. The 340th and 341st Squadrons arrived over Rouen at 23,000 feet and dropped 19 tons of bombs on the target between 1739 and 1746 hours, while the six B-17s of the 342nd Squadron flew along the French coast as a diversion. Accuracy was good. One of the aim points, the locomotive shops, was destroyed by a direct hit. The overall results were moderate. First Lieutenant Lavon L. Ray, aboard Butcher Shop, was the group lead bombardier. He later recorded the mission in his diary. Twelve ships with Colonel Anderson and our crew in the lead ship took off from Grafton Underwood on the first all-American high-altitude daylight raid of this war. Target was Rouen Marshalling Yards, which received a very good pasting. Opposition was very weak. Surprise was apparent, and what few fighters did get up caused very little damage. One ship exchanged fire with a fighter, and one of our ships was hit with a stray piece of flak. Among the German pilots who intercepted this first mission, but did not attack the heavily armed bombers, was Uberleutnant Egon Meyer and his wingman, Leutnant Georg Peter Eder of Jag Geschwader II, JG2, 2nd Fighter Wing. Meyer later recalled that he was surprised by the great size of the American bombers, though both he and Ader noticed that the B-17's formidable defenses did not extend to the bomber's forward quarter. They would both make use of that knowledge in other observations of the early 8th Bomber Command missions that fall to devise what they called the company front attack, and American air crews would remember as the terrifying 12 o'clock high head-on attack. For the Luftwaffe, the advent of the American bombers was different from the threat it had faced during the RAF's 1941 offensive. Where the RAF had sent Blenheim light bombers, which carried a maximum bomb load of 1,000 pounds, generally in the form of four 250-pound bombs, 
The American B-17 carried 4,000 pounds of bombs, and the B-24 a load of 5,000 pounds. Whereas the British bombers had been distinguished by an inability to create serious damage to their target and could often be ignored, the American bombers could carry sufficient heavy 500-pound or 1,000-pound bombs to punish their targets. Thus, the Jagdwaffe could not ignore them. The German fighters were forced to confront every raid, losing the tactical initiative they had maintained over Europe since the Battle of Britain. Fortunately for the fighter pilots, American strength was slow to develop, which gave them time to experiment with tactics and equipment with which to oppose the new enemy. Because JG-2 Richthofen and JG-26 were positioned so close to the Channel coast, they needed more warning than the German controllers had been used to giving if they were to have time to climb to the bomber's altitude over 20,000 feet. In several of the early missions, the defenders failed to intercept due to a late warning. This incurred the wrath of both Reichsmarschall Göring and General de Jagdflieger Garland, who was finally promoted to General Major, Major General, on November 1st, giving him military authority equal to the responsibility assigned to him for organizing the fighter defenses. Leutnant Karl Boris, Staffelkapitän, squadron commander, of 8th Squadron JG-26, later wrote of the psychological impact of the B-17s and B-24s on German pilots. Pilots were now facing the most formidable challenge of their lives. The size of the heavy bombers and their formations, and their unprecedented defensive firepower, could not be adequately described to the green pilot. They had to be experienced firsthand. The classical stern attack, which at the time was the only approved method, was frequently initiated and broken off too soon to cause damage. Range estimation proved difficult. The Revy gun sight was sized for attacks on fighters. The wings of a typical fighter filled its sighting circle at 100 yards range. The bombers loomed large in the Revy long before reaching effective range. By August 18th, the 31st's three squadrons had each flown several missions over enemy territory, escorting A-20s and B-17s, as well as several two-plane rhubarbs and some RAF circus sweeps. Rhubarb involved two aircraft at low level attacking targets of opportunity, usually in bad weather, to preclude interception. Circus was an escorted bomber mission into Europe in the war's early days. That evening, the group was declared operational. Its pilots would fly their first mission as a full American-only group the next day, when their baptism of fire would find them flying cover for the Dieppe raid. The pilots were called to readiness at 0320 hours on August 19th. At 0717 hours, RAF Wing Commander Peter Wickham led 308th Squadron Commander Major Fred M. Dean and Lieutenants Hill, Van Reed, Ingraham, Smith, Dalrymple, Baker, Fleming, Corrigan, Reichert, and Waltner when they took off from Kenley, and flew into history as the first U.S. AAF fighter pilots to join combat with the Luftwaffe. When they arrived over the fleet off Dieppe, the enemy was waiting for them. The Germans were first aware of the Allied force offshore when shelling began around 0600 hours. Two FW-190s from 5th Squadron JG-26, flown by Oberleutnant Horst Sternberg, with Feldwebel Peter Krump as his wingman, arrived over Dieppe at about 0620 hours, and saw the Allied ships offshore firing on the town, and landing craft headed toward the shore. Avoiding several spitfires that Crump called out, the Rota, two-fire formation, flew over the town, and then returned to Abbeville to report what they had found. The Luftwaffe was not really able to engage the Allied force. The only day bombers on the Channel Front were the two Jabstaffeln, fighter bomber squadrons of FW-190A-4-U3s operated by JG-2 and JG-26, which had at the time some 18 fighter bombers operational between them. There were 220 JU-88 and DO-217 night bombers in Belgium. The first German fighter response was a formation of 10 FW-190s, followed by another of 16 from 1st Group JG-26, a saint omer Arc, which spotted 12 Spitfires orbiting over Dieppe, the Americans from the 308th Squadron. 
the JG-26 FW-190s dived through the 12 Spitfires, which immediately broke formation to evade the attack. Lieutenant Hill found himself behind the German lead fighter and fired his 20mm cannon. The FW-190 smoked and turned away, but Hill was not able to confirm his victory when he was set on by the wingman. A moment later, Lieutenant Ingraham was forced to go over the side from his burning Spitfire, which had been set afire by the FW-190 that latched onto his tail. His parachute streamed and only filled moments before he touched down in the water, right next to a pair of German E-boats. He became the 31st's first prisoner of war, POW. Ingraham's wingman, Lieutenant Smith, was able to make it back to Kenley despite a big hole in his right wing made by the explosion of a 20-millimeter cannon shell. While the Spitfire's fuselage was recorded as being well-ventilated, with 7.62-millimeter bullet holes, the 11 survivors were all back at Kenley by 0900 hours. Twenty years later, Frank Hill provided a full account of his experience over Dieppe to historian Eric Hamill. As we neared the French coast, we could see a number of ships near Dieppe Harbor, and a large number of aircraft were flying in the general area. At our altitude, it was hard to tell if the ships or planes were friend or foe. We had been over Dieppe only a few minutes when the RAF Operations Center reported that a dozen or so enemy aircraft were approaching Dieppe from the direction of the big German aerodrome at Abbeville. A few minutes later, a flight of aircraft arrived above us at about 12,000 feet and immediately rolled over and commenced an attack on my flight. I could see they were FW-190s. I wanted to keep my flight together and avoid giving up the advantage. As the Germans attacked, their formation broke up into pairs. I turned and flew at them head-on, which made it hard for them to keep their sights on us and force them to attack us head-on. After about three minutes of trying to keep my flight from being hit, by constantly breaking and turning into the Germans, I found myself in a position to get a good shot at one, and I fired everything I had. He swung out to my left, and I got in another good burst, firing at his left side from 300 yards down to about 200 feet. He started pouring black smoke, then rolled over and went straight down. I followed him to about 3,000 feet, but had to pull out because the ack-ack coming from the ground was really intense. The last I saw of him, he was about 1,000 feet over the channel, north of Dieppe, still smoking and in a deep dive. Since neither Hill nor anyone else saw the FW-190 crash, he would receive credit for a probable. In fact, Uberleutnant Schmidt had attempted to break away using a split S, a diving turn to reverse direction. With insufficient recovery altitude, he crashed into the channel. The first German fighter shot down by an American pilot in a USAAF fighter. Meyer Pipspriller's 3rd Group JG-26 at Wevelhem in southern Belgium sent two Staffeln squadrons off at 0700 hours, but they failed to make contact with any Allied fighters. Second Group JG-26 launched the first large response with the entire Gruppe group taking off from Abbeville and Amiens at 0750 hours. The Staffelkapitän of 5th Staffel Lieutenant Wilhelm Ferdinand Wutz Garland, Adolf Garland's middle brother, was in the lead, upset that his regular Schwarze 8 FW-190A-4 had been damaged earlier by flak when flown by Crump on the initial reconnaissance. The Gruppe arrived over Dieppe at approximately 0830 hours, where it broke into Staffel formations and took on the orbiting Spitfire cover. The 309th Squadron's first mission of the day set off from Tang Mir at 0754 hours. They arrived on the scene at around the same time as the second group JG-26 formation and were immediately engaged by enemy fighters in the middle of what was shaping up to be the biggest air battle of the war to date. The 309th's first Lieutenant Junkin scored the first officially credited U.S. victory, an FW-190 that was among the Staffel of Vergers that dived on the star-marked Spitfires. All U.S. Spitfires survived the fight and returned safely by 0930 hours. Second Group JG-26 returned to their bases at 1040 hours, with the pilots claiming a total of 27 Spitfires shot down in the various individual battles that had raged over the invasion fleet. The 307th took off from Biggin Hill at 0950 hours, with Wing Commander Thomas 
leading Squadron Commander Major Marvin L. McNichol and 10 other Americans. Arriving over the fleet at 10.15 hours, they split into elements of two and chased German fighter bombers from 10th Group Yabo JG-26 that were diving on the ships below. But the FW-190A fighter bombers were diving on the ships from the seaward side, dropping their bombs at minimum altitude and maximum speed, and heading straight inland at high speed. The Spitfires had no chance of catching them. When the 309th returned to Biggin Hill at 11.20 hours, Lieutenants Tovri and Wright were missing, and Lieutenant Mitchell's Spitfire was heavily damaged. The 308th sent off its second mission of the day at 10.02 hours. When they returned at 11.30 hours, Major Dean Spitfire and the fighters of Lieutenants English, Robb, and Johnson were all damaged to varying degrees. None had seen their attackers. Dieppe was a hard graduation test for brand new fighter pilots. At 11.30 hours, the second group JG-26 Abbeville Drucat Airfield was bombed by 24 B-17s from the 97th Bomb Group on its second mission. Bombing from 23,000 feet, the B-17s met no fighters since the Germans were busy elsewhere, but flak holds several of the bombers. The bombers reported a successful drop, and the radio on the airfield went off the air following the attack. The German air operations were not affected since 2nd Group JG-26 was able to operate from the satellite airfields at Cambrai-Epinois, Lichecourt, and Amiens. Lieutenant Ray recorded the mission in his diary that night. 24 ships attacked Abbeville Airdrome in support of the Dieppe Commando Raid. It was very successful, some flak, but few fighters. We hit the radio station and knocked it out, and diverted the fighters from Abdiv further inland. Two enemy ships taking off disappeared in the smoke of one bomb. Colonel Anderson flew with us again as lead ship. Further missions were flown throughout the day. The British radio monitors were impressed by how calm the German controllers sounded as they vectored the FW-190s and BF-109s onto the Allied fighter formations. The Germans did not consider it necessary to involve any other units, but JG-26 and JG-2. After the initial Gruppa strength mission, 2nd Group JG-26 operated at Staffel strength through the rest of the day. The Jabo Staffeln of both Geschwaden wings made repeated attacks on the ships offshore, with two FW-190A-4-U3 from 10th Squadron Jabo JG-2 hitting and sinking the Royal Navy destroyer HMS Barclay with 500-kilogram bombs. The 307th final mission took off at 1605 hours, with Major McNichol leading Captains Zimlick, Robertson, Labrèche, and Lieutenants Collinsworth, Throop, Wizenant, Wooten, White, Dugan, Mitchell, and Leggett. The fleet was already turning away from France, having evacuated the Canadian survivors of the raid that made it off the beach. Four FW-190s attacked the Spitfires, and Wizenant and Wooten chased after them opening fire on the leader, who caught fire and disappeared, pouring black smoke. Captain Robertson and Lieutenant White chased a second 190. After several bursts, the enemy fighter went straight down on fire, though neither American could stick around to witness the final outcome when four more FW-190s showed up. At the end of the day, Lieutenants Tavri, Collins, Wright, and Dabney were missing and Lieutenant Wells had been fished out of the channel by an RAF rescue launch, drowned after having struck his head when he attempted to ditch his Spitfire into the water. Lieutenant Junkin, the first official American victor, had been badly wounded in a fight on a later mission. The final credits gave the 307th Captain Robertson one FW-190 destroyed, Lieutenant White one FW-190 probable, and Lieutenant Wizenant one FW-190 probable. For the 308th, one FW-190 probable was credited to Lieutenant Hill. The 309th's major thing was credited with a probable, while Captain Thorson and Lieutenants Biggard and Payne shared a DO-217 damaged, and Lieutenant Junkin had one FW-190 destroyed. Overall, the results of the 31st's participation in what had become indeed the biggest air battle of the war to date was a good first show for an inexperienced unit. 
At 1724 hours, Wutzt Galland, with Peter Kromp, forgiven for damaging his fighter and now flying as his wingman, led Fifth Staffel on a Freie Jagd, free hunt, a fighter sweep similar to a U.S. ramrod, a fighter sweep by a squadron or group looking for targets of opportunity, to Dieppe. Crump remembered that the town was now deserted, with some British tanks and other equipment abandoned on the beach following the withdrawal of the Canadian troops earlier that afternoon, with the only other evidence of the day's battle being the destroyed houses along the beach and the corpses of British soldiers floating in the water. Minutes later, they spotted an RAF rescue launch headed west and strafed it. The boat evaded the first run, zigzagging at top speed. On the second run, its bow wave disappeared under the hail of fire and the boat quickly sank. No survivors were spotted. Overall, all three Gruppen of JG-26 had flown 377 sorties during the day in 36 missions. They claimed 40 Spitfires that were later confirmed, and 11 Probables. JG-2 claimed 42. The Allies claimed 47 FW-190s, 3 BF-109s, 33 DO-217s, 8 JU-88s, and 5 HE-111s shot down. Actual German losses were 14 fighters from JG-2 and 6 from JG-26, with a total of 14 pilots lost. The RAF recorded 71 pilots and 10 aircrew killed or missing, and 106 aircraft failed to return, including 88 fighters. The German claims were much closer to reality. The next day, Major McNichol led Circus 206, a diversionary sweep that flew as far inland as Saint-Omer, first group JG-26's main base. Unfortunately, after the big day before, the Jagdwaffe was uninterested in the 20 Spitfires. On August 21st, Wing Commander Thomas led the 31st on Circus 209, a sweep to Ostend. Nothing was seen until the end, when six FW-190s were spotted below, just before it was time to turn for home. Pilots called them out as the four fighters ran away inland, but Thomas came on the radio and pointed out 60-plus FW-190s that were climbing to their altitude from inland. Clearly, the first six were bait to draw the Spitfires back inland, while the large formation cut them off from getting home. As they followed Thomas back toward the channel, Lieutenant Wisenant's flight of four reefed around and pointed their noses at the trailing Germans, who all turned and ran while out of range. Over the rest of the month, the American Spitfires, again flying with their British mates, made several appearances over the channel and northwestern France, but the Germans refused to be goaded into action. September saw more of the same with escort missions flown by raids by RAF Boston bombers, the British version of the A-20, and several diversionary circus missions flown. In mid-month, the group was told to pack its gear for a major move. After that was completed, there was no move, and operations continued, though the increasingly cloudy fall weather forced several aborts and outright cancellations. The first shootdown of a B-17 by a German fighter happened on September 6th, when Hauptmann Connie Meyer, Gruppenkommandeur, group commander, of 2nd Group JG-26, shot down a flying fortress from the 97th Bomb Group near Amiens at 1855 hours, after the Gruppe had dispersed the Spitfire high cover of 133 Eagle Squadron, which lost three of its airplanes and pilots. Several minutes after Meyer's victory, another B-17 from the 92nd Bomb Group under attack by four FW-190s of 4th Squadron JG-26 crashed into the English Channel near Le Trepol. The ability of the B-17 to absorb damage and keep flying was already becoming legendary among German pilots. Oberleutnant Kurt Rupert of 9th Squadron JG-26 repeatedly attacked a damaged B-17 that had fallen out of formation. In repeated passes, he knocked out three engines one of which fell off the bomber and crashed in the channel. He watched amazed as the B-17 remained airborne on one engine while the crew threw out equipment and guns. He followed it across the channel and witnessed its successful crash landing on the beach at Ramsgate. By the first week in October, the 31st group loaded gear on lorries that disappeared out the gate. 
destinations unknown. On October 13th, the 31st was declared non-operational. All flying ceased on October 16th. Between October 19th and 23rd, the group departed West Hampton Airfield in separate groups. They boarded trains and after overnight trips ended back where they had started, in the Firth of Forth, where the first group went aboard a transport on October 22nd. By October 24th, all were aboard ship. On October 25th, the large troop convoy departed England. Once at sea, the pilots and ground crew were called to meetings where they were informed they were about to take part in the invasion of North Africa. The 31st would not see England again for the rest of the war. The 97th Bomb Group flew its final mission from the UK on October 21st against the U-boat pens at Lorient Harbour on the Bay of Biscay. Lieutenant Ray recalled that Major Tibbets led the mission. Three other groups turned back because of the weather, but we bombed from 14,000 feet, just under the overcast. With that, the 97th and the 301st Bomb Groups the two most experienced 8th Bomber Command units were transferred to the newly formed 12th Air Force to take part in the North African invasion. By the end of October, the 31st and the 52nd Groups, both equipped with Spitfires, and the P-38 equipped 1st and 14th Groups that had also come to England over the summer and had been about to fly their first escort missions for the B-17s, were transferred to the North Africa-bound 12th Air Force. The 82nd Group's P-38s arrived in England in November, and the unit was immediately transferred to join the others in North Africa. 8th Fighter Command would now start over. In September 1942, while the men of the 31st Group were honing their skills in their spitfires over the English Channel, back on Long Island, the 56th Group welcomed a new commander, Major Hubert Zemke. Born in Montana in 1914, Zemke had never exhibited any interest in airplanes or flying as a youth. Graduating from the University of Montana in 1936 with a degree in engineering and with few employment prospects in the midst of the Depression, he allowed two friends to convince him to join them in the Air Corps as flying cadets. After graduating with his pilot's wings from Randolph Field in 1937, he was assigned to the 36th Pursuit Squadron based at Langley Field, Virginia, just in time to see its ancient Curtis P-6E open cockpit biplanes replaced with the then-new Curtis P-36A a few months after his arrival. In 1940, the squadron was among the first units to re-equip with the new P-40B fighter. Promoted to captain, Zemke was sent to England in September 1940 as a combat observer with the Royal Air Force, where he studied the tactics of both the RAF and the Luftwaffe. The next year, he was sent to the Soviet Union to instruct Russian pilots on flying Lend-Lease P-40s. After his return to the United States in February 1942, he was one of the first Air Corps pilots to fly the XP-47B that spring. His experience with the P-47 and knowledge of European air combat made him a natural choice to take over the 56th. On November 1, 1942, the 78th Group set out for England departing Oakland on November 10th, bound for Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. Major Morris Lee later recalled, We were not in cattle cars, but the old coaches they had pressed into service were anything but comfortable for sleeping. The baggage car used as a mess hall was cold and windy. I saw several guys step through the passageway back to their car, only to find their plates empty upon entering the coach. Those strange air currents between the cars could take the sauerkraut and wieners right off the plate, The poker games ran all night and all day through the five days of the trip. Robert Ebby remembered their arrival at Camp Kilmer on November 15th. Colonel Armand Peterson believed in advance planning. Before we left, we salvaged two large crates used for film-developing machines. The pilots and crews all chipped in and bought enough American booze to fill the crates, which were cleverly marked and shipped off with the other equipment. There must have been some breakage en route, as only one crate was eventually delivered in England. We voted not to open it until Christmas. Pilot Earl Payne recorded in his diary, 20 November, 1942. Had my last typhus shot today. The worst of the three. The most painful. They gave the whole barracks a five-minute physical today. 
It is a prerequisite for overseas shipment, and they do everything they can to not find anything wrong with a person. Two ahs, a cough, and a bend over forwards, spreading the buttocks. On November 23rd, the men went aboard RMS Queen Elizabeth with 12,000 other American soldiers, sailors, and flyers. French flyers, British flyers, and 300 nurses. Pilot Jack Miller remembered. The big disadvantage to being on a limey ship was the chow. It would take hours to sweat out a chow line, which wound its way down four flights to the mess deck. When the line got far enough that the familiar smell of mutton would waft upstairs, I just returned to the cabin. My main diet was Nestle bars and Pepsi Cola. At night, one of the cooks would come around with a box of ham sandwiches, just two slices of bread and a slab of ham. I never tasted better sandwiches in my life. No one asked any questions about where he got the ham. They were so glad to get edible food. He must have made a fortune off us. The group arrived in Scotland on November 29th, and the next day headed for their new base. Jack Miller was amused by the English railways. Every station we came to, smiling ladies came along the cars passing out hot tea and crumpets, which tasted mighty good after living on chocolate bars and coke for five days. The afternoon was bright and sunny, and we passed through some very beautiful country of rolling hills and woodland. Everyone started to think, this wasn't going to be half bad. But we learned later, when the sun shines here, it is a rare occasion. The 78th arrived at Gox Hill at 0130 hours, November 30th, 1942. Unofficially named Goat Hill, 8th Air Force Station number F-345, Gox Hill Field, had been built by the RAF in 1941, and new USAAF units received ETO indoctrination there beginning in August 1942. Earl Payne recalled Nissen Hut living as 16 beds and one teeny-weeny coal stove, no latrines or water within a mile, with 25-watt bulbs for illumination. The sun hardly ever shone, and the days were short, and lately it was very cold and windy. Mutton was soon replaced by spam. Morris Lee remembered. One group member got a Christmas present from home. When he opened it, he found a 10-pound can of spam, he was said to have contemplated suicide, but was talked out of it. To add insult to injury, his friends and family had to pull their ration coupons back home to buy it for him. While the 78th was traveling to England that November, the 56th Bob Johnson was one of the pilots who learned about the P-47 and compressibility the hard way. As he later wrote, he was at 33,000 feet when he decided to find out why the pilot's manual expressly forbade power dives from high altitude. I pushed over, and in a matter of moments, the airplane was shaking so hard the stick came out of my hand. I grabbed it and tried to regain control, but things only got worse. As I passed through 10,000 feet with no sign of any change, I literally placed my feet on the instrument panel to give myself leverage to try and pull the stick back. Suddenly, as the altimeter went through 5,000 feet, the shaking stopped, and suddenly the nose came up so sharply I had to push forward to avoid stalling out. Badly shaken, he went back to Farmingdale and landed, hoping no one would notice. The event was discovered when the crew chief found the fabric elevators nearly destroyed. Since the group was short of pilots and now under orders to prepare to move to England, Group Commander Zemke didn't throw him out of the group. Around the same time that Johnson had his near-death experience, Lieutenants Harold Comstock and Roger Dyer of the 63rd Fighter Squadron got into similar compressibility dives while flying two of the first P-47Cs equipped with metal rudders and elevators, which allowed them to reach unprecedented speeds in the region of 500 miles per hour. Republic's publicity department took advantage of the incident to proclaim that they had come near to the speed of sound. By the end of 1942, most of the P-47's troubles had been worked out, the 56th was alerted for overseas movement on November 26, 1942, and ceased flying operations. On December 28th, it moved to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and on January 6, 1943, it sailed from New York City aboard the RMS Queen Elizabeth for Scotland, arriving seven days later on January 13, 1943. Chapter 4 Yanks in the RAF. September 29, 1942, saw a driving rainstorm over East Anglia. At Debden, a pre-war RAF base, 
65 young Americans lined up in formation in the soaking rain. Over the previous month, they had exchanged their former RAF blues for new, tailor-made pinks and greens, while in London to take their officers' oath of allegiance to the United States. James A. Goodson, who had only recently joined what was now the 336th Fighter Squadron, later recalled, We couldn't understand why they had to have us out in the rain when we could have held the ceremony inside one of the hangars. It was the first of many run-ins we would have with the strange and unexplained ways of the U.S. Army's bureaucracy. For the USAAF and 8th Fighter Command specifically, these men were a godsend, since the one thing America's industrial plant couldn't provide was an entire fighter group composed of pilots with combat experience on the crucial channel front. Previously, the pilots had been members of 71, 121, and 133 squadrons, RAF, known to the public as the Eagle Squadrons. In the mythology of aerial warfare, the Eagle Squadrons, the Yanks and the RAF, rank with the Lafayette Escadrille and the American Volunteer Group, AVG, for mystique. The Eagles were far more in the mold of the young pilots of the Escadrille Lafayette. Like them, none were professionals before joining the RAF, while the AVG was formed with professional Army, Navy, and Marine Corps pilots their mission underwritten by the U.S. government. The closest any of the Eagles had gotten to service in the U.S. military was as aviation cadets who were flunked out for various reasons, while many had been rejected before getting that far, primarily for lack of the proper educational background. They had found an Air Force willing to take them in and train them in Canada. All they had to do was risk the loss of their U.S. citizenship for violating the Neutrality Act if they were caught by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, when crossing the border. Several of the men who became original members of the Eagles were pre-war pilots who had originally come to Europe after the outbreak of war to join the French Air Force as their forebears of the Lafayette Flying Corps had, or to volunteer to fight with the Finns. Since the Finnish war with the Soviet Union was over quickly, with France defeated a matter of months later, they found themselves in Britain, where the RAF was glad to take them into service. Ten flew in the Battle of Britain, though none of them were still alive to stand in the rain at Debden this day. During the Battle of Britain, Charles Sweeney, a wealthy American businessman in London, persuaded the British government to form an RAF squadron manned completely by Americans. Once the idea received Churchill's approval, Sweeney's group joined the World War I ace Billy Bishop and the U.S. aviation artist Clayton Knight to form the Clayton Knight Committee in New York City to recruit Americans for the RAF. Sweeney and his rich society contacts provided over $100,000 for the cost of processing and sending the volunteers to Canada and the United Kingdom for training. Such financial support to individuals was in the form of loans that were never repaid, and as such were legally gifts to encourage foreign service, making such support a crime. While the Knight Committee's activity was unofficially supported by President Roosevelt himself and thus tolerated by the Department of State, the committee was constantly harassed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation on the orders of J. Edgar Hoover himself, regardless of any support for this by the President, since Hoover considered his authority independent of anyone else in the government, as the likelihood of the United States entering the war became more obvious during 1941 the Bureau began to desist in their enforcement of the Neutrality Act. By the time the United States entered the war, the Knight Committee had processed 6,700 applications from Americans to join the RCAF or RAF, though 86% of the applicants were rejected, with only about 1,000 actually joining the RAF. Of those 1,000 volunteers, only 244 served in the Eagle Squadrons. A unit like the Eagle Squadrons attracted adventurous types, and the Eagles, in both their RAF and USAAF editions, had more than their share of memorable characters in their ranks. The minimum requirement for acceptance by either RAF or RCAF was a high school diploma, aged 18 to 31, minimum eyesight of 2040, correctable to 2020, and 300 hours of flight experience. As then, 19-year-old Barry Mahon recalled, I had about 70 hours actual time in Piper Cubs and padded my logbook with 230 hours in a Spartan executive as 
complex aircraft experience to get to 300. When I got to Canada, the first day I was on the field, they told me that with my experience, they'd just send me off in a Harvard. I was convinced I was going to die, but somehow I managed to climb up into that cockpit, got airborne, flew around the pattern, and put it back on the ground in one piece. Fortunately, they noticed my lack of ability and decided I was in need of more training, though my instructor later told me he admired my guts for trying. The 1st Eagle Squadron, 71, was formed in September 1940 at Church Fenton. Originally, it was considered that the squadron might fly the American Brewster Buffalo fighter, and several were delivered to the field. Fortunately, the poor performance of the export version of the Buffalo obtained by the RAF was quickly apparent, and the squadron re-equipped with hand-me-down Hurricane 1 fighters that had served in the Battle of Britain in November. In January, they were issued new Hurricane 2s and became operational for defensive duties on February 5, 1941. Among the original pilots was Chesley G. Peterson, who found his way to the RAF after being flunked out of Army Air Corps pilot training during ground school in early 1940. While working at Douglas Aircraft, he learned of the Clayton Knight Committee and applied for the RAF that spring. Following flight training, he arrived in the United Kingdom in December and was immediately assigned to 71 Squadron. Demonstrating talent in the air, Peterson was promoted to flight lieutenant in May with command of B-Flight, the first American in the squadron to join the RAF leaders in a command position. By June, they had shown themselves capable and joined the Hornchurch Wing in 11 Group on the Channel Front. By August 1941, the Hurricanes were exchanged for hand-me-down Spitfire twos. Peterson was promoted to command the squadron at the end of August, only weeks past his 21st birthday, the first American to command an Eagle squadron. When the Eagles were taken into the USAAF 14 months later, he was promoted to group executive officer as a 22-year-old lieutenant colonel and became group commander six months later, promoted to colonel that summer of 1943 at age 23, the youngest full colonel ever in U.S. service. The 2nd Eagle Squadron, 121, was formed in January 1941 at Curtin on Lindsay and was declared operational in July. The 3rd and final Eagle Squadron, 133, was formed that July at Coltis Hall and became operational in August. By that fall, 71 had re-equipped with the Spitfire 5, followed by 121 in November, after both squadrons had briefly flown hand-me-down Spitfire 2s for a month each. 133 re-equipped with Spitfires in January 1942. The three squadrons only flew together for the first time during the Dieppe Raid on August 19, 1942. 71 Squadron claimed one Ju-88, 121 and FW-90, with Victor Barry Mahan shot down moments later while shooting down a second 190 to become a POW. 133, now operating with the Debden Wing, claimed four FW-190s, a Ju-88, and a DO-217 with pilot officer Don S. Gentile claiming the DO-217 and one FW-90 to open his score. Six Spitfires were lost, with one pilot taken prisoner and one killed. In light of its excellent performance at Dieppe, 133 Squadron was promoted to flying the new Spitfire 9 while the pilots completed their transfers to the USAAF. Unfortunately, on September 26, 1942, 11 of 12 brand-new Spitfire 9s were lost while escorting B-17s to bomb Morlaix, France. Unforecast strong winds, reaching 40 knots, blew them further south in the cloudy skies than expected. After failing to rendezvous with the bombers in the poor weather and short of fuel, the squadron let down through the clouds to find themselves directly over Brest, where they were intercepted by FW-190s from JG-2, and the many German flak batteries below opened up. Four Eagles were killed, 1st Lieutenant William Baker and 2nd Lieutenants Gene Neville, Leonard Ryerson, and Dennis Smith, and six became POWs after bailing out of their stricken fighters. One FW-90 fell to Captain Marion Jackson before he parachuted into captivity. Only 2nd Lieutenant Richard Beatty made it back to England, where he was badly injured when he crash-landed on the Cornish coast. 
Second Lieutenant Don Gentile was left at Debden. As the spare, he had turned back when the squadron reached the French coast, and none of the other 12 aircraft had aborted the mission. The escort was also composed of 64 Squadron RAF and 401 Squadron RCAF, which never rendezvoused with 133 in the poor weather. Australian ace Tony Gaze, 64's commander, was relieved of command following the mission for insufficient preparation of the mission and mistakes during its execution. Negotiations between the RAF and USAAF over transfer of the three Eagle squadrons had commenced shortly after Ira Eaker had arrived in the UK in January 1942. Inter-service bureaucracy took nearly nine months to straighten out. President Roosevelt had to formally pardon each pilot for violating the Neutrality Act in order for them to meet the qualifications for an American commission. Since none of the pilots had completed USAAF flight training, there were additional negotiations for the USAAF to certify that the RCAF and RAF flight training standards met U.S. standards so they could be issued USAAF pilot wings. A seemingly minor point regarding authorization for the pilots to wear RAF wings on their U.S. uniform took three months to resolve in favor of a slightly smaller version of the RAF symbol being worn on the right breast of the uniform jacket, opposite the silver USAAF wings. The RAF received extra aircraft through Lend-Lease to compensate the loss of three experienced fighter squadrons. In the meantime, the RAF scoured their squadrons to find enough experienced American pilots to completely fill out the squadron tables of organization. Among the Americans who involuntarily became Eagles, three would become prominent in the fourth fighter group. Foremost among the three was 23-year-old Flight Lieutenant Donald J.M. Blakesley. Born in Fairport, Ohio in 1917, his father had taken him to the Cleveland Air Races, where he fell in love with airplanes. After learning to fly in 1938, he and a friend purchased a Piper Cub, which the friend crashed in 1940. Unable to meet the educational requirements to join the Air Corps, Blakesley joined the RCAF through the Knight Committee and trained in Canada. Arriving in the United Kingdom in May 1941, he was assigned to 401 RCAF Squadron. He proved to be a gifted pilot, though not a good shot. He would later joke with the other aces of the 4th that, You dead-eye shots take all the fun out of it. The fun is when a guy like me comes motoring up behind them and has to open fire to see where the bullets are going. Scoring his first victory in November 1941, he shot down two FW-190s in April 1942 by which time he had demonstrated gifted leadership that was cited in the Distinguished Flying Cross, DFC, he received that summer. He resisted transfer to the Eagles' squadrons because he considered them pampered prima donnas who played sister with their claims. Only after learning that he would be transferred to instructor duty on completing his combat tour in August 1942 did he change his mind about the Eagles. On a personal level, Blakesley was remembered by those he flew with as intense and committed. He was also described as thoroughly GI. In almost all photos taken of him in the USAAF, his officer's hat was always completely regulation with the wire frame inside, unlike the 100 mission look with the hat frame removed, which had been adopted by Air Force pilots up to General Carl Spatz. Blakesley was destined to achieve legendary status as the 4th Fighter Group's leader at the high point of the battle with the Luftwaffe in 1944, and would be tied with Hub Zemke of the 56th Group as the finest fighter group commander in Air Force history. Another reluctant volunteer was Flying Officer James A. Goodson, who was transferred from 403 Squadron RCAF. Born in New York City of British parents and educated in Canada, making him a passport American, Goodson traveled to England shortly after graduating from high school in the summer of 1939, working his way on a freighter as a pantry boy. Once there and realizing that war was coming, he tried to join the RAF, but was told there was a six-month wait. Told he would have a better chance joining in Canada, he booked passage aboard the SS Athenia, which departed Liverpool for Montreal at 1,300 hours on September 2nd, the day after the Germans began World War II with the invasion of Poland. At 16.30 hours on September 3rd, five and a half hours after Britain had formally become a combatant, 
the ship was spotted off the Hebrides by U-30. Her commander, Leutnant Helmut Lemp, tracked the liner until 1930 hours, when he fired two torpedoes, one of which hit Athenia in her engine room. Goodson, who was on deck when the torpedo struck, later recalled assisting with rescue efforts as Athenia listed and her lights went dark. He later wrote in his memoirs, I went to see if there were people trapped in the main section, and I saw dead bodies swooshing around in the water. I was plunged into the whole war thing in a matter of minutes. More than 100 passengers and crew were killed, including 28 Americans. Their loss so concerned Hitler that the United States might enter the war that the Germans denied sinking the ship until Lemp confessed to having done so after the war. Rescued by a passing ship and taken to Galway, Ireland, Goodson met the son of the American ambassador to Britain, who had come to Ireland to assist the surviving Americans. Goodson and John F. Kennedy would renew their friendship after the war until Kennedy's assassination. Completing training in May 1941, Goodson was sent back to Britain that fall, where he underwent operational training. He joined 416 RCAF Squadron in June 1942 and participated in the Dieppe operation, where he scored a probable FW-190. Once in the 4th Fighter Group, Goodson would later command the 336th Fighter Squadron, formed from 133 Eagle Squadron, and would become the group's leading ace by the time he was shot down on a strafing mission on June 20, 1944. Goodson later recalled in his memoirs that Blakesley was not fond of authority. While no one questioned his talent in the air, many in the top command had less confidence in his behavior on the ground. He recounted that the night before the Eagles' official turnover to the United States, Blakesley entertained two female Women's Auxiliary Air Force WAAF officers in his room. When Brigadier General Frank Monk Hunter, commander of 8th Fighter Command and a nine-victory ace during World War I, arrived to visit Debden the next morning prior to the turnover, the two WAAFs just had time to scramble out the barracks window, right into the path of the general and his staff. When told that Blakesley would be demoted and transferred, Hunter responded, for one, maybe, but for two, he should be promoted. The third pilot sent to the Eagles was later recalled by Walter Cronkite, who covered the air war as United Press's Man with the Eighth, as the single most interesting individual I ever met in all of World War II. Born November 10, 1919, in Athens, Greece, the son of a poor streetcar motorman with a large family, young Spiros Pisanos, grew up expecting he would follow his father in work. In 1935, however, he met his destiny. I was out in the country when I heard a noise, and when I looked up, I saw two airplanes practicing aerobatics. Transfixed, the boy forgot about everything else as he watched the two fighters. Minutes later, they flew to what turned out to be a nearby Greek Air Force base. They let me close to the airplanes and explained them to me. I thought they were wonderful and said I wanted to be a pilot and fly airplanes like these. One pilot quickly disabused him of the idea, telling him that, in Greece, a boy like him could never fly airplanes. Pisanos left, but the officer had not destroyed his dream. When I got home, I told my father I was going to America, where all things are possible, to become a pilot. His father had no argument that would change his son's mind. He did, however, manage to elicit a promise that his son would not leave home until he completed school. In 1938, Pisanos was ready to leave for America. Too poor to pay for passage, he signed aboard a freighter as a cabin boy, planning to jump ship on arrival at his destination. It took me three trips because I didn't know there was a North and South America. After trips to Buenos Aires and Rio de Janeiro, Pisanos finally arrived in Baltimore, where he went on shore leave and never returned becoming what would be called today an illegal immigrant. He found a restaurant owner in the Greek community there who hired him to wash dishes until he could earn enough to take the train to New York City, where he found work shelling oysters in Delmonico's restaurant for $10 a week and Americanized his name to Steve. I knew I had to learn English before I could fly, so each day on the streetcar I would read the New York Post with a Greek-English dictionary. Within a year, he began flight training at Floyd Bennett Field. A one-hour lesson cost $5. By this time, his pay was $15 a week. 
I moved to Plainfield, New Jersey after I soloed, when I found a better job and a cheaper flight school. By May 1941, Greece had fallen to the Nazis. Pisanos, with all of 80 hours in light planes, bumped that total to 300 hours with an hour's work on his logbook and snuck across the Canadian border to join the RCAF. He was a newly minted pilot officer when he completed training in April 1942 and arrived in England in May, where he was assigned to 402 Squadron, RCAF, from which he was assigned to 71 Squadron that August. When his paperwork was being processed for transfer to the USAAF, the fact that he was not an American citizen came out. American Ambassador John Winnant learned that Congress had just passed a law allowing an immigrant who joined the armed forces to gain immediate citizenship. On September 10, 1942, Spiros Steve Pisanos became the first immigrant to take advantage of that law. Immediately after, he took the oath of allegiance to the United States as a citizen. He was sworn in as a second lieutenant in the USAAF. The son of the poor Athens streetcar motorman was not only a pilot, but an American citizen and an officer and a gentleman by act of Congress. Lieutenant Colonel Edward Anderson, who at age 39 was definitely old for a fighter pilot, became group commander, though the fourth was considered the Debden Wing in RAF Fighter Command, with an RAF station commander and wing leader, Duke Woolley, leading the group in the air until January 1942, when Debden became an official USAAF base and 8th Fighter Command assumed official control. Major Gus Damon, a former set decorator at MGM in Hollywood before he joined the RAF, and became the first Eagle Squadron pilot officially credited as an ace in August 1941, led the 334th Squadron. Major William Daly, who had transferred to the group from the RAF just before the turnover to the USAAF, was appointed commander of the 335th Squadron. Major Carroll W. Mack McCulpin, the second American ace of the war after setting a record of shooting down five enemy aircraft in five weeks and fighting leading German ace Werner Mulders to a draw, the only pilot to serve in all three Eagle Squadrons, and the second American to command an Eagle Squadron in the RAF when he was sent to 133 after the Morlaix disaster, commanded the 336th Squadron. For the pilots, the main change as a result of transferring to the USAAF was a pay increase. A pilot officer in the RAF made 70 pounds a month, U.S. $350 then, while a USAAF second lieutenant drawing both flight and combat pay received $550 per month, a significant difference. With white stars rather than RAF roundels now when it's Spitfire Fives, the 4th Fighter Group flew its first USAAF mission on October 2, 1942, escorting B-17s to Dunkirk. The Luftwaffe decided to contest the mission, and the 334th and 335th Squadrons engaged FW-190s from JG-26 with Captain Oscar Cohen and Lieutenants Gene Fetro and Stanley Anderson, each credited with an FW-190, and 2nd Lieutenant Jim Clark sharing an FW-190. All missions flown over the rest of the month failed to entice the Luftwaffe to show up. Finally, Lieutenants Jim Clark and Bob Book found some action flying a rhubarb on November 16th in poor weather. When they strafed saint valery en in Normandy, Clark flew so low avoiding the defending flak that he hit a tree, returning to Debden with branches in his radiator intake. On November 19th, the 335th's second lieutenant Frank Smolinski added to the group's score when he shot down an FW-190 over the channel. On November 22nd, Major Daly completed his operational tour. Don Blakesley, who had managed to keep his commission as a captain despite the incident with the WAAFs, was promoted to replace Daly. The weather then closed in for the rest of the month, precluding operations until early December. The fourth flew a group-strength rodeo, a non-escort mission by a squadron or group fighter sweep along the French coast on December 4th, which the Luftwaffe again ignored. Two days later, flying escort to B-17s that bombed the Lille Fiva locomotive works, Jean Fetro spotted an FW-190 as they headed back to England and shot it down. The weather closed in again over the rest of December, and the only action seen were a few low-altitude rhubarbs 
flown in the poor weather. The first major missions of 1943 were two bomber escorts flown on January 13, 1943. The next day, Lieutenants Anderson and Buch flew a rhubarb to Ostend, during which they were intercepted and bounced by a pair of FW-190s. Chopping his throttle and skidding violently, Anderson managed to get the two Germans to overshoot, quickly straightening out. He caught the wingman from a range of 200 yards, setting the enemy fighter on fire and sending it into the channel below. In the meantime, Buch spotted two more Vergers, closing in on Anderson and opened fire on the leader, who reared up before crashing into the channel in a shower of spray. After other uneventful missions, some of which were canceled due to weather, the group escorted B-17s to bomb Saint-Omer on January 22nd. This time, JG-26 intercepted the Spitfires over the coast. The FW-190s turned onto the Spitfires and one shot up Bob Book badly, a bullet actually clipping his goggles and knocking them off. He managed to return to Debden, where his Spitfire was written off. In the fight that followed, 336 Squadron CO Captain Oscar Cohen and Lieutenant Joseph Matthews each claimed one FW-190. Four days later, Cohen led the squadron on a ramrod fighter sweep to Bruges, Belgium. As the planes crossed the coast, Buch's new Spitfire was hit by flak and caught fire. Buch turned out to sea to put as much distance between himself and the enemy as possible. When the fire started to melt his flying boots and burned through some control cables, he was finally forced to go over the side, six miles off the Belgian coast. While four of his fellow pilots orbited overhead, he got in his raft and began paddling toward England. Fortunately, 20 minutes later, he was picked up by a British ship. Chapter 5 Starting Over Just as 8th Fighter Command's groups were beginning to demonstrate their ability, 8th Air Force lost its most experienced units to the North African invasion. Just before this was announced, the command flew its most important and ambitious mission to date. Mission 14, target Lille, flown on October 9, 1942, would be the first opportunity to demonstrate the four-engine bomber as a war-winning weapon, and the first time the Luftwaffe would get a taste of the battles to come. Lille was in range of the fighters based in southern England. A complicated schedule of fighter sweeps and diversions was planned, though there would be no close escort for the bombers, which were considered capable of self-defense. The operation would also involve 36 Spitfire squadrons of the RAF's 11 group. A total of 432 fighters would be involved in the two target support forces that would cover the forces' entry into France, two rear support forces to cover withdrawal, and three diversionary forces which were to distract the defenders. Both target support groups would reach Lille just before the bomber's arrival and orbit until they arrived and hit the target. As the target support groups disengaged when low on fuel, the two rear support groups would cover the return of the bombers out of France and across the channel. The bombing force was composed of 108 heavy bombers of the 92nd B-17, 93rd B-24, the veteran 97th B-17, 301st B-17, and 306th B-17 bomb groups. It would be the debut mission for the B-24Ds of the 93rd and the 306th Group's B-17s. The B-24s would fly at 23,000 feet, while the B-17s flew at 25 to 26,000 feet, in 18-plane box formations. Opposing them would be the three Gruppen of JG-26, all equipped with the FW-190A. The Verge, Butcher Bird, as it was known, was superior to any Allied fighter at low to medium altitudes, while its heavy armament of two MG-151 and two MGFF 20mm cannon gave it hitting power to knock down a bomber. This would be the first time FW-190s would attack B-17s flying at 25,000 feet or higher, which would reveal the fighter's poor performance above its rated altitude of 23,000 feet. The bombers began taking off from their East Anglia airfields at 0830 hours. The point of penetration into German-controlled airspace was just south of Dunkirk. 
the German Y service intercepted radio traffic from bomber radio men testing their gear before the takeoff, while the Würzburg radars spotted the bombers as they climbed above 500 feet over England. With all the Allied formations heading toward Dunkirk, it was quickly apparent to the German controllers that the target was in northern France. JG-26's first Gruppe was scrambled from saint omer arc at 10.17 hours, followed within minutes by all of 3rd Group JG-26 from their airfields at Morsela and Wevelchem in southern Belgium, led by their commandeur, the redoubtable Major Josef Pips Priller, a veteran now of three years' combat on the Western Front. The Vergers set course toward the channel as the pilots strained for altitude, and soon sighted the Fat Ones, the B-17s and B-24s. The 93rd's novices in their B-24s were the first to reach Lille, around 10.25 hours, in a formation depleted by 14 mechanical aborts. There was only light flak. The B-17 groups, minus 16 aborts, were all over the target at 10.40 hours. A total of 69 B-17s and B-24s attacked the primary target, with 10 others bombing a secondary target. The intercepting German fighters were soon on the scene, with gunners reporting attack by a total of 242 enemy fighters, an overestimate. The fighter pilots were inexperienced in dealing with the American bombers and attacked primarily from the rear, which exposed them to withering defensive fire. The 12 o'clock high attack had yet to be devised to counter the lack of forward defensive armament of the B-17 and B-24. The Germans paid no mind to the P-38s of the first group, which were on their first escort mission and flying at 30,000 feet, or the Spitfires of the 31st and 4th groups, holding formation over the bombers at 28,000 feet. This was Pips Priller's first combat with the American heavy bombers, and he had difficulty comprehending their size. He underestimated the enemy's altitude twice, but eventually positioned the three Staffeln correctly and they initiated a mass attack from the rear. Priller bored in and was the first to score when he set a B-17 on fire that dropped out of the formation for his 78th victory of an eventual 101, all scored on the Western Front. At 10.45 hours, Hauptmann Klaus Mitouche, whose seventh shuffle had overwhelmed the British defenders of Malta six months earlier, firewalled his throttle as his 10 FW-190s closed on the bombers. Mitouche shot down one B-17 while his wingman claimed a second, and a third fell out of formation, smoking and damaged, as the Staffel swept through the formation. Close behind was Oberleutnant Kurt Rupert, leading 9th Staffel. Rupert hit one bomber solidly, which fell out of formation, while Leutnant Otto Stato Stamberger, a two-year veteran of the Channel Front, who had finally scored his first victory during the Dieppe raid, and a second RAF Spitfire a week earlier, latched onto a B-17. Opening fire at first out of range because he misjudged the target's size, he recalled his engagement. I then approached much closer and saw hits on the enemy's left wing. By my third attack, both left engines were burning, and I fired freely at the right outboard engine as the crate spiraled downhill in broad left turns. At about 2,000 meters, 6,500 feet, Four or five men jumped out. The bomber struck the ground east of Vendeville. I looked up. The sky was empty. I was out of cannon ammunition and slunk home. The B-17 was his third victory and the first of five fortresses he would be credited with shooting down over the next six months. The bomber gunners claimed 25 German fighters shot down when they returned to their bases. In reality, only Priller's Gruppe claimed six bombers five B-17s, and one B-24, shot down with a B-17 forced out of formation in their 10-minute engagement. They also claimed one Spitfire. In fact, 315 Polish Squadron's 24-year-old flight Sergeant Marian Kordasevich made it back to England in his bullet-ridden Spitfire Mark 9, but was killed attempting to crash land at RAF Manston. Mission 14 cost three B-24s and a B-17, with four B-17s seriously damaged. A further 32 B-17s and 10 B-24s reported varying degrees of damage, with 31 crew members missing and 13 wounded. 
the losses from Lille were more than had been experienced in the 13 previous missions. One bomber crewman later wrote home saying, Lille was our first real brawl, while another described the mission as the roughest yet. Lille was the first mission in which exaggerated numbers of enemy fighters were claimed by the bomber gunners. The initial claims were 56 destroyed, 26 probably destroyed, and 20 damaged, for a total of 102 enemy aircraft reportedly hit. A remarkable total, given that in fact there were only a total of 108 enemy fighters airborne. A London newspaper headline on October 12, 1942 proclaimed, 53 enemy planes bagged in Allied raid on Lille. In fact, only 7th Schaffel's Unteroffizier Victor Hager had been shot down, with the pilot successfully bailing out. German claims were more realistic. Bomber gunner claims were quickly seen by intelligence officers as fantasy, but were explainable when as many as 15 to 20 gunners in different airplanes might shoot at one fighter as it flashed through a formation, with each having mere seconds to sight the target and fire. Eighth Bomber Command never revised the gunner claims of any mission, on the grounds that accepting the gunner's good faith beliefs contributed to morale. For the Germans, the initial claims reflected the difficulty the pilots had in dealing with the B-17 and B-24, both of which were tougher than the bombers they had previously been faced with. The bombing results also reflected the inexperience of the American crews, with accuracy for the raid considered poor after bomb damage assessment post-strike photos were examined. With 588 bombs on the target factory in Lille, only nine fell within 1,650 feet of the aiming point. General Eaker had claimed that daylight bombing would be more accurate and lead to fewer civilian casualties, but most bombs hit residences around the Fives Lille factory, killing 40 French civilians and wounding 90. However, the nine bombs that did fall on the target temporarily put the factory out of operation and damaged equipment. A contributing factor to the poor bombing was the unreported 80 to 100 mile per hour winds at the bombing altitude. General Eaker wrote to General Arnold that the Lille mission had demonstrated that day bombers in strong formation can be employed effectively and successfully without fighter support. With the diversion of much of the force to North Africa, it would be six months before 8th Bomber Command flew a second similarly sized mission. The Luftwaffe would soon demonstrate that Eker had been vastly over-optimistic in his report. It did not take the Jagdwaffe long to discover that the B-17s and B-24s were vulnerable to attacks from forward. Crews returning from the attack on the U-boat pens at Saint-Nazaire on November 23rd reported that the majority of the fighter attacks had come from dead ahead. JG-2's Oberleutnant Egon Meyer, who led the attacking fighters, had studied the largely unsuccessful efforts made so far to stop the American bombers and had determined that they were most vulnerable to this tactic. The original forward armament of the B-17E and F was a single 50 caliber machine gun in the extreme nose manned by the bombardier. Over the course of the past several months, this armament had been increased by fitting larger windows to either side of the nose compartment with an additional 50 caliber gun fired from each but these weapons could not be brought to bear against fighters attacking from directly ahead, which were still only defended by the single weapon that could not be used while the bombardier was busy with his sighting. The B-24 had similar forward armament. On November 30, 1942, the men of the 78th Fighter Group arrived at Gox Hill at 0130 hours. While the group awaited the arrival of its aircraft, Major Peterson was named station commander and promoted to lieutenant colonel. With pilots anxious to get on with it and knowing they needed to get experience as quickly as possible, Colonel Pete arranged to send pilots to RAF units for familiarization after the Christmas holidays. Captain Charles London, flight commander in the 83rd Squadron, was sent to Hornchurch. He later reported, Wing Commander Bentley wondered what we were supposed to do. We said he was supposed to teach us to fight the war, so he got us checked out in Spitfire Mark 9s. I got about three quarters of an hour in one, and then he says, tomorrow we'll go on a do. The next day, the Americans accompanied the wing on a mission to Calais. London recalled that later that day, we were about to take off on another mission to see if we could goad the Hun into a reaction, 
when a teletype came in stating we were not supposed to fly. This was very embarrassing since apparently he was just supposed to tell us war stories. Eighth Bomber Command made its only effective attack so far on the German Air Force with a large-scale mission flown against the aircraft repair depot at romilly sur seine on December 20th that was the deepest penetration of enemy territory yet made. The depot and airfield were 65 miles southeast of Paris, near the Seine, and performed depot-level repair on Luftwaffe aircraft from units in France and the Low Countries. A force of 101 bombers was dispatched, of which 72 bombed the target. Flying to the target, the force was opposed by all three JG-26 Gruppen, reinforced by JG-2, and the air battle became the largest fought to date, turning into an important test of the theory that the bombers could successfully carry out unescorted missions deep in enemy territory. Escort for penetration of French airspace and withdrawal support was provided by eight RAF Fighter Command Spitfire squadrons and the 4th Fighter Group's three squadrons. Diversionary missions involving a total of 89 Spitfires were flown to known German fighter bases, but there was no response to the fighters. The RAF provided 35 new Spitfire 9s that escorted the bombers as far as Rouen. They turned back at 11.50 hours. Minutes later, an estimated 60 FW-190s from JG-26's first and second groups appeared and made the first attacks. As had happened at Saint-Nazaire, the majority of the attacks came from ahead. The German formations were seen to fly alongside the formation beyond range of the defending gunners till they obtained position two to three miles ahead, at which point they curved in on the formation, attacking at its flight level. The first pass claimed a B-17 from the 91st group that hit the ground, with a second shot out of formation that lost altitude and came under attack from several Fokkerwurfs that followed and shot it down. A second group of 50 to 60 Fokkerwurfs from JG-2 entered the battle at approximately 12.05 hours. These fighters made several attacks as the formation neared the target. BF-109s from JG-1 that had been brought in from Holland joined the battle with a 30-plane formation diving on the bombers five minutes before they arrived over the target at 12.40 hours. One B-17 from the 306th group was forced out of formation, about 12.30 hours, crashing five minutes later. The bombing results were later determined to be reasonably good. Hangars, barracks, and aircraft were damaged to varying degrees, and the airfield was cratered with 138 bombs. The flight home saw the Germans make continuous attacks after they had landed and refueled from their first interceptions. The 306th Group lost two B-17s shot down near Paris. The sixth loss finally went down over the channel, last seen when it dropped out of formation as the smoke from fires aboard increased. Two other B-17s managed to land back at their bases, but were so badly shot up that they never flew again. A further 29 returned damaged to varying degrees. Flak had been inaccurate and ineffective throughout the mission, and all losses were due to enemy fighters. The losses exceeded the 5% deemed sustainable and demonstrated that the defenders were quickly learning how to deal with the American bombers whose appearance over the continent had initially intimidated them four months before. In post-strike intelligence interrogation of the crews, Claims were made that seven enemy fighters were seen to crash, 18 broke up in midair, and 27 went down in flames. Total claims included 50 destroyed, 13 probables, and 8 damaged. These claims were originally reduced to 30 destroyed and 15 to 20 damaged. On January 5, 1943, 8th Bomber Command lowered the figure to 21 shot down, 31 probably shot down, and 7 damaged. The Jagdwaffe only listed two FW-190s lost and a third damaged. The German records also listed 10 fighters damaged in non-operational losses. At the end of December, General Garland issued new instructions for attacking American bomber formations. The preferred method was now an attack from the front in as large a formation as possible. The general stressed that the fighters should attempt to stay together as they broke off their attack above the bomber formation to allow them to reform for a second attack. However, among German fighter pilots, the favorite method of ending an attack was a split S, 
pulling out below the formation, usually too far to give time to climb back for a further attack. For the majority of German pilots, one head-on rush into a formation of enormous bombers, with tracers flashing straight at him, and the ever-present likelihood of a head-on collision, was enough. As missions continued into the new year, the Jagdwaffe's frontal attacks grew in number and soon accounted for most losses. Losses to enemy fighters rose from an average 3.7% of the attacking force in November to 8.8% in December and 8.7% in January. The Germans found that if such frontal attacks were made just before the bombers reached the point of bombs away, it would most likely spoil the bombardier's aim. Breaking up the bombing run appeared to now be a primary objective of the defending fighters. Modification for additional nose armament, which had been carried out at English depots and at bomber bases, was now performed at the modification center operated by United Airlines in Cheyenne, Wyoming, before a B-17 was flown on to England. A modified mount for multiple nose guns was developed for the B-17F, which improved the field of fire while still allowing sufficient room inside the crowded nose compartment for the bombardier to attend to his primary job. Most bombers in England were equipped with more effective forward fire by late January 1943. The ultimate solution, the adoption of nose turrets for both B-17s and B-24s, did not happen until the appearance of the B-17G and the B-24H, beginning in the late summer of 1943. On January 10, 1943, Major Josef Pips Priller became Geschwader Commodore, Wing Commander of JG-26, a position he would hold for the next two years. Priller was just 27 years old when he took command. He had first made a name for himself in Werner Mulder's JG-51 during the Battle of Britain, where he was awarded the Knight's Cross in October 1940 at the end of the campaign. He had then transferred to JG-26, where he became Staffelkapitän, squadron commander, of 1st Group JG-26. In early 1942, he had moved up to Gruppenkommandor of 2nd Group JG-26. He was, at the time of his promotion, to lead the Geschwader, the leading Experte, German term for ace, though it was not merely based on how many planes were shot down, but by a judgment of the skill used by the pilot among the pilots, with 60 victories. He was a notable bon vivant, though he took the responsibility of command seriously and was always concerned with the welfare of his men, both pilots and ground crew. They responded with deep loyalty to his leadership. He would continue his leading role in the air battles of the Western Front until the Jagdwaffe was reduced to near irrelevance after the losses incurred in Case Bodenplatte at the end of the Battle of the Bulge. Most importantly for the proposed U.S. air campaign, the Casablanca Conference was convened in January to determine Allied strategy in the coming year. Churchill was of the opinion that the 8th Air Force had not proved its worth since not one bomb has fallen on Germany since their arrival. Churchill and Chief of the Air Staff Sir Charles Portal wanted to see the Americans join the RAF in night bombing. When General Arnold, who attended the conference with President Roosevelt, learned that Churchill had won the president to his position over dinner on the day they arrived, he quickly ordered Eker, Spots, and General Frank Andrews to Casablanca before the conference began on January 13th to defend the daylight bombing campaign. The decisive meeting with Churchill happened on January 20th. Eker's presentation was the most convincing. Churchill later wrote in his memoirs that Eker's promise to mount a 100-plane mission by February 1st and as many thereafter as conditions allowed, along with his presentation of the advantages of round-the-clock bombing of Germany, changed his mind. Considering how much had been staked on this venture by the United States and all they felt about it, I decided to back Eker and his theme, and I turned around completely and withdrew all my opposition to the daylight bombing by the fortresses. Eker later recalled that Churchill merely agreed to allow 8th Air Force more time to prove its case. Fortunately, Churchill did not hold Eker to his promise. On February 2, 1943, 8th Bomber Command's authorized strength rose to six heavy bomber groups with a strength of 210 bombers, 35 frontline and 18 spare per group. However, none of the groups were close to their paper strength. 
On February 1st, there were only 182 B-17s and B-24s total in theater, including those under repair, and of that total, only 98 were ready for combat. 8th Bomber Command had fallen to its lowest combat-ready strength. The force was further marginalized by frightful winter weather conditions, which permitted daylight operations on only a handful of days. Rather than a 100-plane mission by February 1st and as many as possible thereafter, there were only seven missions flown, two of which failed to reach their targets due to weather. None exceeded 93 bombers. Shortly after returning to England, Eker ordered the first mission to bomb a target inside Germany, the U-boat construction yards at Figasak. Arriving over the target, they found it completely cloud-covered. The members of the force then bombed their secondary target, the port of Wilhelmshaven, which was only partially covered by clouds. They were thus still able to drop the first American bombs on German soil. With that, 8th Bomber Command had its first major victory. However, rather than continue bombing targets in Germany, the targets hit over the next several months were still the U-boat bases at Saint-Nazaire and Lorient. This continued through the spring. Following the first USAAF photo reconnaissance mission in the ETO on March 28th, photo interpreters noted that there was no building still standing undamaged in either Lorient or Saint-Nazaire. On April 1st, German submarine commander Admiral Dönitz reported that the two towns had been reduced to uninhabitable rubble and that all support operations for the U-boats had been moved into the massive concrete submarine pens where they were completely undisturbed by the bombs the Americans dropped. The Allied losses to U-boats in the Battle of the Atlantic continued unabated. Brand new P-38Gs arrived at Gox Hill during January but they were not destined to remain long. Having taken one up for a test flight, Captain Harry Dayhuff decided to buzz the field. His first run was successful, so he decided to repeat it, only lower. He kept at it, going lower again on a third pass. By his fourth pass, he was nearly clipping the grass on the field with his propellers, and he had gotten closer and closer to the operation shack. When he climbed out after landing, armorer Warren Kellerstadt congratulated his flying and commented that he'd done a very good job of missing the telephone pole right next to the operation shack. Dayhuff went white when he saw the 20-foot pole, which he had not spotted while performing his buzz job. On January 13th, the 56th group arrived in Britain after a six-day voyage on the Queen Elizabeth from New York. It was originally sent to King's Cliff, a satellite field of RAF Wittering, where the men learned how cold an English winter could be after moving into the new Nissen huts that had been set up for them. Hub Zemke recalled that his first impressions of King's Cliff were that the aerodrome was in a bleak location that overlooked a small river valley to the south and the village of the same name immediately to the west. The field had three short hard surface runways encircled by a paved perimeter track. Civilian workers were still erecting what the British called utility buildings and Americans came to know as Nissen huts. The group would be housed at nearby RAF Wittering while the base was still under construction. All were happy to find that Wittering was a pre-war RAF base that had steam-heated barracks and was overall much better than King's Cliff. Zemke's first act was to replace the English cooks and their English food, which the Americans disliked, with American cooks who provided food that was not what could be found back home but more to the American palate. Once King's Cliff was finished and they moved to the base, they quickly found that the stoves and the Nissen huts were terrible. 61st Squadron Commander Dave Schilling claimed one could be stoked for three days and could still be picked up with bare hands with no fear of harm. Soon, everyone seemed to come down with colds as they got acclimated to the English winter. When Zemke went in search of transportation, the RAF supplied him with a Wolseley limousine, which he remembered as a big English car that must have been commandeered from the nobility with separate compartments for the driver and passengers. Deciding it was not a very practical car for his needs, he commandeered a jeep but kept the Wolseley for use by the group. Fueled with 100-octane avgas, the car was even faster than Zemke originally found it, 
and pilots soon put it to use for picking up girls for parties, which resulted in it being named the Sex Machine. Semke also made use of it when he had official business to transact at 8th Fighter Command headquarters, and the weather was too poor for him to fly the 100 miles to London, since the vehicle always turned heads when it arrived. The Big Wolseley was a temperamental and cantankerous vehicle. Zemke's driver, Sergeant Curtis Houston, recalled a trip to London that proved troublesome in many ways during the trip home. Driving on the A-12 from London to Ipswich, the engine suddenly coughed and died. Houston's guesstimate was carburetor trouble. Zemke found that tapping on the carburetor with a screwdriver caused whatever was sticking inside to become unstuck, and the engine started again without trouble. Zemke hopped in front with Houston, and they drove on, only to have the problem repeat itself five miles further on. More tapping brought the engine back to life, and they drove on. Just outside Ipswich, they spotted a British Army soldier thumbing a ride. Zemke ordered a stop and offered the man a ride. Surprised to find such a luxury vehicle in the hands of the American Air Force, the private climbed into the luxurious rear cabin, and they set off once again. A few miles later, the problem raised its head again, but this time, Zemke's tapping only revived the engine so long as he continued tapping. The colonel was in no mood to remain at the side of the road awaiting help, so he opened the laterally hinged hood and positioned himself on the long mudguard and continued tapping, which allowed them to drive on without further delays. Curious, the passenger in back opened the window to Houston's driver compartment and inquired, Who's your mate out there, Sergeant? He's my colonel. Houston replied. The private was silent during the rest of the 25-mile drive while the big Wolseley purred down the road with a full colonel applying a monkey-see, monkey-do solution to the problem as he held on to the mudguard while his sergeant drove and a private rode in splendor. The incident was a perfect demonstration of the kind of officer Zemke was. On his first meeting with General Hunter, Zemke learned that the 4th Group had priority on receiving P-47s since they had combat experience. Although General Hunter had a good reputation as a pilot and a war record to back it up, Zemke soon found that while his commander was willing to delegate authority to his staff, he seldom followed up to see how they had dealt with an assignment. Zemke later recalled that, as a result, his staff officers became effectively commanders in their own right, which was wrong. Zemke believed Hunter lacked the spark of real leadership and did not understand modern aviation administration and control. Zemke later commented that Hunter's unfitness for his position adversely affected the operations of the fighters through their first crucial year of operations. Zemke remembered that, as the men grew restless without any chance of flying, one of the officers came up with the idea of simulating formations by using the English bicycles each pilot had been issued. The spectacle of a dozen men pedaling hard around the perimeter track in echelons of four must have confirmed to the British that we Yanks were crazy. The 56th finally received its first P-47s on January 24th, following re-equipment of the 78th with the P-47 because its P-38s had been sent to North Africa. Zemke's biggest problem was the enthusiasm of his pilots to get back in the cockpit. Because the airplanes had only recently been reassembled, and because theater modifications had been made to them that the pilots would not be used to, he was concerned about flight safety. He remembered later that they called them together and informed them no one would fly the planes till they had been thoroughly inspected and he had signed off. He established a five-pound fine for anyone breaking the rule, which the pilots all took as a challenge. While the mechanics in the 64th Squadron worked on the first of the P-47s, the pilots drew straws as to who the first lucky man would be and passed the hat. Zemke was surprised when they came into his office and dumped a hatful of coins on his desk, announcing that this contained the five pounds and they were going to fly that afternoon. Zemke later recalled that morale was sky high when after a few days the first airplanes were ready and the pilots flew them relentlessly over the next week. Things were different for the 78th. On January 15th, Colonel Peterson informed the pilots that they would soon begin escorting missions against the U-boat pens at Lorient and Brest. However, at the same time, the need for P-38 replacements in North Africa meant that airplanes were being sent on arrival in the United Kingdom to the Lockheed facility in Belfast, Northern Ireland, 
for transfer on to North Africa. The arrival of four P-47C Thunderbolts on January 29th seemed ominous. No one had ever seen a P-47 before, and there was great curiosity, particularly when two ferry pilots crashed and died the next day, bringing in more P-47s. Charles London recalled that his first thought on seeing the Thunderbolts was, Thank God we don't have to fly those things. He soon learned otherwise. These were their airplanes. Pilots were struck on reading the manual by the dire warnings not to dive vertically above 25,000 feet. On February 6th, Captain Herb Ross took one up for a check ride. Climbing to 35,000 feet, he decided to see what the warning was about and pushed over into a steep dive. Speed built rapidly. At 27,000 feet, he experienced tail buffet so intense the stick flailed out of his hands. He was only able to grab the stick as he sped through 20,000 feet, with the controls set in concrete. Seeing he was at the top of the yellow arc of the airspeed indicator and believing his time had come, he stopped trying to work the controls and began to feed in nose-up elevator trim. As he passed through 10,000 feet, suddenly the racket stopped and the nose gradually came up. Leveling off at 5,000 feet and catching his breath, Ross called to ask whether he should land the damaged airplane or bail out. He was told to bring it in to have a look. On arrival, he was still so shaken he had to be helped from the cockpit. A short inspection certified the P-47 Class 26 as damaged beyond repair. The paint was off the leading edges of all flying surfaces, wing spars had been pulled back, and the sheet metal failed at the wing roots. Vertical and horizontal stabilizers were pulled back with root failure, and most of the fabric on the elevators was in tatters. Harry Dayhuff recalled, It was the sickest-looking lately new P-47 one can imagine, having only collided with air. Ross subsequently gained the nickname Rocket. On February 7th, Colonel Peterson was ordered to attend a meeting at 8th Fighter Command headquarters. Several hours later, he called and ordered all officers to assemble in the briefing room at 1,500 hours. When he and the staff entered the room, everyone could see from their faces that the news was not good. Voice shaking, Peterson informed them that all pilots in the group, except group headquarters, squadron commanders, and flight commanders of each squadron, were to be immediately transferred to North Africa to replace heavy combat losses in the other P-38 groups, and they should be ready to depart the next morning. Just as it was about to enter combat as the first long-range fighter escort group of 8th Air Force, after a year's preparation and training, the 78th Fighter Group was gutted and given a new airplane none of them knew anything about, and pilots none had ever met. They had to start over from scratch, but there would not be another year in which to prepare. Adolf Garland later wrote in this period in his memoir, The First and the Last, that the hour had struck for the defense of the Reich, but that no one wanted to admit that the Germans had lost the initiative in the West, where they were now the defender rather than the attacker. With air supremacy now threatened, it was essential that the fighter force be strengthened, since only fighters can achieve air supremacy. England had given us a practical demonstration of this. It is amazing and shocking that this thought never occurred to either Hitler or Goering. Chapter 6 Opponents Jagdgeschwader 26 Schlageter was the German fighter unit best known to its American opponents, who called its members the Abwil Boys, identifying them with their main base outside Abwil in northwestern France. By the end of the war, JG-26 was the leading German fighter group on the Western Front. Manned by experienced aces who had fought since the Battle of Britain, when 8th Bomber Command first ventured across the English Channel, they would be a major thorn in the side of the Allied forces to the last day of the war even as the experienced pilots were lost in the war of attrition and replaced by partly trained youngsters. On the Western Front, Jagdgeschwadern II, 1, and 11 were also the primary opponents of the 8th. The Abwehr boys were known for their brightly painted Fakke Wolf FW-190s, the aircraft known to its pilots as the Verger, Butcher Bird. Aviation historian William Green wrote of the fighter, no combat aircraft has ever achieved perfection, 
but at the time of its debut, the FW-190 probably came as near to this elusive goal as any fighter. It was a brilliant design, in which weight consciousness and simplicity were keynotes, although they had not been allowed to affect structural strength. But this beautifully proportioned fighter was not merely a pilot's airplane. It had been conceived with a careful eye to the problems of both producibility and maintenance in the field. Grumman test pilot Corky Meyer, who flew a captured FW-190A-5 in 1944, considered it the most amazing airplane he had ever flown. Hellcat designer Bob Hall, who also flew the airplane, was so impressed that he designed the F-8F Bearcat as a carrier-based FW-190. When 8th Bomber Command began raids into northern France and the Low Countries, and later into central and western Germany, the main route ran through the region defended by JG-26. By the spring of 1943, 1st and 2nd Gruppen operated the latest version of the FW-190A. At the height of the battles between 8th Fighter Command and the Jagdwaffe, the primary version of the Verga was the FW-190A-8, which appeared in late 1943 and became the most produced A-series subtype. The A-8 sacrificed air combat agility for heavy armament, useful in attacking bombers. With additional armor plate installed and other technical changes, the days of the lightweight dogfighter that could outmaneuver every Allied fighter were gone. The primary target of this fighter was Allied bombers, not fighters. The 7.62 mm machine guns originally mounted in the fuselage ahead of the cockpit were replaced with heavy 13 mm MG-131 machine guns for the anti-bomber role. The primary armament was four 20 mm MG-151-20 cannon, with some exchanging the outboard MG-151 for an MK-108 30 mm cannon. The A-8 was powered by either the standard BMW 801D2 or the 801Q, providing 1,800 horsepower. This could be enhanced by the Erhöhte Notleistung emergency boost system that raised power to 1,953 horsepower for approximately 10 minutes by spraying additional fuel into the fuel-air mix, cooling it, thus allowing higher boost pressures, but at the cost of much higher fuel consumption. Though the FW-190A was always the German fighter with the best armament for opposing heavy bombers, it was at a disadvantage against American fighters since the Verger's best altitude performance was at approximately 22 to 23,000 feet. With the American bombers at 25,000 to 27,000 feet, the FW-190 equipped units were at a serious disadvantage if they ran across any opposing P-47s, which were operating at their best altitude. Thus, the Jagdgeschwadern opposing the Americans changed in the summer of 1943 from being solely equipped with FW-190s in all three Gruppen to having two Gruppen on the FW-190 while the third Gruppe flew the Messerschmitt BF-109G, which could fly and fight at altitudes above 30,000 feet. Developed from the Friedrich F-series airframe, the primary difference of the Gustav-109 was the Daimler-Benz DB605A engine, a development of the DB601E engine that powered the preceding BF109F-4, providing a power increase to 1,455 horsepower. By 1943, this basically clean design began to change with the introduction of the pressurized BF109G-5, in which the 7.92 mm MG-17 weapons were replaced with 13 mm MG-131 machine guns. The G-5 and the unpressurized G-6, the most produced BF-109 subtype, that quickly followed received the nickname Bull, the bulge, due to the MG-131's much larger breech block, as well as a bulged fairing on the wings due to use of larger tires. In late 1943, the MG-151 was replaced by a 30mm MK-108 cannon. To increase the anti-bomber firepower, many BF-109Gs were equipped with a 20mm cannon in an underwing fairing outboard of the main gear well in each wing. These weapons added weight and also contributed increased drag, which adversely affected maneuverability in fighter versus fighter combat. 109s so equipped were known as Kanonenboote, 
gunboats. J.G. 11, Experta Heinz Konoka, recalled in his memoirs that the Gustav had to be flown in the landing pattern at full power, which he initially found disconcerting. During the period before American fighter escorts gained the range to accompany the bombers all the way to and from the target, one of the most dangerous opponents the bomber crewmen faced was the twin engine fighters called Zerstörer, destroyer, the BF 110G, and ME 410, Hornissa. The major problem with twin engine fighters was that, despite the heavy armament and longer range, it would always be at a disadvantage with single engine fighters due to its size and weight, which limited its maneuverability. It has become a well known fact that the BF 110 series was a compromise in conflicting requirements resulting in a mediocrity, with a combat record that made it a humiliating failure. As with many such well-known wartime facts, there is a kernel of truth in the charge, but looking more closely, that history is based on wartime propaganda. Both the Germans extolling its virtues and the RAF claiming that it failed in the Battle of Britain, the result is further proof that if a lie is repeated often enough by a sufficient number of experts without it being pointed out as a lie, it becomes the truth. The primary design role of the BF-110 was as a bomber-destroyer, and in this role it was outstandingly successful. From its first interception of 18 RAF Wellingtons off the Heligoland Bight on December 18, 1940, when four of the eight bombers shot down were credited to the BF-110s of 1st Group ZG-76, 1st Group Sestorgeschwader, Z-6, 1st Group of the 76th Heavy Fighter Group, to the day battles over Germany in 1943, when the Zestörers hacked down B-17s and B-24s with heavy guns and rockets. The BF-110G, which began production in May 1942, was powered by the DB605B-1 engine, providing 1,475 horsepower for takeoff and Notleistung, war emergency power, and 1,355 horsepower at 6,000 meters, nearly 20,000 feet. Two belt-fed MG-151s were mounted below the cockpit, and there were four 7.62-millimeter machine guns in the nose, with additional Rustzeitze field modification sets the BF 110G 2 became a very effective, heavily armed bomber destroyer. R 1 was a BK 37 cannon mounted under the fuselage, with the two MG 151s in the lower fuselage removed. One hit by the 37 mm shell would explode a B 17 or B 24. R 3 replaced the four MG 15s with two MK 108 30 mm cannon. R-4 was a twin 20mm MG-151 pack under the fuselage, with the internal MG-151s retained. The BF-110G-2-R6 carried two 21cm, 8-inch, Werfer Granate 21, W.GR.21 infantry barrage rockets in mortar tubes carried under each outer wing in replacement of the drop tanks. These were developed from the 210mm Nebelwerfer artillery rocket. The timed fuse was set for a range of 500 to 1,200 meters, 1,640 to 3,937 feet, to explode in a formation and damage or bring down several bombers, as well as cause the formation to break up. These rocket guns, as they were called by American crews, were fired beyond the range of the defending guns and were wildly inaccurate. But one hit would tear apart an unlucky bomber. BF-109Gs and FW-190As also used the W.GR.21, carrying one under each wing. Since the tubes reduced maneuverability, their use by single-engine fighters was limited and stopped after the Allied escort fighters gained the ability to cover the deep penetration raids. So long as the American formations were unescorted, the BF-110 G-2 was deadly. But American fighter pilots considered them meat on the table. By the late spring of 1944, the BF-110G was withdrawn from the day fighter role after the units suffered heavy losses. The Ju-88 bomber, modified as a night fighter, was also used in the Zerstorer role, along with the ME-410 Hornissa, Hornet. 
these aircraft too suffered badly once American escort fighters could escort the bombers all the way and were also withdrawn from the daylight battles in 1944. So long as the American fighters lacked the range to escort the bombers the whole way to their distant targets and back, by the time of the regensburg schweinfurt raid on August 17th, the Luftwaffe was exacting losses among the bombers such that an American crewman on his sixth mission was statistically flying another man's time, since the life expectancy of a bomber crewman by the latter half of 1943 was five missions, with 25 missions required to complete a tour. The one element of the German defenses that was present on every Allied Air Force mission, from the first day of the campaign to the last, was flak. Flak is a contraction of Fliegerabwehrkanone, which translates as aircraft defense cannon. For Allied aircrew, flak was a generic term for ground-based anti-aircraft fire. While a fighter attack might be scary for an instant, when the planes had flashed past, it was over. That was not the case with anti-aircraft fire. One B-17 bombardier recalled, There was nothing more terrifying than to look up from my bomb site and see the entire sky ahead of us black with flak explosions, with red, orange, and yellow flashes from within that evil cloud as they put up more. There was no place to go, no place to hide. Every time I thought to myself, there's no way we will get through that in one piece. And for too many, they didn't. The leaders of 8th Bomber Command considered that, while overall losses attributable to flak were small, accounting for approximately 25% of USAAF bomber losses in 1942-43, to there was a significant number of bombers damaged by flak and forced out of formation, which were then more easily shot down by fighters. Additionally, flak intimidated the crews and was a major factor in degrading bombing accuracy. The primary anti-aircraft artillery piece used by the Germans was officially known as the 8.8-centimeter Flak 18. The gun could be used against either aircraft or ground targets, such as armor or attacking troops. Informally, these guns were universally known as the Acht Acht 88 by Germans and the 88 by the Allies. The gun could fire a 9.24 kilogram (20.34 pound) shell to over 49,000 feet. The high muzzle velocity combined with a high weight projectile made the 88 the deadliest anti-aircraft weapon deployed by any combatant in World War II. Anti-aircraft artillery constituted 29% of the German weapons budget and 20% of the munitions budget. Half of all Luftwaffe personnel were assigned to operate and service the weapons. In 1943, the flak units nearly doubled from 629 heavy batteries in January 1943 to 1,300 in January 1944. By late 1943, there was growing disquiet among senior Nazi leaders regarding the enormous costs associated with the flak force. After the war, Albert Speer acknowledged that the combined bomber offensive did constitute a second front before the Normandy invasion, and that the personnel and resources devoted to the air defense system both artillery and aircraft and their associated support systems, diverted enough of Germany's limited military resources to negatively affect the outcome of the battles on both the eastern and western fronts. Overall command of the Luftwaffe was vested in Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, the last commander of the Richthofen Geschwader in World War I, and a 22-victory ace, who was one of the longtime leaders of the Nazi party. Goering's leadership style was once described by General der Flieger Karl Kohler thus, The Reichsmarschall delighted in playing one man off against the other, and it gave him malicious pleasure when the two protagonists were at each other's throats. He would stand nearby and make scornful comments to those around him. He often impressed me as being pleased with the disharmony reigning among his most important staff. It seemed that he had no interest in encouraging an atmosphere of smooth cooperation since he was afraid that this would create a united front against himself. Leader of the German air defenses at the time the American Daylight Campaign began was General Josef Kamhuber, commander of 12th Fliegerkorps, 12th Air Corps, who created the air defense control system in 1941 to deal with the British night bombing offensive. His power and influence waned following the disaster of the Hamburg fire bombing in July 1943. 
12th Plieger Corps became Jagd Corps 1, and Kamhuber's replacement was a man of much lesser ability, General Beppo Schmid. When he was head of Luftwaffe intelligence during the Battle of Britain, Schmid's incompetence led to a complete misunderstanding of the status of the RAF as the battle wore on. He believed that once an RAF airfield was bombed, it was knocked out, and also completely missed the repair system established by Minister of Aircraft Production, Lord Beaverbrook, which returned nearly two-thirds of RAF aircraft shot down to service. He was, however, a master at catering to the wishes of his superiors, a necessity for success in the Nazi hierarchy. In this new position, he managed to impress his superiors sufficiently that in December 1944, he was placed in command of Luftwaffenkommando, West, responsible for all Luftwaffe units supporting the Western Front. This despite the disaster that 1944 was for the Luftwaffe. Schmid thrived in the chaotic environment created by Göring and was one of the Reichsmarschall's favorites. Adolf Galland who commanded JG-26 during the Battle of Britain and was the leading Luftwaffe experta on the Channel Front with 96 victories when he was named General de Jagdflieger, General of Fighters, just short of his 30th birthday in November 1941, was capable, competent, charismatic, determined, talented, and had almost no tolerance for the toadies who inhabited the upper reaches of the Nazi government, even being willing to speak back to Hitler in person. He was a constant irritant to Goering due to his championing of the Jagdwaffe. That he survived politically in this position as long as he did was considered miraculous by his fellow fighter commanders. The system of air defense command and control established in Germany closely mirrored that which Air Marshal Dowding had established for RAF Fighter Command, which was responsible for the British success in the Battle of Britain. The Luftnachrichtendienst, Air Surveillance Service, provided early warning and tracking units. Initially, this consisted of visual observation posts linked to a Flugdwache Kommando, shortened to Fluko, Aircraft Reporting Center. Between 1939 and 1943, radars and other electronic sensors were added. This sophisticated network was known as the Kamhuber Line by the Allies after its creator, General Josef Kamhuber. The first line of the system was the Funkkaufklärungsdienst, Electronic Intelligence Early Warning Service, which monitored the radio frequencies used by Allied bomber formations as they prepared for a mission, beginning with picking up radio tests by bomber radio men on their airfield, and then as they took off and assembled over England. This initial test was fed to the Zirauba, Pirate Center at Zeist in the Netherlands, and was then communicated to the relevant fighter and flak command centers. Radio interception was then followed by the long-range search radars positioned along the French and Dutch coasts, which picked up the Allied formations as they crossed the English Channel or North Sea. This data was communicated to the forward alert radar centers that used the smaller Freya and Würzburg radars that tracked the bombers as they entered German-controlled airspace. Fighter commanders' complaints regarding delays in communicating radar information led to command of the Luftnachtrichten, air surveillance regiments being changed from Corps headquarters in Zeist to Regional Jagd Division, Fighter Division headquarters. The result was a more responsive, though less centralized, air defense system. This culminated in February 1944 with new Jagd Division command centers taking responsibility for creation of a common Luftlagerbild air situation report, rather than the previous confusing mix of Jagdflotte, fighter fleet, and Luftgau, air region, reports. These new fighter sector directors were controlled by the new division command posts, which were now highly sophisticated data collection and dissemination stations, derisively known as battle opera houses by fighter pilots for their choreographed activities. Data from radar stations and other intelligence sources was fed to these posts, where the data was collated and the air situation report created. The fighter director then used this information to assign missions to the various fighter units under his control. Airborne fighter direction was conducted by voice radio from the Jägerleit Gefechtstand, fighter control center. The main link between the ground control intercept system and the airborne fighters was the Upsilon Verfahrenkampf, 
Y combat system, known by the code name Benito. The system's ground stations interacted with a transponder on a fighter through the moraine antenna mounted on the aircraft's lower wing or fuselage, which retransmitted the signal back to the ground so that the Y station could track friendly fighters. The Reichsverteidigung, Defense of the Reich, the German Aerial Defense Force, expanded throughout 1943, though only barely enough to keep pace with the growth of the Allied air forces. Expansion of the single-engine day fighter force came partly from withdrawing units from the Russian and Mediterranean fronts and partly from increased fighter production and pilot training. A major difference between the Luftwaffe and the Allied air forces was the matter of combat tours. For a pilot in 8th Fighter Command, a tour was 250 combat hours. This was counted as time over enemy territory and, for most pilots, the nine months to a year it took to amass such a total, flying an average two missions a week, was more than enough. Most were happy to go home and become flight instructors to pass on their hard-earned knowledge. Some few asked for tour extensions of 25 hours. These were usually granted when a pilot was on a roll with scoring success. A pilot could volunteer for a second 250-hour tour, which guaranteed him a 30-day leave at home before returning to operations. Fewer than 1 in 10 pilots took this option, though the percentage was higher among aces. This system gave Allied pilots a goal to achieve, while also providing experienced instructors to maintain quality in the training system. The Luftwaffe combat tour was unlimited until either a man was wounded so badly he couldn't return to flying duty, or death. A pilot who survived would become very experienced. As the home team, they fought over their own territory, and when shot down would return to duty. Only one German experta, Adi Grunz, was never shot down during his time in combat, and many were shot down more than once. Flying and fighting took a physical toll as well as the mental and psychological result of combat. Walter Kropinski, who came to JG-26 in the fall of 1944 from three years on the Eastern Front with JG-52 and flew combat from the first day of the war to the last, admitted years after the war that by the time he commanded 3rd Group JG-26, I was shot, no good. He frequently had barely the strength to fly a mission, the duties of group commander, caring for his pilots, ground crews, and other personnel were very secondary in his priorities. 3rd Group JG-26 suffered increased losses in comparison to the records of the other two Gruppen because of Kropinski's lack of leadership, despite his demonstrated prowess as a fighter pilot. The overall leadership of the Luftwaffe, particularly the Jagdwaffe, was not equal to the task. There was no ranking officer corps of experienced aviators. High-ranking commanders lacked contemporary aviation experience, their direct involvement having ended with the German defeat in World War I, and many did not fully grasp the problems of this war. The men who did understand were fighter leaders in their mid to late twenties who lacked experience in managing large organizations and were frequently not promoted in rank upon assuming command of a Gruppe or even a Geschwader, as their Allied counterparts were, which limited their dealings with superiors. Adolf Garland forcefully represented his pilots in his dealings with the upper leadership. However, several years after the war, he admitted he had lacked the knowledge of working in a large bureaucracy that would have given him the skills to deal with policy formation and administration more effectively. Such skill only came through experience, which comes with age. The Jagdwaffe leadership lacked both, to their detriment. Göring instituted a policy of promoting leading Experten to unit command. The result was that the German fighting force had some excellent frontline leadership, men who commanded the respect of their pilots. Several were truly outstanding, but many proved that the ability to shoot down a large number of the enemy does not necessarily make one a leader. Attacking the bomber formations was difficult for the German fighter pilots. Initially, German fighters attacked the bomber formation from the rear, which gave the most time for a pilot to aim and fire at a specific target. However, attacking from the rear subjected the attacker to the massed firepower of the formation. Both the B-17 and B-24 had their defensive armament positioned to oppose this specific tactic. A standard approach from 1,000 yards astern of the formation 
with an overtaking speed of 100 miles per hour, took over 18 seconds to close the distance down to 100 yards, the range at which gunfire had an effect on the target. Probably the majority of valid gunner claims for destroying attacking fighters involved rear attacks. By the spring of 1943, the standard Luftwaffe strategy for intercepting a bomber force had changed to attacks from ahead, due to the fact that the bombers had the least amount of defensive armament facing forward. An attacking fighter unit would fly a parallel course out of range of the defenses. When the force reached a point about three miles ahead, the flight swung 180 degrees to attack the formation from ahead. Initially, such head-on attacks were conducted from the same altitude as the bombers. However, judging range to the target was very difficult. The urge to open fire from too far away and make the breakaway too soon for fear of the collision that loomed in the gun sight was overwhelming. As they gained experience with the head-on attack, the Germans adopted the company front formation. The entire unit spread abreast and attacked from 10 degrees above the horizontal. This greatly simplified estimating range, with a constant angle of fire similar to ground strafing. The attack was a single pass through the bomber formation. It became known to the Americans as 12 o'clock high. The major danger was mid-air collision. Walter Kropinski said that just before he would give the order for his pilots to push their throttles forward and initiate their dive, my entire life would pass before my eyes, and I would momentarily wonder how many we might lose to accidental collision. Second Lieutenant Albert Williamson never forgot his first experience of such an attack. He and his childhood friend had joined the Air Force and trained as pilots together. Both were co-pilots in the 91st Bomb Group. On their second missions, each was in an adjoining bomber in the same formation. When the call, Fighters, 12 o'clock high, came over the radio, Williamson glanced out his side window to see an FW-190 collide nose-to-nose -nose with his friend's bomber. The two airplanes appeared to stop in midair. Then the fighter's radial engine broke loose. Momentum carried it the length of the B-17 till it fell out the tail. No one got out. The two airplanes, locked together in a death embrace, seemed to float toward the ground below. Curtis LeMay, commander of the 305th Bomb Group, began developing a new defensive formation in collaboration with 1st Bombardment Wing Commander General Lawrence Cooter. Originally, each of the four groups in the wing flew its own formation. There was no wing organization, and coordination with each other was limited to all being assigned the same target. Initially, individual three-plane VICs were used, but this formation was too small to provide mutual protection. The combat box was developed, with each squadron flying in two three-bomber elements, the different groups flying in line astern. Each was separated from the one following by a distance of approximately 1.5 miles. This resulted in an unwieldy formation that took a long time to get over a target. Cooter pushed for a larger formation for mutual protection, and also a more compact one, to get the bombers over the target faster. LeMay created a wing formation combining three 18-bomber boxes into one larger, mutually defending box formation. Instead of line astern, the three groups were positioned at high, medium, and low level, close to each other. The lead group flew the medium-altitude position, while the high group was above and to the right, with the low group beneath and to the left. Within each group formation, the three squadron formations of six bombers and two Vs flew in a high, medium, and low position similar to the large formation. The resulting 54-bomber formation occupied a stretch of sky 600 yards long, a mile or so wide, and half a mile deep. Each bomber carried approximately 9,000 rounds of ammunition. The wing was defended by 648 50-caliber machine guns with an effective range of 1,800 feet. The wing combat box provided mutual gunnery coverage while forcing the flak defense to change altitude settings to fire at each box, as well as the entire wing formation, dispersing and slowing the rate of fire. These formations spent less time over the target and were easier for the fighter escorts to defend. LeMay's concept was gradually accepted through all bomb wings over the course of operations in the spring of 1943. The new formation, called a pulk, heard, 
by the Germans was an unnerving sight for any fighter pilot, be he novice or grizzled veteran. With a combined closing speed of 500 miles per hour and a head-on attack, fighter pilots and defending gunners had only seconds to fire. The FW 190's four 20mm cannons fired 130 rounds in a three second burst. It took an average of 20 hits to destroy a B 17, and the average pilot only scored 2% hits. Thus, 1,000 rounds were fired to score the 20 hits. A head on high attack gave a clear shot at the bomber's vulnerable oil tanks in the wing, between the inboard engines and the fuselage, and the wing fuel tanks between the inboard and outboard engines. Lieutenant Franz Stiegler recalled one such attack. With high speed built up in a dive, my aircraft made a very fleeting target, and the more vertical my descent, the more difficult it was for the top turret gunner to get an angle on me. I targeted the pilots, the engines, and the wing's oil and fuel tanks. I could get in only one short burst, but I was through the formation before he even saw me. No matter how experienced a pilot was, attacking an American formation was unnerving. Oberst Phipps Philip Commodore of JG-1 wrote, Against 20 Russians trying to shoot you down, or even 20 Spitfires, it can be exciting, even fun. But curve in towards 40 fortresses, and all your past sins flash before your eyes. Air warfare in the stratosphere was terrifying to all participants. As the number of missions grew in 1943, some cracked under the strain. Future Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara, then a staff officer at 8th Bomber Command, investigated the growing abort rates during the summer of 1943, a phenomenon he suspected was due to pilot cowardice. He recalled that following completion of the report, he was called to a meeting of unit commanders. One of the commanders was Curtis LeMay. He was the finest combat commander of any service I came across in the war, but he was extraordinarily belligerent, many thought brutal. He got the report. He issued an order. He said, I will be in the lead plane on every mission. Any plane that takes off will go over the target or the crew will be court-martialed. The abort rate dropped overnight. That's the kind of commander he was. Fighting in the stratosphere over Europe was a nightmare for all concerned. Chapter 7 Eighth Fighter Command Struggles to Survive As of February 8, 1943, Eighth Fighter Command was a shadow of what it was supposed to be. The three fighter groups were now equipped with the P-47, with which only the newly arrived 56th Group was familiar. The 78th and 4th Groups were given two months to learn the airplane before commencing operations. The 56th had experience in the airplane, the 4th had experience in combat, and the 78th had neither familiarity with the airplane nor operational experience and faced the high hurdle of recreating a fighter group. Pressure was on from the highest levels to whip things into shape. The P-47 in the spring of 1943 was far different from what it would become over the next year. As the only fighter after the P-38 capable of high-altitude operation, its choice was due to force majeure. However, it could only fly slightly beyond the European coast from East Anglia. Designed to intercept high-altitude transatlantic bombers, it was no dogfighter. It had the slowest climb rate of any American fighter. The P-47 was defined more by what it couldn't do than what it could. As a result, the fighters were to remain at high altitude and not engage in air combat below 20,000 feet. Unfortunately, an airplane that couldn't fight effectively at every altitude was not much use. The orders were largely forgotten after the first few combats. The leadership of Armin Peterson, Colonel Pete, as his men called him, was vital for the 78th's success. Robert Ebby recalled, Colonel Pete put me in charge of bore sighting the guns. I went to 8th Fighter Command to obtain the ballistic data, and it took me three days with the various bureaucracies to find what we needed. I had to go through 8th Fighter Command, RAF Fighter Command, and the English Air Ministry. I drew up alternate combinations of bore sighting patterns and used the data I cajoled to choose the best ones. Colonel Pete was way ahead of the other groups on this. When they went to the Air Ministry, they were told the Yanks had been given the data once, and that was enough. 8th Fighter Command had to come over and get our data. 
I was very pleased when Colonel Pete told me that when he met at Fighter Command with Colonel Zemke and Chesley Peterson, they accepted our patterns. In the end, all the P-47 groups in the ETO used our material. Ebby also remembered Peterson's struggle to improve the P-47's gun sight. The American gun sight had a 60 mil ring that was inadequate for our speed, and Colonel Pete loved the Spitfire sight. He tried to get them, but was turned down. Ebby scratched a 90 millimeter ring on a reticle and found a local company that could produce it. Pilot performance in gunnery training improved drastically with the new reticles. Peterson did not give up on the Spitfire sights, finally obtaining them in mid-March. Non-magnetic mounts had to be made since the sight was right above the magnetic compass, which was thrown off 20 to 30 degrees by the standard mount. Peterson's unceasing efforts created a strong bond between him and his men. On February 16th, several American transferees from the RAF and RCAF arrived at Gox Hill. Second Lieutenant Harding Zumwalt recalled, On February 11, 1943, I reported to Gox Hill and the 83rd Fighter Squadron. There I saw my first P-47, and it was quite impressive. The jug weighed twice as much as the Spitfire and appeared large enough to house a couple of waste gunners in the rear. When I first taxied a P-47, it was like driving a Cadillac the way it would squat on its gear when you hit the brakes. Eighth Fighter Command made an agreement with the RAF to have U.S. fighter groups occupy RAF fighter stations. At the end of January, the 78th moved to the RAF station at Duxford in Cambridgeshire. Every American ever stationed there remembered the central steam heating. Anyone who spent a night in a Nissen hut knew just how cold an English winter was and all knew how lucky they were to go to station number 357-F, 8th Fighter Command, as Duxford was officially known. The Eagles remained at Debden. 2nd Lieutenant John T. Godfrey, who joined the 4th in September 1943, recalled Debden. The walk to headquarters, occasionally asking directions, was enlightening. There was a base hospital, the Red Cross Club for Enlisted Men, tennis courts, volleyball courts, armament building, movie house, post exchange, photography shop, enlisted men's barracks, and finally headquarters. The streets and sidewalks were paved and the grass was carefully cut. In back of all this, three huge hangars loomed, and everything was painted with the characteristic camouflage. 1,500 officers and men lived on the base, all slaves to the 48 P-47s sitting around the field. On February 27th, Captain Francis Stanley Gabreski, was welcomed to the 56th. Son of Polish immigrants, Gabreski had joined the newly organized Civil Pilot Training Program when he was accepted to Notre Dame University in 1938. After six hours in a tailor craft, his flight instructor advised him to drop out since he did not have the touch to be a pilot. Despite this, Gabreski dropped out in 1940 to join the Air Corps. At Parks Air College near East St. Louis, Illinois, Gabreski showed little talent flying the PT-17 and had to pass an elimination check ride to continue. In basic flight training, he began to show more promise in the Volti BT-13 and completed advanced training at Maxwell Field in the AT-6 Texan. In March 1941, Gabreski earned his wings and commission and assignment to the 45th Pursuit Squadron of the 15th Pursuit Group at Wheeler Field in Oahu. On December 7, 1941, Gabreski got airborne in a P-36, but the Japanese had already departed. After Pearl Harbor, he applied to be sent to Britain to train with the Polish pilots in the RAF on the grounds that he spoke fluent Polish and would gain valuable experience. The Air Force agreed, and he arrived in England in September 1942, promoted to captain and assigned as liaison with 8th Fighter Command Headquarters. He finally managed to fly with the Polish 315 Squadron in January 1943, flying 20 missions and entering combat once, unsuccessfully. When he arrived at King's Cliff, Gabby was the most combat-experienced pilot in the group. Both the 4th and 78th groups declined to bring him into their units since they had no slot for him. Zemke recalled that when General Hunter asked if he would take Gabreski, he had had a similar reaction. Finally, Lieutenant Colonel Lauren McCollum, 61st Squadron CO, agreed to take him. Gabreski's quick promotion to flight leader was resented by others, and his opinions of the flying abilities of some of his squadron mates, based on his experience with the Poles, 
didn't help. While the men of the 56th dealt with cold Nissen huts at King's Cliff before their move to the RAF base at Horsham's St. Faith on the outskirts of Norwich in Norfolk on March 5th and bemoaned the lack of flying opportunities, P-47s arrived at Debden in late January. Don Blakesley's 335th Squadron became the first to convert. While they learned the P-47, the 334th and 336th Squadrons continued flying their Spitfire 5Bs, and Blakesley's squadron also flew patrols in their Spitfires. On February 19th, Blakesley decided his pilots knew enough to fly 12 P-47s to Saint-Omer. Fortunately, when they found they couldn't communicate by radio due to intense interference, a problem associated with poor electrical shielding of the engines, the enemy paid them no mind. However, some RAF Spitfires mistook them for FW-190s as they crossed the English coast homebound, and they only escaped by diving away. 8th Fighter Command soon began to give the P-47 prominent identity markings to avoid such incidents in the future. Orders went out that the P-47 was to be marked with a 24-inch wide white stripe around the front of the cowling, a 12-inch wide stripe across the vertical fin and rudder, 18-inch wide stripes on the horizontal stabilizers, and U.S. national insignia twice the regulation size under each wing. At the end of February, the 334th Squadron began its conversion. After 10 days, Chesley Peterson decided to mount the first official P-47 mission. The 14 P-47s from 334th and 335th Squadrons that led to Ostend on March 10th returned frustrated. The Luftwaffe had completely ignored them. The 336th Squadron flew its final Spitfire mission on March 16th. The four pilots who had been flying with the 335th to learn the P-47 became instructors for the squadron's conversion, and the 4th was declared fully operational with the Thunderbolt. Missions were flown, but the enemy continued to ignore the Eagles and their P-47s. Don Blakesley led a ramrod on April 11th over France, but the Abville boys didn't come up. Two days later, one of the group's P-47s was shot down by British anti-aircraft gunners when the pilot returned over Dover at low altitude and was mistaken for an FW-190 on a tip-and-run raid. Overall, most of the former Eagles did not take well to the P-47, which compared badly in their experience to the highly maneuverable Spitfire as regarded handling, and they made no effort to keep their opinions to themselves. The former Spitfire pilots weren't alone in their dislike of the P-47. The remaining pilots in the 78th, who had experience in the nimble P-38, also considered the P-47 a clunk when it came to maneuverability. Both groups had strong doubts regarding the Thunderbolt's ability to fight it out with FW-190s that could fly rings around most Allied types. Major Cass Huff, an experienced test pilot on 8th Fighter Command staff, was able to fly a P-47 in mock combat with both a captured FW-190A and a BF-109G. His results showed that below 15,000 feet, both German fighters had all-around better performance than the P-47, particularly with regard to rate of climb. The P-47's performance improved progressively at altitudes above 15,000 feet, until between 25 and 30,000 feet, its performance bettered its opponents in all areas but acceleration and rate of climb. At full power, the P-47 was faster than both the 109 and 190, with the advantage rising to 30 miles per hour above 25,000 feet with regard to the FW-190 and 35 miles per hour at 30,000 feet over the BF-109G, reflecting the fact that the 190 was supreme below 23,000 feet, while the 109 could nearly give as good as it got in terms of performance above that altitude. The German fighters accelerated faster in dives, but the heavy Thunderbolt caught up with them easily and completely outdived both. Provided it kept its speed above 200 miles per hour, the P-47 was the equal of both German machines in turning ability, though both of them outperformed the American fighter at lower speeds. On April 8th, Zemke got orders to take himself, 62nd Squadron CO Major Dave Schilling, and Captains John McClure and Eugene O'Neill on a mission with 4th's Thunderbolts for a ramrod to the Pas de Calais that marked the entry of the 56th into combat. On April 13th, the 78th Fighter Group sent the 83rd Squadron to fly with the 4th in the early afternoon, 
while the 82nd Squadron flew with the Eagles that evening. Both were high-altitude fighter sweeps taking in the coast from Dunkirk to Furness, then Saint-Omer, ending at Calais. Charles London remembered, The Germans ignored us completely, not even bothering to shoot flak at us. Hub Zemke also took Schilling, McClure, and O'Neill for a second familiarization flight on this mission. The next afternoon, Zemke led the same four-ship flight, along with four plane flights from the 61st and 63rd Squadrons, as they accompanied the 78th on its afternoon ramrod. During this second mission, 78th Group Executive Officer Lt. Col. Joe Dickman suffered what was at the time a common P-47 accident, failing to carefully maintain the mixture control as he operated the throttle during the flight. The result was a blown cylinder head over Calais, which forced him to bail out two miles offshore. Dislocating his arm when bailing out, he had trouble shucking his parachute and deploying his dinghy. Using his hunting knife to free himself, he poked a hole in the dinghy. He had to pump to keep it inflated. An RAF air-sea rescue launch was delayed because the crew had to carefully pick their way through the minefield he was in. On April 15, 1943, Don Blakesley scored the P-47's first victory when he violated all the rules and dived from 28,000 feet on three FW-190s flying at 20,000 feet. One tried to outdive him, and he followed it down toward the channel, where he exploded with a long burst from short range at an altitude of 500 feet. When Jim Goodson congratulated him back at Debden for proving the Thunderbolt could outdive the Focke-Wulf, Blakesley famously replied, By God, it ought to dive. It certainly won't climb. Not everyone shared Blakesley's opinion. Steve Pisanos loved the Thunderbolt, recalling, I like the P-47. It was big and powerful, and it had eight machine guns. If you put the sight on the other guy and held it there, you had him. Group flying executive Chesley Peterson, leading the ramrod, became the second P-47 pilot to score against the Luftwaffe moments later, shooting down his seventh and last enemy fighter. As the FW-190 caught fire and went down, Peterson turned to re-enter the fight, but the temperamental P-47 he was flying blew a cylinder just at that moment. Peterson dived away from the air battle and managed to nurse his crippled Thunderbolt back across the channel. Thirty miles short of the English coast, the engine caught fire and Peterson bailed out. His parachute broke his fall only a few seconds before he went into the water. A nearby RAF walrus heard his mayday and picked him up after only 15 minutes in the water. While Blakesley and Peterson scored the P-47's first victories, Bob Book got FW-190 number three, and Lieutenant Leroy Gover downed number four. Captains McMinn and Anderson were both killed in the fight. As this happened, Zemke led the 56th on its first solo sweep along the Dutch coast. It was uneventful, as were the three flown over the following four days. The ramrod of April 18th saw Bob Johnson fly his first mission with the 61st Squadron. On April 18th, the 78th welcomed the first 18 pilots trained on the P-47 in the United States to Duxford. Among them was a flight instructor who had been fighting for a year to get out of training command. First Lieutenant Quince Brown betrayed his Oklahoma origins when he opened his mouth. Second Lieutenant Ernie Russell would later be Brown's wingman, an element leader, remembered. He could joke and had a little smile, but he was not brash or loud. However, you knew that he meant what he said, and, if tested, would tell you what he thought, never loudly, but as a matter of fact. He was not prone to jest, but he did have a good sense of humor. Above all, he was not a braggart. It just wasn't in his makeup. He was known by all in the squadron as one of the best pilots, though he would never tell you that. Like a cowboy, the proof was in the pudding. He had excellent vision, better than mine, and I had 20-10 vision, good peripheral vision that is essential to seeing movements in the sky, and good judgment. All that combined with the fact that he was an excellent shot made him a superb fighter pilot. Born in 1917, Brown was the fifth of five sons, hence his name. After finishing at the University of Oklahoma, he joined the Air Corps in 1940 at age 23, receiving his wings and commission as a second lieutenant at Kelly Field, Texas, on April 25, 1941. 
The superb flying ability demonstrated during training resulted in an assignment as an instructor at Randolph Field. When he arrived at Duxford, Brown was older than most pilots, and the 1,326 hours in his logbook were bettered in the group only by Colonel Peterson, who had joined the Air Force four months before him. Since he had more P-47 hours than those leading the group, Brown was given a quick promotion to element leader by Gene Roberts when he was assigned to the 84th Squadron. The 56th finally met the enemy on April 29th, when a ramrod led by Major Dave Schilling was intercepted by FW-190s from JG-26. The star personality of the group, Schilling was impulsive and subject to taking incautious risks, which he did this time when his radio failed while crossing the channel. He did not pass lead to a pilot who could communicate with the formation as they took up their patrol along the coast. When they were bounced, 2nd Lieutenant Winston Garth and Captain John McClure were badly shot up and forced to bail out, then picked up by the Germans. Schilling and his wingman returned to Horsham St. Faith with their fighters shot up. Zemke was forced to institute stiffer aerial discipline and end the buddy-buddy atmosphere in favor of operational improvement. The result was that the loner commander became more isolated from his pilots, never achieving the popular leadership that Chesley Peterson and later Don Blakesley won in the 4th, or that Colonel Armin Peterson had in the 78th. Up to April, 8th Bomber Command had only four B-17 and two B-24 groups that could regularly fly missions. Other groups had arrived in England and were training. Thus, it was only in May 1943 that the 8th Air Force began to command a force commensurate with the responsibilities assigned. On May 3rd, 8th Bomber Command Leader Lt. Gen. Frank Andrews died in the crash of the B-24D Hot Stuff in Greenland. The bomber, unofficially recognized as having been the first in 8th Bomber Command to complete 25 missions in late February, was scheduled to be flown back to the United States by its regular pilot, 1st Lt. Richard Shannon, and his crew to participate in a war bond tour. However, just before they were to take off for Iceland, General Andrews and his staff took over the airplane to fly to Washington for the coming Trident Conference. Andrews flew as pilot in command. After receiving a weather briefing in Iceland, indicating that a storm was brewing over Greenland, he determined to press on. When the bomber flew into snow flurries as it approached Bluey West 1 airfield in Greenland to refuel, it crashed in the poor visibility, leaving no survivors. In the wake of Andrews' loss, Eaker was promoted to Major General and given command. Andrews would be remembered with his name on the main AAF airfield outside Washington, D.C. By May, operational experience recognized the Agdwaffe as the primary obstacle to expansion of the daylight campaign. German fighter disposition on the Channel Front was unchanged from what it had been in August 1942. Allied estimates that the force had dropped from 270 in August to 215 from diversions to the eastern and Mediterranean fronts had resulted in optimistic plans to extend the bombing campaign into Germany itself, but optimism had faded as the enemy defenses seemed to grow ever stronger. German records had 350 fighters assigned to the Western Front in January and 600 in May. One quarter of the total Jagdwaffe was located in Germany and the areas of the occupied countries the bombers were forced to overfly. This growing enemy defensive air strength was reflected in growing loss rates for the bombers. An important milestone was reached in May when two bomber crews became the first to be officially recognized as having survived their 25-mission tour. On May 13th, the B-17F Hells Angels, serial number 41-24577, assigned to the 358th Bomb Squadron of the 303rd Bombardment Group based at RAF Molesworth, returned successfully from its 25th mission. A week later, on May 19th, B-17F Memphis Bell, serial number 41-24485, assigned to the 324th Bomb Squadron, 91st Bombardment Group, based at RAF Bassingbourne, completed its 25th mission. The event was important to the command because it proved to the crews it was possible to survive their tour and return home. The fatal statistics of bomber losses were clear to many. Most crews were gone by their fifth mission. Statistically, a man flying his sixth mission was on someone else's time. 
The operational losses, combined with the great difficulty of obtaining replacements, created a crisis. By February 1, 1943, 8th Bomber Command had received only 20 replacement crews against 67 lost to combat and war weariness. In March, things got worse, with 73 crews being listed war-weary and only eight replacements arriving. By April, the bomb groups were operating at only half of authorized strength, which made the combat losses even harder to bear. This was also a period in the overall war in which the combat needs of the campaigns in the North African, South Pacific, and China-Burma-India theaters led to the diversion of units intended for the 8th. All in all, by May 1943, combat crews looked at the statistics of attrition and replacement and saw the likely prospect of a short career. The two bombers' records of survival were important to 8th Bomber Command, and the command's public relations office had made plans for a major celebration when the event occurred. The 8th now had an embarrassment of riches, with two bombers and their crews achieving the goal. They also had a public relations nightmare. The plan to celebrate this event included returning the first bomber and its crew to the United States. That was, according to the records, Hell's Angels. Crew and airplane would participate in a national recruiting drive and war bond tour. As such, the B-17 and its crew would represent the Army Air Forces, and specifically 8th Bomber Command, to an American public that was still recovering from the cultural shock of hearing Clark Gable exclaim, Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, at the end of Gone with the Wind. There was a not insignificant part of that public guaranteed to express moral outrage to their local newspaper editors and their representatives in Washington at the sacrilege of a bomber named Hell's Angels touring the country as the representative of all the God-fearing fine American boys defending the country. The command looked for some way to change the order of seniority and send home the bomber with the right name. Both bombers and their crews had flown their first missions in November. Memphis Bell was senior, having flown her first mission to Brest on November 7th, while Hell's Angels had bombed Saint Nazaire on November 17th. There was the problem that the crew of Hell's Angels had flown all 25 missions in their airplane while the Memphis Bell crew had only flown 21 of their missions in their airplane, with the other four having been flown in other aircraft, while the Bell had been grounded for repairs. A different crew had actually flown the bomber's 25th mission. Nevertheless, Memphis Bell got the nod, and pilot Captain Robert Morgan and his crew departed Scotland for the United States on June 8, 1943. After six months being wined and dined across America, Morgan would return to combat on November 5, 1944, as pilot of the B-29 Dauntless Dottie, lead ship on the first mission to Tokyo since the Doolittle Raid. Hell's Angels remained at Molesworth, and the 303rd adopted its name for the group. The bomber flew 48 missions by January 1944, when it was flown back to the United States to tour war factories. While Memphis Bell escaped the scrappers the summer after the war and was eventually displayed at the National Museum of the Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Hell's Angels was sold for scrap in August 1945 and likely ended up a part of the aluminum siding craze in American housing during the 1950s. Thus, Memphis Bell is carried in the records as the first bomber to complete 25 missions and return to the United States. The 78th's first full-group 48-plane mission was flown on May 4th to the Brest Peninsula. It was logged as an uneventful sweep. Further missions on May 7th and 13th failed to rouse the Luftwaffe. On May 13th, Colonel Zemke, flying his personal P-47, now named Moy Tavaric, my friend, in recognition of his time in the Soviet Union with the Red Air Force, accompanied by a painting of a wheel with a very large hubcap for Hub Zemke, led 34 P-47s to rendezvous with the bombers over St. Nicholas for withdrawal support. When the P-47s arrived over Antwerp at 13.30 hours, they received a call that the bombers were under attack. Zemke later remembered that for once, the bright spring day brought excellent visibility. As they crossed the Dutch coast, he saw two FW-190s at his two o'clock position dive out of sight. He immediately called his flight to follow and executed a 180-degree diving turn to pursue the enemy. 
they had disappeared. He suddenly realized that the whole squadron had followed and ordered them to climb and reform. He then spotted four airplanes a mile to his left and realized they were the enemy. Calling for a turn, he gradually brought his flight in on their tails, where he could identify them as FW-190s. They were in a string formation, unaware of the approaching P-47s. Zemke, still new at air combat, continually jiggled the throttle and sideslipped so as not to overrun and his flight struggled to keep up with his gyrations. He closed to 500 yards on the enemy number three and opened fire. Missing completely, he nosed down and fired again, and there was a flash on the top of the 190's canopy. But again, Zemke's fire was too high and the enemy pilot immediately rolled over into a dive. As he turned in front of Zemke, Zemke gave a last burst and saw flashes along the left wing route and fuselage before the 190 disappeared below him. He had a newcomer's exhilarating feeling of accomplishment for a moment before he heard a warning that he was about to be attacked. Breaking left into a climbing turn, he saw four aircraft coming down head on, and as the leader came within range, he fired a burst but saw no hits or return fire before he was passed and gone. I looked around, and three of my flight were still there, but Bob Johnson was missing. Back at Horsham St. Faith, Zemke learned another flight of the 61st had also engaged the enemy and made claims for probables and damaged. Johnson got separated but flew home alone. Zemke's claim for a destroyed was downgraded to a probable. After the gun camera film was viewed at 8th Fighter Command headquarters, the claim was further downgraded to a damaged with Zemke realizing he had opened fire far out of range for effective gunnery. He made a mental note to get real close next time. Despite another 14 missions in May, the Luftwaffe ignored the Wolf Pack, as the 56th had named themselves. Five new B-17 groups, the 95th, 96th, 351st, 94th, and 379th, became operational during the second week of May, and the 92nd resumed combat operations after having been used for training since November. Organized into the 4th Bombardment Wing, commanded by Brigadier General Frederick L. Anderson, the groups flew their first mission on May 13th. Eker wrote Arnold, stating that, This date, the 13th of May, is a great day for the 8th Air Force. Our combat crew availability went up in a straight line from 100 to 215, If the groups prove to be superior in combat to the old ones, it will scarcely be a fair fight. Bomber strength went from 379 to 605. On May 14th, the Luftwaffe introduced the 78th to combat when they escorted 40 B-17s to targets in Belgium. The mission departed Duxford at 12.35 hours, and the Thunderbolts arrived over St. Nicholas, Belgium, to find FW-190s attacking the bombers. Colonel Peterson led the 82nd and 83rd Squadron in a diving attack, chasing the Germans into the bomber gunner's fire. The 83rd Squadron's CO, Major James J. Stone, scored the group's first victory when he flamed an FW-190. Almost simultaneously with Stone, Captain Robert Adamina scored the second victory. Unfortunately, his wingman, Flight Officer Samuel R. Martinek, was hit by another FW-190 and had to bail out. Adamina was hit a moment later and also bailed out to become a prisoner with Martinek. Element leader Captain Elmer F. McTaggart put a solid burst in the victorious FW-190, then followed it in a dive. Closing rapidly, he hit its wings and rear fuselage with his next bursts. As he passed through 12,000 feet, McTaggart fired again, and the FW-190 burst into flame. Unfortunately, he followed it to low level to observe the crash. As he turned away to head home, McTaggart saw tracers flash past his canopy, fired by another FW-190. When he attempted to evade the new enemy, he hit a tree and the prop sliced through a telephone line that began to wrap around the fighter. The ruggedness of the Thunderbolt saved him when he hit a second tree. He was able to zoom up to 1,500 feet and bail out. I was just outside Ath, Belgium, When I jumped, my plane hit in the adjoining field and burned, while five or six Belgians in the grain field below watched me land, but they scattered when I hit the ground. As he touched down, 
McTaggart's adventure had only just begun. Shucking his parachute harness, he started to run toward the tree line, but before he could get there, he came across a Belgian peasant who was willing to help. The man led him to an adjoining field and hid him in a line of bushes. He left some food and told McTaggart he would come back after dark. At 2100 hours, he returned and led the American to a farm which was owned by a member of the local resistance. He stayed through the next day at the farm, but it was apparent from the German search effort that something had to be done quickly. A risky plan was developed. The resistance man outfitted him as a Basque peasant and gave him forged papers that claimed he was mute. He was given a bicycle and told that the Pyrenees were a several-week journey to the south. Pedaling along back roads across France, he slept in fields at night. I'd been a Boy Scout, so I was able to live off the land, and taking the back roads allowed me the best chance of avoiding the Germans. He made it to the Pyrenees in 13 days and found the resistance group he had been told to contact. On June 1st, he was taken up into the mountains by a guide to the Spanish border. Crossing into Spain, he stopped at the first village he found and went into the local cantina, where he was able to use the phone and call the number of the American embassy in Madrid he had been given back in England. Two hours later, the Spanish Guardia Civil arrived and took him to a larger town where he was put in the jail with other Allied escapees. Most escapees who had made it this far had to wait as long as six weeks before the Spanish bureaucracy turned them over to the Allies. However, McTaggart's good luck continued when he found the cell was filled with men who had spent the requisite weeks in purgatory. The next morning, the guards took all and put them in trucks for a three-day trip to Madrid. Once there, they were sent on to Gibraltar, where they arrived on June 11th. After a week waiting for a flight to England, they arrived in the United Kingdom on June 21st. McTaggart had only been gone five weeks, setting the record for escape, evasion, and return before the invasion. Successful evasion meant he was sent back to the United States. He returned as a squadron commander in the P-38-equipped 370th Fighter Group assigned to the 9th Air Force after the Normandy invasion. The same day that McTaggart was shot down, Don Blakesley shot down a second FW-190, which, added to the three scored while flying Spitfires with the Canadians, gave him five victories to become an ace, a remarkable achievement for a man who was the first to admit he had to open fire to see where the bullets were going. Between May 12th and 25th, the third wartime U.S.-U.K. conference was held in Washington, D.C. to plan future actions. Winston Churchill was still determined to put off a confrontation between the Allies and Germany on the Old Western Front until he had exhausted every alternative. In the glow of the Africa Corps surrender in Tunisia on May 14th, he was able to obtain U.S. agreement for an invasion of Sicily that would finally free up the Mediterranean as a shipping route, restoring the Suez Canal as the gateway to the east. The Americans only gave up their push for an invasion of France in 1943 when Churchill was able to convince Roosevelt that a further delay would allow production of more landing craft, as well as give American army units time to train in England for the invasion. At the time, there was only one American division in the United Kingdom. In return for agreeing to a delay, General Marshall convinced the president to get a commitment from the British prime minister that the Normandy invasion would definitely happen in May 1944. On May 18th, the conference approved a new plan for what was now called the Anglo-American Combined Bomber Offensive. The destruction of the Jagdwaffe was given top priority as Operation Point Blank, followed by submarine yards and bases, the aircraft industry, ball bearings, and oil. 8th Fighter Command now felt ready to meet the Luftwaffe in combat. Approval was given for sending two 8th Bomber Command B-24 groups and a third destined for the 4th to 9th Air Force in North Africa for Operation Tidal Wave, a special one-time raid on the Romanian oil fields at Ploeshti. These decisions put a time limit on 8th Bomber Command, which had been tasked at the Casablanca Conference in January with establishing air superiority over Western Europe by defeat of the Luftwaffe, as a precondition for invasion. Point Blank approved expansion of the 8th to 1,750 bombers by January 1944 and 2,700 by the following April. 
full equipment of 8th Bomber Command was given priority over all other theaters. As impossible as the situation might have appeared at the time to the crews flying missions and meeting the Jagdwaffe over occupied Europe, they had a year to win the battle. On May 29th, 8th Bomber Command flew its largest mission to date, when 279 bombers were sent out, with the three fighter groups sending a total of 131 P-47s for escort. The mission also saw the first use of a possible alternative to the fighters. This was the YB-40, a B-17 variant designed as a long-range convoy escort aircraft, not a fighter. The concept of a heavy gun platform stationed at weak spots in a bomber formation received strong support from Eker, and Boeing modified 14 B-17Fs, arming them with a second power-operated turret over the radio compartment, doubling the number of waste guns, and grafting on a remotely controlled two-gun turret under the bombardier's position in the extreme nose. Altogether, the YB-40 carried 10 50 caliber guns in four turrets and the tail position, and four guns in the waist. There was substantial armor plating around the nose, the cockpit, the waist, and the tail, and it carried double the ammunition load of a standard bomber. Fully armed and loaded, it weighed more than a B-17F with a full bomb load. With this excess weight, the YB-40 was unable to climb or keep station with the rest of the B-17s while loaded with bombs, and slowed a returning formation that was now lighter after releasing their bombs. After only a few missions, it was recognized that the YB-40 slowed the formation it was supposed to defend, and the additional armor could not withstand direct hits from the 20mm and 30mm cannon carried by German fighters. The YB-40 was quickly deemed a failure, and the search for a way for the fighters to provide escort to the target and back continued. By the end of May, the 56th had joined the 4th and 78th groups, mounting 48 plane sweeps and escorts. 8th Fighter Command now felt ready to meet the Luftwaffe. Chapter 8 The Battle Gets Serious The 78th's major scrap with the Luftwaffe on May 14th was the announcement that their air war between 8th Fighter Command and their German opponents was now on. The Germans had taken the measure of the American fighters and taken action on that knowledge. With the increasing American formations, JG-1 was transferred to bases in the Netherlands and Belgium to reinforce JG-26's position in the middle of the American aerial superhighway to Germany and build a wall of fighter units from JG-2 on the Cotentin Peninsula to JG-11 on the German Bight. JG-1's transfer immediately added 72 FW-190s and 36 BF-109Gs to the German order of battle, a 25% increase in enemy strength. The May 14th strike against Kiel saw Heinz Knorke's Staffel of JG-1 achieve a milestone in its battle with the Americans. Now that he had proved with himself and his wingman that the tactic of dropping bombs on a formation could wreak havoc with the bombers, the entire Staffel was armed with a 250-kilogram bomb on its shackles under the fuselage. Knorka later wrote that he attempted a formation attack from 30,000 feet over Holstein, but the bombers below did not hold their course in one direction long enough. He was impressed by the precision by which the Americans bombed the Germania shipyards, describing it as fantastic. Weber-Feldwebel's Fiermen, Fest, and Biermen closed to attack from a lower altitude closer to the bomber formation, and each successfully hit a bomber. The explosions disrupted the formations. Kanoka dropped his own bomb without success, then attacked a formation of 30 B-17s. He could feel his Gustav take hits, but he hit a bomber in the cockpit. He later described the bomber rearing up like a great animal that has been mortally wounded, before it dropped away in steep right-hand spirals until at approximately 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet. A wing came off and it crashed near Husum at 12.17 hours. This was Kanoka's fifth bomber victory since scoring his first in late March, and was one of five brought down by 5th Staffel on this mission, giving the squadron a score of 50 B-17s and B-24s since 8th Air Force had begun its campaign in February. Konoka was proud to note in his diary that 5th Staffel 
now had more bomber victories than the Gruppe Staffleit and 4th and 6th Staffeln combined. While the 78th was finding the enemy reluctant to engage, the Eagles managed to find enemy fighters willing to do so. On May 14th, 2nd Lieutenant Dwayne Beeson and his element leader, Captain T.J. Andrews, scored the first two BF-109s credited to Thunderbolt pilots during a rodeo mission to Bruges, Belgium. The 334th Squadron's formation was bounced by two BF-109Gs that shot up 2nd Lieutenant Bob Book's P-47 and then dived away. Book's fighter caught fire before he could get out, and he was killed when the plane struck the water below. In the meantime, Andrews and Beeson went after the two 109s, quickly finding themselves pursued by the other two 109s of the enemy formation. Both turned into their pursuers and gave them the full effect of their eight 50 caliber guns, sending them into the channel. Born in Boise, Idaho, hence all his planes receiving the name Boise B, Beeson was another eagle who couldn't qualify for the USAAF due to lack of education, but he trained in the RCAF, passing out of flight training with the comment in his record that he was a good average pilot and is slightly overconfident, no outstanding faults. He joined 71 Eagle Squadron on September 5, 1942, just before its transfer to the USAAF. One of the shortest pilots in the group at 5 foot 3 inches, he was just short of his 22nd birthday, but looked younger than his years. In a unit of strong individualists, he was remembered as particularly intense, and would make his mark as one of the leading pilots. The next day, Lieutenant Colonel Peterson was replaced as group flying executive by Major Blakesley. Peterson had completed 200 missions at this point and moved up to become group executive officer. Demonstrating that success on one day was no guarantee of success on the next, when the bombers returned to Kiel on May 15th, 5th Staffel was not able to fly its usual 12 since several aircraft had been damaged the day before. Konoka reported in his diary after his return from the mission, This seems to be one of those days when every blasted thing goes wrong. I lose sight of the fortress which I have started to shoot up. By this time, I simply could not care less. I dive sleepily from behind at another fortress flying at the tail end. At last, my firing begins to have some effect. The two left engines begin smoking. The yank loses height rapidly. Once he is out of the formation, it is all over. I fasten on behind his tail and blaze away with everything I have. Bright flames spread along the belly. All ten members of the crew bail out. The parachutes hang in the sky like washing on some invisible clothesline, while the giant plane goes down, trailing a long column of smoke, in a pilotless spin, falling out of control, and finally disintegrating in its descent. On May 16th, following its first serious run-in with the enemy, the 78th engaged formations of more than 100 FW-190s over Flushing, Belgium, as it escorted the bombers into Germany. With the 82nd Squadron maintaining high top cover, Gene Roberts led the 84th into a fight with 60-plus FW-190s at 20,000 feet, while the low squadron 83rd climbed to meet 50 others that had attempted unsuccessfully to lead the Americans inland, where they could be cut off from returning to England. The 84th's flight officer Charles Brown ran across three 190s and blew up tail end Charlie, then flamed a second before six others dived on him from above and behind. In a desperate fight for survival, Brown's P-47 blew up under the German fighter's combined fire, wounding him in his foot, leg, and head. Amazingly, he was thrown clear of the wrecked fighter by the explosion and managed to open his parachute. Touching down off Valkeren Island, a German destroyer plucked him from the water. The battle continued above, when Major John D. Irvin scored a third 190 before the combatants separated. Pilots who flew a second rodeo to Abbeville saint omer that afternoon were disappointed when the Germans refused to answer the challenge. By May 26th, the 78th had added 11 more missions to the records, all of which the Germans chose to ignore, to the dismay and chagrin of the pilots. On May 17th, 8th Bomber Command flew Mission 58 against the U-boat pens at Lorient and Bordeaux. 
This was a continuation of the anti-submarine campaign that had begun on October 20th, 1942. The Germans claimed the pens were impossible to destroy with aerial bombs. Their concrete roofs were 20 feet thick. To date, they had proven impervious to the bombs dropped by both RAF Bomber Command and 8th Bomber Command. Even 1,000-pounders did nothing but pockmark the structures. Two formations of bombers struck Lorient. 100 B-17s from the 91st, 92nd, 303rd, 305th, and 306th groups bombed the port facilities and shipping as a diversion for the second group of 59 flying fortresses from the 94th, 95th, and 96th groups, which bombed the pens themselves. The bombers were intercepted by the FW-190s of JG-2, the Geschwader, tasked with defending the Cotentin Peninsula and French Atlantic ports. Defending gunners in the first formation claimed 27 fighters shot down, while gunners in the second formation claimed 20. Things picked up for the 78th at 10.15 hours on May 26th, when a maroon limousine drove up to the Duxford Gate, then proceeded to group headquarters where the unit stood to attention. King George VI and Queen Elizabeth stepped out of the limousine to pay their first visit to an 8th Air Force base. They were accompanied on their inspection of the base by 8th Air Force Commander Major General Eaker and Fighter Command Leader Brigadier General Hunter. Major James Stone's HLZ, in which he had scored the 78th Group's first victory, was inspected, with the King climbing into the cockpit while a formation of 72 B-17s passed in review overhead. Duxford's broad grass field gave an advantage to the group in allowing for launching and assembling quickly. Harding Zumwalt remembered. Our procedure for departure was to assemble 48 aircraft at the east end of the field. Two flights each, eight aircraft, would line up and take off across the field, followed at 15-second intervals by the remaining flights. Once off the ground, you held your heading for two minutes before executing a 180-degree turn by flights. The one difficult part was that number two had to drop down below the flight and move to number one's left while in that turn. In a minute and a half, all 48 aircraft were forming up on the group leader. With the weather sometimes down to 500 feet, we had to assemble quickly before we went into the clouds, which were often so thick a wingman could barely see his leader, even when tucked in tight. Each flight leader maintained a constant rate of climb until we broke out on top, which sometimes didn't happen till we reached 25,000 feet. But we would be in a reasonable group formation when we popped out. On June 1st, two of Konoka's pilots had a remarkable escape after colliding with each other after Oberfeldwebel Kramer's Gustav took a hit in the tail, falling off and hitting the fighter flown by Oberfeldwebel Biermann. The two 109s locked together for several seconds, fell nearly a thousand feet before Biermann's plane broke free. Attempting a dead stick landing at their base, he touched down too fast and overturned. The ground crews were amazed when they approached the mangled fighter to see Biermann open the canopy and climb out unharmed. Shortly after the separation, Cromer had managed to bail out, but he immediately opened his parachute due to the low altitude. His high speed resulted in two of the harness straps breaking, leaving the parachute only half open when he hit the water. Fortunately, a rescue launch was nearby, and they pulled him out of the water, spitting blood, and shocked to have survived. On June 4th, Zemke promoted the 61st's CO, Lauren McCollum, whom he considered the best of his squadron commanders, to be flying executive officer for the group. McCollum's replacement as 61st commander was Captain Francis Gabreski. The 56th, which had been late to the table since its arrival in England six months earlier, finally got the group's first score on the rodeo flown on June 12th. While over Belgium, 62nd Squadron CO Dave Schilling spotted a squadron of FW-190s below. Leading his flight down, Schilling was diving so fast that he overshot the enemy fighters. Captain Walter Cook, leading the second flight that dived after Schilling, managed to pull out of his dive onto the tail of the formation and open fire at one of the trailing Vergers at 300 yards knocking pieces off the 190's wing before the fighter flipped into an uncontrollable spin and went in with the pilot, unable to get out. The next day, Zemke spotted a formation of FW-190's 10,000 feet below the group formation. 
taking two flights down with him, Zemke pulled onto the formation without being spotted and shot down both FW-190s of the trailing Rota. Moments later, Bob Johnson shot down the wingman of the other pair in the formation Zemke attacked. On return to Halesworth, Johnson was called to the group commander's office for having left his flight without permission. It was a violation of flight discipline that Zemke would not abide. Johnson offered the defense that he and his element leader had agreed when they first started flying together that whoever saw the enemy first would take lead and attack. The element leader said he had heard nothing from Johnson. The future leading ace narrowly escaped expulsion from the group with a warning from Zemke that he would not be so lucky if it happened again. June 7th saw the arrival at Goat Hill of the 4th Fighter Group to be assigned to 8th Fighter Command when the 353rd Fighter Group, composed of the 350th, 351st, and 352nd Fighter Squadrons, arrived from training in the United States. Originally activated on October 1, 1942, the unit was the second after the 56th to have extensively trained on the P-47 prior to being sent overseas. Among the few experienced pilots in the group was the executive officer, Lieutenant Colonel Glenn E. Duncan, who had been an Air Corps pilot since receiving his wings at Kelly Field on October 5, 1940. P-47s arrived a week later, and the group began two months of intensive operational training for the conditions it would meet in the ETO. Over the rest of the month, the 56th flew mostly rodeos that were ignored by the enemy and a few close escort missions for B-17s attacking targets within the P-47's limited radius of action. Flying on internal fuel only, the average mission length was 90 minutes, with around 30 minutes of that time spent over enemy-occupied territory. Climbing to 30,000 feet before crossing the enemy coast, combined with the necessity of keeping a high speed in hostile airspace, saw the P-47s consuming their internal 305-gallon fuel load at around 200 gallons an hour. If they engaged the enemy in combat, the R-2800 engines drained the tanks at a rate of nearly 300 gallons an hour. Fortunately, such engagements were short and sharp, but pilots nervously watched their fuel gauges as they flew back across the channel toward home. At nearly the same time that the 56th was notching its first two scores, the 78th Group, which had flown 14 missions in June, with nine provoking no response from the enemy, ran into 20 FW-190s near Lumbre, France. The JG-26 pilots were good, and the 78th lost one pilot killed in action, KIA, while another parachuted into captivity. Several P-47s landed back at Duxford, badly shot up, for no enemy claimed. Eight days later on June 22nd, the group arrived over Volcaren Island to rendezvous with the bombers and support their withdrawal across the channel. The B-17s were under fierce attack from FW-190s, which knocked down three stragglers before they dived away from the approaching American fighters without loss. The 78th finally added to their score two days later, when BF-109s bounced them between Lille and Ostend during a rodeo, and three pilots divvied up one 109. On June 22nd, 4th Fighter Group Flying Executive Officer Major Blakesley led a ramrod to Antwerp, though the rendezvous with the bombers was missed due to the cloudy weather. By the time the 4th found the bombers and picked them up, the B-17s were under attack from 20 German fighters. The 335th and 336th squadrons dived on the enemy, while the 334th stayed as top cover. In the fight, the pilots claimed three FW-190s and a BF-109 shot down. One of each was credited to First Lieutenant Beatty, demonstrating he was fully recovered from his adventure being dunked in the channel when he was shot up a week earlier. Beatty reported that he and his section spotted four FW-190s attacking a straggling quartet of B-17s. I overshot the last 190 and attacked the one in front of him. I saw strikes and a big ball of black smoke as he snapped over and went straight down. Beatty blacked out when he turned sharply away from the FW-190. But First Lieutenant Paul Ellington saw the enemy fighter hit the water near the Dutch islands of Beverland Volkeren. Coming to a moment later, Beatty found himself surrounded by ten BF-109s. Three of them went directly in front of me as I pulled over in a tight chandelle. 
I dove on the last in a line and got in strikes on his cockpit, and he started over in a roll and went down. I followed him until he started pulling up. I was very close to him and was just pushing the firing button when he bailed out. First Lieutenant Fonzo Snuffy Smith shot down another FW-190, then in turn was chased by two that he outran. First Lieutenant Jim Goodson shot down the third FW-190 near Hulst for his first victory. On June 25th, Heinz Konoka was badly injured by bomber gunners in one plane when he attacked the B-17 on their plane's wing. He returned to base with a wounded hand and a bit of a scare when it took longer than expected to get back to the coast after the flight. The medics worked on the hand in the base hospital and gave him a room to stay in. Once they were gone, he slipped out and returned to the unit. He changed the bandages on his hand daily, and the commandeur took the opportunity of being wounded to give him two weeks' leave back in his hometown, Hamelin. After only a week, he returned, unable to relate to his friends who had no understanding of the battle he was fighting daily. On his return, he got his mechanic to create a heavy leather glove he could wear that would protect his hand while allowing him to fly. Four days later, on June 26th, the 4th picked up the B-17s near Dieppe to provide withdrawal support. The bombers appeared along with a swarm of enemy fighters. First Lieutenant Raymond Kerr and his wingman First Lieutenant Dwayne Beeson, both flying new P-47D-1s, each scored a BF-109, with Second Lieutenant Dal Leaf damaging a third. Kerr reported, Six BF-109s came in under us head-on, about a mile east of me. I turned and followed them inland. Two of them broke away and turned out to sea. I picked the leading aircraft and fired four or five bursts. I closed to 250 yards and gave two more bursts, which hit the enemy aircraft in the cowling and cockpit. Fire burst out of his engine, and the enemy aircraft slid down into the sea. Beeson knocked down the wingman. On June 29th, the 78th Group refueled at RAF Ford on the coast so that its pilots could maximize their limited range to penetrate deep enough into northern France to meet the bombers as they came off their attack on ville couble Airdrome near Paris. The B-17s were under fire from heavy flak and BF-109s when the Thunderbolts arrived on the scene. Captain Charles London added victories 2 and 3 to become the group's top scorer when he chased two 109s through the bomber formation exploding them within seconds of each other. Flight Officer Peter Pompetti, flying number four in the 83rd Squadron's fourth flight, spotted an FW-190 below. Radioing a sighting report and failing to receive a response from his flight leader, he split est onto the enemy fighter, exploding it with his first burst. Back at Duxford, his flight commander called him before the squadron commander for violating flight discipline. When Pompetti asked if his calls were heard, the flight leader responded he had heard them, but that Pompetti had broken formation and left them exposed. Pompetti refused to back down. Exposed? We were at 30,000 feet. Two days later, on July 1st, the 78th experienced its blackest day of the war. Although the group was credited with the destruction of four FW-190s, damaging five others, it became known as the day Pete didn't come back. Colonel Armin Peterson, flying his P-47C Flagari, call sign King Post Leader, led 32 P-47s from the 83rd and 84th Squadrons on a rodeo to the Dutch coast. Approaching just south of Hoek van Holland at 29,000 feet, FW-190s were spotted about 5,000 feet below. Peterson led his flight in a diving attack on four, while Gene Roberts and his flight took on four others. The battle turned quickly into a dive and zoom fight. Peterson missed his intended target and zoomed straight up into the late afternoon sun where his wingman lost him in the glare. With no one covering him, Peterson banked around and dived on the enemy in a second pass, but was in turn hit by an unseen foe. There was no radio call, and no one saw King Post Leader plunge into the North Sea off the island of Oudorp. One moment he was their beloved commander. The next, Colonel Pete, had vanished forever. No other commander would ever be so loved and respected as the 28-year-old Peterson, the man who had brought them together in difficult circumstances the year before, 
turning a collection of individuals into a fighter group that led them to England and into combat. Every pilot in the group believed that Peterson knew and liked him personally. Everyone knew he would do anything for them to ensure their success. The next day, Bob Hope and Francis Langford brought their United Service Organization's USO troop to Duxford. Hope later remembered, they were the toughest house I played to in the war. Over the next week, pilots searched the area off Oudorp in vain for any sign of their leader. Colonel Pete's call sign King Post was permanently retired. 83rd Squadron Commander Major Jim Stone was made temporary commander with a promotion, taking the call sign Gray Wall Leader. Days later, Stone moved down to Deputy Group Commander on the arrival of Lieutenant Colonel Melvin F. McNichol, whose ETO experience had begun with assignment as liaison officer with RAF 601 Squadron in the fall of 1941, following its re-equipment with the Era Cobra 1, Lend-Lease version of the P-39D. His twin brother commanded the P-39-equipped 350th Fighter Group in North Africa. Bob Johnson nearly ended his flying career two weeks after scoring his first victory, when the 56th experienced one of its worst days. Group Flying Executive Colonel Lauren McCollum led the mission. After landing at RAF Manston, the most forward base in England, to refuel, the mission was to meet and bring out the bombers after they hit Villacouble Airdrome. Nearing the rendezvous point at Forge les eaux they were jumped from above and behind by 16 FW-190s from 2nd Group JG-26. The Germans' first pass scattered the Americans. Johnson, who was sticking to the formation like glue in the aftermath of his run-in with Zemke, was number four in the rearmost flight of the 61st Squadron. His P-47 was badly shot up by an attack that ruptured his hydraulic system with a burst of 20-millimeter cannon fire. Burned and partially blinded by hydraulic fluid that sprayed in the cockpit, Johnson attempted to bail out, but damage to the canopy prevented him opening it more than about six inches. The thunderbolt fell into an uncontrolled spin. When he managed to pull out, he found the fire had been blown out. As he headed home at low altitude, a single FW-190 spotted him and curved in to attack. With the P-47 badly damaged, Johnson could only take the hits while the enemy pilot made several attacks. As he crossed the Channel coast, the enemy pilot ran out of ammunition. The German pulled alongside the shot-up Thunderbolt. Johnson recalled the fighter looked beautiful in its gleaming dappled camouflage. Finally, after several minutes spent examining the shot-up P-47, the enemy pilot shook his head and rocked his wings before turning back and leaving Johnson to his fate. The opponent was most likely Meyer Egon Meyer, Gruppenkommandor of 3rd Group JG-2. Meyer reported that he had expended all his cannon ammunition by the time he encountered Johnson, but nevertheless made a claim for the P-47 that was confirmed. After nursing the smoking P-47 across the channel, Johnson managed to land at Manston. It took several minutes for the ground crew to remove the canopy, which had been torn up by a 20-millimeter round so that the twisted metal caught on the fuselage and prevented it sliding open. Once out of the cockpit, Johnson tried counting the bullet holes, but gave up after reaching 200 without ever taking a step around his plane. The German attack on the 56th resulted in four other pilots shot down and killed in the initial attack. Two P-47s that managed to get back to Halesworth were damaged beyond repair, and five others severely damaged. The Schlageter Geschwader pilots were given confirmation for nine Thunderbolts shot down. Johnson returned to combat five days later and recalled the mission as the most harrowing of his career in his memoir, Thunderbolt. On July 14th, Major Harry Dayhoff led the 78th Group to cover the withdrawal of B-17s attacking Amiens Glissy Airdrome. Over Montreuil, he spotted FW-190s heading for the bombers and led an attack that turned into a major fight. Second Lieutenant August de Janeiro thought he was going to die when he was bounced by two FW-190s, and the right side of his cockpit and instrument panel were shot out while he received splinter wounds in both hands, his ankles, and right knee. He managed to recover and now, damn mad, dived into another FW-190 formation. 
he shot down one from 100 yards, probably destroyed a second, and damaged a third before he ducked into the nearby low clouds and headed for the channel, followed by three vengeful Germans, all while he flew without instruments, controlling the thunderbolt with his forearms. To make matters more difficult, on the way home he lost his right aileron due to damage and had to fight the damaged rudder and elevators. As he had unstrapped when he thought he would bail out, a crash landing was out of the question when he found he couldn't hook up his seatbelt. Spotting an English fishing boat, he circled it while he managed to batter open the jammed canopy with his injured hands. Letting go of the controls to jump, the airplane rolled inverted and he fell out, landing in the water near the little old lady. Her crew saved his life when they managed to pull him out quickly, since he could not unfasten his parachute and was suffering from blood loss. He went home a few weeks later after being awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Eighth Technical Command had begun distributing 200-gallon ferry tanks to the three fighter groups, delivering them to the 4th on July 19th and to the 78th two days later. While these unwieldy, unpressurized tanks could not be used above 20,000 feet, the fighters could suck fuel from them as they flew across the channel before switching to internal fuel, which could add a very useful 50 to 60 miles range that allowed the P-47s to reach the Dutch-German border. Jim Goodson scored his second victory on July 22nd, shooting down an FW-190 near Holst in Belgium, while the 4th provided withdrawal cover for the bombers. The victory saw the beginning of his climb to top ace of the 4th. The final week of July was Little Blitz Week, the first attempt by 8th Bomber Command to maintain a sustained series of attacks against the German aviation industry. Good weather allowed 14 missions to be flown between July 24th and 30th. The 4th made use of the 200-gallon tanks for the first time on July 25th on a rodeo to Ghent that saw the Luftwaffe ignore the Thunderbolts. On July 27th, the need for the tanks, despite the performance loss imposed by their use, was made clear when the group was forced to turn back early during an escort mission for B-26s when the tankless P-47s ran low on fuel. After this, the tanks were installed on all aircraft. The next day's ramrod to Vesthoop Emmerich, which saw the fourth's first penetration of German airspace, demonstrated the value of the tanks. Minutes before making rendezvous, a wing of B-17s over Utrecht was spotted under attack by more than 30 BF-109s and FW-190s. The Thunderbolts dived headlong into the enemy fighters, and a big battle developed over the city. In the end, five BF-109s and four FW-190s were added to the scoreboard for the loss of the 336 Squadron's second lieutenant, Henry Ayres, who was forced to bail out after being shot up by Major Rolf Gunther Hermeken, adjutant of 3rd Group JG-26. Dwayne Beeson was credited with one of the BF-109s, reporting, I saw many strikes. His left wingtip blew off, and then there was an explosion just in front of his cockpit, when he lurched violently and went down smoking. While climbing back to rejoin my section, an FW-190 got on my tail, and Lieutenant Kerr closed up behind me and opened fire. There were many strikes, and the pilot bailed out. Captains Carl Miley and Leroy Gover each scored single 109s while Group Commander Colonel Edward Anderson downed the remaining two BF-109s for his only victories of the war. That afternoon, 335th Squadron Commander Major Gilbert Halsey showed that every mission was a crapshoot. Flying a circus to Vesthoof Emmerich, the 16 P-47s ran into the entire 3rd Group JG-26, nearly 50 FW-190s. The Eagles did not spot the enemy until the redoubtable 3rd Gruppe adjutant, Major Rolf Gunther Hermeken, killed 1st Lieutenant Frederick Merritt in the first diving pass. The outnumbered Americans fought for their lives and managed to down five Schlageter Geschwader FW-190s in a desperate fight. 1st Lieutenant Aubrey Stanhope spotted three Fokker Wolfs ahead and attacked the one on the right, later reporting, I was getting hits on his tail and left wing, he sideslipped and went down. I then turned to the one on the left wing, firing a long burst from 15 degrees deflection to dead astern. I saw strikes on his tail and left wing. 
Then there was a violent explosion in his left wing where his gun was. There was a huge flash, pieces flew off, and all his wing outboard of his gun came off clean. The plane then tumbled tail over nose and spun down, smoking badly. Second Lieutenant Pierce McKinnon saw what he later reported as, a bomber being clobbered by two FW-190s. I cut my throttle and dove on one as he broke away and went into a diving turn. He went into a sharp climbing turn to port. I firewalled everything and closed to within about 150 feet and got in a three or four second burst. Something flew off his port side and large quantities of white smoke came pouring out. He flicked violently to starboard and I almost hit him, passing within just a few feet of him. I saw his engine on fire with long streamers of flame and smoke. McKinnon turned away, having just scored the first of his eventual 11 victories. Second Lieutenant Ken Smith saw a fighter he mistakenly identified as a P-47 below and throttled back to stay with it, at which point he suddenly saw it was an FW-190. Unknown to him, it was flown by Feldwebel Ernst Christoph, a first group JG-26, who had just shot down the B-17F Lucky Lady II from the 96th Bomb Group's 388th Squadron. I opened fire at about 75 yards and immediately saw flashes at the wing root and cockpit area. I broke off as he rolled and went into a spin. Kristoff managed to get out, but opened his parachute too soon, snagging it on the horizontal stabilizer as it flashed past. The nine-victory Experta was dragged to his death in the crash. The fourth considered themselves lucky to be able to claim five Fockelwolfs for the loss of merit. The nature of the air battle the Thunderbolts fought changed on July 28, 1943. The seven days of good weather in the last week of July 1943 would be known afterwards as Little Blitz Week, the first sustained attacks by 8th Bomber Command. The Blitz now ended with three missions against the Fokowulfs factories at Oschersleben, Warnamunda, and Kassel. They were deep penetration missions beyond the range of escort fighters and drew maximum opposition from the German defenders. The sky was clear over the English Channel at midday. Fifteen miles west of the Dutch coast, 40 Thunderbolts of the 78th Fighter Group eased their slow climb out of England and leveled off at 23,000 feet to enter enemy airspace. Standard operating procedure was to enter enemy territory at 29,000 feet, above the flak, which meant switching to the fuselage tank at that point. This time, 84th Fighter Squadron CO Major Gene Roberts was trying something new. He recalled, We started with the usual 48 fighters, three squadrons of 16 fighters per squadron. However, two pilots reported mechanical problems and had to abort. In each case, I had to dispatch the aborting airplane's entire flight to provide an escort. That left us with 40 fighters by the time we reached Holland. Above Roberts' squadron, the 83rd flew high cover, led by Captain Charles P. London, Red 1, the group's top scorer with three victories. Major Harry Dayhuff led the 82nd in the low position. They stayed at the lower altitude, draining their belly tanks. The Thunderbolts entered Holland north of Rotterdam and flew past Nijmegen, where they switched to internal tanks and followed Roberts up to 29,000 feet to enter Germany. He thanked the lucky tailwind they must have found for pushing them so far east since this was the deepest penetration yet made. His decision to delay climbing to penetration altitude as long as possible was proven right. The bombers targeting the factory at Osserschleben bombed through a cloud deck over the target when a small hole in the nine-tenths cloud cover opened and the lead bombardier was able to recognize a crossroad a few miles from the aiming point. The B-17 crews were thankful that the westerly wind allowed them to continue straight on for home. As they came out of the flak field, defending fighters slashed through the formations. Three fortresses were hit and the sky filled with parachutes. The bombers neared Holtern, where rocket-armed BF-110G fighters attacked, firing their missiles outside the range of defensive fire. At that moment, the 78th arrived. Roberts spotted the enemy. We were outnumbered by at least three to one odds, but were able to maneuver into attacking position with very little difficulty. The main reason for this success was that the German fighter pilots didn't believe we could possibly show up that far inland and were not expecting to see a defensive force at all. 
the Americans took full advantage of German confusion. Reynolds remembered. There was one B-17 beneath the main formation, and it was pouring smoke and appeared to be in deep trouble. I dove down on the enemy fighters that were attacking the cripple. They broke away and dived for the ground. There wasn't much more we could do to help the crippled B-17. We turned away from the bomber formation about 1,000 yards out. I discovered on reaching this position that I had only myself and my wingman, Flight Officer Glenn Kuntz. We immediately saw enemy aircraft ahead of us and above the formation. I judged that there were over 100 enemy aircraft in the area as compared with our 40. Dead ahead of me was a single FW-190, at the same level as Kuntz and me, about 1,000 to 1,500 yards ahead. He was racing in the same direction as the bombers so he could get ahead of them, swing around in front, and make a head-on pass. Roberts closed to 400 yards and opened fire, hitting the fighter heavily with a three to five second burst, and it spun down in smoke and flames. He spotted two more and closed so fast he had to pull up and roll in on his second victim to avoid a collision. I opened fire from dead astern. I observed several strikes and, as before, the enemy fighter billowed smoke and flames, rolled over, and spun down. Amazingly, Roberts and Kuntz were still in the middle of the action. After the second engagement, we were about two miles ahead of the bombers, about 500 feet above them, and still well out of their starboard side. Kuntz was on my right wing. About this time, I observed a 109 on the port side and ahead of the bomber formation. I dropped below the bomber formation, crossed over to the port side, and pulled up behind him, again at full throttle. The 109 turned to attack the bombers head on. Roberts followed. The bombers loomed beyond. I closed to within 400 or 500 yards and opened fire. He was in a tight turn, and that required deflection shooting. My first two bursts fell away behind him, but I continued to close. I fired my third burst as he straightened out to approach the bombers. The enemy fighter fell over into a spin, trailing smoke and flame. Kuntz flamed the wingman Roberts hadn't seen. Gene Roberts had just scored the first triple victory by an 8th Fighter Command pilot. Group top scorer Charles London caught two FW-190s, flaming the leader and diving to avoid the wingman. He spotted a BF-109 and set it afire. With this victory, he was the first 8th Fighter Command ace to score all victories in a P-47. Quince Brown and wingman Peter Pompetti spotted a flight of four BF-109s. As he made a high G turn, five of Brown's eight guns jammed. With only three still working, he hit the 109 on the right in the cockpit, killing the enemy pilot before breaking off to avoid a collision. Captain Jack Price came across the four FW-190s and flamed the leader. He turned into the enemy element leader and opened fire with his wingman's second lieutenant, John Bertrand. Each hit a 190, and both went down out of control. Deputy Group Commander Lieutenant Colonel James Stone hit a BF-109 that blew up so close that his wingman flew through the explosion. 82nd Squadron Commander Dayhuff spotted a BF-109 attacking the bombers, closing astern. The 109 blew up under his fire. Suddenly, there were no more enemy fighters. The battle had been an intense ten minutes. The Thunderbolts broke off while they had gas to return home. The B-17s were soon picked up by the 4th Fighter Group and taken home safe. For a cost of seven P-47s, the 78th was credited with 16 victories. With the 8 credited to the 56th and 4th Groups, 8th Fighter Command's total score to date was doubled. The force sent to Aschersleben lost 15 of the 39 that bombed the target. Their leaders later said they thought they would be wiped out, had the fighters not intervened when they did. Among the targets hit in Little Blitz Week was Hamburg, which 8th Bomber Command struck in collaboration with RAF Bomber Command in Operation Gomorrah. Hamburg's shipyards produced U-boats, and its oil refineries were crucial for the German war effort. What made this operation different was that it was the first to make widespread use of what the British called window and the Americans named chaff. This was bundles of aluminum strips cut to the wavelengths of the German radars. As the bundles broke open after they were thrown out of the bombers, the foil strips floated to the ground. While they were in the air, they effectively blinded the German radars, 
which returned nothing but snow. This meant that the German night fighters were completely unable to make any interception under radar guidance. While enemy fighters could spot the American bombers in daylight, the lack of radar vectoring meant that the short-ranged German fighters used up crucial gasoline searching for their targets. Both sides had known how this worked conceptually for at least a year before, but neither had been willing to make use of the tactic since its success would inform the other side, which could then use it against the radars of the initiators. British losses at night had grown as the Kamhuber line became more effective with its Himmelbett, heavenly bed, system of radar-guided interceptions, which prompted the Allied decision to finally make use of the new weapon. By July 1943, both the RAF and USAAF bomber commands in England were at the point of put up or shut up. They needed a major success. With an extended period of good weather forecast, Hamburg became the target. The bombers would drop incendiaries aimed at the old medieval heart of the city, where building construction was largely of wood. The USAAF had just received a large supply of the new American-made oil-based incendiaries, which 8th Bomber Command believed was superior to the 4-pound magnesium-cased thermite bombs used by the RAF. There would be multiple raids over a period of days to stoke the fires that the earlier raids started. Weather-wise, there had been little rain in previous weeks, while the temperatures had been unusually warm. These conditions would allow the bombers to make highly concentrated drops around the intended targets. The dry, warm air would create a vortex and whirling updraft of superheated air, which resulted in a tornado of fire. Operation Gomorrah, named for the biblical city destroyed in a rain of fire and brimstone, began on July 24th and continued for eight days and seven nights. It was the most sustained bombing campaign to date. The first RAF raid began 57 minutes after midnight on July 24th and lasted for nearly an hour. The 40,000 firemen found their firefighting resources damaged when the telephone exchange caught fire. Rubble blocked the movement of fire engines through the city streets. The fires raged out of control and were still burning three days later. The first USAAF raid arrived over the city at 1640 hours. Although 300 bombers were supposed to participate, problems in assembly in poor weather over England meant that only 90 bombers attacked the Blom and Voss shipyard and a Daimler-Benz aircraft engine factory. Smoke from the fires made visual bombing difficult, and the shipyard was only lightly damaged while a generating station was bombed instead of the factory, which was invisible in the smoke. German flak damaged 78 of the 90 attackers to varying degrees. The smoke was so thick that the planned bombing that night was canceled, with the RAF hitting Essen instead. The raid attempted on the night of July 26th was not considered successful because of thunderstorms and high winds over the North Sea that caused bombers to abort. There was no USAAF raid that day, again due to poor visibility from the smoke of the still-burning fires from the first night. On the night of July 27th, just before midnight, 787 British bombers began dropping incendiaries, with the main aiming points being the dense housing in the working-class neighborhoods of Bilverde, Burgfelde, Ham, Hammerbrook, Hohenfelde, and Rotenberg's sort. The use of blockbuster bombs dropped in the early part of the raid prevented firefighters from getting to the scene quickly. The lack of firefighting and the dry, warm weather let the fires grow quickly, which culminated in a firestorm. The tornado of fire created an inferno, pushing the winds as high as 150 miles per hour and reaching temperatures of 800 degrees Celsius, 1470 degrees Fahrenheit, while the flames reached an altitude of over 1,000 feet. A total of 21 square miles of the city were incinerated. Asphalt streets caught fire, while fuel oil from damaged and destroyed ships, barges, and storage tanks filled the canals and the harbor which caught fire. General Major Wilhelm Kerl, chief of Hamburg's civil defense, reported, Trees three feet thick were broken off or uprooted. Human beings were thrown to the ground or flung alive into the flames by winds that exceeded 150 miles per hour. The panic-stricken citizens had nowhere to turn. Flames drove them from the shelters, but high-explosive bombs sent them scurrying back again. 
Once inside, they were suffocated by carbon monoxide poisoning, and their bodies reduced to ashes as though they had been placed in a crematorium, which was indeed what each shelter proved to be. RAF Bomber Command attacked again the next night. The incendiaries merely kept the fires going. Thunderstorms over England led to cancellation of another U.S. AAF raid during the next day, and the British bombers were kept on the ground by the rain that night. The last raid was made by the U.S. AAF and RAF on August 3rd. The death toll from Operation Gomorrah will never be certain, but by December 1st, 1943, the official toll was 31,647 confirmed dead, though only 15,802 were based on actual identification of a body. The number of those who died in cellars and shelters could only be estimated from the quantity of ash on the floors. The first week after the raid, approximately one million survivors were evacuated, since 61% of the city's housing stock was destroyed or damaged. The workforce was reduced by 10%. No subsequent city raid shook the German government the way Hamburg did. Josef Goebbels, who visited the city 10 days after the raids, is said to have reported to Hitler on his return to Berlin that more raids like this would force Germany out of the war. Industrial losses were severe. 183 large factories were destroyed of 524 in the city, while 4,118 smaller factories were destroyed of 9,068 total. The losses included severe damage to 580 industrial firms and armaments works. All local transport was completely disrupted and did not return to normal during the rest of the war. Hamburg would be bombed 69 times over the course of the remainder of the war, preventing any real recovery. As late as 1955, the city was still being rebuilt. In the censored German media, the Hamburg raids were seen as being far worse than the major military reverse that had taken place over the course of July in the Battle of Kursk or the loss of Sicily the same month. An August 9th report by United Press carried an account by a Swiss merchant who had been in the city, stating that Hamburg's ceaseless inescapable destruction is on a scale that defies the imagination. On July 27th, Heinz Konoka went flying for the first time since being wounded back in June. He took the unit's BF-108 Typhoon hack and flew to Hamburg. What he saw left a strong impression when he wrote in his diary later that he had observed great fires still raging everywhere in what was now a vast area of rubble. An enormous cloud of smoke rose 3,000 feet above the fires, fanning out to a width of 10 to 20 miles, slowly drifting eastward to the Baltic Sea. The sky was cloudless, and the column of rising smoke stood out starkly against the summer blue. The horror of the scene makes a deep impression on me. The war is assuming some hideous aspects. I resolve with grim determination to return to operations in spite of my wounded hand. In the next two years, Hamburg's 35,000 would be joined by the deaths of 25,000 in the firebombing of Dresden and the almost unimaginable loss of 100,000 in one night to a firestorm set by B-29s on March 9, 1945, in Tokyo. But Hamburg shocked the senses because there was nothing before it to compare. In the aftermath, Adolf Garland advocated a massive fighter production program. In a meeting at Hitler's Wolf's Lair headquarters in East Prussia, even Hermann Göring was finally convinced, stating at the conclusion of the meeting that the Luftwaffe must now change over to the defense against the West, it should be possible to stop the Allied raids against the Reich by concentrating all forces and their effects on this one aim. He then left the meeting to report their decision to Hitler. An hour later, he returned and walked past them all, wordless, and disappeared into an adjoining room. Garland and Dietrich Peltz, Inspector der Kampflieger, Inspector of Bombers, were called in. Göring was at the desk, his head in his hands a broken man. He finally gathered himself and told them Hitler had absolutely refused to countenance anything he said, stating that the way to counter the Allied bombing was for the Luftwaffe to direct every effort to burning England's cities to the ground. Incredulous, 
Galland later wrote that it was difficult to describe how he felt on hearing Goering's words. Annoyance and revolt were mixed with a failure to understand and a wish to resign. What could I do here now? Should I not have asked to be relieved of my post? In the end, he and the others remained in hopes that Hitler's decision could be changed. It was not. The decisive moment for German leadership to change course in the light of Allied action passed untaken. Eighth Technical Command had not rested on their non-existent laurels for having found a way to fit the unpressurized ferry tanks on the P-47s. The need was for a tank that was useful at all altitudes and was hopefully not as aerodynamically inefficient as the bulbous ferry tanks. The technical experts found a way to use the exhaust of the P-47's instrument vacuum pump to pressurize a standard Air Force 75-gallon aluminum drop tank carried on bomb shackles. While the tank held less than half the fuel of the ferry tank, all those 75 gallons were usable, unlike those of the ferry tank. Also, the P-47 was more fuel-efficient at high altitude. Thus, a P-47 equipped with the new tank, taking off and climbing to 30,000 feet over the channel, thus entering German airspace at a fighting altitude, could fly as far into enemy airspace as it could with the larger ferry tanks flying at a far lower altitude. Maximum range using all fuel in the tank, with the fighter flying at 25,000 feet or higher, was 340 miles, nearly 100 miles further than with the ferry tank. The major delay in using the tanks was that the P-47Cs had to be modified at a depot with a deeper keel in the lower fuselage between the landing gear to allow installation of shackles capable of holding the tanks, and a sufficient number of tanks had to be brought to England. The newer P-47Ds that were now arriving at aircraft depots in England already had the keel and the bomb shack attachments installed at the factory. The aluminum tanks had originally been developed as ferry tanks, but were now in use with P-40 and P-39 equipped squadrons in the Pacific, and extending their use to the ETO put a strain on U.S. production of the tanks. Nevertheless, the fourth group became the first to receive the tanks in early August, followed by the other groups over the remainder of the month. On August 3rd, the 353rd Fighter Group was declared operational. Additional P-47s were arriving in sufficient numbers to allow groups to expand their establishment to 72 Thunderbolts each, allowing them to fly two 36-plane escort groups simultaneously. By the end of the month, 8th Fighter Command would effectively increase its strength by 250%, through this expansion. With more airplanes in a group, there was a need for more pilots. The 78th Group welcomed a second group of trained P-47 pilots to fill out the ranks on August 5th. The men were members of USAAF Class 43C, all of whom had trained on the P-47 from the time they were designated single-engine fighter pilots. Among them were 2nd Lieutenants Dick Hewitt and Ernie Russell. Russell was the youngest, having turned 19 on May 19th. A policy change made following the outbreak of war allowed an applicant to demonstrate in tests that he had knowledge equivalent to two years of college, thus meeting the educational requirements to enlist as an aviation cadet at age 18. Russell had taken advantage of this the month after he graduated from high school in Mississippi. He later recalled, We were fortunate to be held off operations for further training at what the group called Clobber College, where we learned things we hadn't been taught back in the States, such as how to fly at very high altitudes, get some real instrument time in actual bad weather, as well as get a good indoctrination on German fighter tactics from guys who had learned to fight the hard way. Similar groups of pilots from Class 43C arrived at the other groups over the course of August. Beginning in August, when two more bomb groups were declared operational and able to fill the gap created by the assignment of the command's two B-24 bomb groups to 9th Air Force in Libya for the Ploeshti mission, 8th Bomber Command began bombing targets deeper in Germany. On August 12th, the 78th provided escort for a mission to attack the synthetic oil installations at Bochum, Gelsenkirchen, and Recklinghausen. Since the German fighters remained out of range and avoided making attacks while the escorts were present, the group returned to Duxford without incident. Once the Thunderbolts turned away, the Germans hit the bomber formations hard, 
knocking down 23 and damaging 103 before the 56th Group arrived to cover their final withdrawal. Three days later, the 78th escorted B-17s on a mission to hit Merville, Lille, Vondeville, and vitry en artois airdromes in France, during which it claimed three FW-190s for two losses. August was shaping up as the month that 8th Bomber Command finally entered battle directly with the Luftwaffe over Germany. Chapter 9 Against the Odds August 1943 would mark the one-year anniversary of the entry of the 8th Air Force into the European Air War. Despite the promise Eker had made to Churchill at Casablanca, that 8th Bomber Command would be committed en masse to the bombing of Germany. The first U.S. bombs had not fallen on German soil until nearly six months later. Since then, the command had seen more units added, but there had still not been any major mission flown against the kind of strategic target whose destruction the USAAF bomber barons had promised would change the war. The entire USAAF high command was now at the point of put up or shut up. The Quebec conference was scheduled for August 17th to 24th, and the topic was whether or not the Normandy invasion would occur on May 1st, 1944, or some later date, or whether it would happen at all. Winston Churchill was still reluctant to commit to a nose-to-nose, bare-knuckles battle on the old Western Front, where Britain and its empire had sacrificed a generation. Britain had defeated Napoleon by striking him where it was difficult for him to respond, on the Spanish Peninsula taking later advantage of his failure in Russia in 1812. Churchill was personally still in favor of such a strategy. He was now pushing for an invasion of the soft underbelly through Italy, following the Allied success in Sicily. The Italians were giving every sign of wanting to get out of the war. Churchill argued that giving the enemy a year's breathing room between the taking of Sicily and the proposed landing in France would allow them to build up their defenses to a point where the Atlantic Wall that Hitler was planning would indeed keep the Allies out. His argument included the possibility that the Allies might quickly move through Italy following an Italian surrender and advance through the Ljubljana Gap onto the plains of Hungary, putting the Western Allies into Eastern Europe and blocking an occupation of the East by the Soviets. The failure to date of 8th Air Force to inflict any serious damage on the German war machine in general, and the Luftwaffe in particular, as called for in Operation Point Blank, meant that perhaps the invasion of France would not be possible at all, if combined with the free pass to the enemy to build up defenses. It was now crucial that 8th Bomber Command celebrate its one-year anniversary with a demonstration that it could accomplish what had been promised. The Quebec conference was scheduled to begin on August 17th, the exact one-year anniversary of that first mission by a dozen flying fortresses to Rouen. Whatever was going to be done had to be done before that date. What was needed was a target, a bottleneck, the destruction of which would maximally damage both the German war machine in general and the Luftwaffe specifically. Operation Juggler was conceived as an attack against the Messerschmitt production facilities at Regensburg in Bavaria and Wiener Neustadt in Austria. Allied intelligence credited the two factories with producing 48% of all single-engine fighters used by the Luftwaffe. The operation was conceived as a coordinated attack by both the 8th Air Force in England and the 9th Air Force in Libya striking simultaneously would leave the defenses at both locations taken by surprise. Regensburg would be struck by 8th Bomber Command, while Wiener Neustadt would be targeted by the 9th Air Force. Regensburg would not be 8th Bomber Command's only target. There was a target nearby that was as important, if not more so. Schweinfurt. In 1883, Friedrich Fischer, a mechanic living in Schweinfurt, a medium-sized city in Bavaria, invented the machine that could produce ball bearings on a mass production basis. His son founded the Kugelfischer firm in 1906, which, by World War I, was the cornerstone of the ball bearing industry. Production had surged after the war. By 1943, the population of the city had grown by 50,000 since 1922. There were now five factories in Schweinfurt, operating 24 hours a day, 
responsible for the production of approximately two-thirds of all German ball bearings and roller bearings. Demand only grew, with the German aviation industry alone using 2.4 million ball bearings a month. The British Ministry of Economic Warfare had collected information regarding potential German economic targets since 1939. A hard lesson in the importance of ball bearings had been given during the Battle of Britain when the Luftwaffe bombed one British ball bearing plant, which caused a serious delay in aircraft production. Ball bearings were a bottleneck. Extensive damage to or destruction of German ball bearing production would destroy the production capability of every factory producing war material. When British planners presented ball bearings as a target by the Americans in early 1943, 8th Bomber Command planners immediately saw that destruction of this particular bottleneck target by precision daylight attack would shorten the war and truly demonstrate the power of strategic bombing. Since May, five new B-17 groups had become operational. All now had sufficient experience that a major mission such as this was within the command's capability. 8th Bomber Command could put almost 400 bombers in the air over a target. With the force now available, it would be possible to strike both Schweinfurt and Regensburg simultaneously, thus demonstrating to the conference attendees at Quebec, most prominently Roosevelt and Churchill, that the bombers could disrupt German war industries and strike a serious blow against the Luftwaffe. The bombers would be operating far beyond their fighter cover. 8th Bomber Command's intelligence section believed that the enemy's single-seat fighters were concentrated in a belt along the coast from Brittany through the Low Countries to North Germany, and that behind that fighter wall the enemy would use their twin-engine fighters, the BF-110s, ME-410s, and JU-88s, which were believed to be less capable of penetrating the bomber box's defenses. Planners determined that they could dilute the defenders by striking both targets closely enough in time that the fighters could not land to refuel and rearm between the two forces. If Wiener Neustadt was struck simultaneously, the German defenses would be stretched to the breaking point. Colonel Curtis LeMay's 4th Bombardment Wing would hit Regensburg, while the 1st Bombardment Wing, led by Brigadier General Robert B. Williams, would go to Schweinfurt, with the two missions' targets hit close to simultaneously. The Regensburg force would not turn back and return to England, but would turn south to cross the Alps, landing in North Africa in the first shuttle mission, with the B-17Fs using Tokyo tanks installed in the bomb bay to provide the necessary range. LeMay's force, arriving first, would face the defenders' initial interception missions, then escape over the Alps. William's Schweinfurt Armada, arriving shortly after the departure of LeMay's force, would catch the enemy defenders on the ground, refueling and rearming, and would thus face the full fury of the Luftwaffe on its return flight to England. Essentially, it came down to LeMay's men fighting their way in, while William's airmen fought their way out. All that was needed was good weather. Operation Juggler was then set for August 7th. Unfortunately, while weather over the continent was generally good throughout the month, the mission was scheduled and canceled three times because poor weather over England prevented the safe takeoff and assembly of the two forces. Once it was determined that the strike force could not take off early enough to hit targets deep in Germany, missions were flown in mid-morning, after the fog had burned off the airfields in East Anglia and the Midlands, to targets in the Low Countries and northern France. These missions were protected to and from the target by fighters, now that all four operational 8th Fighter Command groups had received additional fighters and pilots that allowed each to fly two missions in a day. After several postponements, it was finally recognized that a simultaneous attack was not possible, and the two air forces were directed to stage their operations separately as weather allowed. The three 8th Bomber Command B-24 groups that were on detached service with the 9th Air Force for the Ploeshti attack, which had happened on August 7th, attacked Wiener Neustadt on August 13th. Unfortunately, three understrength bomb groups were not able to create serious damage to the complex, but they did damage the final assembly plant sufficiently that production of BF-109s was reduced from 270 in July to 184 in August. Repairs were slow enough that production had only recovered to 218 
in October. On August 16th, the weather was good enough over England to allow an early takeoff and assembly, but weather over southern Germany was poor. Thus, 170 B-17s were sent to bomb the Renault factory outside Le Bourget field in Paris. This was the deepest escort mission yet flown, and was made possible by use of the new tanks. The value of complete fighter escort was demonstrated when the Luftwaffe rose in large numbers to protect its main French aircraft repair facility. The fourth provided penetration support inbound, along with the newly operational 353rd Group, which was flying its first combat mission. Target support would be the responsibility of the 56th Group, while the 78th Group flew withdrawal support. A measure of the level of opposition can be seen by the fact that the fighter pilots would claim a total of 18 FW-190s and BF-109s shot down over the course of the mission. The mission would be the most memorable of their tours for Group Executive Officer Don Blakesley, First Lieutenant Jim Goodson, and his new wingman, Second Lieutenant Bob Wehrman. The morning of August 16th dawned warm and hazy over England. Pilots were roused at 0600 hours and gradually made their way to the officers' club for breakfast. This was Wehrman's first mission. He remembered breakfasts at Debden. You could always tell who was flying the mission that day. They were the ones with a plate full of real eggs, any style, bacon or sausage, real bread, toast, and real butter. The stuff he didn't get any other time. We used to joke it was the condemned man's last meal. But for too many, that wasn't really a joke. A lot of the guys sat there staring at all that food and maybe picking at it at the most. I was no hero either, but if I thought it was going to be a bad mission, I'd make myself eat because I'd tell myself I didn't know when or where I'd have my next meal. But there was one guy who never had any problem with breakfast. That was Mac McKinnon. He'd eat his, look across the table at you, and if you weren't eating yours, he'd ask if you wanted it, and if you said no, he'd pull it over and down it. After he'd found every unwanted breakfast within reach and polished them off, you'd think with all that was going on to make one hell of a mess in his cockpit the first time he pulled G's, but he never did. When he was done, he'd push back from the table and go over to this beat-up old upright piano in the corner. You have to remember, he was a professional concert pianist before he joined up, and he was really good. He'd turn around and look at everyone with that grin of his and say, For those about to die... And then he'd sit down and play a real mournful version of The Old Rugged Cross. When he'd get to the end, he'd sit back a minute and look at all the mournful faces, and then he'd launch into the most outrageous boogie-woogie version of that song you could imagine. He never did it twice the same. You'd look around and you'd see the guys start tapping their toes, drumming their fingers, bopping their heads, and when he was done, all the gloom and doom was gone. He was the best boogie-woogie piano player I ever heard in my whole life, and what he did was the morale boost we all needed. After that, you were ready for anything. Bob Wehrman wasn't one of the aces of the fourth, though he would eventually become one of the most respected men in the 336th Squadron and a flight leader. When he was informed in the 1980s that the American Fighter Aces Association had decided to credit him with three victories after reviewing the fourth's records, he campaigned to have the score reduced to one, insisting, and I'm only about three-quarters certain about that one. Raised in the Midwest, Bob hadn't had the world's best childhood. He wanted to leave home and do something no one else there would be likely to accomplish, knowing how low people's expectations were of him. A barnstormer had come through town when he was eight, landing on his uncle's farm. He'd gotten a free ride in return for his uncle's permission to use the field. Growing up in the 1930s, he had religiously followed the exploits of air racer Roscoe Turner, listening to the boys' adventure radio show of Turner's exploits. Turned down for lack of academic credentials by both the Army and Navy when he tried to volunteer for flight training the week after Pearl Harbor, he learned about the Clayton Knight Committee and was accepted, successfully passing basic flight training at Grand Central Air Terminal in Glendale, California, which introduced me to Southern California, a place I determined I would come back to when the war was over. After advanced training in Canada, where he was good enough to be commissioned a pilot in the RCAF on graduation, Wehrman arrived in England in May 1943. When he discovered what a second lieutenant in the USAAF was paid, and that the USAAF would now take him as a trained pilot, he requested a transfer. I hadn't really read all that much about the Eagle Squadrons before, 
but I answered yes when the officer in charge of assignment asked if I would like to serve with them. He arrived at Debden in late June 1943 and went through the group's Clobber College over July to be checked out in the P-47 and instructed in what to expect over Europe. I managed to impress Jim Goodson when he flew with me for my final checkout in the P-47. When we landed, he told me he would take me along as his wingman on my first mission. The way he put it was it would be a milk run, and I should stick to him like glue. As things turned out, that wasn't quite what happened. After breakfast, the pilots assigned to the mission went to the operations office and then into a briefing by Group Executive Officer Blakesley, who would lead the mission. I was in awe of Colonel Don from the first time I saw him in the officers' club that night I arrived, listening to his briefing. I was sure we'd be okay. As Blakesley explained it, the 4th would pick up the bombers near the major German fighter base at Abville and stay with them until the wolf pack showed up just before they got to the target. It wasn't quite billed as a tour of Paris, see the city of lights and all its glory from 25,000 feet, Wehrman recalled, but the general opinion was it would be a whole lot easier than the missions to Germany. Goody told me it would be a good way to get my feet wet without getting hurt. After a weather briefing in which they were told that there would be only light clouds and haze over France, and an intelligence briefing where they were told the Germans had suffered losses and would likely not be encountered in strength, Blakesley ended by announcing he would fly with the 336th, with the squadron placed in the low position. Goodson, with his wingman Wehrman, would lead the squadron's second flight. It was one of those glorious English summer days, Wehrman recalled. As we crossed the south coast of England, northern France appeared across the channel like a map. We crossed into France, and I picked out Abbeville and Saint-Omer airfields on my map. I wondered if we'd meet the Abbeville boys. Soon there was a warning call as FW-190s were spotted in the distance, climbing for an attack. The bombers became distantly visible ahead, and the aggressive Blakesley determined to hit the JG-26 fighters before they could organize an interception. I heard Colonel Don call for Goody to cover him, and that's when everything happened. Blakesley hit the climbing Focke Wolfs in a near vertical dive. Neither he nor Goodson and Wehrman knew that immediately after they peeled off, other German fighters had hit the rest of the group, who were now in a swirling fight. Blakesley had outdistanced the rest of his flight and was alone by the time he opened fire. Wehrman recalled. Goody pushed his throttle through the gate to catch up to Colonel Don. We were going faster than I'd ever flown in a P-47. I saw Colonel Don pull out of his dive right behind the four 190s and open fire. He was behind one, but the truth was he wasn't the best shot, and the others broke away and he ended up with all three in his tail and him still chasing the first one. My airplane was shaking. We were diving so fast to catch up to him. All I could think of was to stick like glue the way Goody had said. He started to pull out and we almost didn't make it. I blacked out and when I came to a moment later, I was surprised I was still with him. Goodson called to Blakesley. Break, horseback, they're behind you. Blakesley broke off his attack, pulling a tight, wings vertical left turn and streaming contrails from his wingtips in the humid air. The three Vergers followed. Colonel Don turned away, but we were under 10,000 feet, and the 190 could outturn a P-47 down there. Goody managed to cut the corner as he followed them and finally got in range of the tail-end German. He opened fire. There was a flash on the fuselage just above the wing and a puff of smoke, and then the wing came off. It was the first time I ever saw an airplane shot down. It headed straight down, but he was already after the second one. Colonel Don was calling out he'd been hit, and Goody was yelling for him to hang on. Blakesley was taking repeated cannon hits in the fuselage and wing of his Thunderbolt from the lead German. All three enemy pilots concentrated on their target and did not see their nemesis approaching low from the rear. Standing on his left wing and using all his strength to haul back on the control stick, blood draining from his head due to G-force, Goodson managed to bring the third Focke-Wulf into view ahead. I was turning tighter than I ever had before. I didn't think the P-47 could turn that tight, but I did it, Goodson later recalled. The enemy pilot was engrossed in opening fire on Blakesley's thunderbolt, ahead as Goodson closed the distance between them. It seemed to take forever for him to fill the glass, but once he did, I let him have it. He settled on the fighter's tail and opened fire. 
Blakesley was doing everything he could to evade the relentless FW-190 on his tail, to no avail. His control surfaces were riddled, and the big thunderbolt was not responding well. Goodson remembered. I radioed, hang on, horseback, I'm coming. And Don replied, hurry. The two Faka Wolfs were darting back and forth as they followed his evasive moves, and I followed. I was cutting the corner with each change, and it seemed like I was closing on the second enemy fighter. Finally, he was in range, and I fired. The first burst missed right as he bounced left, then the second missed behind. But the third time, I got a good hit just behind the cockpit. I called to Don. I got the guy, but he yelled, the hell you've got him. He's got me. Goodson hung on. I fired again, and this time, pieces came off. Smoke started to pour out his exhaust. I gave him one last burst, and he flicked over to the right and went in. When he exploded on the ground just in front of me, I suddenly realized how low we were. Blakesley was in big trouble. His engine had been hit, and the big R-2800 was throwing oil out the cooling flaps. He later recalled, the forward fuselage and the canopy windscreen were covered in oil, and it was hard to see straight ahead. I looked in the rearview mirror, and that guy was hanging in right behind me. Goodson did everything he could to cut corners as he trailed the German leader, who hung grimly on Blakesley's tail. Closing, he opened fire and got hits, then fired again. All of a sudden, everything went silent. I was out of ammo, and that guy was still closing on Don. Goodson sliced to the side where the German could see him, then turned in on the Focke Wolf as though entering a gunnery pass. He suddenly glanced over his shoulder and saw me. I tried closing, hoping he'd break. Finally, he tipped over and banked steep, streaming contrails, and he pulled out just over the threes. Now all we had to do was get across the channel and hope we didn't run across anybody as good as that guy was. Wehrman remembered. We finally caught up to Colonel Don, his airplane was a real chewed up mess. Goody asked if he could make it, and he replied he had to run the engine full throttle just to stay in the air. There was a real chance he could run out of gas that way. The three Thunderbolts turned back for England. We attracted inquisitive 190s a few times on the way out, but Goody would turn at them with me, and they'd dive away before either of us could open fire. We didn't chase them, and would just turn back to Colonel Don. Goodson remembered glancing at his fuel gauges. I'd been running balls out so long I was close to empty. All we could do was keep on. I knew Don must have been really low, and Bob had to be nearly out too, keeping up with me. They continued on, Goodson recalled. We saw a pair that started to turn in on us, but I banked toward them with Bob, and they thought better of it. I couldn't tell anyone I was out of ammo, since the Germans were listening to us. Finally, the P-47s crossed out of France, north of Calais. Blakesley was down to only a few gallons. Goodson remembered. It seemed to take forever, and I had one eye glued on the gas gauge. After what seemed like an hour, but was only a few minutes when I glanced at my watch, I could see the white cliffs of Dover. Soon, Manston's big grass runway appeared. Wehrman remembered. Goody fired off a red flare and they cleared us straight in. Colonel Don couldn't see out front to land because of all the oil on his canopy. So Goody flew beside him and let him in. Fortunately, Manston had the biggest, widest, longest runway in England. Blakesley touched down, and moments later, he ran out of gas as he rolled down the runway. Goodson pulled up, came back around, and landed with Wehrman. Blakesley was already out of his airplane when Goodson and Wehrman taxied up and shut down. Wehrman remembered. I was still sort of in a daze from everything, and I sat there in my cockpit after I shut down. Goody got out and went over to check Colonel Don, then he came over and climbed up by me. He told me it was a good show and said, I don't know how you stayed with me. To which I replied, neither do I. And then he told me that when he hit the third 190, he ran out of ammo. The whole trip back, I was the only one with guns. He couldn't tell me because he knew the Germans were listening to our radios. For Goodson, Wehrman's cool response, hey, Goody, the next time you're planning a milk run, be sure to include me got him the permanent job of wingman. A guy who can do that on his first mission, he's the one you want with you every time. The two were friends for the rest of their lives. With the two Focke-Wulfs added to the other two he had claimed in June and July, and the BF-109 he had claimed in the RAF, James A. Goodson was now an ace 
and on the way to ultimately leading the fourth's scoring list. While Goodson and Wehrman had been saving Blakesley, the rest of the group had gotten involved in a big fight with the Focke-Wulfs of JG-26 and returned to Debden with pilots receiving credit for 18 destroyed, the group's best one-day record since entering combat. Finally, on the night of August 16th, the weather forecast showed clearing over England sufficient to allow the bombers to take off and form up and weather over the targets clear enough for precision bombing. Eker gave the order. 8th Bomber Command Mission No. 84 was a go. It was the anniversary of the first 8th Bomber Command mission, as well as the first day of the Quebec Conference. General Eker expected to have good news for General Arnold in 24 hours. Heinz Konoka later recorded in his diary that his pilots were awakened early and the Staffel was told to fly to Rheina in Germany, 120 miles away. Just before they were to take off, they were ordered to fly instead to Gilza Ryan. They arrived at 11.15 hours. Following his success with the air-to-air bombing tactic, Kanoka's Staffel had been involved in testing the new W.GR.21 unguided rockets, and they were told that they would use them today against the expected enemy raid. The Regensburg force was estimated to be airborne for 11 hours the force would have to take off between 0630 and 0800 hours. British double summer time to allow for two hours of climb and assembly, with the bombers reaching North Africa in daylight. LeMay was confident his force would meet that timing. Since the crews of the fourth wing were all qualified for instrument takeoffs, they could fly through whatever clouds might be over England until they broke into clear skies and then assemble. Unfortunately, only LeMay's airmen were so trained. Dawn on August 17th found England covered in fog, contrary to the forecast. The takeoff time for the Regensburg force was delayed three times as the fog refused to burn off. By 0800 hours, the last possible time for the fourth wing to take off, the fog had cleared sufficiently over the wing's East Anglia airfields for the B-17s to take off. Despite the fact that attacking both targets close to simultaneously was deemed critical for success, the Regensburg force was ordered to take off while the first wing's airfields in the Midlands remained fog-bound. Once airborne, the bombers climbed through 10,000 feet of cloud before breaking into clear air. By the time the fog had sufficiently cleared over the first wing's field, the Regensburg force was making landfall across the channel over the Netherlands. The Schweinfurt force would have to delay their takeoff until the escorts could return and refuel. The Jagdwaffe would now have more than enough time to land, refuel, and be airborne to meet the second force. The first wing would have to fight their way to the target and then fight their way home. The first wing's bombers did not begin taking off until 11.15 hours, a three-hour gap. The fighters had similar difficulty with the weather. The 56th Hub Zemke later remembered that when he saw the poor weather that dawn at Halesworth, He doubted that the group could fly the mission because only a few pilots in the group had sufficient instrument experience to take off into the clouds and climb to assembly in clear air. When I called General Hunter to express my misgivings, he reminded me that this was a maximum effort mission and ended the conversation by saying, I suggest you better think of going on this mission. His meaning was clear. At the pre-takeoff briefing, Zemke outlined a new takeoff procedure. After takeoff by element pairs, each pair would make a wide circuit of the field below the cloud base, then commence climbing on a predetermined heading, holding this until they broke out into the clear, with the element leader flying on instruments and the wingman maintaining visual contact with his leader. As it turned out, the cloud cover was not as thick as expected, and the P-47s popped free of the clouds at around 5,000 feet and were able to establish their formation without trouble. Curtis LeMay flew as co-pilot of the lead bomber. The fourth wing was composed of seven bomb groups, and 146 B-17s were airborne behind him. Due to his relentless training, the bombers were in tight, provisional combat wing formations. LeMay's formation consisted of three groups, the 96th, 388th, and 390th, followed in trail by two wing boxes with two groups each in echelon formation. The first box was composed of the 94th and 385th groups, 
with the 95th and 100th groups forming the second. Unfortunately, the overall length of the formation was too much for effective fighter support. The third wing formation was 15 miles behind the first, almost out of visual range. Two P-47 groups had been assigned for escort, but only one arrived on time at the rendezvous, with the second 15 minutes late, again due to the English weather. The RAF Spitfire escorts were forced to break off as the formation entered Dutch airspace. The P-47s could only stay with the bombers as far as Open, 15 minutes further inland after crossing the coast. Approaching Open, the German fighter formations could be seen in the distance, waiting for the American fighters to turn back. The P-47s reversed course, and the first 12 o'clock high attack hit LeMay's formation three minutes later. Kanoka's Staffel was among the attackers. The Messerschmitts had trailed the groups of fortresses as they headed southwest and kept off to the side while they waited for the moment the Spitfires would turn back for England. Minutes after the Allied fighters turned away, Kanoka led his fighters to attack the bombers over Aachen. As Kanoka closed on the formation, he was hit in the left wing before he could open fire and the left stovepipe was shot away. With a large hole in the wing and the loss of the weight of the mortar, he was barely able to hold the unbalanced aircraft on an even keel. Fearing that the main spar was damaged, making it possible the wing would come off completely under too great strain, he avoided any sharp maneuvers that would increase G-load and fired his second rocket at the formation. Oberfeldwebel's Führmann and Fest each scored direct hits that exploded the B-17s in midair. The others fired their rockets without effect. Kanoka recalled, My own rocket also passes through the middle of the formation without hitting anything. Kanoka immediately landed at Bonn, where he taxied to the repair depot, and a maintenance inspector confirmed that the main spar in the left wing was broken, which put him out of action for the rest of the day. Fortunately, the BF-109 had separate left and right wings, and overnight the repair depot fitted an entire new wing. The battle continued for the next 90 minutes until the German fighters were forced to break off, low on fuel and ammunition. By then, at least 15 bombers, including 13 from the third wing box, had been shot down or fatally damaged. Colonel Bieren Ley Jr., at the time 8th Bomber Command's official historian, who would later co-author the novel and screenplay 12 O'Clock High, flew as a co-pilot with the 100th group in a B-17 named Piccadilly Lady. He later remembered. After we had been under attack for a solid hour, it appeared our group was faced with annihilation. Seven had been shot down. The sky was still mottled with rising fighters, with the target still 35 minutes away. I doubt if a man in the group visualized the possibility of our getting much further without 100% loss. Near the IP, the initial point for the bomb run, one hour and a half after the first of at least 200 individual fighter attacks, the pressure eased off, although hostiles were nearby. The bloody hundredth lost nine of the 21 B-17s sent on the mission. The 131 survivors soon saw Regensburg ahead. Visibility was clear, and the flak over the target was light. At 11.43 hours British time, LeMay's bombardier called, Bombs away! And the 126 B-17s dropped 299 tons of bombs on the Messerschmitt factories, with a high degree of accuracy. LeMay then led the bombers in a turn south toward the snow-covered Alps in the distance. The move took the defenders by surprise, and only a few BF-110s and JU-88s were able to attack. They were soon forced to disengage due to low fuel. Two badly damaged B-17s turned away from the formation and headed toward neutral Switzerland and internment. As the formation flew south over the Ligurian Sea, past Italy, another badly damaged bomber turned away and crash-landed ashore. Five more ditched into the Mediterranean. The 122 survivors finally arrived at Ilergma. The force had lost 24 either in direct combat or as the result of combat damage. Of those that managed to land, 60 had varying degrees of damage. Many would never return to England left to rot on the airfields in Tunisia because they could not be repaired. LeMay's force had hit Regensburg as hard as possible, 
blanketing the entire factory complex with high-explosive and incendiary bombs that damaged all the important buildings at the plant and destroying a number of finished, single-engine fighters on the field. However, the machine tools in the factories were largely unharmed because the bombs dropped were not big enough to create blast damage strong enough to affect these large machines. In fact, workers were able to clean up the factory within a week and commence production regardless of the fact the roofs were missing. Despite an immediate 34% loss of production, fighter production was quickly restored. The nine groups of the first bombardment wing put up a maximum effort with four three-group wing boxes. In addition to the formal group organizations and formations, a third composite group was formed of a squadron of spare aircraft from each of the eight groups to make up the formation of four wing boxes. The first task force was formed of the 201st Provisional Combat Wing, PCBW, made up of the 91st and 381st groups, and the 101st Composite Group, and the 202nd PCBW, which contained the 351st and 384th groups, and the 306th Composite Group. The second task force was formed of the 203rd PCBW, with the 306th, 305th, and 92nd groups, and the 204th PCBW composed of the 379th and 303rd groups, and the 103rd composite group. The bombers of the first wing were unable to begin taking off until 11.30 hours to allow the escorts to return and refuel. They followed the same route taken by LeMay's bombers. Due to their late start, 11 and 83 groups of the RAF put up 96 Spitfires to escort the B-17s as far as Antwerp, where the P-47s would pick them up to take them as far as open. The force was expected to enter European airspace at an altitude of 23,500 to 25,000 feet, but on approaching the coast at 1330 hours, the clouds were so thick at that level that the commander of the first task force elected to take the bombers down and cross the coast under the clouds at 17,000 feet. This time, the German fighter attacks began before the escorts were forced to leave. Over 300 fighters from as far afield as Norway were called in to the battle. The 201st PCBW was subjected to nearly continuous head-on attacks. Although the Spitfires claimed eight victories, the fights burned so much gas so fast that they were forced to break off early. Unfortunately, the 78th Group, which was supposed to relieve the Spitfires over Antwerp, arrived eight minutes late due to the adverse weather. The bombers had been left unprotected for seven deadly minutes. The P-47s were immediately engaged by large German formations and were forced to break off after only ten minutes' combat to return with two victory claims. Finally, at 1436 hours, the bombers turned over Worms. German controllers now knew the target was Schweinfurt. Losses in the lead wing were severe. By the time that the bombers were 15 miles from Schweinfurt, fighters had shot down 22 of the 57 B-17s in the formation. General Williams himself took over a machine gun in a cheek blister of the bomber he was in, firing it until the barrel burned out. At 1430 hours, the fighters were instructed by their ground controllers to break off and land at the nearest airfield to rearm and refuel. This was unexpected by the Americans, who had believed the fighters would return to their own bases. There was no fighter belt of single-seaters to be penetrated by the formations. Five miles from Schweinfurt, the formation turned on its attack heading. The sky ahead was filled with black clouds and flashing explosions as the enemy anti-aircraft guns put an effective flak barrage in front of the attackers. Three B-17s went down after being hit over the target. The 40 surviving B-17s of the lead wing arrived over the target and began unloading their bombs at 1457 hours. The 143 bombers following bombed the five factories over the next 24 minutes. The bombing accuracy of each combat box was increasingly hindered by the heavy smoke from the preceding bomb explosions. A total 424 tons of bombs, including 125 bombs of incendiaries, was dropped on Schweinfurt. Each combat wing reassembled over Meiningen before turning west toward Brussels. Enemy fighters reappeared at 1530 hours, concentrating their attacks on damaged bombers that had fallen out of formation. 
Among the attackers was Kanoka, who had decided to fly again regardless of the damage to his fighter's wing. He gathered the young pilots who had landed at Hangalar Airfield outside Bonn for refueling and informed them that he would lead them as an impromptu formation against the bombers as they headed for home. Kanoka led his Staffel off in a large, compact group at 1,700 hours. The Americans were now homeward bound. He had to handle his plane like a basket of eggs, climbing to an altitude of 7,000 meters, 23,000 feet. They saw the formation of about 250 fortresses directly ahead. They closed in on them gradually, until Kanoka was able to send the individual Staffel members in to attack one by one. I myself remain behind the enemy formation and pick off as my target a lone fortress flying off to the left and a little below the main body. At a range of 500 feet, I open fire in short bursts. The American defenses reply. Their tracers come whizzing all around me, uncomfortably near my head. The usual pearl necklaces become thicker and thicker. Once again, there is altogether too much of this blasted metal in the air. I am at a grave disadvantage in that I have to fly behind the massed enemy group for several minutes without being able to take evasive action. I keep looking anxiously at my wing with the hole in it. Suddenly, my poor plane is literally caught in a hail of fire. There is a smell of burning cordite. The engine still seems to run smoothly, however. I bend double up behind it. It offers good enough cover. Closing up to within 300 feet, I take aim calmly at my victim. Vumph! My fuselage is hit. The sound is more hollow than that made by the engine or wings. Kanoka's fire caught the B-17 on fire as it swerved off to the left and dropped away below the formation. He saw four parachutes mushroom open. Suddenly, his fighter was hit several times in succession and badly shaken. It sounds like a sack of potatoes being emptied over a barrel in which I am sitting. The engine caught fire and the smoke filled his cockpit. He pushed open the side vents, but the smoke only grew more dense. As he broke away from the bomber formation, he saw the fortress he had set on fire crash in the Eiffel Mountains below. Finally, he was forced to cut off his engine as oil sprayed from under the cowling. The flames subside. The fire is out. I pull the emergency release and jettison the canopy. The slipstream rush takes my breath away at first. The wind tugs at my helmet and whips the scarf from my neck. Shall I bail out? My Gustav has been shot full of holes, but it still flies. Hoping to stretch his glide far enough to get back to Hengelar Field, he saw the Rhine ahead and crossed it with the altimeter still reading 4,000 meters, 13,100 feet. When the fighter dropped to 3,000 meters, 9,800 feet, he tried the engine, hoping to keep the plane airborne. With a clattering bang, the engine started. Not daring to touch the throttle, he climbed back gingerly to 4,000 meters. The engine started to smoke again and smell burnt. Before the engine could catch fire, he switched off again. There was no chance of making Hangalar. As he got lower, he began searching for a likely crash landing spot. Picking out what looked like a large field, he spiraled down toward it. The ground came rushing up at a terrific speed. He prepared for a belly landing and once again switched on the ignition. The engine started and he was able to reach the landing field. Suddenly, the engine begins to grind and clatter to a standstill for the last time. Cut! It has seized. The prop is rigid, held as if by a vice. My plane becomes heavy and unresponsive to the controls. It begins to stall, and the left wing drops. Damn! I push the nose down hard and regain control. Houses flash past below in a nearby village. My airspeed indicator registers 100 kilometers per hour, 65 miles per hour. I almost scraped the tops of some tall trees below. Slowing, I must touch down. My wingtips scrape the treetops, and then I smash through two or three wooden fences. The splintering posts and crossbars fly in all directions. Dust and chunks of earth hurtle into the air. I hit the ground, bounce, bracing myself for the crash, hard against the safety belt, with feet clamped on the rudder pedals. The 109 bounced over a dike and came to a crashing stop. He unfastened the safety belt and dragged himself out of the cockpit. My Gustav looks like an old bucket which has been well kicked around and trampled underfoot. It is a total wreck. There is nothing left intact except the tailwheel. The 56th group was able to push 15 miles past open by staying at 20,000 feet 
to use all the gas in the unpressurized ferry tanks it carried. It then initiated a climb to 23,000 feet to meet the bombers. They surprised the enemy fighters still harrying the bombers when they arrived on the scene at 1630 hours. The Thunderbolts tore into the enemy formations, and in the ensuing fight, First Lieutenant Glenn Schiltz and Captain Gerald Johnson each scored three, with Captain Bud Mahurin putting in a claim for two, while the rest of the group claimed 11 more for a loss of three P-47s. The 353rd Group, led by the 56th Flying Executive Lieutenant Colonel Lauren McCollum, after losing its group commander, arrived on the scene at 1640 hours, just west of Open. Between then and 1700 hours, the 93 P-47s of the two groups and a further 95 RAF Spitfires claimed 21 victories, but eight more B-17s went down to fighter attacks before the lead formation crossed the Dutch coast. Three more ditched in the North Sea. The 353rd's performance under McCollum's leadership was such that General Hunter confirmed him as permanent group commander that night. He was replaced as flying executive in the 56th by Dave Schilling, commander of the 62nd Squadron. Both groups were forced to break off combat west of Antwerp due to fuel shortage. Zemke, who had shot down a BF-110 in a formation attacking the bombers, recalled that the group had been in action no more than seven minutes before they were forced to break off and head for Halesworth, carefully monitoring fuel gauges. He wondered how the other groups had fared, and later learned that the 56th had claimed all but two of the enemy fighters claimed by P-47s over the entire mission. Total losses on the Schweinfurt mission were 36 missing and nearly 100 with varying degrees of damage. Of the 601 crewmen lost, 102 were killed and 481 became prisoners of war, with 18 missing. The defending gunners claimed 288 fighters shot down, while fighter escorts claimed another 31 for both missions. The Jagdwaffe units reported 25 fighters destroyed, with 15 pilots parachuting safely. While the German losses were comparatively light, one of the 10 pilots killed that day was Major Wilhelm Ferdinand Wutz Garland, Gruppenkommandor of 2nd Group JG-26, and an experta credited with 55 victories, including eight fortresses, later judged to have been one of the two victories credited to Bud Mahurin. He was the middle brother of General der Jagdflieger Adolf Garland. The three Garland brothers, Adolf, Wilhelm Ferdinand, and Paul, had all joined the Luftwaffe before the war and become fighter pilots. Paul, the youngest, had been the first lost when he was shot down during the Luftwaffe fighter-bomber attack against Canterbury on October 31, 1942, one of the last daylight raids over England. Wutz, who was considered by those who served with both him and his older brother to be Adolf's equal in skill as a fighter pilot and a leader, had become well-known to the fighter pilots of both sides during his two years on the Channel Front. Under his leadership, 2nd Group JG-26 had been judged by Allied intelligence to be the most effective and dangerous of the German fighter units opposing 8th Fighter Command. Bomb damage assessment photos of Schweinfurt revealed that the two largest factories suffered 80 direct hits and extensive fire damage. But again, the bombs were not powerful enough to completely destroy the heavy precision machinery that produced the ball bearings. Even so, and despite the operational fumbles, the raid dealt Schweinfurt a hard blow. German armaments minister Albert Speer later wrote in his memoirs Inside the Third Reich that the attack resulted in a 38% drop in ball-bearing production. Output was so sparse in the weeks following that factories using ball-bearings sent men with knapsacks to pick up as many bearings as could be found. There were stocks on hand sufficient only to cover six to eight weeks' production. Speer wrote, after the raid, we anxiously asked ourselves how soon the enemy would realize that he could paralyze the production of thousands of armament plants merely by destroying five or six relatively small targets. He declared that if three more missions could have been flown to Schweinfurt over the following four weeks, then the jig would have been up. General Eker gave the impression of victory where none existed, writing of Schweinfurt Regensburg. It was a bold and strategic concept, one of the most significant and remarkable air battles of the Second World War. The flight crews demonstrated a determination and courage seldom equaled and never surpassed in warfare. 
our bombers could and did press through to their assigned targets. This battle resulted in the recall of many squadrons of German fighters from the Eastern Front at a critical time there, in a vain effort to meet the bomber onslaught. The one part of Eker's statement that was accurate was that Luftwaffe fighter units were withdrawn from the Eastern Front and returned to Germany. The truth was that 8th Bomber Command was in no position to mount further raids in such operational conditions of enemy air superiority over the target. Because of the losses on August 17th and poor weather over Germany for almost the entire month of September, 8th Bomber Command could only mount a small number of short missions carried out with fighter escort. There was an unintended result to the raid that would have long-term influence on the air campaign. Although the Luftwaffe had inflicted heavy losses on the Regensburg and Schweinfurt raiders, the writing was on the wall that the Allies were growing stronger and that they would not be set back by the day's events. Fingers were increasingly pointed at the Luftwaffe's chief of staff, General Oberst Hans Jaschanik. A World War I pilot, Jaschanik had hitched his star to Hitler and the Nazis soon after they took power. His slavish devotion to Hitler and Göring had led to quick promotions, with a meteoric rise from Hauptmann in 1932 to General Major in 1939. His toadying to Göring saw him appointed Chief of the Luftwaffe General Staff in November 1938 at age 39, following the death of General Voltaire Weber. With Hitler insisting on a rapid buildup of the Luftwaffe, Jaschanik canceled Weber's program to develop four-engine strategic bombers in favor of presenting his leaders with a larger force of twin-engine bombers, despite the fact that this would mean the Luftwaffe would lack the capability necessary to defeat Britain. In addition, his policies neglected industrial production, military intelligence, logistics, air defense, and the creation of reserves in order to please Hitler and Göring neither of whom had the slightest understanding of what an Air Force needed to accomplish its goals, and his influence on Air Force development was almost entirely negative. He was a primary force in the decision not to make production of fighters the overriding priority. As American daylight raids grew in number and intensity in 1943, Göring faced increasing criticism in light of his pre-war assurances that no enemy bombers would appear over Germany, made Yashonik his whipping boy blaming his decisions for the lack of success against the Americans. Following the raids on August 17th, Goering excoriated his chief of staff for his failures. That night, RAF Bomber Command carried out the Pinamundo Raid, dealing a serious blow to German rocket development. Informed the next morning of the raid by his adjutant, Yashanik went into his room and committed suicide. Although his management of the Air Force had been faulty, he had been personally popular with the airmen, and his death left a void in the Luftwaffe command at a difficult time, which would not be filled. Chapter 10. Carrying On As 8th Bomber Command struggled to meet its commitment under Point Blank during the summer and fall of 1943, losses continued to grow. Schweinfurt Regensburg was a shock to the system. Even for the missions that received full fighter escort support, the lack of fighters was problematic. Over the two months between the Schweinfurt-Regensburg mission and the return mission to Schweinfurt on October 14th, there were still only four operational fighter groups, all equipped with short-legged P-47s and 13 months of combat, had confirmed that fighter advocates were right. Bombers needed escorts if they were to survive. 8th Bomber Command did carry on, in spite of the losses. However, there were no further deep penetration missions while its losses were made good. On August 19th, all four fighter groups escorted the bombers to hit Gilza Ryan and Flushing Airdromes in Belgium. The escorts claimed nine destroyed, two probably destroyed, and four damaged for the loss of one Thunderbolt. Zemke recalled that the Germans thought this was another long-range attack and sent up the Luftwaffe as soon as the first bomber crossed the coast. Back at Halesworth, the 56th claimed nine destroyed and three damaged. The other three groups only claimed probables. Three weeks earlier, the 56th had been considered the least successful of 8th Fighter Command's groups. Now it was in the lead, with 28 victories claimed in just two missions. 
Zemke was gratified that Gerald Johnson had claimed a BF-109, making him the group's first ace, and was particularly proud that they had sustained no losses in the battle. Five days later, the Thunderbolts escorted another raid on the Villa Coublet Air Depot outside Paris that was unopposed because of the escort's presence. On August 27th, 178 P-47s from all four groups provided penetration, target, and withdrawal support for the first bombing of a V-1 launch site under construction at Watton, France. This time, JG-2's FW-190s rose to defend the target, and the escorts claimed eight shot down. By late August, the 56th Group had found there were benefits to having been moved to the relative isolation of Halesworth. The fact that it was the easternmost of all 8th Fighter Command stations meant the group could maximize its time over the continent, since the pilots did not have to fly so far to get to the fight or get home. Colonel Zemke remembered that the contractors finally began to make good progress in constructing barracks, allowing the men to move out of the cold, tar paper shacks that were all that was available when they first arrived. He also remembered that there was less trouble over women as when they were near the big towns. The venereal disease rate was nil in August. Simke was also glad to learn that General Monk Hunter, who he had never thought had what was needed to lead 8th Fighter Command, was being replaced by Brigadier General William Kepner, whom Zemke remembered from his days at Langley when he was a fledgling second lieutenant and knew to be an able commander. On the other hand, the 56th commander was more convinced than ever that the 65th Wing, which was responsible for operational command of the fighter groups, was unduly influenced by the 4th Fighter Group, given that the wing staff was based at Saffron Walden, a small village not far from Debden. On September 1st, Colonel Chesley Peterson, at 23 the youngest full bird colonel in U.S. history, led the 4th on a rodeo near Formerly as their new commander after Colonel Anderson was promoted to Brigadier General. As with most fighter sweeps, the Focke Wolfs and Messerschmitts refused to take notice of their presence in the French sky. Things were different two days later, on September 3rd, when the Eagles escorted the heavies to bomb JG-26's home base at Abbeville. FW-190s rose to defend the base, and the attack was broken up by the 336th Squadron, which failed to score when the Germans dived for the ground after the initial pass. On September 3rd, Zemke led the Wolf Pack on an escort to bomb airfields in France. Just as they were relieved by the arrival of the 353rd Group, a formation of FW-190s was spotted, and Zemke led the attack. As he closed to attack the element leader of a flight of four, tracers flashed past his wing that he thought came from his wingman opening fire too soon. He closed to 400 yards and fired a long burst, getting no strikes, then fired two more bursts, and the 190 caught fire, belching smoke. He skidded after number two, but the enemy were now alerted and broke away. Using the momentum of his dive, he zoomed up to gain altitude, practicing what he preached to the others, strike and recover. Back at Halesworth, he found 20 millimeter holes in his prop. Another enemy flight had been followed and had opened up on his flight when they dived to attack. On September 4th, Zemke led three 12-plane squadrons to escort B-17s bombing an airfield near Brussels. Once they were over the target, the clouds forced the Thunderbolts to fly at 23,000 feet, between cloud layers nearly level with the bombers. When the mission leader was unable to find the target in the poor weather, he called off the mission, since there was too much chance of dropping the bombs on civilian areas, with the poor visibility. As the bomber formations crossed the coasts, Zemke decided to circle back one more time to cover any stragglers. Visibility was poor, and the sun was now low, making it difficult to look to the west. Suddenly, he heard an alarmed, Yardstick lead! Break left! Filling his headphones. Instinctively, he pulled the stick hard over. As he started into the turn, he heard a loud ping above the roar of the engine, and the instrument panel shattered. With the impetus of fear, he skidded into a dive. A glance at the gauges that were left showed all power was gone. I couldn't see a pursuer in the mirror, so I eased out of the dive and tried to prime the engine to life. Nothing. There was nothing to do but bail out. But just as he was about to slide back the canopy, the engine coughed and sputtered and came back to life. Realizing instantly that the turbo supercharger in the rear must have taken a hit, 
causing the engine to die through insufficient air to the carburetor, he cautiously leveled off, turned out over the coast, and made sure there were no Fakavurs in the vicinity. Confidence returned, and I had no further difficulty getting back to Halesworth. Back on the ground, his diagnosis was proven correct when it was discovered that a 20-millimeter shell had hit the turbo. The P-47 had also taken a 30-millimeter hit, severing a trim control cable in the wing route. No one had seen the 190s dive out of the clouds, and the other two pilots in his flight, Lieutenants Wilfred Van Abel and Walter Hannigan, had both been shot down, with Hannigan killed and Van Abel a prisoner. The outfit that hit us turned out to be 2nd Group JG-26, the same boys we had decimated on August 17th. The fact that 8th Bomber Command was limited in its operations to the radius of action of the short-ranged P-47 was seen by all as preventing the command from fulfilling its reason for existence under Point Blank. Eker had constantly requested replacements for the P-38 units originally assigned to 8th Fighter Command that had been taken away a year before for the North African campaign. Finally, by the end of August, it seemed his requests were about to be answered. The problem was that there was a high demand for P-38s in all theaters, which could not be met due to the fact that the P-38 was difficult to mass produce. The original YP-38s had been hand-built, and producibility had not been a consideration when Kelly Johnson and his design staff created the airplane, since at the time, total production was expected to be limited to only 60 aircraft. The P-38 F and G that were the first of the breed considered combat-capable had only started to come off the production lines shortly before those first four groups had deployed to England over the summer and fall of 1942. Every Air Force command was crying for the fighter. It had proven itself capable of taking on Japanese fighters over New Guinea and the Solomons that were feared by the pilots of P-39s, P-40s, and F-4Fs. A squadron of P-38s had been the only aircraft capable of intercepting and killing Japanese Admiral Yamamoto. Engine cooling had been a persistent problem with the P-38 from the outset. The problem was due to the fact that the designers had installed the smallest possible radiators to keep the sleek shape and used pipes in the leading edge of the outer wing to cool the small intercoolers, circulating the air out to the wingtip and back. This had proven insufficient to cool the engines of the P-38F and G, which were heavier and more powerful than the engines used in the first P-38s. The design had been revised in early 1943 to use larger intercooler cores mounted in a chin fairing, with larger radiators mounted on the booms. While this was less streamlined and aerodynamically efficient, performance was improved by installing more powerful Allison engines providing 140% more power than the engines used in the prototypes. The result was the P-38J, the first P-38 to approach the performance hoped for at the outset. However, the wartime supply chain was not always smooth functioning. Lockheed's subcontractors were initially unable to supply both production lines with a sufficient quantity of new intercooler cores and radiators. The P-38 was only produced at the Lockheed factory in Burbank, California. P-38 airframes, sans engines, continued to come off the line, and fighters minus intercoolers and radiators now sat on Empire Avenue at the foot of the Lockheed Burbank Airport, stretching across the San Fernando Valley some two miles to where the road passed under the main Pacific Coast Railroad tracks. Lockheed's solution to the bottleneck was the creation of the P-38H, a hybrid between the earlier P-38F-G series and the more developed P-38J. Beginning in May 1943, the P-38s parked on Empire Avenue were equipped with the earlier intercoolers and radiators of the P-38F-G with the new Allison V-1710F-17 engines of the P-38J that provided 1,425 horsepower. At higher boost levels, the air temperature from the intercoolers could increase above limits, with the engine subject to detonation if it was operated at high power for extended periods of time. Thus, the P-38H was limited in performance by the necessity of reduced power settings that did not allow use of the maneuvering flap system, which allowed the P-38 to maneuver successfully against more maneuverable, single-seat opponents. General Spatz had said of the P-38, I'd rather have an airplane that goes like hell and has a few things wrong with it than one that won't go like hell and has a few things wrong with it. 
the Air Force now found itself with 601 unplanned P-38s, which were used on an interim basis to let 5th Air Force in New Guinea expand the number of squadrons flying P-38s, while two groups equipped with this model could now be sent to England for 8th Fighter Command, and the 1st, 14th, and 82nd groups in Italy could be reinforced and assigned to the 15th Air Force, the newly organized strategic bombing force that was to take on the bombing campaign against Axis forces in Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary, as well as southern Germany. The P-38 returned to 8th Fighter Command with the arrival of the 55th Fighter Group on September 4th. The 55th Pursuit Group, Interceptor, had been constituted on November 20th, 1940, and activated on January 15th, 1941. The group was originally equipped with the Republic P-43, the first of Alexander Codfrelli's fighter designs to feature turbo supercharging. In May 1942, the unit became the 55th Fighter Group when the Army Air Forces dropped the designation Pursuit. In late 1942, the group commenced conversion to the Lockheed P-38 Lightning as P-38F and G models became available and was fully equipped by early 1943. As with other groups that had trained on the P-38 earlier, pilot attrition during training was high due to the compressibility problems associated with the aircraft. Because of this danger, pilots became hesitant to fly the airplane to its limits, a necessity in combat that would hinder the use of the P-38 until the anti-compressibility dive flaps that Lockheed was experimenting with became available in the summer of 1944. Unfortunately, this would adversely affect the P-38's use in 8th Fighter Command. With the availability of the P-38H beginning in May and June 1943, the unit re-equipped and was designated for operations with 8th Fighter Command. The 55th was notified in late July that it would be transferring to England. Personnel received two weeks' leave during August while the unit's equipment was prepared for shipment. The 300 officers and 3,000 enlisted men of the group boarded the transport HMS Orion and departed New York for England on August 25th, arriving in Liverpool on September 4th. They were then transported to their operating base at Nothamstead, near Colchester in East Anglia. The 55th was the first long-range fighter escort group, and there was considerable pressure from 8th Fighter Command for it to become operational as quickly as possible, since plans were already being drawn up for a second mission to Schweinfurt. However, nothing could happen until its airplanes were delivered. A week after the 55th arrived in England, the 20th Fighter Group, also operating P-38s, arrived. This group would take even longer to become operational than the 55th, due to the fact that it was second in line to receive the limited number of P-38s that were becoming available in Europe. On September 6th, 8th Bomber Command sent 400 heavy bombers, a new record in numbers as the four B-17 groups that had arrived during the summer became operational, to Stuttgart to bomb the VKF ball-bearing factory. The three B-24 groups had returned from the Mediterranean at the end of August, with their losses replaced, and added to the force's numbers. Escort was provided inbound and outbound by 176 P-47s, but the Germans refused to engage while the Thunderbolts were present. Once the escorts left, the Jagdwaffe shot down 45 bombers, 10% of the attacking force. The value of full mission escort was driven home over the next four days when three fully escorted missions to the Low Countries and northern France saw no German response. On September 10th, a deep penetration mission to Anklam Marienburg resulted in 28 bombers lost, 8% of the force, while 30 more were lost the next day over Munster, 13% of the attacking force. Eighth Bomber Command could not continue in the face of such casualties. The defenders had reverted to the strategy used during the RAF's nonstop offensive in 1941, attacking only when they had the advantage. The 78th's Ernie Russell who finally flew his first combat mission during this period, remembered. Generally, when the Germans did respond, it was just a few who checked we intruders from a superior altitude and tactical position, and if the odds were not to their liking, they would split S and easily elude us. As we crossed in, the RAF controller broke through the German static. Gray wall leader, there are bogeys at 11 o'clock, 30 miles, angels 27. Then, gray wall, red leader, bogeys at 10 o'clock high. 
Looking around frantically, I suddenly sighted them. I was fascinated. There were about 12 of the most strikingly beautiful but lethal FW-190s I could imagine, flying parallel to and several thousand feet above us. They must have determined not to engage us as they hung there for a minute or two, then split est and dove, vertically toward the deck, accelerating at a tremendous rate. They were out of sight and range before we could engage them. I had been very fortunate. I had seen enemy fighters on my first combat mission. I would fly nine more missions before I saw another enemy plane. Additionally, the escort policy limited what opportunities to fight did come along. The escorts were under orders not to attack German formations even when they were spotted forming for attack. An aggressive pilot like Peter Pompetti, who committed the offense of disregarding formation integrity to go after the enemy, could and did find himself removed from operations after repeated offenses. In part, this was due to the belief that the Thunderbolt could not take on German fighters, despite the record over the summer, but also because the number of escorting fighters would not allow greater regression that drew the escorts away, thus leaving the bombers open to additional attacks, while the fighters could be forced to withdraw early when they used their fuel more rapidly. Zemke, however, had adopted a strategy of placing the group's three squadrons around the bomber formation, with the two squadrons to either side separated into two sections at different altitudes, while the third squadron became a freelance, flying above the formation and joining in any fights that developed. He credited this strategy with the group's recent successes. In written reports and conversations with my superiors, I was careful not to elaborate on just how loose our close escort had become, letting results establish the worth of these attacks. The 55th welcomed its first P-38Hs on September 21st. Eighth Fighter Command wanted them operational immediately, but the pilots needed the opportunity to learn ETO conditions before they could be committed to combat. Within a week, 48 Lightnings were in their revetments at Nut Hampstead. Once they began flying over England, two things were immediately apparent. The cockpit heating system was completely inadequate to provide a working environment for the pilot in the cold temperatures at 25,000 feet and higher, altitudes they had not flown at in the States. And the engines seemed more touchy than before. Incidents of engine detonation happened during their high-altitude training. The group engineers quickly determined that flying at high cruise power at high altitude for an extended period, then pushing the engines immediately into high power for combat, was practically guaranteed to lead to detonation, which could lead to failure of one or both engines. The first problem was dealt with by providing pilots with so much increased clothing that it was hard to maneuver the controls once seated in the cockpit. Unfortunately, even this was not enough to overcome the inadequate heating system. One pilot later recalled that his feet were almost warm while his head and hands were painfully cold. The engine problem would never be fully resolved, the fact that the problem did not manifest with P-38Hs flying in the 15th Air Force, despite being used under similar operating conditions, led some to lay blame on the lower-quality British aviation gasoline used by the 8th, while the Air Forces in the Mediterranean used U.S. aviation gasoline. This theory was supported by the fact that nearly all other American air units in the United Kingdom had been forced to switch from their U.S. to British spark plugs, which reduced plug fouling from the lower-quality fuel. Unfortunately, all this meant that the group was not declared operational in time to fly the Schweinfurt mission. On September 22nd, a group of replacement pilots arrived at Debden. Among them were two young pilots who would make names for themselves in the group. John T. Godfrey, the second of three brothers who had been born in Canada to English parents, then raised in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, had finally achieved his dream of being a fighter pilot. Following his graduation from high school in June 1941, he tried to get to Canada to join the RCAF, but his mother notified the FBI and he was arrested twice for violation of the Neutrality Act. Finally understanding his determination, his parents agreed to let him go, and he joined the RCAF in August, graduating from flight school in October 1942. While in flight training, he was told of the death of his older brother Reggie whose ship was sunk while he was on his way to Britain. He had become obsessed with avenging the brother he had adored. After arriving in England in early 1943, he remained with the RCAF until he transferred to the USAAF in April 1943. He was assigned to the 336th Squadron, where he originally roomed with Bob Wehrman, 
whose roommate had been shot down the week before. Wehrman had met Godfrey when both were in advanced training with the RAF and described him as being shy at first and a bit standoffish, but once she got to know him, he was one of the best. I felt fortunate to become his friend. Ralph Kidd Hofer had joined the RCAF on a lark. A native of Missouri, Hofer was an outstanding athlete, being especially adept at football and boxing, which he had taken up professionally. Visiting Detroit for a boxing match, he decided to visit Canada. When he crossed the bridge afoot, the immigration officer at the border assumed he was another would-be recruit and sent him to the RCAF recruiting office. Though he had no interest in airplanes or flying, the enthusiasm of the other Americans convinced him to enlist. He had demonstrated real skill during flight training, but shortly after arriving in England, he transferred to the USAAF. Once at Debden, Hofer was assigned to the 334th Squadron. The bombers did not appear again over Germany until September 27th, when the target was Emden. By this time, 8th Technical Division had created a new 108-gallon drop tank made of paper rather than aluminum, and British factories had produced enough of them that the P-47s could now carry one each on their belly shackles, extending their range 380 miles into Germany. With the new tanks, the fighters were able to cover the heavies inbound, over the target, and through withdrawal for targets in central West Germany. The 78th Group sent 45 Thunderbolts, led by Harry Dayhoff, headed for rendezvous 10 miles west of Emden, to provide target cover. Dayhoff led the 83rd Squadron at 27,000 feet, with the 84th at 29,000 feet, and the 82nd providing high cover at 32,000 feet. They arrived at the rendezvous to find 30 BF-109s making rocket-firing passes as two huge fireballs fell away from the formation. The Germans had no expectation of meeting American fighters, and the 78th hit them hard. Heinz Konoka's rocket-firing 5th Squadron JG-11 were the first Jagdwaffe pilots to be surprised by the P-47's new capability. The Staffel was called to readiness with the rest of 2nd Group JG-11 at 10.30 hours, and the pilots manned their planes at 10.45 hours. Takeoff was at 10.55 hours, with the fighters vectored to intercept the bombers as they crossed the North Sea coast north of their base at Yever. Kanoka later recalled that the day of the battle, the sky was completely overcast. Climbing through the clouds, they broke out at nearly 10,000 feet and saw the fortresses directly overhead. Climbing on a parallel course, they leveled off at 23,000 feet when Kanoka ordered the flight to jettison their auxiliary tanks, and they quickly turned in to attack with their rockets. As they got into position, the fortresses split up into separate groups and constantly altered course, leaving a zigzag pattern of contrails in the blue sky. Kanoka ordered the flight to fire rockets at a range of 2,000 meters, 6,500 feet. His two rockets both registered a perfect bullseye on a fortress, which blew up in an enormous, solid ball of fire with its entire load of bombs. His second Rotenführer, element leader, Venikos, also scored a direct hit with the bomber going down in flames, while his Rotenflieger, wingman, Sergeant Reinhardt, hit and damaged another fortress that swerved away off to the left. Reinhardt chased off after the bomber. Just then, Konoka's attention was attracted by the rather peculiar appearance overhead of moisture trails, apparently emanating from very fast aircraft. He thought they could only be other German fighters, though they did not attack the bombers. As he dived again on the formation to attack with his guns, suddenly, four single-engine aircraft dive past. They have the white star and broad white stripes as markings. Damn, they're thunderbolts. I immediately dive down after them. They swing around in a steep spiral to the left, heading for a lone flying fortress whose two outside engines have stopped. There is a Messerschmitt on its tail. It is Reinhardt. The bloody fool has eyes only for his fat bomber and is unaware of the enemy fighters coming up behind. Reinhardt, Reinhardt, wake up! Thunderbolt's behind! Reinhardt does not reply, but keeps on calmly blazing away at his fortress. I go flat out after the Thunderbolts. The first of them now opens fire on my wingman. The latter just keeps on firing at his victim. Kanoka had the leading thunderbolt a perfect target in his sights. A single burst of fire set the P-47 on fire, and it spun like a dead leaf. 
There is a sudden hammering noise in my crate. I turn round. There is a thunderbolt hard on my tail, and two others are coming down to join it. I push the stick right forward with both hands, diving for cover in the clouds. He was too late, as his engine caught fire. Jettisoning the canopy, he pulled off the oxygen mask and unfastened the safety harness, drawing up his legs. He kicked the stick forward, which shot him clear of the aircraft, somersaulting through the air. I feel the flying suit whipped against my body by the rush of wind. Slowly, I pull the ripcord. The harness cuts in, and I am pulled up with a jerk as the parachute opens. After the terrific drop, I seem to be standing on air. I swing gently from side to side. Overhead, the broad white silk parachute spreads out like a sun awning. The supporting shrouds make a reassuring whoosh. I quite enjoy the experience. What a marvelous invention the parachute is, to be sure. Always provided it opens. Yever lies off to the north. They must be able to see me from there. If they only knew that this is the commander of the fifth, who is now dangling ignominiously because of having allowed himself to be outmaneuvered by a thunderbolt. I come down in a field, after dropping the last few feet in a rush. Time, 11.26 hours. Only 31 minutes since I was airborne. Time enough for three aircraft to have been brought down. It is some consolation, however, that the score is two to one in my favor. Kanoka was shot down by either Everett Powell or Jesse Davis of the 78th Group's 83rd Squadron, with the other likely also getting his wingman, Reinhardt, when they sent two rocket-carrying BF-109s spinning down in flames. Lieutenants Harold Stump and Peter Pompetti of the 84th exploded a third 109, with Stump hitting a fourth while Pompetti shot up a BF-110 that spun down to crash with a dead pilot at the controls. 84th Squadron leader Gene Roberts, with his element leader, Quince Brown, closed on a pair of 109s. Roberts couldn't get position, but Brown set the wingman on fire. The high-cover 82nd Squadron dived into the battle with Squadron Commander Major Jack Oberhansley setting a BF-109 on fire and exploding a second. The five-minute fight broke up the German formations. The Thunderbolts rejoined and stayed with the bombers, beating off later attacks until they were forced to depart 40 miles off the Dutch coast. The fuel-hungry fighters landed at the first fields they came across in England, rather than flying on to Duxford. The 78th's claims for nine destroyed and no losses put them on top, while the other groups claimed 12 more destroyed for one loss. The mission had demonstrated what was possible when the fighters could close with the Luftwaffe over its own territory. Dayhuff, one of the originals in the group, left the next day for 8th Fighter Command staff, replaced as deputy group commander by top group ace Gene Roberts, while Major Jack Price moved up to take command of the 84th Squadron. Kanoka's diary entry confirmed the P-47's success. By evening, it was ascertained that among my own pilots, Sergeant Dueling has been killed, and Raditz and Johnny Fest shot down also. Fest is wounded in hospital at Emden, Fourth Staffel has lost two killed and one seriously wounded, while the headquarters flight has lost one. Sixth Staffel seems to have got the worst of it. Nine out of its twelve pilots are lost. All of the nine have been killed. The remaining three have been forced to either crash land or bail out. Not a single one of their aircraft returned. On the credit side, however, we have brought down twelve of the enemy to offset these heavy casualties. No fewer than six are credited to my lucky fifth alone. My own score has now risen to 16 bombers. The heavy casualties on our side are to be explained by the fact that nobody had anticipated an encounter with enemy fighters. We were taken completely by surprise. He ended. This war has become a merciless affair. Its horrors cannot be escaped. John T. Godfrey flew on the Emden mission as Shirt Blue Purple 8 to second flight element leader Don Gentile. The weather the 4th ran into over Germany was worse than forecast, and they were recalled. Cruising at 25,000 feet and heading home on instruments due to the poor visibility, all eyes were on Mac McCulpin, shirt blue purple one, in the lead. After several long minutes of this, Gentile succumbed to vertigo and quickly went into the dead man's spiral. While his P-47, Donny Boy, spiraled toward the cloud deck below, the inexperienced Godfrey, who had received the standing admonishment, stick to me like glue before takeoff, followed Gentile's spiraling thunderbolt. 
As the airplane entered a spin, Gentile managed to recover his spatial awareness and realized his predicament. He nosed down and broke out of the spin, pulling out just above the cloud deck below. He later recalled that he was amazed to look out and see Godfrey's P-47 off his wing. Now separated from the others, the two flew home together. Back at Debden, Gentile was effusive with his praise of Godfrey for doing something that wouldn't have been expected of an experienced wingman. He asked McCulpin to assign Godfrey as his wingman whenever possible. The two would go on to write a remarkable record in the group's annals. The 56th also benefited from the new tanks, which gave it the ability to surprise the Jagdwaffe. Dave Schilling was leader for this mission. Over the target, a formation of rocket-carrying BF-110s maneuvering for attack was spotted, and the Thunderbolts shot down five for a loss of one P-47, likely shot down by BF-109s that dived into the fight to protect the Zerstörers. September continued to demonstrate that fickle weather over England and or the continent continued to play havoc with operations. During the month, there were 18 days during which targets in Germany were obscured by 6 of 10 to 8 of 10 cloud cover. On 12 other days, the weather forecast predicted temporary clearance over the target, but only on two of these days were missions scheduled to German targets completed. On the other 10, the weather closed in too soon, after 0800 or 0900 hours. On these days, the weather was better over France, which allowed secondary missions to targets of importance in occupied territory. Overall, 8th Bomber Command was able to complete 10 missions during September, as many as had been accomplished during any of the previous months since June. However, most of these were not targets in Germany. Impatience grew both at the Pentagon and at Pine Tree, the code name for 8th Air Force Headquarters, as the coming winter months promised even fewer opportunities to hit the targets that had to be destroyed if Point Blank was to succeed. The bombers returned to Emden on October 2nd. Again, the 56th was able to put the new tanks to good use. Surprising a group of FW-190s forming up to attack, Zemke scored his fifth victory to become the Wolfpack's second ace. Dave Schilling, scoreless in 52 missions, was credited with two. Schilling demonstrated that he had found his shooting eye two days later on October 4th when the group escorted bombers to Frankfurt. 240 miles inside Germany, a new record for deep penetration by 8th Fighter Command. Catching a gaggle of BF-110s by surprise, the Thunderbolts knocked down a record 15 Zerstörers, one of which was credited to Schilling. On October 6th, Schilling led an escort to Bremen and shot down one of the four enemy fighters claimed by the group. He made ace on the October 10th mission to Munster, where he claimed one of the 10 Thunderbolts shot down. Dave Schilling had become the third ace in the Wolfpack in only four missions. The new capability of the P-47 to provide longer-range escort at high altitude had an unexpected effect on the pilots. Steve Pisanos explained, We were now regularly flying at 30,000 feet for several hours, and the missions only got longer as technical command developed the ability to carry more drop tanks. Our unpressurized oxygen system was unchanged, it was good over 12,000 feet, but over 24,000 feet, it wasn't feeding as well as it did lower down, and if anything happened to the system, a man could pass out within a matter of a few minutes and not realize anything was happening until he was out. By the time he came to, his airplane was likely in a flat spin or a terminal velocity dive he wasn't going to get out of. After the war, Air Force declared we had to have a pressurized system for altitudes above 24,000 feet but we fought the whole war with an oxygen system that really wasn't giving us everything we needed up there. As experience grew in the fighter groups, the pilots found ways to express their self-confidence. Dave Schilling, whom Zemke considered the group's leading personality, was a fan of the comic strip Little Abner, which was published in the Stars and Stripes newspaper. In September, he had written to the strip's creator, Al Cap and requested permission to use the strip's characters for nose art in the 62nd Squadron. Cap immediately gave permission, asking that the group set a goal to be met by Sadie Hawkins Day, a mythological holiday in which any gal was allowed to wed the man of her choice if she could catch him. After Schilling became an ace in early October, the 56th announced that they would have a group score of 100 by Sadie Hawkins Day, which was November 6th, 
1943. Unfortunately, Semke would not be around to discover if the goal was achieved, since he received orders to accompany Curtis LeMay and other officers who were headed back to the United States to present a report on the achievements of the 8th Air Force. He went on the proviso he could have his command back when the event was completed. Writing after the war in his memoir, the first and the last, General der Jagdflieger Adolf Garland said of the air war in 1943, Above all, the withdrawal and concentration of the fighter units in Germany came too late. This took effect only when the Thunderbolt escort fighters were operating over Germany with increased range. At the start, the American escorts made tactical mistakes. Instead of operating offensively against our fighter units, they limited themselves to a close, direct escort. In doing this, they went through the same negative experience we had done over England. The fighter pilot, who was not at all times and at any place offensive, loses the initiative of action. Chapter 11 Mission 115 The Day the Luftwaffe Won In September 1943, British intelligence presented evidence that the Germans had prioritized repairing the damaged ball-bearing factories at Schweinfurt and had purchased massive numbers of ball-bearings from Sweden. Eighth Bomber Command realized that a second attack on Schweinfurt had to happen. The weather was closing in. Mid-October was the beginning of winter. So far in the war, each winter had been colder with more marginal weather than the one before. The winter of 1943-44 to would not disappoint. There was thus a time concern that the mission be flown before the weather closed off the possibility. In the weeks following Schweinfurt-Regensburg, German fighter groups were recalled from the other theaters of war. The Jagdwaffe had put some 330 fighters in the air on August 17th. With the reorganization and transfers, by October 1st, it was estimated the German fighter force would number nearly 800 fighters. The defenders had already demonstrated what they were capable of. With a forecast for five days of clear weather when a ridge of high pressure settled in over Germany during the second week of October, Eker launched a multi-mission offensive. 8th Bomber Command flew three maximum effort missions totaling over 1,000 sorties that came to be called Black Week by the air crews. The first on October 8th targeted the bremen Vegasak area. The mission was memorable to the fourth when Dwayne Beeson scored two victories to become the group's first ace to score all victories with the fourth. Steve Pisanos recalled, the low clouds, fog, and drizzle that had kept us from flying finally broke on October 8th. We took 48 P-47s on this mission, refueling at RAF Shipdom. We were escorting 180 B-17s. With Blakesley leading the group, Jim Clark led the 334th Squadron, with Ralph Hofer flying his first mission as Clark's wingman. The Thunderbolts met the bombers at 1419 hours over Tessel Island off the Dutch coast. Pisanos, Clark's element leader, remembered. We immediately took up our positions over the well-spread-out bomber formation. Our squadron was assigned to cover the rear group of some 60 B-17s. They had just taken station over the bombers when Clark spotted 30 BF-109s to the south. At first we thought they were after the bombers, but we soon realized we had been duped. Fifteen of them ignored the bombers and went straight for us. Their plan was to break up the escort and open the door for the rest to go after the B-17s. As they got in range, Captain Clark called, Pecton Squadron, break hard, now! Clark and Hofer broke right while Pisanos and his wingman broke left. This scattered our squadron all over the sky. I couldn't tell who was who. P-47s and 109s were chasing each other, hoping to get a shot. Suddenly, Pisanos saw a BF-109 below him. When I closed in to 300 yards, I tried to place him in my gun sight, but my hands were shaking. I told myself to settle down. Then I pulled the trigger. He began to smoke, and he turned steeply to the left in a dive. Before he could get away, I gave him another burst, and a lot of smoke came out from under his cowling. At that moment, tracers flashed past Pisanos. He pulled the stick back. When he recovered, the enemy was nowhere to be seen. The guy had scared the daylights out of me. As he turned away, he saw another P-47 shoot down a BF-109 and recognized it was Beeson. I later learned back at Debden that this was his second, which gave him a score of six and made him our leading ace. The two flew home together, 
but Pisanos was forced to land at Halesworth to get enough gas to get home. His gun camera film confirmed his claim. Pisanos now had a score of four. During the fight, Hofer followed Clark while he shot down a BF-109, then spotted another P-47 under attack. Without hesitation, Hofer winged over and shot down Unteroffizier Franz Effenberger of First Group JG-3. Unfortunately, he was too late to save the other pilot, but crashed to his death in the Zauder Z. Back at Debden, Hofer performed a victory roll and on landing told his crew about shooting down the FW-190. Other pilots were skeptical until that evening when his gun camera film confirmed the victory. Ralph Hofer had shot down an enemy plane on his first mission and would soon become one of the most memorable characters in a unit full of them, known as the most completely undisciplined pilot in the unit. The 56th was also in action, flying withdrawal escort. Bob Johnson engaged a very able German pilot and shot him down for his fifth victory, becoming the group's fifth ace. His very able crew was Oberstleutnant Hans Philipp, one of the Jagdwaffe's leading experten, credited with 206 victories in 500 combats going back to his first on September 3, 1939. Following his 203rd victory on March 17, 1943, when he shot down four Soviet fighters, he was awarded the Diamonds to his Ritterkreuz, Knight's Cross, promoted to major and sent to the Western Front as Geschwader Commodore of JG-1, the front-line Jagdgeschwader on the main route from England to Germany. Philip's Stab staff flight was vectored toward the bombers. He shot down a B-17, then spotted the Thunderbolt escorts. His wingman, Feldwebel Hans Gunther Reinhardt, last saw his leader banking toward the bombers just as four P-47s swept down on him in a dive. Johnson reported spotting one FW-190 turn toward the bombers. I was going so fast I only had a chance for a quick shot. The engine caught fire and the plane fell off to the right. Philip bailed out, but his parachute failed to open. His body was found in a field with the parachute streamed. He was six months past his 26th birthday. On October 9th, the bombers went on to Anklam, Marienburg, Danzig, and Gdynia. On October 10th, the target was Munster. Over the course of the three missions, the Jagdwaffe and Flak had knocked down 88 bombers. Over Munster, the 78th caught 15 BF-110s and ME-410s, attacking straggling B-17s. Gene Roberts set a BF-110's engine afire. Rolling to avoid the explosion, he closed behind an ME-410 and opened fire. It exploded, with pieces damaging wingman Glenn Kuntz's Thunderbolt. Roberts was now the top ace of 8th Fighter Command, with a score of 8. The 216 P-47s escorting the mission claimed 19 enemy fighters destroyed for the loss of one. After three days of fog, Mission 115, the second strike on Schweinfurt, was set for Thursday, October 14th. The dawn revealed weather to which the men of 8th Bomber Command had become accustomed. Cold, dreary, and foggy. Captain Wally Hoffman, pilot of the B-17 Morning Delight of the 351st Bomb Group, recalled, When I looked outside at the weather, it was pitch black and very foggy. I thought, we can't possibly take off in this weather. Nevertheless, he and the flyers at 16 bases in East Anglia and the Midlands prepared for battle. Following breakfast, the crews made their ways to their respective pre-mission briefings, where the tensest part came when the briefing officer pulled back the curtain that covered the map of Europe. Wally Hoffman later wrote, There is a hushed silence as everyone leans forward looking at the fateful end of the red yarn. It's Schweinfurt, the major says with a sardonic smile, and gives us time to think. Abruptly, a buzz of voices breaks out, and one voice says, Son of a bitch, this is my last mission. And it was, as he was one of those who never made it back. In all the briefings, the group commanders ended the meetings by reading a message from General Eaker. This air operation today is the most important air operation yet conducted in this war. The target must be destroyed. It is of vital importance to the enemy. Your friends and comrades that have been lost and will be lost today are depending on you. Their sacrifice must not be in vain. Good luck, good shooting, 
and good bombing. Mission 115's plan was complex. The 1st Air Division would lead, followed by the 3rd Air Division, 30 minutes behind the 1st, on a parallel course 10 miles to the south. The two liberator groups of the 2nd Air Division were to fly well to the south of the fortresses, then rendezvous with them just prior to the bomb run. 1st Lieutenant William C. Heller, a B-17 pilot with the 303rd Hells Angels Bomb Group at Molesworth, remembered, It was misty and raining, and there was some talk that the mission might get scrubbed. At 0900 hours, word was received from an RAF weather reconnaissance mosquito that the target was clear. At 0930 hours, the fog began to lift over East Anglia. By 0945 hours, the order was given to start engines. The 317 bombers taxied for takeoff at 1000 hours. Almost immediately after takeoff, the plan began to fall apart, once again the victim of the English weather. Once airborne, pilots realized that the forecast was wrong. Instead of breaking out 2,000 feet, most did not find clear air until 6,000 feet. Some only broke out at 10,000 feet. Lieutenant Heller recalled, Visibility was still so bad we couldn't see the end of the runway, but we took off and transitioned to instruments until we broke out into a brilliantly clear sky at 7,000 feet. The excessive cloud cover delayed and in some cases prevented bombers joining their formation. Most significant was the loss of the entire 2nd Air Division. Only 29 of the 60 B-24s joined up. Failing to contact the others, the air commander aborted the mission to Schweinfurt and flew a diversionary mission to Emden. Only 290 bombers headed for the main target. The poor weather also disrupted the four escort groups. The 353rd and 56th groups rendezvoused successfully, but the 4th could not rendezvous and return to base. The 353rd ended up covering the B-24s that went to Emden. The 78th never took off when fog at Duxford failed to clear. Lieutenant Heller remembered, We made our way east in a nice tight formation. Our Spitfire escort left us about mid-channel, and the P-47s turned back as we reached western Belgium. From that point, we were on our own. Moments after the Thunderbolts turned for home, the Jagdwaffe mounted ferocious attacks. FW-190s and BF-109s made 12 o'clock high attacks, while BF-110s and ME-410s fired rockets into the formations. The Germans started hitting us immediately and never really let up. My aircraft was an older model without servos to power the controls, and my legs got so tired from stepping on the rudder pedals that I had to use my hands to push down on my legs. Just as sure as I'd slip or dive the ship within the formation, shells would burst in a cluster around us, usually in the spot where we had been. There were so many of them that I don't understand how they didn't shoot each other down or run into each other. Everywhere I looked, there were B-17s on fire, enemy fighters being blown out of the sky, and parachutes. It was particularly horrifying to see parachutes on fire and know those men were falling to their deaths. Mission Commander Colonel Bud J. Peasley, commander of the 384th Bomb Group, recalled, The opening play is a line plunge through center. The fighters whip through our formation, for our closing speed exceeds 500 miles per hour. Another group replaces the first, and this is repeated five times, as six formations of ME-109s charge us. I can see fighters on my side, their paths marked in the bright sunlight by fine lines of light-colored smoke as they fire short bursts. It is a coordinated attack. Their timing is perfect, their technique masterly. The 1st Air Division's 306th Bomb Group lost three of its 18 B-17s to mechanical problems shortly after it crossed the channel. By the time the escorts left at Aachen, two more fortresses had been shot down. Six of the remaining 13 went down before reaching Sveinfurt, while two others went down after they'd aborted and headed for home. Only seven managed to bomb a target in Sveinfurt, and only five returned to their base at Thurley. The 305th Group's losses were the worst. Planned as the low group of the 40th Combat Wing, which would lead the attack, it was eight minutes late getting to the assembly point. When the group commander was unable to contact the 40th's wing lead group, he ordered the bombers to fly to another assembly point where they contacted the 1st Combat Wing, which was also missing its low group. The 305th took position as the low group. 
Any momentary relief the airmen of the 305th might have felt at not being low group in the lead wing ended when Colonel Peasley ordered the first wing to take the lead because the 40th wing had no low group. The 305th's bad luck continued as the enemy concentrated their attacks on the lead wing's low group. By the time they reached Schweinfurt, 13 of its 16 B-17s were lost. The three survivors managed to bomb the target and return to Chelveston. The other three groups in the first wing formation only lost one aircraft each. The 3rd Air Division flew to the target relatively unscathed. The 30-minute lag behind the 1st Air Division meant that enemy fighters did not have time to land and refuel. The division also benefited from the course diversion that took the bombers well south of the 1st Division's penetration route and away from the major German airfields. Only 15 B-17s were lost of the 140 over the entire mission. The 91st Bomb Group, first over the target, had an unobstructed view of the five factories. The 3rd Division reached Schweinfurt 10 minutes after the 1st Division to find the entire target area covered by smoke. The return trip was worse. Many bombers were damaged and had lost engines. These were the fighters' main targets. When the bombers reached Aachen, there were no friendly fighters in sight. The weather had once again intervened. The morning fog that almost caused mission cancellation had persisted and in some cases worsened over East Anglia, closing the airfields that the fighters operated from. Thus, enemy fighters attacked the bombers all the way across the Netherlands and even out into the Channel. Once across the Channel and over England, the weather confronted the returning crews. Five more bombers were lost when they were unable to find anywhere to land due to the fog and low clouds and were abandoned by their crews, who all bailed out successfully. Sergeant Piazza stated, Not until we touched down, taxied to our hard stand and cut engines, did we feel a measure of comfort. Captain Hoffman later wrote of the mission after the war, First it was a feeling of wonder that we were alive and had made it back to good old Mother Earth in one piece, plus an inner appreciation of being alive, which I have to this day. Somehow, Heller's bomber made it back to the coast, with both pilot and co-pilot manning the controls to deal with the loss of two engines on the same side. The airspeed indicator and artificial horizon were shot out. Back over England, the clouds covered the countryside below. Heller recalled, When we were down to about 20 minutes fuel remaining, I saw a small hole in the clouds and we spiraled down and pulled out beneath them. We were able to find the RAF station at Henley, outside London, and they cleared us for immediate landing. Back on the ground, the ten crewmen were amazed to discover that none had been hit. Our RAF hosts served us tea and dinner and provided beds for us. I went to bed with a word of thanks to our Lord for our preservation. Of the 229 bombers that made it to the target and returned, only 33 were undamaged. A total of 60 B-17s were shot down of 290 that took off. The Luftwaffe admitted losing 100 fighters in the battle, which extended over 800 miles and lasted for 3 hours and 14 minutes. Among the bomber crews in 8th Bomber Command, October 14, 1943 was thereafter known as Black Thursday. Eker cabled Arnold, detailing the losses and again requesting more bombers and long-range fighters. He concluded, There is no discouragement here. We are convinced that when the totals are struck, yesterday's losses will be far outweighed by the value of the enemy material destroyed. The general was putting on a brave face. While he had not received the final reports, he knew there was little likelihood that the depleted forces had actually bombed Schweinfurt and had put the factories out of commission. In Washington, General Arnold, desperate for a victory in the face of the huge losses incurred, proclaimed at a Pentagon press conference on October 18th, Now we have got Schweinfurt! The result of second Schweinfurt did not discredit either daylight precision bombing or the bottleneck targeting strategy. The two strikes had a dramatic effect on ball-bearing production. Had it been possible to make a sustained effort, the result would have devastated the German industrial base in the words of Albert Speer. What Schweinfurt did disprove once and for all was the myth of the self-defending bomber when confronted by a determined foe like the pilots of the Jagdwaffe. Chapter 12. Reinforcement. 
During September, rumors abounded among the pilots in the fighter groups regarding things to come. When Chesley Peterson returned to take command of the 4th, he told the pilots that there was a new airplane in the works. Steve Pisanos recalled him saying, They're coming up with a new fighter that will be far superior to the P-38 and P-47, a kite that can be used for long-range escort. That rumor became reality on September 26th, when Pisanos returned from escorting B-17s to Les Andolais in northern France. I taxied into the dispersal area only to find a P-51 Mustang with a four-bladed propeller parked on the grass across from my stall. Pisanos was familiar with the Allison-powered RAF Mustang 1, having flown one for 40 hours in OTU, Operational Training Units, training, and then completed another 40 operational hours with 268 Squadron before transferring to 71 Eagle Squadron. He met the pilot, Captain Jack Miller, from 8th Fighter Command Staff, who had flown it to Debden in the Squadron Operations Office. He told me it was equipped with a Merlin engine and that it was on loan to our group for the pilots to fly and evaluate it. A week later, the Mustang was released for flying, Pisanos recalled. I was more familiar with the Mustang than anyone else in the group. When Captain Miller saw I had 80 Mustang hours in my logbook, he turned it over to me. Pisanos found the new airplane to be everything I hoped it would be. After checking himself out for 15 minutes, I dropped down on the deck and decided to make a pass over Debton, clocking some 450 miles per hour. As I passed over, I zoomed up and rolled left and right. Then I did a loop, after which I buzzed the runway a few more times. Everyone was interested in the new fighter. Over the next two weeks, Don Blakesley flew it several times, as did Don Gentile, Jim Goodson, Deacon Hively, and Dwayne Beeson. All were effusive in their praise of the flying qualities of the new Mustang. The P-47 was also about to grow a longer set of legs. Republic had heard the requests from 8th Fighter Command to find a way to extend the fighter's range. The P-47D-15-RE, which started coming off the Republic assembly line in September 1943, was equipped with two pylons under the wings outboard of the main gear plumbed to draw gasoline from drop tanks that would be attached to the pylons. Republic also produced pylon kits that could be used at maintenance depots to modify existing fighters. Once General Kepner learned that the new pylons, each carrying one of the 108-gallon paper tanks with a third tank carried on the center line, gave the Thunderbolt a range increased to 600 miles, almost enough to take the fighters over Berlin. He issued orders to 8th Service Command to initiate a top-priority program to modify every P-47 in the command. With P-47s now pouring into England, the existing fighter groups were able to increase their authorized strength from 48 to 96 aircraft and thus fly A and B group missions of 36 aircraft each. The 78th Group flew the first such double mission on November 5th, with Group Commander Stone leading 78A and Deputy Group Commander Roberts leading 78B. 8th Fighter Command had again doubled its strength. The new pylons also gave the Thunderbolts a new lease on life as a dive bomber. The fighters' repertoire expanded when the 353rd Group was assigned to develop tactics for dive bombing, carrying a 500-pound bomb on each wing pylon. Once proper tactics were developed, the 353rd flew a mission against Artois Airdrome on November 25th with the 78th's A Group providing escort. Heavy flak claimed the 353rd Group's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Lauren McCollum, who was thrown clear when his P-47 exploded in its dive. He was soon captured on the ground. By the time of the Normandy invasion, the P-47 had become the USAAF's premier ground support fighter. Back in the United States, other groups which would become important in 8th Fighter Command operations were forming, and training throughout 1943. George Preddy had dreamed of being a fighter pilot after falling in love with airplanes and flying when his Greensboro, North Carolina neighbor, Hal Foster, took him along for a 30-minute flight in his 1933 Aronka C-3 from Greensboro to Danville on November 13, 1938, three months before he turned 20. A committed diarist, Preddy wrote in his journal afterwards, I see now how great the airplane is. That trip was the most wonderful experience I ever had. I must become an aviator. 
Shortly after the new year of 1939 began, Preddy started taking flying lessons from his friend Bill Teague, who owned a 1931 Waco GXE Model 10 biplane. He soloed in a bit over six hours. Teague then suggested they each invest $75 to buy a 1921 Waco Model 4, and they barnstormed it around North Carolina that summer. The next year, having completed two years of college to qualify for admission to the Navy's aviation cadet program, Preddy applied but was rejected since he was only 5 feet 4 inches tall and did not weigh enough. After two more rejections by the Navy, he enlisted in the Coast Artillery to satisfy the draft while waiting to hear about his application for the Army Aviation Cadet Program. Just before a transfer to Puerto Rico, he was accepted and sent to basic flight training in April 1941. He excelled with the experience of his 80 hours of barnstorming and his demonstration of a shooter's eye, developed in duck and pheasant hunts with his relatives, put him back on track for assignment to pursuit aviation, the fighters he dreamed of flying. Graduating with wings and commissioned a second lieutenant the week after Pearl Harbor, Preddy was one of 50 recent flight school graduates assigned to the 49th Pursuit Group. He had 240 hours in his logbook, not counting the barnstorming. In January 1942, the 49ers became the first American fighter unit to deploy overseas since Pearl Harbor. Originally assigned to reinforce the Philippines, the group arrived in Australia in February. In March, the 49ers became the sole air defense of a continent, assigned to Darwin in the extreme tropical north. The pilots would fly the Brereton route, first established to funnel fighters up to Java before its fall. The flight from Brisbane to Darwin was equivalent to flying from Boston to Houston, staying on the coast with no navigational aids only a few airports to refuel at, and maps with large portions blank under the legend, Unexplored Territory. Such road maps as existed were found to be more accurate. A veteran explained, Just follow the line of crashed P-40s. You can't miss it. Preddy was in the first group to make the flight. Of 25 P-40Es that left Cloncurry Airfield outside Brisbane on March 8th, 13 arrived safely at Daly Waters Airfield outside the abandoned city of Darwin 10 days later. Preddy and the other young pilots now had about 15 hours each in the P-40, experience gained on their flights to Darwin. The town had been abandoned after the first Japanese raid on February 19th, which had caused a lot of damage. The pilots soon discovered that they were now flying in the equatorial weather system, where storms formed quickly and grew in strength. The tropical Australian outback they flew over was dangerous, with several varieties of poisonous snakes and man-eating crocodiles in abundance. By the end of the month, Preddy was assigned as wingman to First Lieutenant Joe Cruzel, who had been assigned to the squadron after escaping the Philippines and Java ahead of the advancing Japanese. The other wingman in the flight was Second Lieutenant John D. Landers, a Texan who had graduated from flight school two days ahead of Preddy. The element leader was 2nd Lieutenant Sidney Woods, senior to Preddy and Landers by four weeks in his graduation and commissioning. They were soon known as the Green Dragon Flight, with each fighter displaying a large green dragon snorting fire that was painted on the cowl. All four pilots would eventually bring their hard-gained combat experience to 8th Fighter Command, where each would make their mark. But first, they would learn air combat the hard way taught to them by the experienced pilots of the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Force in their A6 M2 Zero fighters, which completely outperformed the P-40E in everything but diving ability. On March 30th, the Green Dragons intercepted an incoming Japanese strike. Preddy later wrote in his diary, We went up about 15 minutes before they arrived to intercept them and got hit by the Zeros at 11,000 feet. Neither side lost anything, but Makamsi had to bail out when he got in a spin. I had a perfect shot at a zero, but missed by not having turned the gun switch on. It was a newcomer's mistake that he never did again. July 12, 1942, was a slow day at Darwin, and flight leader Krusel scheduled a training flight for the afternoon, led by First Lieutenant John Sauber, who told Preddy that he would execute a simulated attack, for which Preddy would perform the appropriate escape maneuver. Sauber misjudged his separation, and the two P-40s collided. Sauber was killed in the crash. 
Badly injured, Preddy managed to bail out and parachute to safety. Evacuated to Brisbane, he spent two months in hospital, then received orders sending him back to the United States. He later wrote of his time at Darwin. The Army now finds it was a great mistake to send green pilots just out of flight school into combat. I am thankful I lived through the first stage as I feel I am now a little better prepared, having learned from actual experience how to take care of myself up there. There is something to be learned on each combat mission, and I am just a beginner. After leave at home, he reported to the 4th Air Force in San Francisco and managed to wangle getting checked out in both the P-38 and P-47. Preddy finally received orders on February 15, 1943, assigning him to the 34th Fighter Squadron of the 352nd Fighter Group, then based at New Haven, Connecticut. After a transcontinental train ride, he was welcomed by Squadron Commander First Lieutenant John C. Meyer, who checked him out thoroughly on the squadron's P-47s, then assigned him as a flight leader. By May 1943, all three squadrons of the 352nd were at Mitchell Field, New York, and the 34th Squadron was now the 487th Fighter Squadron. The early P-47Bs they trained on experienced mechanical problems, and several pilots were killed in accidents as a result. Like every other early P-47 pilot, Preddy had one terrifying experience with compressibility in a dive that taught him to respect the big fighter. In May 1943, Group Commander Lieutenant Colonel Ramage was relieved because of the accident rate and replaced by Lieutenant Colonel Joe Mason, who rebuilt the group and quickly turned it into a combat-ready organization that 1st Air Force declared ready to deploy to England on June 14, 1943, two weeks after Preddy was promoted to 1st Lieutenant. On June 22, the 352nd took the train from its base in Connecticut to Camp Kilmer, and went aboard RMS Queen Mary on June 30th for the six-day Atlantic crossing that ended in the Firth of Clyde on July 5th. Four days later, the group arrived at their new station, Bodney, located outside the village of Watton, 90 miles north of London. The pilots were dismayed to find that the only aircraft on the field were a Piper L-4 Cub and a tired ex-RAF Miles Magister trainer. Five days later, on July 10th, the first eight P-47s arrived. Lieutenant Ralph Hamilton remembered that the first Thunderbolt the 487th Squadron received was immediately damaged when a pilot who hadn't flown for a month made a poor landing and banged up the prop. We soon got another, and George made sure he was the first to take it for a spin before someone else could damage it. He gave us a great buzz job when he came across the field at low altitude and pulled up into a barrel roll the group began training to fly in the ETO. Formation flying at high altitude in Finger 4 flights was stressed. Pilots who had not previously flown for extended periods at those altitudes found that formation flying at 25,000 feet was very different from what they had done in the States down at 12,000 to 15,000 feet. The squadron pilots moved into quarters in an English estate, Claremont Hall. Preddy wrote in his diary, the things are quite different fighting here and in Darwin. In late August, squadron and flight leaders went on missions with the veteran 4th and 56th groups, but Preddy was not among those chosen. By the first week of September, the group reported that they had completed all pre-combat training and were ready for assignment. Their first mission came on September 9th, patrolling the coast from Southwold to Felixstowe to cover the return of the 56th and 353rd groups from their escort missions. By late September, the 352nd had flown three rodeos along the French, Belgian, and Dutch coasts, and one shallow penetration escort, with the Luftwaffe paying them no attention. On September 20th, the individual squadrons began sending flights one at a time to Goat Hill, as Gox Hill was now universally known, for gunnery training. Preddy was one of the high scorers. Their first escort missions involved covering Martin B-26 Marauder medium bombers on missions to Belgium and northern France to attack Luftwaffe airfields. On October 14th, the group escorted the B-24s of the 93rd and 392nd groups that failed to fully join up in the bad weather, and the 352nd was diverted to a sweep of the Frisian Islands. The poor weather that followed through the rest of October limited flying of all kinds. James H. Howard returned to the United States in the fall of 1942 after nearly a year in Burma and China, 
and seven months of combat with the famed American volunteer group, AVG, better known to newspaper readers in the United States as the Flying Tigers. AVG founder Claire Chenault had offered him the rank of major and command of his own squadron in the newly created 23rd Fighter Group, which replaced the AVG, if he would remain in China. Racked with the repercussions of a bad case of dengue fever and continuing dysentery, he refused and made his way back to the United States. President Roosevelt had promised Chenault that the United States would make good use of the experience of the Tigers brought home. Hap Arnold wrote Chenault, As a concrete example of the worldwide effect of your superior performance of a most difficult duty, I want you to know that I am personally directing an intense effort to enroll in the Army Air Force all your ex-AVG combat personnel. We are after these lads in order that their skill, experience, and ability which you have instilled in them shall not be lost to the Army Air Forces. Upon arrival home, Howard, who had been a naval aviator when he resigned his commission to go with the AVG, contacted the Navy to see what they would offer a trained, combat-experienced pilot. Their answer was an offer of a commission as lieutenant and an assignment in training command. The Army Air Force's offer was the same, a commission as captain, equivalent to a Navy lieutenant, and an assignment in training command. Still suffering from the after-effects of the dengue fever he had contracted in Burma, and assured by his local draft board that he had time to consider his options, he traveled to San Diego to visit old flying friends at NAS North Island. When the base commander found out he had come onto the base with his old pass, he was summarily thrown off the base and told not to return. This soured me on the Navy, he later recalled. The AAF offer turned into a commission as captain and being trained to fly the P-38 in order to instruct future P-38 pilots at Santa Ana Army Airfield in Southern California. The assignment turned out not to be what he had expected. There were three other combat veterans among the instructors, First Lieutenants Jacobs, Miller, and Geis, who had escaped the Philippines after flying P-40s in the 17th Pursuit Squadron. Fortunately, he became friends with fellow instructor Carl Parker Geis, who was given a temporary assignment at Hamilton Army Airfield, north of San Francisco, in February 1943. A month later, Geis called to tell Howard that the commander of a new P-39 group at the field had offered him the assignment as group operations officer and was also in need of a squadron commander, for which position Geis had nominated Howard. It sounded better than training P-38 pilots who were, justifiably, afraid of their airplanes. And after a phone conversation with the group's executive officer, Major Wallace P. Mace, Howard made the trip north to find out what the offer entailed. The 354th Fighter Group had been activated at Hamilton on November 15, 1942, under the command of 27-year-old Major Harold Martin, who had joined the Air Corps in 1937 after transferring from the Marines. Martin and Howard hit it off when they met, and Howard accepted Martin's offer to take command of the 356th Fighter Squadron to replace the previous commander, Captain Charles C. Johnson, who had been killed in a flying accident. Howard later recalled that Martin's youth belied his maturity and determination. He was unflappable, and everyone liked his low-key style of leadership. On joining the 356th, Howard found that Martin had been right when he said that after the death of Captain Johnson, the squadron had gone downhill. However, after meeting its members, he felt the squadron had potential, because the men were spirited and eager. Despite his lanky six-foot-two-inch height, Howard managed to cram himself into the P-39's tight cockpit and found, like many other pilots, that he liked flying the airplane, just not higher than about 10 to 12,000 feet. In June 1943, the 354th Group was ordered north to Oregon, with the 353rd and 355th squadrons taking up residence at Portland Army Airfield, while the 356th went to Salem Army Airfield outside the state capitol. Howard and Geis were the only combat veterans in the group, as well as the oldest, Geis having just turned 28, while Howard had celebrated turning 30 just before transferring. Howard determined that he would give his squadron as much training based on his combat experience as possible, since he wanted to galvanize the unit into a fighting organization. I didn't want to dishearten them by harping on the cruel actuality of war, yet what we were about to engage in would not be child's play. 
Second Lieutenant Richard E. Turner, one of the recent flight school graduates in the squadron, later recalled that Howard's becoming squadron commander gave the squadron a tremendous boost. The enthusiasm and eagerness kindled under Johnson burned brightly again. The men recognized Howard's reputation in the AVG, and his superior leadership was soon amply demonstrated. Howard initiated a program of training in mutual support tactics as practiced and proven in combat by the Flying Tigers in China. His insistence upon perfection resulted in an aggressive, well-tempered fighting squadron finely tuned to the anticipated conditions of actual combat. We came to appreciate his eagerness to impart his knowledge to us. The fact we were as successful as we were when we got to combat was the result of our good luck in having him as our commander. The pilots trained hard over the summer of 1943, since they had heard a lot about how difficult things were in England and how good the other side was, which galvanized them to work even harder to make the grade. In August, Group Commander Martin decided to find out just how good a fighter pilot Howard was. Martin told Howard to meet him at 10 hundred hours, over a bend in the Willamette River near the town of Newburgh. Martin later described the event. I arrived at the rendezvous point a few minutes early and circled around. After some time, I saw no evidence of another plane, so I opened up on the radio. Howard, where are you? This is Colonel Martin. I've been circling above our rendezvous point for the past several minutes. And then he came on the radio. Sir, if you will look to your rear, you will observe me on your tail, where I have been for the past several minutes. Martin had no doubt of the quality of his new squadron commander. By the end of September, the 354th had passed its operational readiness inspection by 4th Air Force and were declared ready for overseas assignment. Howard had hoped they would go to the South Pacific, but on word they would be traveling by train to Camp Kilner, New Jersey, it was clear the group was headed for England. Everyone knew they would not be flying the P-39 there, and there was much speculation about what fighter would be assigned. They had already heard a lot of stories about the new version of the P-51 Mustang with the Merlin engine, and there was hope they might get to fly it. After everyone had received two weeks' leave before departure, the group boarded the train on October 8th for the five-day trip to the East Coast. On arrival, they got some opportunity to see New York City, but on October 20th, the men were loaded aboard the ferry and crossed to New York Harbor where they went aboard the troop transport HMS Athlone Castle. After 10 days aboard ship, they arrived in Liverpool on November 1st. The ship lay at anchor for three fog-bound days, waiting for the fog to lift. Then, finally docked, and the 354th went ashore in England. Once ashore, the men were trucked to Greenham Common, where they were issued equipment. The morning of November 11th, 1943, the first four P-51B Mustangs were flown in. The 354th would be the first fighter group anywhere to fly North American's new fighter. On November 13th, the group was sent on to its new base at Boxted, near Colchester. At first, it looked as if they would be very comfortable in this English countryside setting. However, shortly after their arrival, the rains came, and the whole base became a giant quagmire. The conditions were so bad that it made it difficult to do the work of converting to the Mustang. The Mustangs that arrived had been modified by 8th Technical Command when they arrived in England, with an additional gas tank mounted immediately behind the pilot in the fuselage on the center of gravity that could carry an extra 90 gallons. When this was filled, pilots discovered that the airplane was slightly tail-heavy, which restricted maneuverability. Operating procedures were modified so that a pilot took off with gas fed from the wing tanks. Once airborne, he would switch to the cockpit tank to burn off that fuel before reaching enemy territory. When that was empty, he would switch to the drop tanks until they were either empty or the enemy was engaged. The fuselage tank was invaluable, since it provided sufficient range that the P-51 could reach any target in Germany with the combination of fuselage tank, drop tanks, and wing tanks. When it was announced that a fighter group in the newly established 9th Air Force, which had recently transferred to England from North Africa to become the USAAF Tactical Air Force in the coming invasion, was the first to receive the P-51, the leadership of the 8th Air Force was shocked. As Steve Pisanos recalled, everyone was paying attention to the P-51. When I was in 268 Squadron flying Allison-powered Mustangs, 
those of us with experience in Spitfires talked about how wonderful the airplane would be with a Merlin up front. While U.S. Air Attaché Thomas Hitchcock worked with Rolls-Royce in early 1943 to mate the Merlin and the Mustang, Edgar Schmood and his team at North American also began planning such a power plant upgrade. Hitchcock's report on the performance of Rolls-Royce's Merlin-powered Mustang 10 testbed which gave an 80 miles per hour speed increase and a doubling of effective combat altitude, provided North American with all the evidence it needed to convince the Air Force to support the work. Word of the first flight of the P-51B in Los Angeles spread through the world of Air Force fighter pilots like wildfire. The pilots of the 4th had been unanimous in their verdict that it was the best fighter any had flown after they were given access to one of the first P-51Bs to arrive in England back in October. 8th Fighter Command's General Kepner immediately protested that a fighter like the Mustang, with a vulnerable liquid-cooled engine and a radiator that only needed one minor caliber hit to be put out of action, was exactly what was not needed in action over a battlefield in a ground support mission. The Mustang had the range on internal fuel only to fly to targets in western Germany that the P-47 had only been able to reach in the weeks before the Schweinfurt-Regensburg mission when the fighters were finally equipped with the 108-gallon drop tank. A P-51B carrying two drop tanks could reach Berlin. For 8th Fighter Command, the P-51B was the solution to the problem they had faced since the command first began flying missions. Tests conducted between P-51Bs and captured BF-109 and FW-190 fighters demonstrated that the Mustang was competitive with these two fighters in ways the P-47 would never be. Above 25,000 feet, the Mustang was superior to the FW-190 in all flight regimes, only being outrolled by the early, lighter versions of the Verger. It was more maneuverable than the BF-109 at all altitudes, and it's equal in all other aspects of high-altitude performance. Don Blakesley told Kepner, The Mustang is a long-range Spitfire! Both Blakesley and Chesley Peterson begged 8th Fighter Command to let the 4th be the first 8th Fighter Command group to take the Mustang to war. No one in England could understand the decision not to send the fighter to the 8th. The decision had been made in the Pentagon by officers in material command who had no knowledge of or dealings with operational realities. The Merlin-powered Mustang was declared a tactical fighter because both the RAF and USAAF had decided that the earlier Allison-powered Mustangs, limited to altitudes below 15,000 feet by their power plant, would be used in the tactical roles of battlefield reconnaissance, ground strafing, and dive bombing. The decision to send the Mustang to the 9th Air Force was based on bureaucratic precedent, if it was based on anything. The first thing 8th Fighter Command did on discovering that the Mustang had been assigned to 9th Air Force was to go to the top and get an agreement that, while the group would remain a part of 9th Air Force administratively, the unit would operate under the control of 8th Fighter Command until the invasion. When they learned that the 363rd Fighter Group, also assigned to the 9th Air Force, was second in line to receive Mustangs, 8th Fighter Command put the engines of military bureaucracy into overdrive to ensure that the rest of the Mustangs went to the 8th Air Force as they became available. Additionally, the RAF had received P-51Bs, which were called the Mustang III in that service, and was in process of equipping four veteran fighter command squadrons with the new fighter. RAF Chief Sir Charles Portal agreed to send these units to support 8th Fighter Command as soon as they were operationally qualified. The pilots of the 354th Group were ecstatic to be given the Mustang. The group historian later wrote that after only one day of test hops, they realized they had the best airplane of the war to work with. To honor their good fortune, a vote was taken, and the 354th adopted the name Pioneer Mustang Group on December 13th. Once at Boxted, training to become familiar with their new mount continued while the men moved into their new quarters. On November 15th, the 354th celebrated its first anniversary as a unit. On December 1st, the pilots were considered proficient enough to fly their first mission in the ETO, a rodeo fighter sweep over Belgium and the Pas de Calais, flown by 24 P-51s, led by Don Blakesley, with Group Commander Martin, who had been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel when the group was declared ready for deployment, flying as Blakesley's wingman. Takeoff 
was at 14.29 hours, and they returned 70 minutes later at 15.49 hours, with the only excitement having been one flak hit on the plane flown by Lieutenant Lane of the 356th Fighter Squadron. The 354th had established a record, flying its first combat mission only 20 days after its first combat aircraft was assigned to it, and 27 days after arriving in England. The 359th Fighter Group, composed of the 368th, 369th, and 370th Fighter Squadrons, had been created on December 20, 1942, and activated on January 15, 1943, at Westover Field, Massachusetts, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Avalon P. Taken, Jr., who would lead the unit until November 1944. His pilots came to call him Hard Tack because Colonel Tacon was a believer that air discipline began with discipline on the ground. During his time as commander, when the group was in England, there were pilots who said his strict discipline in the air was keeping them from winning the war, since he did not tolerate flights breaking away to chase enemy fighters while he held the group over its assigned bombers. Many others later said that they survived their tours because of his enforcement of air discipline. Training began in earnest in March 1943 when the group moved to Grenier AAF in New Hampshire, but flight time was limited due to the low number of P-47s available. A move to Republic Airfield alongside the factory on Long Island in May saw the group finally fully equipped with brand new P-47Ds fresh off the production lines. In July, they returned to Westover Field, where they trained until they passed their operational readiness inspection at the end of September. On October 2nd, they took a train to Camp Kilmer. On October 7th, the group headquarters and the 368th Squadron boarded the USAT Argentina, while the 369th went to the USAT Thurston, and the 370th took the former Dutch MV Sloterdijk. The convoy left New York Harbor before dawn on October 8th and arrived in Liverpool on October 19th. Over the last part of October, the group was moved to its base at East Retham in Norfolk. The base had been constructed by the RAF in the summer of 1940 and used for bombers until the previous summer. The pilots found themselves billeted at the nearby stately Retham Hall, an English country estate with 75 rooms. Once their P-47s had all arrived by November 10th, the group's senior leaders, Lieutenant Colonel Taken and Majors William H. Swanson, John Murphy, Albert Trigger Tyrrell, and Rockford Gray, as well as 12 captains and lieutenants assigned as flight leaders, were sent on detached service to the 78th Group at Duxford to gain operational experience, while the 352nd Group's Major Luther H. Richmond became the temporary group commander to conduct training on 8th Fighter Command operations for the rest of the group. The last P-47 group to join 8th Fighter Command in 1943 was the 358th Fighter Group, which had been formed on January 15, 1943, at Westover Field, where its men remained for most of their training before shipping over to England in October 1943. The group flew only 17 missions with 8th Fighter Command from December 1943 to early February 1944, when the unit was transferred to the 9th Air Force in trade for the P-51-equipped 357th Fighter Group. Five days after Major Martin had taken command of the brand new 354th Fighter Group in the fall of 1942, another fighter group was brought into existence at Hamilton Field when Major Loring Stetson read the orders activating the 357th Fighter Group, composed of the 362nd, 363rd, and 364th squadrons. Over the Christmas holiday and the first month of the new year of 1943, the group received men and everything else needed for operations except for aircraft. In February 1943, the unit went aboard a Union Pacific train for a trip through Donner Pass to Nevada, where they were deposited at the isolated Tonopah Army Airfield, the site of the USAAF's brand new 3 million acre bombing and gunnery range. It was quickly discovered that Tonopah, which was at an altitude of 6,000 feet in the high desert, was a difficult location from which to operate an airplane that was limited to altitude below 12,000 feet. Pilots soon learned that mishandling the P-39 could quickly put one into an out-of-control tumble, while coarseness in maneuvering quickly put a pilot into a high-speed stall spin. The pilot who hesitated in recovery wouldn't make it. 
two pilots, including South Pacific combat veteran Captain Varian White, commander of the 364th Squadron, were soon lost, with White losing his engine on takeoff from Burbank Airport and crashing in nearby Studio City on a return to Tonopah from visiting his fiancée. In early June 1943, newly promoted Lieutenant Colonel Stetson led the group back to California, where it operated from Hayward Army Airfield in the Bay Area. The group's hard luck continued, with nine pilots killed in training accidents in June and July. Two more were lost in August and September. In the face of these losses, the group was glad to welcome 26-year-old combat veteran Captain Thomas L. Hayes, Jr., who took command of the 364th Fighter Squadron. Hayes had enlisted as an aviation cadet in 1940 and was commissioned a second lieutenant and awarded his pilot wings at Kelly Field, Texas, on February 7, 1941. One of the first pilots sent to Australia in January 1942, he was assigned to the 17th Pursuit Squadron of the 24th Pursuit Group, which was soon sent to Java, where he survived combat with the Japanese Imperial Navy's best until he was shot down and wounded on February 19th. After recovering from his wounds in Australia, Hayes went to the 35th Pursuit Group in March. The group took its RAF-rejected P-400 Era Cobras to Three Mile Drome at Port Moresby in late April 1942. By October, when he received orders back to the States, Hayes had received an advanced course in air combat, flying an outclassed fighter against the Japanese aces of the Tainan Fighter Wing, and had been credited with two enemy aircraft destroyed on the ground for which he received the Silver Star. One 363rd Squadron pilot took to the P-39 so well that in later years, after he had flown some of the most famous high-performance airplanes in history, Chuck Yeager listed the P-39 as his favorite, just for the pure enjoyment of flying. Seeing many other pilots succumb to the airplane's ease of spinning while the group was at Tonopah, he remembered, I took the airplane up and deliberately spun it to learn to recover quickly. I kept doing that, and pretty soon, I could recover from a spin in less than three rotations. I knew I wouldn't be one of those going in while executing other maneuvers. And, as it turned out, learning how to get out of dangerous spins eventually saved my life. Jaeger was not one of those men who had grown up in love with airplanes and the dream of flying them. The first airplane I ever saw was a barnstormer that landed outside of town. I went out to see it, and the pilot tried to get me to go up with him so he could sell rides to the others but I told him, no thanks. I didn't think there was very much to all of that. In 1940, Jaeger enlisted in the Army Air Corps at age 18 after his high school graduation with a plan to become a mechanic and because there weren't any Air Corps airports in West Virginia. I wanted to see something of the world out there. After graduating from mechanics training, he was sent to George Army Airfield in the high California desert, where he finally went up for a ride in a B-18. It was a bumpy day over the desert, and it didn't take me any time at all to lose my lunch, all over my fatigues. After an additional few months of service, during which time he noted that officers generally received better treatment, Jaeger volunteered for flight training and passed the academic background test high enough that he could become a flight officer, a non-commissioned warrant officer, on graduation without the requirement of completing two years in college. During his flight training, it was discovered that Jaeger had phenomenal 2010 distance vision during gunnery training. All those years spent hunting ducks with my father paid off, and he was number one in his class for aerial gunnery. I graduated from training and received orders to the 363rd Squadron of this fighter group that had just formed. I took Christmas leave and then reported to them while they were at Hamilton. Jaeger was assigned as wingman to 2nd Lieutenant Clarence Bud Anderson who had graduated from flight training a month before him. They became immediate friends. As the 354th Group crossed the country to Camp Kilmer for transit on to England, the squadrons of the 357th were split up for further training, with the 362nd sent to Boise, Idaho, while the 363rd went to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and the 364th to Lincoln, Nebraska, for additional advanced training and familiarization flights with bombers. On October 18th, the squadrons were put aboard different trains and met up at Camp Kilmer on October 21st. 48 hours later, on October 23rd, they went aboard the RMS Queen Mary with 11,000 other Allied troops headed for England. 
the great liner dropped anchor in the Clyde on October 29th, and the men of the 357th soon made the acquaintance of the English train system when they were transported to their base at Radon Wood in Suffolk. On December 19th, a well-worn RAF Allison-powered Mustang II arrived for use in conversion training. In the next 10 days, 14 P-51Bs arrived. Chuck Yeager recalled, It only took me an hour and one to be convinced I was among the most fortunate pilots in the world that I was assigned to fly this airplane. By January 14, 1944, the 357th had received their full complement of 48 Mustangs. Air Force bureaucracy again had intended the 357th and their Mustangs for the 9th Air Force, but this changed in one of the first decisions General Dwight Eisenhower made after his arrival in England as Supreme Commander, Allied Expeditionary Forces, SHAEF. The 357th was transferred to 8th Fighter Command, with 9th Tactical Air Command receiving the new P-47-equipped 358th Fighter Group. Chapter 13. End of the Beginning On October 14, 1943, the Jagdwaffe inflicted a defeat on 8th Bomber Command as decisive as that of RAF Fighter Command over London on September 15, 1940. The 20% loss rate was unbearable. On October 15, 8th Bomber Command could not have fielded 50 bombers for a mission. Fortunately, the bad weather now became a friend. Central Germany was covered by thick clouds for the next seven weeks. The bombers could not have flown a deep penetration mission had they possessed the force to do so. For all of November, 8th Bomber Command only struck targets within range of the escorts. The bad weather hid the fact that they could have done no other if the weather had been favorable. The seven weeks saw a transformation in power. On October 15th, the 55th Fighter Group, with its P-38s, was declared operational and flew a sweep along the French coast. This was the first step on the road to revival. Ten days later, the 20th Fighter Group, which had arrived in England a week after the 55th, was declared operational. There were now 96 fighters capable of covering the bombers over targets in central Germany. Unfortunately, serviceability of the P-38s was low enough that the senior 55th group was forced to commandeer planes and pilots from the 20th to fill out its early missions. It was not until January 1944 that both would have sufficient P-38s to be able to operate individually. On November 3rd, 8th Bomber Command sent 539 bombers to Wilhelmshaven, escorted by 333 P-47s from all four groups. The Jagdwaffe stayed clear. Target escort was provided by the 55th Group. The Jagdwaffe was unaware of the presence of the P-38 groups, and JG-1 received a nasty surprise over Holland when it was hit by P-38s from the 55th, with the 343rd Squadron's 2nd Lieutenant Bob Butkey scoring the group's first victory, a BF-109, quickly followed by a second, while his squadron commander, Major Jack Jenkins, claimed an FW-190. The Lightning pilots claimed six, which JG-1 records would later confirm, though 8th Fighter Command only credited them with three. Overall, the Geschwadern reported the loss of 13 fighters, four FW-190A-6s and nine BF-109Gs to the Lightnings and the P-47s of the 4th, 56th, and 78th groups. 11 B-17 Pathfinders equipped with H-2X marked the target, the first to be hit by blind bombing. Steve Pisanos remembered that Don Blakesley again led the mission as penetration escort. They left Debden at 0945 hours and again flew to Halesworth to refuel after heading across the North Sea. They were cruising at 26,000 feet when they crossed into northern Holland at 1225 hours. Moments later, we were suddenly bounced from above by a gaggle of 109s, Captain Clark was first to spot them and called the warning just in time for us to drop our tanks and break hard against them. Pisanos turned so tight he blacked out momentarily, and when he came to, he was alone in the middle of a swirling fight. He looked up and saw more enemy fighters diving into the fight. He chased a BF-109G, but the pilot spotted him and dived away. Blakesley called for everyone to return to base. As I flew back across the North Sea, 
I realized the Luftwaffe had suckered us. The attack was meant to make us drop our tanks prematurely and thus prevent our meeting up with the bombers. The bastards had succeeded. The result was a claim for one BF-109 for the loss of two pilots. The 56th, 78th, and 353rd groups claimed nine between them, while the 55th's P-38s claimed three over the target and again returned without loss. The bombers had unloaded through the thick clouds by use of H-2X. Bomber losses were only seven, four to flak and three to fighters. On November 5th, the 56th, now six victories short of the 100 they had proclaimed they would score by Sadie Hawkins Day on November 6th, flew escort to Munster. Dave Schilling was supposed to lead, since Semke had departed for meetings at 8th Fighter Command prior to the publicity trip to Washington. Zemke, however, learned that the former 56th Group pilots, now on Fighter Command staff, had assigned the group to cover the bomb group most likely to be hit by the Luftwaffe. I flew back to Halesworth and walked into the briefing room just as Dave was about to start. I announced I was taking the mission, and he was grounded. I'm sure he spent the next few hours cursing that SOB Zemke. The group covered the 2nd Air Division, rendezvousing over the Zauder Zee. As the P-47s flew deeper into enemy airspace, they encountered small formations of enemy fighters, which they drove off. Near the target, someone called in, Bandits to the north. It was a formation of around 30 FW-190s divided into assault and top cover sections, trying to get ahead of the bombers to make a head-on attack. Zemke took the 63rd Squadron to break up the enemy, while Gabreski and the 61st continued to cover the bombers. The wolf pack maintained the element of surprise and knocked down two on their first pass. Zemke fired on one that exploded when he hit the fuel tank. The flight behind Zemke's claimed three more. Gabreski and the 61st went after the assault group, which were carrying W.GR.21 rockets, limiting their maneuverability. The 61st broke them up before they could fire, knocking down two. In five minutes, the enemy fighters had been completely scattered and no longer threatened the bombers. As a result, only one B-24 was lost. The claims for six victories gave them the 100 they had promised. Zemke authorized an extra allotment of liquor and beer for the officers club that night to celebrate. As he later recalled, what had been achieved was justification of all the group had striven for over the past months of training and operations. They had emerged the leading group in England, with nearly twice as many victories as the next in line, cubs that had become a seasoned wolf pack. The 56th now had six aces, Gerald Johnson, Bob Johnson, Bud Mahurin, Frank McCauley, Dave Schilling, and Zemke himself. On November 11th, 58 lightnings from both the 55th and 20th groups and 342 thunderbolts escorted 237 B-17s to Munster again, though the bombers were forced to abort due to bad weather obscuring the city. The P-47s claimed eight destroyed for the loss of two thunderbolts. The next day, 45 P-38s and 345 P-47s escorted 262 bombers on a blind bombing mission to Bremen, in which 100 bombers aborted due to bad weather. Ten enemy fighters were claimed destroyed for a loss of seven P-38s and three P-47s. Significantly, the P-38 losses were due to engine failure at high altitude, which would be a continuing problem throughout the winter of 1943-44. to On November 13th, the 55th Group ran head-on into the problem of operating at high altitude in winter weather with an airplane that was not really suited for the conditions in which it was asked to fight. By the time the pilots reached the target, 48 P-38s had been reduced to 36, with 12 forced to abort en route to the target after suffering engine failures. Only eight of the aborts returned to Nuthampstead the missing four likely falling victim to enemy fighters who came across the cripples and finished them off. When the P-47s reached the limit of their endurance and turned back for England, the relatively small force of P-38s was outnumbered by five to one. The enemy converged on the bombers and the lightnings were badly mauled. Six were shot down when BF-109s streaked through the formation before they could bring their engines to full power. 
This inability to push the Allisons from cruise to full power without risking engine failure created difficulties for the P-38s throughout their time in 8th Fighter Command. Of those that returned to Nuthampstead, 16 were damaged to varying degrees. Second Lieutenant Gerald A. Brown, who would become the group's first ace, brought his P-38 back on one engine. When the ground crew examined it, they counted more than 100 bullet holes and five 20-millimeter shell holes, but Brown was unhurt. Despite the losses and damage suffered and low claims for enemy fighters shot down, the 55th's P-38s held bomber losses below 5%. The Germans were ordered to avoid combat with the escorts if at all possible. The P-38's distinctive shape could be identified at a distance, making it possible for a flight of four lightnings accompanying a wing of bombers to force the enemy to break off. P-38s tearing up the enemy over New Guinea and Rabaul in the Pacific were doing so at altitudes below 20,000 feet. The war that the lightning pilots fought over northern Europe was completely different. The growing ability of 8th Fighter Command was reflected in Heinz Kanoka's diary entry on November 16, 1943. On October 14th, November 13th and 15th, we are sent into action against formations of heavy bombers over the Rhineland, but no further successes are won by the flight. Every time, we become involved in dogfights with the escorting thunderbolts and lightnings. On November 17th, Kanoka was introduced to Reichsmarschall Goering as JG-11's leading bomber killer, credited with having shot down or forced from formation 15 B-17s and B-24s since April. Kanoka noted later that Goering made a most peculiar impression, wearing a unique kind of fancy gray uniform with cap and epaulettes covered with gold braid. He had scarlet boots made of doeskin. His bloated, puffy face made him look to me like a sick man. Close up, I am forced to the conclusion that he uses cosmetics. He has a pleasant voice, however, and is extremely cordial to me. I know that he takes genuine interest in the welfare of his air crews. The Reichsmarschall was most interested in Kanoka's having shot down the first de Havilland mosquito to fall to a Jagdwaffe pilot a year earlier, taking time to express how much he disliked the airplane and the crews that had once disrupted a major speech he was to give in Berlin. November 19th saw the weather over northern Europe go from bad to worse. Kanoka recorded in his diary that the weather closed in, blanketing Holland and Belgium under a murky overcast and swept by heavy blizzards. Even before we managed to thaw the chill out of our bones round the stove in the wooden canteen hut, our planes outside are coated with the congealing snow until they look like petrified monsters out of some fairy tale. The 55th's lightnings scored again on November 25th during a mission to bomb the lille Hasbrook airfield in France. The 338th Squadron's Captain Chet Patterson led his flight to the aid of a P-38 under attack by two FW-190s. Patterson shot down one while the unfortunate P-38, flown by 2nd Lieutenant Manuel Aldecona, collided with the other. Aldecona managed to bail out, but his parachute failed to fully deploy. Mayor Johannes Seifert, Gruppenkommandor of 2nd Group JG-26, and a 57 victory experta, never got out of his fighter. The P-38s returned to Nuthampstead, with pilots claiming four victories. On November 26th, the 78th A and B groups escorted a mission to Montdidier, where they encountered 30 FW-190s from JG-26. Jack Price, 84th Squadron Commander, claimed an FW-190 and a BF-109 for victories four and five, making him an ace. Howard Askelson, shot down one of three BF-109s attacking a B-17, while Warren Wessel shot down an FW-190 when it flew into his fire. The four victories cost two pilots POW and one KIA. The same day, Bob Johnson looked forward to that day's mission to Bremen. He had finally been elevated from wingman to element leader after becoming the 5th 8th Fighter Command ace back on October 10th. Today, he was to lead the 61st Squadron. Unfortunately, he was forced to abort just after takeoff when he discovered a major fuel leak. To top it off, the mission was one of the best the squadron had flown. Over the target, a formation of rocket-carrying BF-110s was spotted. 
Bud Mahurin scored his second triple, bringing his score to 11 as the group's leading ace. Dave Schilling shot down two FW-190s, and Gabreski became the seventh 56th group ace for shooting down two BF-110s. A further four ME-410s were also shot down, while Ralph Johnson of the 62nd Squadron brought down a final pair of 110s. The total claim was 23 victories, three probables, and nine damaged, for no losses. The Bremen mission also saw the 352nd Group finally meet the Luftwaffe while providing withdrawal support. Unfortunately, George Preddy experienced engine roughness crossing the Dutch coast and was ordered to abort. He later wrote in his diary, As luck would have it, my squadron bounced four 109s after I left and three were shot down. Meyer and Dilling got one each, and Bennett and Berkshire shared one. I know my day is coming, and I'm going to do everything possible to be ready when I do meet the Luftwaffe. The bad weather almost cost more casualties when Gene Roberts led 78A Group on an escort mission canceled by weather on November 28th. Lost in the foul weather and unable to see the ground to determine location, he radioed a request for homing to Duxford, receiving a vector heading to the base. When the 36 Thunderbolts finally broke into the clear, they were over the London Barrage balloons, 50 miles south of Duxford. This was due to unforecast winds aloft from the northwest that blew them off course while flying on instruments. The bad weather in November limited the 78th to 11 missions, claiming six for three losses. Second Lieutenant James Slick Morris of the 20th's 77th Squadron was flying his second mission with the 55th on November 29th as second element leader of a 338th Squadron flight. When they came under attack by BF-109s, Morris went after one, but broke off after hitting it to return to the bombers since they were ordered not to leave the formation. His damaged marked the 20th group's first score. Chet Patterson, leading another flight, shot a BF-109 off another lightning's tail. The rest of the group got rough treatment, losing seven for claims of three. Over their first month, the 55th lost 17 P-38s in combat and four likely in combat after suffering mechanical failure, while claiming 23. On November 30th, Jack Oberhansley led 78B Group to Aachen. As he closed behind an FW-190, someone called it out as a P-47. Oberhansley pulled out to the side and, after ensuring it was indeed an FW-190, rolled back in and exploded it. On December 1st, the 78th celebrated its first year in the ETO, escorting bombers to Duren. When the Jagdwaffe intercepted over Aachen, Charles Kepler shot down the FW-190, and James Wilkinson destroyed a BF-109. The bombers suffered low losses with the escorts covering them to and from the target. That day saw the 4th escort 299 bombers to Solingen. John Godfrey was a spare to replace any aborts. Halfway across the channel, Bob Wehrman experienced engine roughness. Jim Goodson told him to turn back. Johnny pulled in on Goodson's wing. He now had his own P-47D, Gentile's old Donny boy, and named it Reggie's Reply in memory of his beloved older brother, whose ship had been sunk by a U-boat in 1941. The cowling carried a portrait of Godfrey's pet spaniel, Lucky, inside a horseshoe he'd paid his crew chief five pounds to paint. The mission marked his first score. He later remembered. Down below me, a lone fort was headed for home, and a BF-109 was jockeying for position up sun to it. I dove down on him from up sun, and he never saw me. I closed in on him very fast from astern. I fired at 250 yards. Immediately, red and white sheets of flame enveloped him. I pulled up to watch him go down, but there was nothing left. I destroyed my first plane and undoubtedly killed a man. I trusted that God would understand. I flew unscathed through the smithereens of what was a plane and a man, and baking sharply, I cleared my tail and watched the clouds hungrily suck the falling debris into their bosom. The wind dispersed the fast-disappearing black cloud, and I flew alone. George Preddy also experienced his baptism of fire. The 352nd flew withdrawal support, leading Crown Prince Red Flight of the 487th Squadron, Preddy spotted an enemy fighter 10 miles south of Wright, Holland. He later reported, I saw one ME-109 behind the rear box of bombers about 3,000 feet below me. 
I started a quarter stern attack, and when about a thousand yards from the enemy aircraft, it started a steep spiral to the left. I followed, closing to 400 yards. As I closed to 200 yards, I fired and saw strikes along the wing route and cockpit. The airplane began smoking and fell out of control at about 7,000 feet. I fired another burst, closing to about 100 yards. After I broke off the attack, the enemy aircraft disintegrated. Preddy's victory was witnessed by his wingman, Second Lieutenant William T. Wisner, and confirmed by his gun camera film. The 487th was the only squadron to encounter the enemy, submitting claims for three 109s. Unfortunately, the 55th again suffered serious losses when eight P-38s failed to return. Six were shot down over Solingen by 109s diving out of the sun. An additional two were lost after suffering engine failure while returning to England. This second heavy loss resulted in General Kepner replacing the group commander. However, the problem was not the command but the airplane. The P-38H was a bad fit with the winter skies over Germany. The 56th scored another six victories for one loss. Gabreski claimed two FW-190s to bring his score to seven. Returning pilots reported the enemy pilots were some of the toughest opponents they had fought. The need of the Mustang for over-the-target support was so great that the 354th Group participated in its first escort mission over Germany on December 5th, a record for arrival to first mission timing in 8th Fighter Command. The group sent 36 P-51s, again led by Don Blakesley with Group Commander Martin Flying Wing, escorting bombers striking airfields around Bordeaux. The 55th sent 34 P-38s, along with the 354th's 36 Mustangs, for target cover, though the Luftwaffe failed to come up. On December 11th, the 354th suffered its first loss during a mission to Bremen, though no enemy fighters were encountered. The 313 P-47s from the 4th, 56th, 78th, 352nd, and 353rd groups claimed 21 shot down. The December 11th Emden mission was one of the most hard fought in a year of hard fights. It was Francis Gabby Gabreski's best-remembered mission, when he came very close to coming in second place in a two-man shootout with a persistent BF-109 pilot. The weather was out of the ordinary, with clear skies over Germany. The weather over England, conversely, was terrible, forcing a takeoff delay until 1,100 hours, when fog burned off, leaving a 5,000-foot ceiling over East Anglia. The P-47s took off two at a time, joining into four plane flights over the nearby North Sea before penetrating the clouds, climbing at 150 miles per hour and 1,000 feet per minute, with wingmen and element leaders glued to the flight leader. After what seemed like forever, the clouds above became lighter as they passed 10,000 feet. They finally popped out into bright sunshine at 11,000 feet. Formations rejoined, and the 16 P-47s crossed the Dutch coast at 20,000 feet. Leveling off at 23,000 feet, they rendezvoused with the bombers in completely clear skies. Moving up the bomber formation, Gabreski spotted another aircraft at the head of the formation and soon identified them as German. Turning the squadron toward the fighters, forming up for head-on attacks, he saw a formation of 60 rocket-carrying BF-110s, ME-410s, and JU-88s, they were still out of firing range when he led the Thunderbolts in a desperate attempt to break them up before they could fire rockets. Picking out three BF-110s, Gabreski closed with his flight, picking Tail End Charlie and closing on its tail. At 200 yards, he opened fire. Pieces flew off as he concentrated on the right-wing route. The right engine billowed smoke as it caught fire. The BF-110 banked away, then fell off in a final dive. He followed and saw the pilot and gunner bail out, then pulled out, realizing the dive had separated him from his flight. Looking around for other P-47s, Gabreski saw four radial engine fighters ahead and below. A glance at his gas gauge told him he should be turning back for England, but flying back alone held no attraction, and he continued closing. Suddenly, he realized they were FW-190s. He reduced speed and fell back, hoping they hadn't spotted him. Dropping below their altitude, he turned away and they continued on. He climbed to 27,000 feet to get best fuel consumption, 
throttled back and leaned the mixture to get across the North Sea to England. After several minutes, he checked his fuel. There was a bit over an hour of flying time. Getting home would be close. He spotted a distant shape. It grew in size as it approached, and he recognized the BF-109. Moments later, the airplane turned toward him. He couldn't change power without losing all chance of getting back. The German curved around to attack from the rear. Just before he came in range, Gabreski turned toward him, and they passed each other. He turned back to 260 degrees. The enemy pilot sensed he couldn't engage in combat and made a second pass. Once again, Gabreski turned toward him, and the tracers missed. Again, he turned west, and the German set up a third pass, taking his time. Gabreski knew he couldn't use the same dodge a third time. As the 109 closed, he tried to climb out of the line of fire, but was just too late. The cockpit filled with smoke as a 20-millimeter shell exploded inside, tearing away the right rudder pedal. The engine stuttered. The enemy fighter flashed past as he fell out of the stall and entered a left spiral that became a spin. He saw a cloud deck below at 11,000 feet and continued spinning, hoping the enemy would take it as the fatal dive. Falling from 25,000 to 11,000 feet seemed to take forever. Halfway there, his opponent recognized the ruse and made another firing pass. Gabreski rammed the stick forward and came out of the spin, diving toward the clouds below. Finally, with the P-47 shaking as it closed on a terminal velocity dive, he disappeared into the clouds. Gabreski throttled back and recovered, hoping not to mush out of the clouds where his opponent was probably waiting for him. He kept releasing back pressure as he felt himself graying out. As his vision returned, he pulled back some more. After nearly blacking out three times, he leveled off in the clouds. His eyes were glued to the altimeter, airspeed indicator, and ball as he concentrated on staying in the clouds as long as possible. The engine was rough, but running, and he had 50 gallons of fuel. Hoping he was near the coast, he slowly climbed, waiting to pop out of the cloud, hoping he could get his position. At 11,000 feet, he sliced up out of the cloud and saw the Dutch coast behind. He was over the North Sea. A shadow passed over, and he looked up. There was the 109. When he saw the pilot set up a pass, he disappeared back into the cloud. Not knowing where he was, he switched to emergency frequency and called, Mayday, hoping for a vector home. The air-sea rescue controller answered after the third call. After being identified, he was told to maintain 260 degrees. Dropping out of the cloud, he was alone between two cloud decks. Time stood still as he crossed the 100 miles of freezing North Sea. Finally, he saw a line on the horizon that soon became the English coast. Roaring over the beach, he recognized Ipswich below. He was 10 miles from Halesworth. Turning south, the airfield was soon in sight. With no other traffic, he made a straight-in approach and dropped onto the runway. A moment later, the engine rumbled to a stop, out of gas. He coasted to the runway's end and turned off, breaking to a stop. Smoke curled from under the cowling as he slid the canopy open and dragged himself out. The crash truck and ambulance came to a stop in front of him. The Emden mission was successful. Escorted all the way, only 17 bombers were lost of the 500 cent. The 56th had arrived just in time to prevent the Zerstörer's rocket attack that would have decimated the formation. On December 13th, the 354th celebrated its first month with the P-51 by sending 36 Mustangs to fly target over Kiel, their first trip to Germany. The 355th Squadron's 2nd Lieutenant Red Emerson's Mustang got very badly shot up by flak over the target. Dazed and weakened by loss of blood when a piece of shrapnel cut his neck, Emerson flew back across the North Sea to England and landed without brakes in extremely poor visibility. His fighter looked like a sieve, and his parachute harness had been severed by another hunk of shrapnel. The 354th finally met the enemy in combat during the escort mission to Bremen on December 16th and claimed one BF-110 shot down by 2nd Lieutenant Charles F. Gum of the 355th Squadron. Colonel Martin led this as an all-354th mission. 
On the way home, the 353rd Squadron's 2nd Lieutenant Glenn T. Eagleston became the first pilot to survive bailing out after he managed to get across the channel and almost to the English coast after his Mustang had been damaged by the rear gunner of a BF-110G that he claimed as a probable. Fortunately for him, he was spotted by the crew of an RAF rescue launch just as he touched down in the icy waters and was plucked aboard after only five minutes of what he later said was, the coldest I ever was in my life. A third mission to Bremen on December 20th saw the Pioneer Mustang Group contribute 47 P-51s led by Colonel Martin to an escort force of 26 55th Group P-38s and 418 P-47s from the 4th, 56th, 78th, 352nd, 353rd, and the new 356th, 358th, and 359th groups that had arrived in late October and early November and were flying their first mission. The 546 B-17s and B-24s that made the attack were the largest mission so far. 8th Fighter Command was now twice the strength it had been on Black Thursday, with three long-range groups capable of escorting bombers all the way to the targets. Over the target, James Howard spotted three BF-109s, making passes at the bombers. One made the mistake of pulling up under a B-17 as he completed his gunnery pass, which gave Howard the chance to close in on it from four o'clock. While still out of range, he fired a burst to scare his opponent away from the bomber as the pilot positioned for another attack. Pushing his throttle forward, Howard rapidly closed the BF-109 from dead astern. When it filled his gun sight, he fired a two-second burst and it emitted heavy black smoke. Back at Boxstead, after their return, his wingman, Lieutenant H.B. Smith, reported that he saw parts fly off the BF-109 before the engine exploded and that it fell away in an uncontrollable vertical dive. The 354th claimed three victories, but suffered its first combat losses when three Mustangs failed to return, including Major Owen Seaman, commander of the 353rd Squadron, who went down over the North Sea after his fighter had been damaged over the target. On December 22nd, the group escorted bombers to Osnabrück and Münster, with 28 354th P-51s and 40 P-38s from the 55th Group providing target cover. The P-51 at this point was not reliable and suffered numerous instances of engine problems, forcing a pilot to abort the mission that were later traced to the poor combination of British aviation gasoline and American spark plugs. On this mission, 20 Mustangs were forced to abort due to rough engines. The 448 P-47s from eight groups claimed 15 destroyed, one probable, and six damaged. The December 22nd mission would be forever recalled by John Godfrey as the one that gave him nightmares for the rest of his life. The day began at 0745 hours, just sunrise in wartime winter England, when he was awakened by one of the English batmen who served the fourth pilots and was informed he was on the day's mission. After breakfast, Group Commander Chesley Peterson briefed at 0900 hours. This time, the target was Munster, 300 miles inside Germany, making it the deepest penetration mission the 4th had flown to date. The group would provide withdrawal cover. Takeoff time was 1245 hours. The weather briefing was low clouds over England, heavy clouds over the North Sea, extensive clouds over most of the continent, and especially heavy clouds over Munster. The bombers would drop using H-2X blind bombing radar. The intelligence briefer announced that the Luftwaffe now had more fighters stationed in Germany than ever before, and opposition is assured. At 12.37 hours, Major Selden Edner, the new 336th commander, started his engine. Soon, the hum of 48 turbocharged R-2800s overwhelmed all other sounds on the airfield. Godfrey, flying Edner's wing as shirt blue purple too, goosed his thunderbolt from its parking spot as Edner taxied past. At 12.43 hours, the squadron braked to a stop on the taxiway behind the 334th and 335th squadrons. Bob Wehrman, who was grounded with a cold, was assistant flagman for the takeoff. He recalled, They moved onto the runway two at a time, stood on their brakes, and ran up their engines for mag checks. Then they pushed the throttles to take off power. When everything sounded right, you waved a black and white checkered flag, and they started rolling. 
The next pair moved into position, and you sent them off when the ones ahead had reached midpoint of the runway. You always had to check nothing had happened on takeoff, because our runway was higher in the middle than it was at either end, and once they passed the midpoint, they were out of sight till they lifted off. Once off the ground, the pilots sucked up gear and flaps, then banked to the left, circling the field with each pair cutting the turn a little tighter than the ones ahead to speed join up. By the time formation leader Colonel Peterson had completed two circuits of the airfield, all 48 were in position. They continued climbing, and each flight disappeared into the murk. Wingmen kept their eyes glued on their leader, formatting as tight as possible while they held best climb. At 13.15 hours, 25 minutes after takeoff, they were still in the soup when they crossed the East Anglia coast, unseen below, and continued climbing over the North Sea. Everyone listened intently to their engines. A man had 15 minutes in those waters to get in his life raft before he froze to death, should he go in now. Finally, as altimeters turned past 15,000 feet, the light inside the cloud grew brighter. The formations continued on up, and the white nose fighters suddenly popped into the cold blue sky under a bright sun at nearly 17,000 feet. Each pilot's headphones were filled with the high-pitched whine of German jamming as they continued on up to 22,000 feet and leveled off. A break in the clouds several minutes later revealed the Dutch coast north of the Zouder Zee. The enemy paid them no attention as they flew on toward Germany. Outside the cockpits, the air temperature was 40 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. Steve Pisanos recalled that under these conditions, your feet were about melting from the hot air pumped in from the engine, but by the time that air got to the control stick, your hand felt frozen around the grip. Finally, Munster hove into view. The sky was black with flak bursts. Moments later, Peterson called, there they are, as the lead bomber formation was sighted. Peterson and the 334th Squadron took up position above the leading bombers, while the 335th Squadron moved to the right around the formation's middle, and the 336th took up position to the formation's left rear. Every pilot had his head on the proverbial swivel, searching the skies for enemy fighters. Godfrey, who would later be known as the pilot in the group with the best vision, glanced down and spotted two shadows racing across the cloud deck. In an instant, he spotted the shadow's source, two BF-109s. He called them in, but squadron leader Edner couldn't see them. Follow me, I'll show them to you, Godfrey called. He punched off his drop tank and winged over into a steep dive, failing to notice that no one followed. He rapidly closed from behind. The 109s gave no sign of having spotted him. His dive turned him away from the bomber's course, taking him further into enemy airspace alone with each second. Closing, he watched the two fighters make their way only 20 to 30 feet from the tops. The wingman was higher than the leader, and Godfrey chose him. He was closing so fast, he pulled the throttle back almost to idle to cut his overtake speed. It was not enough, and he had time for only one burst as he roared past the surprised enemy pilot. The 109 was hit, but not enough to go down. As the enemy pilot turned to latch onto Godfrey's tail, First Lieutenant Georgia Wynne from the 334th Squadron, who had heard Godfrey's call and followed him down, pulled onto the Messerschmitt's tail and opened fire. Godfrey rolled onto the tail of the leader before he could react. A solid burst set the engine on fire and smoke billowed from the cowling. An instant later, the canopy flew off and the pilot launched himself into space and pulled his ripcord. The parachute billowed as Godfrey's thunderbolt flashed past. He was exhilarated at the realization he had scored victory number two. Suddenly, the thunderbolt staggered under heavy cannon hits. Godfrey looked in his rearview mirror and saw a third 109 on his tail, spitting fire from its centerline cannon. Hit again, Godfrey pulled the stick back to his stomach and stomped the right rudder pedal, attempting to flick roll out of the line of fire. Instead, the P-47 flipped tail over nose, tumbling into the clouds below. Now he was in a life-or-death battle to regain control of the violently spinning fighter. He was thrown around the cockpit despite being strapped in. There was only one option left. Bail out. But G-Force threw him back into his seat each time he tried to grab the canopy handles to slide it open. Time seemed to slow as his body filled with adrenaline from the terror of dying. In a moment's clarity, 
Godfrey suddenly thought to grab the throttle and stick and push them both forward. As speed increased, the violent shaking stopped and he was able to execute a successful spin recovery, graying out under the G-force as the P-47 nosed up. When he glanced at the instrument panel, he saw it had been shot out. There was no altitude indicator, and the ball was no longer there in the turn and bank indicator. The airspeed indicator seemed to function, and the magnetic compass was still okay. Inside the cloud, he had no idea if he was upright or inverted. Suddenly, the thunderbolt popped out the bottom of the clouds. Whatever his altitude, the ground was close. He pulled back the throttle, then pulled the stick back as far as he could. G-force again grayed him out. Then the treetops flashed below as the thunderbolt streamed thick contrails from its wingtips. Suddenly, he was surrounded by flak explosions. Flying by instinct, Godfrey pushed the throttle forward and pulled the stick back, climbing desperately for the cloud base. In a moment, he disappeared back into the enfolding grayness. He concentrated on flying carefully, watching the altimeter closely to spot a dive from vertigo as quickly as possible. Suddenly, the airplane seemed to go faster, and then he felt the spin as G-Force pinned him in his seat. A moment later, the P-47 again spun out of the clouds in a vertigo-induced dead man's spiral. He managed to pull out over the treetops again. This time, he remained in the clear as he roared on just above the trees. There was a town ahead. Then suddenly, there was more flak exploding close enough to toss him around. Godfrey turned east, then north, staying low, and left the flak behind. But this wasn't the direction home. Looking outside, he realized he was now over Holland. A moment later, he suddenly found himself over a Luftwaffe airfield he hadn't seen in the rain. Knowing they would send someone after him, he again took refuge in the clouds, regardless of vertigo. Once inside, he kept climbing. All he could do was watch the altimeter, which kept advancing for several minutes. Then the needle started unwinding, and he felt the buildup of G-forces again. For a third time, the P-47 fell out of the clouds in a spin. Desperately, he nosed down to get out of the spin, then pulled the stick back hard, and contrails from the wingtips drew a line that only flattened just above the trees when he blacked out for an instant. Now thoroughly terrified, Godfrey's flying gear was sweat-soaked, clear through. He stayed on the deck, heading toward the coast. Again, flak bursts blossomed around him. There was a line of flak towers ahead, and he could see the flashes of gunfire as they opened fire. His fear of being shot overpowered the fear of vertigo, and he climbed back into the clouds, reasoning that he only had a few minutes to fly in them to get past the coastal flak belt. Again, he strained to watch the slightest movement of the altimeter, and moments later felt the unmistakable g-force of another vertigo-induced spin. This time, when he came out, he saw the water of the North Sea below. The prop blast traced a line on the water as he pulled out mere feet above the waves. He steadied the compass and took up a 260-degree heading. The radio was out, wrecked by gunfire, so calling air-sea rescue was impossible. The P-47 droned west, just above the waves of the rain-swept North Sea. Godfrey leaned out the mixture till he heard the engine popping, then gave it just enough to keep it steady. Finally, a smudge on the horizon resolved itself as England, but Godfrey had no idea where he was when he crossed the shoreline. Several minutes later, he came across an airfield he did recognize, Downham Market, west of Norwich, north of the Wash. He lowered flaps and dropped his gear, which thankfully came down and locked and made a straight-in approach, heedless of any other airplane. He touched down and rolled out, coming to a stop by the small RAF control tower. Switching off the engine, he sat there in the silence a long moment, then slid the canopy open and climbed out. When his feet touched the grass, he was overcome with nausea and was throwing up when an RAF officer arrived a minute later. After downing a tumbler of Irish whiskey to steady his nerves in the tower and sitting still for half an hour, he went back out and looked his thunderbolt over. There were bullet holes, but nothing serious. He told them he was going home. Twenty minutes later, never flying above 1,000 feet, Godfrey sat down on the Debden runway. In the officer's club later, Colonel Peterson started to reprimand him for leaving the formation, then thought better of it 
and bought him a drink. After six days of bad weather that grounded all operations, Ludwigshafen was struck on December 30th. The 20th Group finally joined the 55th, with both sending 78 P-38s, including four new P-38Js from the 20th, while the 354th sent 41 P-51s to provide target cover. The Mustangs ran into several formations of enemy planes maneuvering to set up attacks and broke them up, with pilots claiming four destroyed. The 483 P-47s claimed another four destroyed. This was the 78th Group's last escort of the year. 78A provided withdrawal support near Saint-Mahil, where Lt. William Julian scored his first victory, a BF-109 sneaking up on a straggler. The final escort mission of 1943 was flown on December 31st to Bordeaux-Paris Airport. The two P-38 groups again provided 78 Lightnings and claimed three enemy fighters destroyed, while the 33 Mustangs claimed two over the target. The P-47s claimed six. The P-38s had problems with the weather. One had an engine explode while the second caught fire over England on the return. While the main force hit the Paris airport, the 78th flew its first fighter-bomber mission, a dive-bombing attack on Gilzarayan airfield. The P-47s carried a 500-pound bomb on each wing pylon. Every pilot returned with a tale of personal terror as they dived into the sea of flak over the field. Ernie Russell flew as wingman to Quince Brown for the first time. He later remembered that, I was never so scared before or after, diving into that flak, but I managed to put the bomb somewhere useful and impressed Quince so much that he asked for me as his regular wingman. That was the best compliment I ever got in the Air Force. On December 27, 1943, General Arnold sent a New Year's message to the commanders of the 8th and 15th Air Forces. Aircraft factories in this country are turning out large quantities of airplanes, engines, and accessories. Our training establishments are operating 24 hours per day, seven days per week training crews. We are now furnishing fully all the aircraft and crews to take care of your attrition. It is a conceded fact that Overlord and Anvil, the invasion of Europe, will not be possible unless the German Air Force is destroyed. Therefore, my personal message to you, this is a must is to destroy the enemy air force wherever you find them, in the air, on the ground, and in the factories. The missions of December had shown that 8th Fighter Command could now provide effective cover to the bombers. Paraphrasing Winston Churchill, it was not the beginning of the end, but it was the end of the beginning. Chapter 14 Jimmy Doolittle Arrives the 37 young men attending Southeastern Normal School, Oklahoma's teacher training school in Durant, Oklahoma, answered as one when the United States declared war on Germany in April 1917, all enlisting in the U.S. Army. Among them was Ira Clarence Eaker, then a senior and a week short of turning 21, who was planning to teach science and history in the state to which his hardscrabble family had moved from East Texas when he was five years old. A month short of graduation, he was sent to officer candidate school and commissioned a second lieutenant of infantry that summer. Eaker met his destiny shortly after he arrived at Fort Bliss in November 1917. A Curtis JN-4D landed with engine trouble, and Lieutenant Eaker offered to help. Once the cowling was opened, the solution was easily found, and Eaker reconnected the spark plug lead. By chance, the pilot was flying from base to base, hoping to recruit volunteers for flight training with the Signal Corps Aviation Section. Congratulating Eaker on his mechanical ability, he encouraged the young lieutenant to apply for transfer to the Air Service, and he did just that. Eaker was awarded his pilot's wings at Kelly Field in July 1918 and received an assignment to Rockwell Field near San Diego. Fate again intervened in early 1919, when Colonel Henry H. Hap Arnold returned from combat in France, assigned as the new commanding officer at Rockwell. He was accompanied by another veteran who had flown with him in France, Major Carl A. Tui Spatz, Arnold's executive officer. A few months later, the command's adjutant was killed in a crash. Lieutenant Eaker had impressed Arnold, and he was offered the position. Eaker had found that he liked the Army, but had been on the point of taking his discharge 
since he did not see how he could compete professionally with the West Pointers who dominated the officer corps. With Arnold's sponsorship, he soon became one of the Air Service's rising stars. Still not convinced that his future lay in the Air Service despite his appointment as commander of the 5th Aero Squadron at Mitchell Field on Long Island in 1921, Eaker was ready to submit his papers and leave the Army for law school when fate intervened a third time in the person of Major General Mason M. Patrick, Chief of the Air Service, who was forced to land at Mitchell while flying to Boston when his pilot became sick. Eaker volunteered to fly him onto Boston and back to Washington. Impressed by Eaker's flying skill and learning of his plans, Mason offered to sponsor him at Columbia University Law School if he would remain in the Army. Eaker took the offer, though he returned to Washington in 1924 as Patrick's executive assistant, having found the law not to his liking. There, he renewed his contract with Arnold, who was now Chief of the Air Service Information Division. The two, despite being cautioned by Patrick against risking their careers, became passionate supporters of General Billy Mitchell when he challenged the Army leadership on behalf of the Air Service and Air Power. Arnold and Spots were among those who did risk their careers to testify for Mitchell at his 1925 court-martial, while Eaker worked behind the scenes. He thus avoided the professional banishment that Arnold and Spots suffered following Mitchell's conviction. Following Mitchell's dismissal from service, Arnold took on his mantle as leader of the Young Turks in the Air Corps, as the Air Service had been renamed. Eaker remained in the vicinity of the upper reaches of the Air Corps when General Patrick's assistant and successor as chief, Major General James E. Fetchett, retained him as staff pilot and promoted him as Air Corps executive officer in the office of the Assistant Secretary of War. Eaker was not happy flying a desk and took every opportunity to get away and fly, continuing the success he had found as leader of the 1925 Pan American Mission, in which his planes and crews visited 25 Central and South American nations to demonstrate air power's long reach. He pioneered aerial refueling in 1929, setting an endurance record of nearly six days in the air as chief pilot along with Spots, 1st Lieutenant Harry Halverson and 2nd Lieutenant Elwood P. Casada in the Fokker C-2 question mark which was refueled in flight over Southern California 43 times by a hose from a Douglas DWC tanker. This included an appearance at the year's Rose Bowl football game, where they overflew the crowded stadium. In 1931, Eaker obtained a degree in journalism from the University of Southern California, during which time he spent his weekends out at March Field in Riverside, where Arnold was the base commander. After he graduated in 1933, he took command of one of the March-based squadrons. The two also hunted and fished together in the Sierra Nevada. In 1936, he set a record by flying nonstop from New York to Los Angeles, entirely on instruments and navigating by the newly built radio beacon system. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, Lieutenant Colonel Eager commanded the 20th Pursuit Group at Hamilton Field outside San Francisco. Arnold, chief of the newly designated U.S. Army Air Forces, quickly recalled him to Washington and gave his longtime trusted associate the assignment to organize the American Air Force in Britain that would take on the Luftwaffe, sending Eaker to London after promoting him to Brigadier General and pinning his own Brigadier General's stars on his old comrade. With that history, it was with a heavy heart that Arnold was forced to the conclusion after the Schweinfurt disaster in October 1943 that he must replace one of his oldest and most trusted friends as commander of 8th Bomber Command. The man Arnold chose to replace Eaker was a friend he had made back when both were members of the Rockwell Bunch immediately after World War I. Major General James H. Doolittle, former commander of the North Africa-based 12th Air Force, now commander of the newly created 15th Air Force, rivaled and even exceeded Eaker for setting aviation records and contributing to aviation development. Doolittle had first gained public notice as the first pilot to fly coast-to-coast -coast between sunrise and sunset in September 1922, departing Pablo Beach, Florida at dawn in a de Havilland DH-4 and flying to Rockwell Field in San Diego, where he landed at dusk. He was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for the feat. He was then assigned to the Air Corps Engineering School at McCook Field, later Wright-Patterson. 
In 1925, he received the first doctorate in aeronautical engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, after completing his MS in aeronautics there the year before and receiving the Distinguished Flying Cross a second time for research performed for his master's thesis regarding aircraft acceleration. He was then assigned as pilot of the Curtis R3C2 racing seaplane, in which he won the Schneider Cup that year with a record speed of 232 miles per hour. For this, he was awarded the McKay Trophy the next year. He followed that in 1927 by executing the first successful outside loop, a maneuver previously considered fatal, in which the pilot faces the outside of a loop and experiences negative g-force through the entire maneuver. Doolittle's most important contributions to the development of aviation involved his work with instrument flight. Working with the Guggenheim Aviation Foundation, he studied the relationships of visual cues and motion senses. In 1929, he was the first pilot to take off, fly, and land an airplane using instruments alone, without any outside view. The result of his work to develop and test the artificial horizon and directional gyroscope. This work resulted in the award of the Harmon Trophy. His other major contribution came after he left active service in the Air Corps in 1930 and became aviation manager for Shell Oil, where he pushed the company to develop 100-octane aviation gasoline and the capability to produce it in large quantity. This was what gave the edge of performance to Allied aircraft over their Axis opponents in World War II. Doolittle became famous with the youth of America, whom he would one day lead in battle when he won the Thompson Trophy in 1932, flying the dangerous GB racer to a record speed of 252 miles per hour after previously setting a world airspeed record for land planes of 294 miles per hour with it. Having won the Bendix transcontinental race in 1931, he had now won the top three awards in racing, the Schneider, Bendix, and Thompson trophies. He officially retired at the end of race week in Cleveland with the statement, I have yet to hear of anyone engaged in this work dying of old age. While Doolittle was arguably America's most famous flyer as the result of these achievements, he became a legend on April 18, 1942, when he led 16 B-25 Mitchell bombers off the aircraft carrier USS Hornet to bomb Tokyo, Kobe, Yokohama, Osaka, and Nagoya. Forced to take off earlier, and farther from the target, than originally planned, all the aircraft were lost when they crashed in China, other than one that landed in Siberia and was interned. The next morning, surveying the wreckage of his bomber, Doolittle confided to his co-pilot, Captain Richard E. Dick Cole, that he expected a court-martial for failure when they were finally able to get back to the United States. Instead, Doolittle was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Franklin Roosevelt in a ceremony at the White House that was mobbed by the press. Arnold promoted him directly from lieutenant colonel to brigadier general and gave him command of the 12th Air Force, which would fight in North Africa following the success of Operation Torch on November 8, 1942. Even as an Air Force commander, he continued to fly combat missions to set an example to his men. A lifelong teetotaler and non-smoker, Doolittle possessed the ability never to forget a face or name which the author discovered on being introduced to him in 1976 when he immediately remembered the author's father of the same name, whom he had not seen since they met at the National Air Races in 1932. This ability on his part made every man who ever worked for him think he took personal interest in their work. He did keep track of his subordinates and made certain they were recognized for their work. There was a major difference between Doolittle and all the other senior USAAF leaders. He had left active, regular service in 1929, becoming a reservist. He had never taken part in the great battles regarding the future of air power that Arnold, Spots, and Eaker, the disciples of Billy Mitchell and Julio Douay, and their advocacy of strategic bombing as the solution to modern warfare, had fought for 20 years. Doolittle, a supreme pragmatist, would use whatever worked regardless of its position in the hierarchy of true belief. Eventually, he would come to see the presence of the bombers not as the ultimate purpose of the mission, but rather as bait to bring the enemy within range of the fighters in order to destroy him. Had he ever stated such a belief before making the decision to follow the tactic, 
he would have been branded a heretic by those who now placed him in command. His pragmatism and refusal to do something just because it fit in with a previous belief system would change the nature of the air war. The problem for Arnold in replacing Eaker was that it had to be done in such a way that there was no hint in public of his being upset with Eaker's performance in England in any way, such an interpretation being deemed bad for morale. This was resolved by the reorganization of the Allied air forces in Northern Europe and the Mediterranean. The origin of the decision was a memorandum by Spots written by Arnold back on June 24, 1943, in which he pointed out that dividing the strategic bombing force that had been established in England into two, with a strategic force based in Italy after the likely invasion of that country, would allow the campaign to take advantage of better weather when the bombers were grounded by bad weather in England. Additionally, such a division of the force would require the enemy to dilute their defenses against either. Eaker argued against the division of force, but Arnold eventually agreed with Spots. The heavy bomber units in the 12th Air Force were transferred to the new 15th Air Force in November, initially commanded by Doolittle. This force would be responsible for strategic bombing of southern Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary from bases in southern Italy. Sextant, the Cairo Conference, held in December 1943, defined changes in the command structure of the Allied Air Forces to streamline command relationships for the air war and invasion to come, just as the previous Quebec conference that summer had defined the goals of the air campaign to create the conditions for invasion. The changes first suggested by Spots were refined and advocated by General Arnold. At the end of the conference, the following organizational changes were approved. The 8th and 15th Air Forces became the United States Strategic Air Forces, USSTAF, commanded by Arnold's closest collaborator, General Spots. Doolittle was replaced by Major General Nathan F. Twining as the 15th's commander. Doolittle was then named the new commander of the 8th Air Force, replacing Eaker. The two strategic air forces were to complement each other and coordinate their missions under the control of Spots, who moved his headquarters to London. The 12th Air Force became the tactical air force committed to the campaign in Italy after the 9th Air Force was transferred from North Africa to England to take the same role in the coming cross-channel invasion and placed under command of Eaker's old question mark crewmen, Major General Elwood P. Casada. 9th Air Force and the RAF's 2nd Tactical Air Force in Britain were placed under the Allied Expeditionary Air Forces, AEAF, initially commanded by RAF Air Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory, an officer universally disliked and considered by many to be incompetent. When Lee Mallory was promoted out of the way to command Air Defense of Great Britain, the former fighter command, RAF Air Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder was placed in charge of the Allied Air Forces committed to the invasion as part of his duties as second-in-command to General Eisenhower, who was named Supreme Commander Allied Expeditionary Forces, SHAEF, at the Cairo Conference. With British General Sir Harold Alexander, now Supreme Commander, Mediterranean Theater, it was required that there be an American second-in-command. Eaker was named Commander, Mediterranean Allied Air Forces, MAAF. The North African Air Forces, which included 12th Air Force, were combined with the Mediterranean Air Command that oversaw the British Desert Air Force and Balkan Air Forces, and the Free French Forces in the Mediterranean, and placed in MAAF, which was also responsible for day-to-day -day operational control of the 15th Air Force. Arnold notified Eaker of the change in assignment in a curt message dated December 19th. Eaker, for his part, did not wish to leave his command and made things as personally difficult for Arnold as possible, cabling him, Believe war interest best served by my retention command 8th Air Force, otherwise experience this theater for nearly two years wasted. If I am to be allowed my personal preference having started with the 8th and seen it for major task in this theater, it would be heartbreaking to leave just before climax. The transfer meant a promotion for Eaker to Lieutenant General. Finally, Eisenhower soothed the situation, cabling Eaker. As you well know, I would be more than delighted to have you with me. Ending with, we do not, repeat not, have enough top men to concentrate them in one place. Realizing there was nothing more to be said, Eaker accepted, but the 25-year relationship between Eaker and Arnold 
was irrevocably harmed. Despite the New York Times headline for December 19th, blaring, General Eaker moves up. Once in his new command, Eaker flourished, directing air support for the Italian campaign and taking a personal role in the shuttle bombing missions from Italy to the USSR that summer. He was in the USSR on June 6, 1944, when he learned that the Luftwaffe had not shown up over the Normandy beaches. He later wrote that the moment was my greatest personal satisfaction in World War II. Throughout the 8th Air Force, New Year's Day brought with it certainty that 1944 would be the war's decisive year and the most demanding time in their lives. For the whole Air Force, but particularly 8th Fighter Command, the pressure was on. Defeating the Luftwaffe in the air was the goal without which there could be no successful invasion. The 8th was still a very long way from achieving that goal. The Jagdwaffe was far from a spent force. Aircraft production in Germany had increased monthly, while the output of replacement pilots kept pace with losses. Though the Nachwuchs, new growth, as they were called in the Geschwadern, did not have the level of training that had been the standard a year earlier, which had been notably lower than that of those who had fought the Battle of Britain. Nevertheless, the Jagdflieger, fighter pilots, were confident that they had the capability to make the Americans pay so heavy a price that their air campaign could be defeated, just as had happened to the German air campaign against England. Doolittle's arrival as commander of the 8th Air Force, effective January 6, 1944, sent a wave of shock and surprise through the force. Captain Richard E. Dick Hewitt, pilot and maintenance officer of the 84th Fighter Squadron in the 78th Fighter Group, spoke for many when he remembered the news. I and every pilot in the group, and I imagine every other pilot in every other group, had grown up reading about his exploits, and a desire to follow his example had probably been part of the motivation of the overwhelming majority of us to become pilots ourselves. There was nothing he would ask of us that we did not believe he would do first himself, and probably already had. That said, most, including Hewitt, thought that Eaker had been unfairly treated, to be removed from the command just as the force was finally ready to achieve what it had been created to do. For the Americans, the key to victory lay in the power of sheer numbers. The call that had been deemed impossible in 1941 for training 50,000 pilots annually had been fulfilled. A new pilot reported to a fighter group with a minimum of 400 hours training, 150 of that in the fighter type he would fly in combat. His German opposite number reported to his unit with a third of that experience, if he was lucky. The new men filled the veteran groups to bursting, allowing General Kepner to issue orders expanding the decision in the fall of 1943 to divide each fighter group into two. Each could now mount two 48-plane missions. New groups arrived each month. Eighth Fighter Command now had 12 of the 15 fighter groups planned for the force, the last three would arrive by May. Not only were there numbers, but now those aircraft were capable of providing protection to the bombers all the way to the target and back. In 8th Fighter Command, two changes in strategy and tactics would have a major effect in the coming battles. The first came soon after Doolittle took command, when he announced a major change in 8th Fighter Command escort policy on January 7th, adopting phased fighter escort a concept that had been argued at length since the beginning of the air campaign back in May 1943. Since then, fighter groups had joined with the bombers and stayed with them until they were required to turn back due to low fuel, with each fighter group supporting a particular bomber formation. This tactic failed to maximize the fighters' range because the escorts ended up flying a further distance than the bombers they were covering. The difference in cruising speeds between fighters and bombers meant the fighters had to weave or fly S-turns to remain close to the bombers. As a result, for every mile the bombers flew, the fighters flew half again, if not more. This cut the maximum range dramatically when compared with their straight-line range. The early P-47s, which had to break off over the low countries due to lack of fuel, actually had the straight-line range to fly well into Germany. Phased escort involved a group flying directly to a rendezvous point from where they would cover a particular area as the bomber formations flew through it until another group rendezvoused further en route. Because they were able to fly directly to the rendezvous point, 
they had more fuel and could take the bombers further. Thus, short-ranged Spitfires escorted the formation across the Channel or North Sea, with P-47s picking them up as they crossed the coast, taking them halfway to a target in Germany, with P-38s relieving the P-47s until the target was in sight, where P-51s would take up the coverage over the target and through initial withdrawal. Though both P-38s and P-51s might cover the target if it was not so deep in Germany that only the Mustang could provide cover. The A and B groups meant that a unit could send one group for outbound escort and the second for return. When the leaders of 8th Fighter Command brought their arguments in favor of this to Doolittle, he had no trouble accepting their validity, since he had made that change in the 15th Air Force many months earlier. While this made sense strategically and tactically, it did not go down well with the bomb groups. Crews were comforted by the sight of the little friends around their formation, despite the fact that placing the fighters in this position and restricting their ability to take offensive action against enemy fighters actually made the escort less effective. The next change Doolittle authorized was even less popular with the bomber crews. On January 21st, following further discussions with General Kepner, his staff, and fighter group leaders, Doolittle declared that while the role of protecting the bomber formation should not be minimized, the fighter escorts should be encouraged to meet the enemy and destroy him rather than be content to keep him away. Several days earlier, when he had visited Kepner's headquarters, he had noticed a sign that read, The first duty of the Air Force fighters is to bring the bombers back alive. When he asked Kepner who had made that rule, he was told that it dated to Monk Hunter's command of the fighters. Indeed, the strategy was at first dictated as much by force majeure as anything else, since when Hunter led the force, there were only some 175 fighters available in all of 8th Fighter Command at the time of the Schweinfurt-Regensburg mission. But now there were 12 groups, each equipped with 108 fighters, capable of sending two 48-plane escort formations with each mission. Doolittle ordered Kepner to change that rule to the first duty of 8th Air Force fighters is to destroy German fighters. When Kepner asked if this meant the command was now authorized to take the offensive, Doolittle replied, yes. Pragmatism had just taken a step away from detailed procedure. Fighter group commanders like Hub Zemke and Don Blakesley had been advocating this change in overall strategy since the previous summer, with Zemke stretching the rules of close escort as far as he could to give the wolf pack the opportunity to meet the enemy as early as possible. Zemke agreed with experienced fighter leaders like Adolf Galland, who had argued vociferously in 1940 against tying the fighter escorts too closely to the bombers and losing the fighters' best tactic offensive action to break up the defenders before they could make an attack. Zemke later wrote of Doolittle's decision, General Eaker's brief had been that our first objective was to bring the bombers home and our second to shoot down enemy aircraft. Now General Doolittle told us to pursue the enemy when and wherever we could. We were now allowed to follow him down and no longer had to break off attacks. It also meant official recognition of what I had long advocated— getting way out ahead of the force to bounce the enemy fighters before they had a chance to make their attacks. The result of the change regarding escort policy was that several fighter groups, most notably the Wolfpack and the Eagles, followed by the 352nd, who became known as the Blue-Nosed Bastards of Bodney, from the markings on their new Mustangs once they re-equipped, and the new 357th group, which arrived as the change was made, ran up their scores over the spring months as the daylight offensive finally hit its stride. However, the change was not universally adopted. Some group commanders disagreed with the new strategy and maintained the close escort policy. Prominent among these was Colonel Jim Stone, whose belief in close escort meant that the 78th would not score as highly as the 4th or 56th groups it had served beside from the beginning a year earlier. The 359th Group's Colonel Avalon Taken Jr. was another who kept the policy of not allowing his pilots to go herring off over the countryside, as he put it. This difference between the groups was primarily down to the aggressiveness of particular commanding officers. By May, Zemke had proposed to General Kepner that the aggressive commanders like himself, Blakesley, 
and those others whose groups were demonstrating the value of the offensive tactics be replaced in their groups, and that they be assigned to the other groups as temporary group commanders for several months, which would allow them to turn those units around by changes in leadership. A few months later, Kepner took Zempke up on the idea, and he left the 56th to take command of the 479th Group, the last to join 8th Fighter Command, which had experienced setbacks in its combat operations. Robin Olds, who became the 479th's leading ace, later said that there was a real difference in the group and the way it went about fighting within a matter of weeks following Zemke's arrival. Choosing to follow a defensive or offensive escort strategy was not the only determinant of a group's success. The escort assignments it received were crucial. A group that was assigned to cover the leading formation was much more likely to run across the opposition than one bringing up the rear. As successful pilots approached completion of their tours, commanders like Zemke and Blakesley intervened at 8th Fighter Command to have their guys assigned to Fighter Command operations, where assignments were made for each mission. By organizing the individual's transfer from operational unit to staff before their tour expired, they remained in the same overall organization, where their presence could be helpful to their old unit. Unfortunately for the 78th, Original pilots Gene Roberts and Harry Dayhuff were not in the operation planning section, but were assigned to tactical development, responsible for bringing new groups up to combat standards. Additionally, its base at Duxford was 50 miles west of the next 8th Fighter Command base in East Anglia, so it could not get assigned to target support cover, where the chance of engaging in combat was the greatest, due to its relative lack of range as compared with the 56th, which was based right on the coast at Halesworth, or the 4th, which was only 30 miles inland at Debden. Thus, geographical location and the politics of fighter command would be a bone of contention between fighter groups for the rest of the war. As Hub Zemke, Don Blakesley, Joe Mason, and other aggressive leaders demonstrated, taking charge on the ground was at least as important as any leadership in the cockpit. Doolittle made one other change. If the fighters were to destroy the Luftwaffe, they couldn't allow the enemy to pick when and where the two sides would meet. Ever since 1941, the Jagdwaffe had used a strategy of avoiding combat when conditions were unfavorable, and the target was not considered to be so important. Thus, most of the time, the only place the fighters could always be found was on their airfields. Doolittle's new rule was that any group that finished their escort assignment without engaging the enemy and had sufficient fuel was to find and hit German airfields on their return. Strafing missions really changed things. A fighter-versus-fighter engagement was a test of skill and ability between the individuals involved. A low-level attack posed the question of whether one could survive the law of probability. German airfields were defended by a multitude of anti-aircraft guns, from 88mm high-altitude cannons through 50mm and 37mm medium-altitude weapons to 20mm cannon down low, all throwing up a veritable wall of fire through which a strafing fighter had to fly. The odds were against the attacker, even in an airplane that could take hits and keep going like the Thunderbolt. To counter the reluctance of pilots to engage in strafing, Doolittle ruled that a ground kill— the successful destruction of an aircraft by strafing, would be credited the same as an air combat victory. No other air force in any theater on either side had such a policy. The result was that more than two-thirds of the German aircraft claimed destroyed between Big Week and D-Day were strafing claims, while 70% of fighter losses were the result of such missions. The 78th Group was the first to follow Doolittle's directive. After chasing FW-190s to low level during an escort on February 6, 1944, to Troyes, France, 78A Group separated into squadrons and strafed the airfields at Orléans, Brissy, Beaumont, Chartres, and Evreux. They ran into the light flak defending the airfields and lost six shot down. It was quickly discovered that attacking airfields without a plan was a recipe for disaster. The P-47 got a technical upgrade at this time that would make the fighter more able to carry out such an offensive strategy. The aircraft were in the process of being equipped with a system to inject water into the engine that would increase power by nearly 20% for a short period of time, a maximum of 10 minutes, 
which could be used at all altitudes, improving both high-altitude and on-the-deck performance. Additionally, a new Curtis paddle blade prop was fitted to the Thunderbolts that improved climb dramatically, increasing the P-47's rate of climb by 600 feet per minute and allowing the fighter to climb to 30,000 feet in 13 minutes rather than the previous 20 minutes. Bob Johnson recalled an experience he had shortly after his P-47 was equipped with the new prop. He ran across a British pilot in a Spitfire 9, the most powerful version of the RAF fighter, equipped with a Merlin engine that had a two-stage supercharger. The two flew alongside each other and signaled interest in what the Americans called hassling, a term used for what would be called in a later war dissimilar aircraft maneuvering or simulated dogfighting. When we did a straight climb, he had me cold. That airplane could pull away from me like the proverbial homesick angel. But after a few times of having my tail feathers waxed, I managed to get above him and make a dive on him. He pulled up, figuring to outclimb me as he had, but I pulled up in a zoom and rocketed past him. He tried to dive, but I came around and the jug seemed to literally fall on him. Then I zoomed and came around again. So long as I stayed in the vertical plane and used the jug's incredible dive and the new zoom ability she was now capable of, he couldn't touch me. I knew I would use that on the Germans the next time I ran across one. Also, by February, every P-47 in 8th Fighter Command had the underwing pylons that allowed them to carry three times as much extra fuel as they had only four months earlier. With the agreement to divert the P-51B from 9th to 8th Air Force, plans were already afoot to re-equip four 8th Fighter Command groups immediately with the new fighter. Hub Zemke was surprised when he returned from his stateside tour in late January to find that the 56th group had been offered the chance to be one of those chosen groups, but had turned down the opportunity. Zemke later wrote that Dave Schilling had done so in his absence, due to the feeling of commitment to the Thunderbolt felt by the pilots who had tamed the beast. Zemke himself had no such attachment to any type of airplane, and would have gladly accepted the offer, because it would have allowed them to chase the enemy anywhere in Germany. On the other hand, Don Blakesley was calling General Kepner every day to request re-equipment, pointing out how easy it would be since most of us had flown Spitfires. In fact, the Mustang was so easy to fly that little thought was given to extensive conversion training before entering combat. When the 352nd Group received its new Mustangs on April 7, 1944, Pilot Robert Punchy Powell remembered, We were coming back from a mission, and when the field came in sight, we saw all these P-51s parked there. On landing, Powell was informed by his crew chief that he was expected to take one of the Mustangs for an initial flight in 30 minutes. Powell was surprised and initially resisted the idea of not even studying the flight manual. But that's what we did. Our engineering officer showed me how to start it, and the next thing I knew, I was at 15,000 feet. To get the feel of it, I did some tight turns, a chandelle in both directions, and a barrel roll. I tested the stall by putting the wheels down, cutting power, and bringing the nose up till she stalled. I was surprised by how stable it was. I went back and landed, and we flew our first mission in the new planes the next day. The bombers themselves were different from what they had been during the battles of 1943. The B-17G had entered production at Boeing in late spring of 1943, and at the Lockheed, Vega, and Douglas Long Beach factories over the summer. The first of these had arrived in England in August. By December 1943, only a few of the earlier B-17Fs were left in the bomb groups. The B-17G differed from the earlier subtypes most notably in the installation of a remote-controlled gun turret immediately beneath the bombardier's position, controlled by the bombardier. Fitted with two 50 caliber machine guns, the turret provided a much wider field of fire than did the two-gun armament fitted inside the nose, which could only be fired individually by the bombardier with limited field of fire. The new turret could cover all the sky ahead of the bomber that would be used by enemy fighters in the 12 o'clock high attack. Additionally, the two other guns fitted in the nose compartment, which could only be fired to the side with the fitting used by the B-17F, were now housed in cheek positions, so named because they bulged out to either side of the nose, that could be aimed much further forward to give a total of four guns defending the nose of the flying fortress. 
the Chin Turret, had first appeared on the 12 YB-40 convoy defenders that had proven unsuccessful. The turret and cheek guns had also appeared on late-production B-17Fs from Douglas Long Beach. The B-17G also featured enclosed waste gun positions, protecting the gunners in the rear fuselage from the icy blasts of high-altitude air whipping through the open waste windows on the B-17F. The B-24 Liberator had also received an armament upgrade. The B-24H subtype, which entered production in mid-1943, replaced the glazed greenhouse nose with an electrically-powered manned Emerson A-15 nose turret mounting two 50 caliber machine guns, with the bombardier's position moved to the area immediately beneath the turret. This change had first been created in the field at the Townsville Air Depot in Australia to modify B-24Ds used in the Southwest Pacific area. The B-24H was built by Ford Motor Company at the gigantic Willow Run factory in Detroit, Michigan, at the time the world's largest building. The B-24J, built by Consolidated at their factories in San Diego, California, and Fort Worth, Texas, differed from the B-24H in having a hydraulically powered Consolidated A6 turret mounted in the nose. On completion of the B-24H contract, Ford's products were similarly equipped B-24Js for the remainder of the war. Assembling bomb group formations in the cloudy skies over England was difficult and led to much delay in starting a mission, resulting in waste of avgas that could affect the ability to reach a distant target. In February 1944, the B-24 equipped 2nd Air Division began using the old greenhouse nose B-24Ds as assembly ships, or formation ships. These war-weary aircraft were stripped of armament and armor and equipped with signal lighting and systems for the quantity discharge of pyrotechnics. They were painted with distinctive group-specific high-contrast multicolor patterns of stripes, checkers, or polka dots, which allowed easy recognition by their bombers. The signal lighting arrangements varied from group to group, but were usually white flashing lamps on both sides of the fuselage, arranged to form the group identification letter. Following some accidents involving the accidental discharge of flare guns in the rear fuselage, most of the assembly ships were modified with the pyrotechnic guns fixed to fire through the apertures in the fuselage sides. The airplanes were operated by a skeleton crew of two pilots, navigator, radio operator, and one or two flare discharge operators. They came to be called Judas Goats by the operational crews, a term loaded with dark imagery of lambs led to slaughter. When the use of assembly ships led to improved operations in the 2nd Air Division, the B-17-equipped 1st and 3rd Air Divisions adopted the idea, using their cast-off B-17Fs. With the additional bomb groups that had arrived in the previous four months, 8th Air Force could now send missions of as many as 700 bombers against targets across Europe, a far cry from January 27, 1943, when 50 B-17s had managed to penetrate Germany for the first time and bomb Wilhelmshaven. By big week, they could send 1,000 or more. Throughout the combined bomber offensive, the weather over Britain and Western Europe was unlike any the Americans dealt with elsewhere. It was problematic throughout the year. Summer fog had disrupted the Schweinfurt-Regensburg mission and was a major reason for the losses incurred then. However, the winter weather over England and Western Europe presented particular difficulties. On the average, severe storms could be expected every three days between London and Berlin. Jimmy Doolittle dealt with the persistent cloud cover over Germany during January 1944 by directing 8th Bomber Command to use radar-directed blind bombing in order to fly missions at all in the unfavorable conditions. 8th Bomber Command and Technical Command had gotten involved in intensive development of radar bombing beginning in late 1942 in an effort to reduce the weather-imposed operational limitations in the ETO as much as possible. At this point in its development, existing radar equipment was seen not as a substitute for visual bombing, but rather as an alternative that allowed 8th Bomber Command to maintain pressure on the German economy as a whole. When radar bombing missions did begin in the fall of 1943, the missions were restricted to targets that showed up clearly on the radar screen. These were primarily built-up urban areas on coastlines or estuaries, since the distinction between water and land was easy to recognize on the screen. 
While a large industrial area could be located without difficulty, it was impossible to identify specific factories unless they were either unusually isolated or unusually extensive. The governing philosophy regarding radar-guided bombing was that it was better to bomb low-priority targets frequently, even if it meant less than precision accuracy, than not to bomb at all. Early plans were based largely on the RAF's experience and British equipment was the first to be used. Of the RAF's radar equipment that best suited to 8th Bomber Command's requirements was H-2S, a centimetric radar using a beam of transmitted energy to scan the ground below the carrier aircraft, with the reflected signals showing a map-like picture on the indicator screen with light areas for ground, dark areas for water, and the broad reflecting surfaces of towns and cities showing up as bright areas. The 482nd Bombardment Group was first to use H-2S on September 27, 1943. With first priority for the sets going to RAF Bomber Command and production pressed to meet those needs, 8th Bomber Command still had only a few sets in October, and the units using them were experiencing difficulty in using the equipment at the high altitudes at which the bombers flew. The MIT Radiation Laboratory was contracted to develop an improved version of the H-2S type. Rather than centimetric wavelength, this set used a new and shorter microwave length, which gave a sharper and more accurate ground return. Known as H-2X, the sets were placed in production in the summer of 1943. The need for rapid supply resulted in the Radiation Laboratory hand-building 20 sets, which were enough to equip a dozen B-17s with necessary spares. The 12 B-17s, manned by crews partially trained in operating H-2X, joined the 482nd Group in October. The crews underwent further training over the remainder of October, and then went operational earlier than intended due to the winter weather being worse than expected. Each H-2X B-17, which were distinguished from standard flying fortresses by the substitution of the H-2X radome in the ball turret position, would lead a combat wing of 60 bombers that would drop on the radar-equipped Pathfinder leader. The first practice mission was flown on November 3rd. 11 Pathfinders, 9 using H-2X and 2 with H-2S, led 539 bombers to attack the port of Wilhelmshaven. This was primarily due to 8th Bomber Command being familiar with the target, it having been the first German target struck by the command back in January, and the fact that its geographic location, situated on the coast near the estuary of the Vesa River, was easily identified by the radar. Despite poor weather over England, 566 bombers assembled without difficulty, with only 27 aboarding. This was the largest mission yet mounted by 8th Bomber Command. The radar worked well, and a record load of more than 1,400 tons of bombs was dropped through a solid layer of cloud with sufficient accuracy to damage the aiming point. The 11 Pathfinders flew with the 7 B-17-equipped combat wings of the 1st and 3rd Air Divisions. The 2nd Division's 117 B-24s were to drop on-parachute marker flares. This resulted in considerable error because the interval between combat wings allowed the flares to drift, in addition to their being hard to distinguish from flak explosions. Unfortunately, while the bombing was effective in terms of hitting the target, the result was less impressive, since the shipyard workshops that were moderately damaged were not being used to capacity, and there was no damage to the hulls of under-construction U-boats. But this was not as important as the fact that the yard had been hit through ten-tenths cloud by inexperienced Pathfinder crews. The fact that the weather had prevented the Luftwaffe from making any significant interception, with only seven bombers lost and four of those due to flak, was also considered beneficial. The bombers were escorted by eight fighter groups with good results. This first success encouraged those who believed in radar bombing and converted the doubtful. Using radar, 8th Bomber Command mounted nine more missions in November, all flown in weather that prevented any opportunity for visual bombing. Unfortunately, the accuracy obtained was not repeated in later missions flown in December, though the commanders were satisfied by the greatly accelerated rate of operations that the force achieved through the rest of the winter of 1943-44, to serving to meet the insistent demands by General Arnold that 8th Bomber Command go all out. The size of the missions mounted was the result of the increase in operating strength in 8th Bomber Command, 
from 20 bomb groups in October 1943 to 30 groups operational by the end of 1943, with double the number of bombers assigned to a group. The November 3rd record of 566 bombers sent was broken on November 26th when a force of 633 went out, with that increasing to 710 on December 13th and 722 on December 24th. The supply of H-2X sets had not improved by mid-January 1944. Shortly after taking command of USS TAF, Spots wrote Arnold, The most critical need of the strategic air forces is for more Pathfinder aircraft. A few H-2X planes now will profit our cause more than several hundred in six months. Further missions were flown to the ports of Bremen, Wilhelmshaven, and Kiel, which were easily identified and allowed the Pathfinder crews to gain experience with their gear. The bombing led by the radar-equipped Pathfinders in November and December had been too scattered to result in more than accidental damage to any particular industrial plant or installation targeted. In fact, bombs fell in the assigned target area on only two missions. Photo interpretation of bomb damage assessment indicated that only six of 151 combat boxes using radar bombing dropped bombs within one mile of the aiming point. Seventeen boxes dropped within two miles, and 30 dropped within five miles. At Bremen, the city hit most often in those two months. No bombs fell within two miles of the aiming point. Five combat boxes were able to drop within five miles. By the end of 1943, it was clear that radar-directed bombing was unlikely to become sufficiently accurate to replace or even compete with visual bombing. Eighth Bomber Command had been involved in the kind of area bombing engaged in by the RAF and deprecated by the USAAF, though the attacks kept pressure on the enemy. The only way to achieve the accuracy necessary to meet the goal set by Point Blank was through visual bombing, and this could not reliably take place before March, leaving too little time to achieve supremacy over the Luftwaffe by the time of the invasion. Thus, when there was any chance of clear weather, Missions had to be laid on as a maximum effort. For now, as 8th Bomber Command Intelligence stated in a report, the weather continued to be a faithful Nazi collaborator. Chapter 15. Blakesley Takes Command Symbolic of the major changes coming in 8th Fighter Command, Don Blakesley took command of the 4th on New Year's Day, replacing Chesley Peterson, who had orders to report to 9th Tactical Air Command as Director of Operations. Many years later, when asked about this, Peterson said, If I had had the slightest idea that one-tenth of what was about to happen would happen, they couldn't have dragged me out of Debden with a Sherman tank. Once he was the leader, Blakesley told his pilots point-blank what he expected of them. The 4th Fighter Group is going to be the top fighter group in the 8th Air Force. We are here to fight. To those who don't believe me, I would suggest transferring to another group. I'm going to fly the arse off each one of you. Those who keep up with me, good. Those who don't, I don't want them anyway. Steve Pisanos later recalled, If anyone had any doubts, it was clear from Colonel Don's statements that the gloves were coming off in 1944. After leading the January 4th mission, where the weather prevented the group from coming to grips with the enemy, Blakesley led his second mission as group commander on January 7th, withdrawal support to cover bombers returning from Ludwigshafen. The Agdwaffe rose to the occasion, and he was nearly undone by his own aggressiveness. When 12 FW-190s dived out of the sun to attack straggling B-17s near Hesden, Blakesley turned to attack them, but was cut off by a flight of RAF Spitfires. Having lost his wingman, he joined Jim Goodson's red section. I had climbed up back to 14,000 feet when I saw more Fokker Wolfs attacking stragglers, Blakesley later wrote in his combat report. I dived on these, being covered by Captain Goodson's section, and chased one enemy aircraft down to between two or 3,000 feet. Goodson, with newly promoted wingman First Lieutenant Bob Wehrman in tow, followed Blakesley in line astern. Other 190s attempted to attack, but usually broke away down through the clouds when I turned into them, Blakesley reported. Goodson later reported, Suddenly, I was jumped by three FW-190s. One made a determined attack, firing at Blakesley even after I attacked him. When I started getting strikes on him, he broke hard to port. 
but even though he pulled streamers from his wingtips, I was able to pull my sights through him. He suddenly did two and a half flick rolls and then split est vertically through some light scud cloud. I followed in a steep wing over and had to pull out hard to miss some trees as the cloud was lower than I had realized. As I did so, I caught sight of an explosion. Since the 190 had gone through the clouds vertically, I feel sure he could not have pulled out even if he had not been damaged. Goodson soon joined Blakesley and Wehrman, but before he could get close enough, another FW-190 got on Blakesley's tail and opened fire. Goodson managed to get on the enemy's tail and fired. I was relieved to see strikes all over him and see him peel away and crash in flames on the ground, which was quite close. Jim Goodson had saved Don Blakesley, but was out of ammunition when a third FW-190 tried to shoot Blakesley. Goodson's element leader, First Lieutenant Vermont Garrison, cut off the enemy fighter and damaged it enough to force the German to break away. This was Blakesley's second close shave with the enemy, where Goodson had saved him. Blakesley still wasn't done with fighting that day, despite the damage to his thunderbolt. When he spotted another FW-190 going after a straggling flying fortress, Blakesley turned onto the enemy's tail. The enemy aircraft I was attacking suddenly broke off its turn, straightened out, and went into haze. I followed, and as he came out, I was dead line astern. I fired a three to four second burst, observing strikes on the enemy aircraft's tail and starboard wing. Pieces came from the cockpit. It then did a half flick to the right and went in. My radio had been shot out, and my aircraft was spraying oil badly. For the rest of the flight back to England, Blakesley and Goodson had to depend on Bob Wehrman, who again was the only one with ammunition. The P-47s were again bounced by BF-109s, which turned away when Goodson and Wehrman turned into them. When they managed to put down at the Manston Emergency Strip, Blakesley later counted 71 holes in the tail and rear fuselage of his Thunderbolt. Following the January 11th mission, in which the 4th was among the groups recalled due to encountering worse weather than originally forecast, the clouds again covered Germany, so heavy that even radar bombing was impossible. The conditions lasted for two weeks, while either cloud conditions over Germany made formation flying at high altitude impossible, or the weather over the East Anglia and Midlands bases made launching a mission too difficult to carry out. On January 14th, the 4th escorted bombers to strike the under-construction V-1 launch site at Magny Soissons, just across the Channel in northern France. Former Eagle Don Gentile was leading shirt blue purple flight of the 336th Squadron, with Johnny Godfrey's best friend, 2nd Lieutenant Bob Richards, as his wingman, and Vermont Garrison as element leader. As the Thunderbolts orbited south of the target at 25,000 feet, a formation of FW-190s was spotted 3,000 feet below, and Blakesley ordered the 336th to bounce them. The Thunderbolts fell on the enemy fighters and a swirling dogfight developed. In the course of this, Gentile became separated from Richards and the other element of his flight. Spotting two FW-190s below flying east to get away from the fight, he dived on them. Pulling in behind, he managed to hit the wingman and set his engine on fire. The leader made a wing over to escape, diving for the ground below. Gentile went after him, finally putting a fatal burst into the Fakovus engine as the two fighters roared 50 feet above the trees. Gentile pulled up to climb back to altitude and rejoin the group, but he spotted two other FW-190s diving on him. He turned into them to break the attack, and initially both overshot, but they came back around. Gentile managed to get on the wingman's tail and fired a burst, but missed. The enemy fighter pulled up and away while the leader pulled around on him, attempting to get on his tail. Gentile pulled the stick into his stomach and slammed it against his right leg as the P-47 stood on a wingtip over the forest, chief force contrails streaming from the wingtips. The two fighters went round and round over the trees. Gentile managed to pull tight enough to get his opponent in his sights, but when he squeezed the trigger, there was no response. He was out of ammo, and the enemy pilot was good. The P-47 wasn't supposed to be able to turn with an FW-190 at low altitude, but Gentile now had no choice. He pushed the throttle into war emergency power, and the R-2800 screamed as the entire airframe shook, right on the edge of a stall that would spin him into the trees below in an instant. 
His only option was to stay in the turn till the enemy pilot ran out of ammunition. Help! Help! I'm being clobbered! Gentile screamed over the radio in near panic. He was answered by the imperturbable Carolina drawl of Captain Willard Millie Milliken. Now, if you will tell me your call sign and approximate position, we'll send help. I'm down here by a railroad track with a 190, screamed Gentile in reply. The turning fight continued below as the other pilots of the fourth looked for their comrade. Afraid the German was going to win the battle, Gentile called out to Blakesley. Horseback, horseback, if I don't get back, tell him I got two 190s. He later reported, I suddenly flicked and just about wiped myself out on the trees. Recovering, I reversed my turn to starboard, and there he was, still inside me and still shooting like hell. I kept on turning and skidding. He slid under and overshot, and I reversed again. We met head-on, and he was still firing. For the next ten minutes, we kept reversing turns from head-on attacks, trying to get on each other's tails. As the FW-190 began to close the gap, Gentile suddenly leveled his wings and pulled the stick back into his gut, standing the big thunderbolt on its prop until the shaking told him he was just about to stall out. He was now above the enemy pilot, and if he'd had any ammo left, he could have swooped down and finished the fight. His German opponent suddenly flicked over, recovered right above the trees, and fled. Gentile leveled out, breathed a sigh of relief, and climbed back to rejoin the group. When he bounced down on Debden's runway, he didn't bother to gun the engine before switching off. Gentile sat in the silence, spent and worn, every fiber of his being heavy with weariness. When the intelligence officer jumped on the wing to interrogate him, he didn't answer. The officer later recalled that when he pulled off his leather flying helmet, it was dripping wet with sweat. Gentile finally found the strength to pull himself up and climbed out of the cockpit. I got two, he said as he jumped off the wing to the ground. The boy, who at age eight had seen the movie Wings and determined he would be a fighter pilot, who had made up business cards reading Don Gentile, ace, had just scored victories four and five. While he was doing that, Bob Richards scored his first victory and lived to celebrate it when Garrison shot the enemy wingman off his tail. When the winter fog finally lifted over East Anglia after bringing flight operations to a halt for five days, Blakesley led a rodeo sweep to the Pas de Calais on January 21st. Most of the time, the Luftwaffe studiously ignored such flights, but this time a fight developed when a small force of FW-190s were caught unaware of the Thunderbolt's presence. Bob Richards recalled, We were vectored to Beauvais to intercept some bandits in that area. When we got near there, there was nothing to be seen except a little flak. My number one, Lieutenant Kenneth Peterson, was still very keen on the way out, and when I saw him roll his airplane on its side, I looked down also and saw four bogies flying south. Peterson started to go down, and I followed. As we got closer, I recognized them as FW-190s. They didn't see us until we got right on top of them, and Peterson started firing. He overshot, and another 190 came in from 45 or 50 degrees, under deflecting all the time. Another 190 came in head on, firing at me. I took a short burst at him. He went over the top of me. I started to pull around to get on his tail when I saw another 190 right in front of me. I had plenty of speed, and I closed in from about a hundred yards, firing all the time. I saw strikes all over him. He pulled up to the right to try to break into me. As he did that, I laid off a little deflection above him, and I hit him all over the cockpit. It looked as if the cockpit was all ablaze from the strikes. I closed in to about 25 yards and pulled off to the side to watch him go down. He rolled over smoking and headed for the deck out of control. For the January 29th mission to Frankfurt, the 4th was assigned penetration support. Soon after they left the bombers over Maastricht, Holland, 16 BF-109s were spotted below. Dwayne Beeson and the 334th Squadron dived on the enemy fighters. Beeson later reported, As our squadron bounced this group of enemy aircraft, I saw six other ME-109s coming in to get on our tails. My wingman, Lieutenant Archie Chatterley, and I turned into them. One put a hole in my tailplane before we could turn into them. But when the turn was completed, I saw Chatterley on a 109's tail. Chatterley remembered. My first strike was on the left wingtip. He straightened out and dived. 
I hit him with many strikes around the cockpit and other sections of the fuselage. Pieces flew off, and the enemy aircraft went out of control and down slowly on its back, with dark smoke trailing behind. I lost sight of it as it floated into the clouds. In the meantime, the other BF-109s continued diving. Beeson reported. I got on the tail of the nearest one and opened fire. I saw very severe strikes on the fuselage and wing roots, then a large flash somewhere in the cockpit area, and the enemy aircraft flicked violently to the right and went down trailing a long stream of gray-black smoke. The last I saw the 109, he was going straight down through ten-tenths cloud below. As Beeson pulled out of his dive, he saw a dogfight below him. I started down again when I sighted an aircraft off to starboard, also diving. When I closed on him, he turned out to be a yellow-tailed FW-190 with a belly tank. I was approaching out of the sun, and he didn't see me. I fired a burst from out of range, trying to slow him down. No results were seen, so I continued behind him as he went into a cloud at about 3,000 feet, and when he came out below, I was about 300 yards behind. I opened fire again and saw many incendiary strikes on his fuselage. He dropped his nose at about 200 feet and went into the deck. Steve Pisanos spotted 15 BF-109s below, and his flight dived on them. I lined up at once and began firing. He went into a dive, and I followed him down, firing. When we were just above the cloud base, I saw hits behind the cockpit. He went out of control and dived straight down into the cloud at 3,000 feet. I then started to climb to starboard when I saw another 109 below me to my port, flying straight and level. I went down and closed on him, opening fire. As he dived into the cloud, I saw hits on the cockpit and fuselage. A lot of fire came out, and he rolled over to the right and went in. With these two victories, Pisanos was one confirmed kill away from making ace. Altogether, Pisanos got two BF-109s, while Beeson and Captain Henry Mills claimed two FW-190s each. Archie Chatterley got one FW-190, as did First Lieutenant Vic France. Unfortunately, the 335th Squadron's 2nd Lieutenant Burton Wyman, who had last been seen chasing a BF-109 into the undercast with another behind him, failed to return to Debden, becoming the 4th's first combat fatality of 1944. The next day, flying a target support mission to Brunswick, the pilots in the 335th Squadron spotted 12 bogies at 26,000 feet and 15 more at 12,000 feet. They climbed after the higher group, and the enemy fighters responded. Second Lieutenant Charles Anderson later reported, When we were almost up to them, two 109s dived down between my number three and me. When they saw my aircraft, they started to climb immediately. I followed them up and fired at the one on the left from about 350 yards. He started smoking badly and turned away to the left. As there were two, I could not follow the one I had fired at for fear that the other would get on my tail. I later saw the BF-109 spinning and burning as it entered a cloud. On January 31st, Captain Raymond Kerr led the fourth on its first-ever dive-bombing mission to strike Gilza Ryan Airfield in Holland. Two four-aircraft flights in each squadron flew thunderbolts carrying a 500-pound bomb on the centerline shackles, while the other two flights provided cover. The P-47s hit a fuel dump and one of the runways. While the dive bombers were attacking, the top cover was attacked by 15 to 20 BF-109s. First Lieutenant Raymond Klotfelter's 335th Squadron flight dodged four diving enemy fighters. I then spotted a BF-109 coming in at 9 o'clock, and when he started to pull deflection on me, I called a break and immediately flicked over into an aileron turn. I saw three other enemy aircraft off to my right approximately 1,500 yards away. I decided I could catch them, so I pushed everything to the firewall and closed very quickly. When the ME-109s recovered from their dives, I pulled deflection and opened fire. After a short burst, I pushed my nose through again and fired a longer burst. I closed to a hundred yards, seeing strikes all over the cockpit, pieces falling off the tail, and a fire. I had to break off to the right, and as I did, I passed within a wingspan of the enemy fighter, which dove to earth and exploded. Captain Mike Sabansky was leading the 336 Squadron's top cover. One BF-109 made a pass at the flight. As he broke away, I saw another ME-109 dive head-on past us, and I followed him down. I gave a short burst while I was in a 70-degree dive, observing no strikes. 
He started pulling up, turning left, and I fired, a 20-degree deflection shot. I observed strikes in the wings and near the cockpit. A large puff of white smoke came out after my last burst, and he flicked left, smoking badly. My wingman, First Lieutenant Howard Moulton, saw him go down in flames after he flicked over. While the top cover was engaged, another group of BF-109s snuck in behind the P-47s that had just bombed. The Thunderbolt pilots thought they were friendly and orbited to join up. The 335th's First Lieutenant Paul Ellington later reported, They turned out all to be ME-109s, about six or eight in number. We engaged them immediately, and three of them dived for the deck. First Lieutenant Kendall Swede Carlson shot down a BF-109, then saw the P-47 flown by the 335th's Second Lieutenant William Rowles with another BF-109 behind him. Lieutenant Ellington cut inside of me and took the 109 off the 47's tail. On fire, the enemy fighter crashed on a mud flat. Vermont Garrison and Dwayne Beeson also claimed a BF-109 each. Group Executive Lieutenant Colonel Sel Edner led a ramrod penetration support mission to Emden on February 3rd that concluded with the enemy ignoring the Thunderbolts. That changed on February 6th, during a penetration target support mission to Romali, when the Luftwaffe appeared in force. Some 15 to 20 enemy fighters continuously attacked the bombers for 40 minutes. The 334th's flight officer, Ralph Hofer, knocked down a BF-109, while lieutenants Vermont Garrison and Robert Hobart each destroyed an FW-190. Four days later, on February 10th, escorting bombers to Brunswick, the group battled 25 to 30 FW-190s and BF-109s that made repeated attacks on the bombers between Lingen and Nienberg. Vic France claimed an FW-190, while Millie Milliken, Red Dog Norley, and Vermont Garrison claimed BF-109s, with Garrison's claim landing him ace status. On February 14th, each of the fourth's three squadrons received a P-51B when the fighters were delivered to Debden. Blakesley informed the pilots that he expected all to check out in the new fighter between flying combat missions. There would be no downtime to permit pilots to transition en masse. Chapter 16 One Man Air Force The 1944 campaign began on January 4th with a radar bombing mission against Kiel, with Munster as a secondary target. A total of 644 bombers took off, of which 555 were able to bomb the target. Kiel was among several targets the next day. This time, the 215 bombers were able to bomb visually and inflicted severe damage to the Germania 